Chapter 51. Check the boxes. After greeting everyone, Amara smiled. It's great to meet you all. I've never seen any of John's friends or family before. Oh, we haven't either. I think he's just a loner. Would you shut up? I kicked Plex again as he trash-talked me, making him jump and back away. Rayla spoke. We all work with John at our company. What company? Divine Distribution. We deliver cargo, messages, what have you. I see. Amara nodded as her smile turned to more of a curious grin, causing me to smirk. This girl, always trying to poke deeper into my business. There was no way she didn't know that what I did wasn't normal since even her mother mentioned it, but now she had more people to pry information from. Not that she could do much with the company name. Anything she could find officially wouldn't tell her anything. Rayla suddenly smiled, looking between Amara and I. So, how long has this been going on? Oh, only a few weeks. We haven't actually been on a proper date since we've been on a military base, but I think we made it work. The closest thing to a date we had was fending off a horde of scourge beasts. And you got injured there too. I'm starting to think you're a magnet for trouble. What can I say? I do my job well. I smiled and shrugged, causing her to pinch my arm. Rayla chuckled a bit. Well, I'm happy for you guys. It took you long enough, John. Yeah, I was starting to think he was messed up in the head somewhere. This guy passed up every damn girl we put in front of him. Plex smirked from behind Libidus, causing me to shake my head. Amara just laughed. After that, we had a few more conversations before Amara and I were let go. We still needed to go back to our dorms and unpack. The two of us walked back together after grabbing our chests. We didn't talk much, but I had a lot on my mind. It was easy to fake pleasantries, so I wondered how Rayla was handling the news. We had been close, definitely closer than good friends should be but we hadn't gone past a certain line ever since we slept together. It had been long enough since then, but there had always been a bit of suspense between us. Now, that was all dashed away with Amara's appearance. Not that it was going to be any other way. I had a lot of time to think during the trip, or more precisely, fill my mind with things other than the emotional conflict between Rayla and I. And I realized that there was no use in putting off the inevitability. I wasn't going to date or marry Rayla. Maybe I didn't want to accept it before and so I convinced myself that perhaps it might happen. But I could have made it happen at any time over the past several months. There were countless opportunities to shatter the thin barrier between us and engage in a proper relationship. But I didn't. I didn't want to, even though I hated myself for that. Now, I was pursuing Amara, and she unintentionally showed me exactly why I didn't pursue Rayla. It seemed that whenever I was with Rayla, there was a dark shadow hanging over both of us. Sure. The two of us were mature and carried ourselves as such, making for a rich relationship. But the shadow was too much for me. It was selfish, but if I wanted the best for myself, then I wouldn't find it with her. On the contrary, Amara and I only seemed to have fun while still being able to engage each other intellectually and emotionally. And we still had a long ways to go in regard to our intimacy, which only made me excited. I had already decided that I needed someone who was at my level, who fit me better. It wouldn't take anything away from my friendship with Rayla, but now, the lingering tension between us was no longer there. The line had been clearly drawn. I didn't look back as Amara and I disappeared into the fourth-year dorms. We went to Amara's room first, which was on the top floor like mine. But whereas my room was 312, hers was 344. It was down a hall, but not that far thankfully. This is me. M.M. I nodded as she used her feet to open the door, kicking it open and heading inside. I followed her in, setting my chest down by the door and looking around. When the light came on, I saw a moderately decorated room that looked pretty normal. There were two paintings, one medium-sized plushie on her bed, and then a large poster containing a diagram of what I could only assume was a spell formation. Amara spoke as she put down her chest. I'm glad I was able to meet your friends. They seem nice. Well, I'm glad they seem that way. Hey, now I just need to meet your family since you met my mother. Oh. Did I not tell you about that? About what? She looked back at me weirdly. I felt odd while explaining. Well, I have a family. It's just that I won't ever be able to see them again. What do you mean? I thought you came from a village. I did, but I wasn't born there. So you lied about growing up in Yumer Village? Yes. I confessed directly, deciding that it was best to get some things out of the way. I traveled to the capital from Yumer Village, but I have no relation to it or anyone there besides the chief who gave me the ride here. So then, I'm from a place very far away, so far that I'll never be able to go back. And my family is there, so I won't be able to see them again. 
What was that place called? Earth. Earth. She stared thoughtfully for a few moments before walking over to me. Her arms wrapped around me in a hug. I know there's probably more to the story, but no matter what, it must be difficult not seeing them. Yeah. But I've made my peace with it. There's nothing I can do anyway. Not that it makes it any easier. I was silent as I returned the hug. It really was difficult, but I found solace in the fact that we had only separated. While they didn't know that, and that worried me, I knew the truth. It was enough for me, mainly because it had to be. Still, I found some comfort in Amara's arms. I felt bad that I had lied to her, but her understanding only made me like her more. After a while of that though, I smiled a bit and broke the silence. So, your mother is fun. See, can we forget about that? As if. Honestly, I don't know how you're more embarrassed than me. I'm the one who had to answer those questions. I mean. She went silent, gradually burying her head in my chest. I almost died. Hee I saw. I chuckled, but being honest with myself, those questions and my answers had gone a bit deeper than I thought our relationship warranted. I had essentially said that I may marry Amara in the future. For the sake of even being able to try, I didn't hesitate to lay out the truth like that. But it could be said that we had taken a rather big step just then, laying everything out on the table so clearly. We separated after she turned me around and pushed me out. So grabbing my chest, I went back to my room and settled down. After that, I decided to run some errands and say hi to my mentor, as well as see if I couldn't start baiting out any latent threats. Ah. Uh, Omara jumped face first into her bed after John left, kicking her legs sporadically while squealing into her pillow. Her mind was entirely filled with what she heard earlier. After being so embarrassed by her mother that her blood boiled in shame, she listened to John speak words that made her heart flutter and breath hitch. It was so overwhelming that she curled up on the floor and buried herself in her robes. She couldn't help but fixate on that one word, marriage. She barely kept up as her fantasies flew out of control. She wasn't even able to look John in the eye. Even just hugging him made her feel tingly. Her last resort was pushing him out to give herself some room to process her spiraling emotions. That, and she needed to prepare for dinner with her mother. Dressing up took time, so she unpacked while thinking about everything before calming down and picking out her clothes. But she encountered a conundrum. She went through all her dresses, some of which were stored in spatial sacks, and tried on six before she caught herself. With every dress, every piece of jewelry, she pictured herself walking down an aisle. How would it look beside him? Is it too noble for his tastes? Would our colors match? Before she knew it, she had spent an entire hour debating the validity of every dress she owned for a scenario that only had a chance of happening years in the future. At some point, she could only pick out her nicest black dress feeling it was barely satisfactory. And after putting on some light makeup, slipping on her earrings, and wrapping a bracelet around her wrist, she put on a fur coat and left her room. On the way out, she passed by John's door and knocked, but to no avail. He was gone on what she could only assume was business. With a sigh, she left the dorms and arrived at the gates, seeing a large carriage. Jumping inside, she sat across from her mother who was similarly dressed. The Duchess looked her daughter up and down. Did you dress for the dinner or for him? I just dressed nicely. Rumble. The carriage rolled as Amara shouted exasperatedly. She was beginning to reach a limit today. Sensing that, the Duchess smiled and looked back down at her aerial. On the screen was a picture of John along with the bounty of 40,000 coin. Below that there were several details about him. More specifically, the Duchess paid attention to one number. Estimated kill count, 108. Before the Duchess, there was no hiding. Over the course of just two hours, she had already collected nearly every piece of information there was to know about John Cooper. But everything she saw only made her more curious. A kill count recently surpassing the triple digits, a number that probably didn't match the true number, despite only being Authority 3. Then there were the weapons he used to carry that out. But more interesting than that was the complete lack of background. He had appeared out of nowhere. Even villages had to take a consensus and submit records to their ruling counties but there wasn't a single record of John's existence. And that wasn't even considering that he was nothing like a village boy should be. Anybody who came from those backwater establishments was uneducated, unrefined, and poor. But John wasn't any of those things. Although he didn't carry the air of a noble, he still knew his manners. Then again, he was more ignorant than she initially thought since he didn't even know that the title of Duchess was equal to that of a duke, the highest noble title only under the king himself. Of course, after her interrogation, she confirmed that his intentions with Amara were pure enough. 
In fact, compared to some snobby noble boys, she quite liked him. But his background was a complete mystery. She had at least wanted to know where he came from, but the only name she found on record was Humor Village, and he most assuredly didn't come from there. She wanted to interrogate him more, but she also knew when she was overstepping. She held herself to certain standards and, as a duchess, wouldn't stoop so low as to force the information out of him. As for everything else, well, she had already found it. A delivery man who had a relationship with the Tavera family and was employed directly under the notorious Plax. Admitted to the school as a fourth year under the recommendation of Maxwell Alberain, a name she was very familiar with. There was even a piece of information mentioning the golden key he obtained from the key master of the Black Spider Hotel, as well as interacting directly with Son of Son Industries. It was like the kid was a walking magnet for notoriety, interacting with some of the most famous underground names out there. Of course, he also fought tooth and nail to keep his life under those circumstances, but there were many others who had died due to far less, which brought her more interest in his summons and his power. Training under Maxwell for less than a year had brought him up to Authority 3, and after just a few days at Calatrop Base, he had already become an elite, a most recent piece of news. Every detail painted an extraordinary picture, and the only thing that amazed her was that he wasn't more famous. Of course, if he kept on his path, that would change very soon. For now, the only decision she had come to was that he was worth keeping around, and that her daughter coming in contact with him was actually lucky. As she thought about those things, the mother and daughter arrived at the nicest restaurant in the capital, besides those behind the Black Spider Hotel. Welcome, Duchess. Your table awaits. After stepping out, they were greeted and led to their table directly. For a Duchess, there was no such thing as waiting or a lack of personal service. Taken to the top floor, they were given a private room that overlooked the nighttime capital city. It was a gorgeous view that even Amara couldn't help but take in with wonder. So, tell me about your trip. I hear it was eventful. I was. We were attacked a few times. Amara went on to recollect the events of the trip, like the siege, their search and destroy mission, and then their last patrol. In each event, she always ended up talking almost strictly about John's side of the combat. There was one detail that surprised the Duchess. He can utilize his aura? M.M. He told me about it. He said it's still useless for anything besides reading the atmosphere, but he eventually wants to use it for something that can help mitigate his weaknesses, like invisibility. I see. So his talent is up to standards as well. Seems you picked a good one. Why yes? Amara ducked a bit bashfully. The Duchess looked at her daughter while resting her chin on her palm as if scrutinizing. Dear, do you truly like this man? Yes? I wouldn't pursue him otherwise. I understand that. But you've always been rather apprehensive about dating. For years you've refused to humor all the handsome suitors thrown your way. And then two months go by during your fourth year at the Magisterium and you come home from a trip with a new boy. You can understand why I'm more than a little surprised. W.L. he just seemed to check all the right boxes. Like? The Duchess' eyebrows raised, causing Amara to fidget. He's smart. Doesn't seem that smart to me. He's not from around here, so he doesn't seem to know much of the culture. But from what I've heard, he's shockingly well-informed on lots of topics, even by our standards. It's why I never believed he was from a village. And what has he spoken of? Well, lots of things. He knows about the human body, like how it's composed of billions of individual living things called cells. Oh, he also talked about light and said that there's such a thing as invisible fire. There was also some stuff about space. Omara described what seemed like a dozen different scientific concepts and her mother was confused as much of the information was entirely foreign to her. As someone who stood at the top of the world, there was very little she didn't know about. She was someone who was more than able to push the limits of magical research and technological development, even the most bleeding-edge science, could be browsed on a whim. It was all well within her grasp. But she hadn't heard about most of what Amara mentioned, let alone how most of it seemed completely made up. Eventually, she shook her head. Never mind that. Continue. Oh, okay. Well, besides being smart, he's rather charming. We can talk for hours. He's also strong for someone who isn't a knight. And he's kind of fearless. Amara glanced out the window and toward the city. I've never seen him scared of anything. Even when our Hummer was flipped, he was the calmest one, even though he's just a summoner. Even when he was attacked and almost killed, I didn't sense an ounce of fear. Almost like it had nothing to do with him. Sounds reckless. I would say that for every summoner who dares to step foot on a battlefield. The Duchess didn't refute, smiling with unreadable thoughts. Chapter 52 
whole truth. The Duchess sighed, seeing her child's dreamy gaze. Oh, how hard you've fallen, daughter. I'm perfectly in control of my emotions. You asked about it anyway, not me. Because I'm your mother, and this concerns more than just yourself. All I can tell you is that if you pursue this man, you'll need to be prepared to drag him into a world he's completely unfamiliar with. Your noble duties cannot simply be neglected, and you'll be required to bring him to a majority of affairs since we both know you have many suitors vying for your hand. I'll never arrange your marriage for you, but that means you must take responsibility for your relationships. I know. Amara nodded solemnly. Dating the daughter of a duchess was a big deal. She had forgotten about that mainly because she never involved herself with much at the magisterium. And when pressured to date, she used her studies as an excuse. But now she was stirring the pot, and both her and John would need to bear the consequences. However, seeing Amara's seriousness, the Duchess couldn't help but chuckle a bit. Don't be so worried. I have a feeling he'll be able to deal with everything fine considering his occupation. As a delivery man? Indeed. What does he really do? Amara asked her curiosity blazing. But the Duchess shook her head. He's just a delivery man. Bullshit. Language. Unlikely. Oomph. Your mouth has become loose. The Duchess smirked and looked out toward the city. Dear, you know I've been keeping certain realities of this world away from you. But you're growing up, and I won't be able to shield you forever. Of course, your choice to date someone involved in those things isn't helping me, but I understand that sheltering you is no longer as necessary as it had been. So can you tell me about what he does? I won't, but I won't stop him from exposing it to you either. However, I've already warned him, and I don't believe he'll test me. He's not to involve you in his work. The people he works with and knows are very dangerous individuals. Your identity is under no circumstance allowed to appear in that world. It'll create a huge mess for all of us, even though I wield a lot of power in that sector as well. I have a hard time believing there are people who can pressure you. Amara looked at her mother with scrutiny, but all she earned was a shaken head. I'm not all-powerful, and power isn't everything. There are those who can match me and have no interest in the royal affairs of the kingdom. They work in the dark, creating entire empires that nobody you see around you will ever know existed. And they who have few rules wield even more influence than I do, and fight to secure more power with means I only dare to defend myself with. You, my dear, are leverage capable of being used against me. Do not give them an excuse to make a move by involving yourself, or we'll all regret it. Do you understand that? Yes. Amara nodded seriously. It seemed the waters were far deeper than she imagined. She didn't think it was possible for anyone other than the king and other dukes to pressure her mother, but it turns out there were others out there who were more than capable of that, and she didn't even know they existed. The duchess looked at her daughter. Despite her warnings, she was still curious. John is a special case since he appeared out of nowhere. He has no background to speak of and works a unique job that gives him special immunities. He's lucky. So when you see him, you can tell him that you're allowed to take tours and go to the parties, but by no means are you allowed to operate in any capacity. I won't babysit you, so take it as a learning experience. Okay. Amara nodded happily. She was finally free. Also, I want you to come home tomorrow. Your father wants to see you. Oh. Her happiness subsided with her mother's next comment as she simply dipped her chin. After that, the mother and daughter discussed more business and leisure until ending their dinner later into the night. After heading to the Black Spider Hotel, I greeted my favorite receptionist. Key Master. Ah, it's John. I see you had an eventful time. You would be correct. Well, it's good to see you in one piece at least. We shook hands as I nodded. Yes, no lost limbs, thankfully. Hey, I have a question. A duchess is on the level of a duke, right? It is. Okay. What does it mean to be a duke? I asked with curiosity, since my original questions from before still hadn't been answered. And unlike the others, the key master simply answered. A duke is someone who has been given a certain level of royal authority by the king. They are at least authority eleven and are given a dukedom. Some dukedoms are entire cities while some are massive swaths of land beyond the capital. And dukes or duchesses who reach authority 12 are titled Grand Dukes, standing almost equal to the king himself. As for regular dukes, they are often given the responsibilities of managing their territories, as well as certain key positions within the monarchy. So they're a bunch of big shots. I suppose. The king master chuckled at my succinct summary, and I was beginning to realize just how important Amara was. She was basically a princess, and her mother was terrifyingly powerful standing just below the pinnacle of this world. 
to think Amara actually pursued me first. Somehow, I managed to seduce a princess. Well, she seduced me too. Regardless, I had a feeling that things would be changing rather soon. There was no way dating someone like her wouldn't bring some special consequences. Was I going to have to learn how to act like a noble? I sincerely hoped not. Besides, I was American. The last time we got told what to do by royalty, we shafted those pompous assholes so hard that they fucked right off back to their tea-sucking continent. So on one hand, I hoped I wouldn't get put in a position to make things difficult for Amara. On the other hand, I looked forward to a tea party. Have you been embroiled with a duke? The key master suddenly asked, making me scratch my head. I may or may not be dating the daughter of a duchess now. Oh my. Teleria. Yeah. So tell me, how bad of a position am I in? Well, not so much bad as it is difficult. I suggest you go get a new suit costing around 200 gold bullion, because the boyfriend of Lady Omara Teleria can't be seen as just any ordinary man. You'll have to prove yourself in many different ways. Oh goodness. I sighed in financial pain. It seemed being Amara's boyfriend would prove to be costly. Well, my savings of one million coin wouldn't be for nothing. Though perhaps I would need to pick up a few jobs soon. Will my coat not be enough? I'd say it's pretty high-end. Definitely cost more than 200 gold bullion. That depends. In some cases it may be. But if you're going to a formal event, a proper suit is a must. You can't meet the highest nobility in the kingdom wearing a leather coat. I guess. I can recommend you to a tailor right here in our market. I get my own suits from him. Oh, I'll take that name. I smiled and got a reference. Apparently, the tailor was pretty popular among those who knew him and naturally only carried the best services. After getting that, we talked a bit more before I decided to go. I should get to Maxwell. Of course. Have a good evening, John, and be sure to keep yourself safe outside. I will. With that, I took the elevator and entered the market. I was greeted with the familiar plaza and road with high-class buildings on either side. And down that road was the Polaris family headquarters where Maxwell stayed. After greeting the guards, I went in and found my way to Maxwell's door. After knocking, I shouted, Housekeeping. What? I stifled a laugh as I went through the door, finding a very confused Maxwell. Oh, it's you. You sound disappointed. Housekeeping may actually have been more welcome. Ouch. I brushed the painful words off and walked over to his desk. Just wanted to check in. Yes, I see you've made significant progress. Are your comprehensions complete? They are. Good. Since you only need accumulation, I'd like you to start coming in every day until you advance. And don't train outside of here anymore. All right. And bring 10 gold bullion the next time you arrive. How about 9? Since you want to be cheap, I'll take 15 now. What? Jumping, I proceeded to negotiate my way down to 13 gold bullion. Afterward, Maxwell chuckled. How naive. Uh huh. I wanted to ask you about something. Go on. Applications of aura. Plex can turn himself invisible. How do I do that? Hmm. Maxwell glanced at me with narrowed eyes. Aura techniques are closely guarded secrets. Even I don't possess more than the one I practiced. But that one isn't suitable for you. Where can I get one? Nowhere other than the church or the kingdom. And to attain one from either of them would require you to not only achieve authority aid, but to have demonstrated that you are assuredly loyal to them. So like crowns, it is not something you can get any time soon. Until you can, however, you should constantly refine control over your aura. The benefits it will give you are absolutely worth the effort until you attain a technique. Oh, I was a bit disappointed. Yet another thing I would have to wait for. After that, Maxwell waved. All right, you can go. I will prepare for your arrival tomorrow. Until then, recover and stay out of trouble. I'll try. Saying goodbye, I headed out of Polaris and made my way back to the Magisterium. Thankfully, I didn't meet any unsavory individuals, allowing me to sleep peacefully that night. Boom. Splat. I fired my shotgun, turning the man's chest before me into a pile of spaghetti. Through my air mask, I only groaned as the knife in my leg stung. Ugh. You know, I didn't consider the possibility of you all working in groups. Slice. I ripped the knife out and looked around. There was another dead body besides the fresh one, along with one more hunter. The first hunter was a warlock, and he didn't even get a chance to fire a spell since I promptly parked a bullet in his brain. The other that I just killed was a knight, but not one specializing in strength. Instead, he was shockingly fast. But with the powers of my coat, I was able to keep up and use my shotgun. Now, there was another knight who stood there with three bullets in his torso. He wasn't dead yet, 
but he was bleeding. I didn't know what level they were at, but it didn't seem very impressive. The only wound I received was from that knife, and it was one that the last man standing had thrown at me. Seriously, I don't ask for much other than peace and quiet. Not my fault everyone wants my money. You killed enough people in the trenches, you son of a bitch. The knight spat his hatred, but it was so ridiculous that I barely held back a laugh. Those guys? Every single one of them tried to kill me for my money or the cargo I was moving. If I hadn't been attacked first, then I would have just made my deliveries and been on my way. I would say the only people I attacked first were the ones trying to withhold payment, but it wasn't like I killed any of them. Quiet. You killed innocent people. Like who? These two guys. I pointed to the two corpses nearby, making him grit his teeth. Yes, and dozens of others, including my brother. None of them deserved to die. Fine. So what do you want? I spoke while throwing open the cylinder in my revolver, taking out the spent casings. My eyes remained on the night as I did so, hearing his demands. I want you to pay for every single one of those deaths. You've robbed our families of people who can make money to support us, so you need to compensate us. I see. I suppose when I defended myself, I was too harsh. I should have at least given them a chance to live. I nodded in understanding as I filled three of the chambers and the cylinders with fresh bullets. It closed with a fresh click. Afterward, as the knight started to smile, I raised the peacekeeper and pulled the trigger. Bang, bang, bang. He froze as three more bullets buried themselves in his chest, taking a few seconds to fall over. After that, I went to each of the corpses and grabbed anything that looked valuable. One of them even had a spatial sack, though a shitty one. As I did so, I looked over to the knight. He laid there with his eyes looking at me. He was still alive, but rapidly dying. Well, knights really are resilient. Unfortunately for you, I don't negotiate with criminals, especially when they try to hurt me. After all, I did in fact leave some of you alive. But you guys always came back. Talk about frustrating. I've got friends too, you know. Should I just lay down and let you all rob and kill me? How convenient for you. You didn't even demand my death either. You just wanted my money. I would have respected you more otherwise. Not that it was very high to begin with. Also dash. I looked over, suddenly halting my words when I saw that he was dead. I let out another sigh while standing. Whatever. Time for the doctor. Making my way through the market, I found the hospital as was routine. Oh my, there's a customer I haven't seen in a while. How are you, John? The girl at the front desk greeted me with a smile while waving over a nurse. I greeted back with a grin. Hey, Kayla. Had a little run-in with some friends. No shit. Just the leg. Yup. Ting. I flicked a gold coin at her, which she caught reflexively and stashed. Right this way. She brought me to a room nearby. Like that. My leg wound was sewn together and healed. It took no more than a few minutes from start to finish. Since I was basically a regular here, I had become familiar with the nurses and doctors. They especially liked me since I tipped them for all their treatments, something nobody else did. So all my treatments were expedited. Treat them nice, and you get treated nicely, even if it cost a bit more. All right, big guy. You're all set. Thanks. By the way, do you have coagulants? These are good for taking care of the flesh wounds on the spot. The nurse suddenly brought out a canister with an odd nozzle and trigger on it. These can be reloaded by swapping the cans. Just spray the contents on the wound directly and it'll seal it while numbing it. It also expands so you don't need very much. Oh, this looks useful. I checked the canister out. It wasn't large, but after a demonstration, I found it very effective for the job. My recovery pills didn't operate very fast. While it could keep my body together, if I got a laceration or stab wound, I wasn't able to take care of it besides shoving a bunch of gauze inside the wound. This was the next best thing. Give me three of these nozzles and a dozen canisters. Coming right up. The nurse smiled and went off to grab me the supplies. Just like that, I was loaded with more medical supplies. Of course, it was a bit expensive, costing about two gold bullion. But I didn't tend to spare the expenses when it came to my safety. Yet another reason they liked me. I bought my medical stuff from them, besides the cigars. And so I walked out of the hospital and continued on to my original destination. Amara had left the city after our first day back. Since then, three more days had passed. The vacation given to us by the puppet master was coming to an end, and I had been fighting off hunters who still seemed eager to claim my head. I was also training with Maxwell every night. I had made good progress, constantly getting closer to Authority 4. In fact, I was so close that I was pretty sure I only needed one more night. And that's where I was headed toward. 
After greeting the key master at the hotel, I went to Polaris and found Maxwell's study. But before I even entered, I could feel a dense, comforting aura from the doors. Pushing them open, I found a chair surrounded by an odd device. It was a ring that hovered a couple feet off the ground, encircling the chair. And along the ring were eight white crystals. You're here. Go ahead and take a seat. Maxwell was succinct, waving me toward the chair. I just did as he said, slipping under the ring and seating myself inside of it. At that moment, I felt a dense power wash over my entire body and mind. It seemed the ring was concentrating the power of all those crystals around the chair. Not only that, but all of them were authority for crystals, a level above me. This device will assist your advancement. Every third advancement is important. As a summoner, your mind will open itself to vast power. Usually you would be able to drain an entire white crystal above your authority, but because you were talented, I've prepared far more than necessary. Now, listen to my instructions carefully. Maxwell instructed while tapping a few buttons on the ring. When you advance, your mind will become a bottomless pit of energy. However, it is Majika that will be infused into your body, a universal energy. Therefore, if we take advantage of this moment, you will receive boosts to more than just your mind. It is possible to infuse both vigor and mana into your body, providing you with a stronger body and even giving you a certain level of mana resistance. That's possible? I was rather surprised. The three types of magi weren't supposed to be able to use the powers of the others. If it was possible, then there would be people who broke the system and rose to levels unfathomable to others. Maxwell responded plainly though. It's not as amazing as you think. The power will reside in your body passively. You won't be able to cast spells or move your vigor, but it will be there, providing enhancements. Of course, it's nothing amazing either. It won't suddenly make you as strong as a knight, but it's something. Besides, we're doing this for the main benefit of flooding your body with Majika, not that. Your spark will be subject to the flood of energy. From what I've learned, it's a malleable object that can be tempered, just how a knight's body and a warlock's mana core can be tempered. However, it has to be open to the tempering. That's why tonight, you are going to entirely empty yourself of Psyche. Then, we will begin your advancement. Oh. I slowly nodded. It seemed like the advancement process was complex. But I was still confused. I've never heard about this at the Magisterium. That's because it's a method exclusive to certain families. Just like how my Call of the Fallen Angel is a summoning technique that stands at the top of all techniques. You think they just pass these things out for free? I guess not. I went silent. For some reason, I felt like I wasn't being told the whole truth. But we proceeded anyway. When Maxwell was finished with preparations, he looked at me. I want you to expel your Psyche. This device will help you with that before reversing the process. Now, begin. He activated the device in full, and when that happened, I felt a deep vacuum force overtake my body, tugging on all the Psyche in my mind. Chapter 53 Future After the vacuum force appeared, my body instinctively raised its defenses. For of the white crystals seemed entirely empty, and because all their power was contained in the space around the chair, their desire to refill ended up exerting itself on me. It was trying to suck out my psyche, which was a bit scary. But after I calmed down, I started doing as Maxwell instructed. Activating my aura, I started infusing my psyche into the air, expelling it with the fastest method I knew. I couldn't even generate a portion of the advancement formation before the psyche was ripped from my control. Like that, my psyche formed streams that refilled the crystals. And it took no more than 20 minutes to deplete nearly all my energy. My mind felt weak and disoriented. Psyche was directly tied to the mind's ability to operate, so removing all of it should end with me passing out. And sure enough, when I didn't even have the energy to resist the suction force, the rest of my psyche was whisked away. I fell unconscious, even as I thought I heard the ramblings of a crazy old man. And the next thing I felt was a force that hit my head like a truck. It felt like someone was force-feeding me as waves of Majika slammed into my body. My mind was faced with a one-sided barrage of psycho while my body was hit with vigor that made me feel like I was burning up and mana which made me feel in tune with the world. And on top of all that, as I was overwhelmed with psycho that my mind couldn't seem to process, my advancement began. The spark in my mind finally seemed to hit the threshold. But whereas my previous advancements ended with all my power being used to break through the barrier to the next dimension, my spark instead began to revolve with more power. I felt all the stars and lights within my mind begin to swirl like a vortex. When it did that, it felt like all of my thoughts were flashing through my mind, as if my brain were out of my control. 
but at the center of it all was my spark, which when faced with a mess of a host who couldn't keep control of his own thoughts, was forced to step in and bring order. And so my spark began to evolve, becoming what could be considered a second mind. The spark opened itself up to greater power, and as Maxwell had said, my mind became a bottomless pit of energy. But the influx of energy was far too overwhelming. My spark was bombarded from all sides as Psycho was forced inside the empty vessel. Normally, it would take several hours for a mind to passively refill its Psycho. It would pull on the Magica in the atmosphere and process it into what I needed. But now, the pressure coming from the outside was so great that Psycho was forced inside without it being allowed to process things, like pressurized water shooting through a filter. And consequently, my spark was tempered, forced beyond its limits to become something better. Of course, I had to deal with the effects. For one, my mind felt like it was going to shatter. I had a headache unlike anything I'd experienced before. But at the same time, I wasn't sure if it could be classified as a headache. A mindache? Whatever it was, it was overwhelming. I couldn't concentrate on anything, like my thoughts were being scrambled. However, things weren't completely out of my control. With my spark being force-fed energy, I naturally regained some semblance of conscious thought. That's when I heard Maxwell shouting from beside me. Write the formation. Use your psyche. His words reached me loud and clear. Although my mind had a tornado inside of it, my senses were in fact stronger than ever. So with my spark, I made a decision and focused all of the spark's power on using my aura to write out the formation. Around me, blue lines were drawn in the air, flickering with complexity. Shockingly, it only took me a matter of seconds to draw the entire formation. Even after comprehending the entire thing, it would take me several minutes to write it out completely. But now, it felt so easy. So I continued to draw more, even drawing the practice formations Maxwell taught me that were redundantly complex. And so, thousands of different formations appeared around my body, glowing just as bright as the white crystals on the device. The psyche in my mind was drained in the process. But with the influx coming from the crystals, my reserves of energy cycled between plummeting and rising. It was like my brain was breathing. It was unlike anything I'd ever felt. At some point, I didn't even feel the pain anymore and simply devoted everything I had toward tempering my spark and mind. How long the process lasted, I had no clue. My spark was the only computer properly operating, and it was entirely devoted toward drawing formations, not counting the passing time. So I seemed to only regain full consciousness when my mind was no longer turbulent, calming, and solidifying like normal. When that happened, I stopped drawing the formations. The influx of Magica was no longer able to overwhelm my mind, and my mind wasn't so open to its power. It processed incoming energy like normal, and I returned to my baseline. I stared ahead while regaining myself in a daze. I wasn't even entirely sure what had happened when thinking back. It felt like days had passed. How do you feel? Fine. I responded habitually, as if nothing had changed. But after regaining my faculties completely, I noticed several drastic effects. For one, the sheer power of my spark, and by extension my mind, was unbelievable. An entire magnitude higher, it seemed. It felt like I would have no issue killing that gorilla from the patrol back then. Unlike before, I felt so much closer to it. My weapons would be able to reach it. As for the speed of my mind, it had risen accordingly. My thoughts flowed so smooth and with such volume that I barely felt like myself. And if I had to identify the difference numerically, I would say it multiplied by about half of my mind's power, meaning a five times increase in speed. And on top of that, my spark had essentially become a second mind. This didn't mean I had an entirely different set of thoughts, emotions, and experiences. Instead, it was more like multitasking had become true multitasking. I could focus on two entirely different subjects and trains of thought at once with complete clarity. When I looked inward at my mind space, I could see the spark revolving with glistening brightness. It was also several times bigger, so instead of being the size of a marble, it was now the size of half my brain. I felt like a damn savant. I felt so clear-headed that for a moment I wondered if I could cure cancer. I also wondered if, in the case I did cure cancer, I may also figure out how to eliminate the aging of the human body. My train of thought stopped there, moving on to more important things. Along with all the enhancements to my mind, which seemed like a top-to-bottom restructuring and renovation, my body had also undergone changes. For one, I could now feel the vigor and mana within me. The vigor made me feel stronger, as it obviously would. But I also felt my lingering wounds begin to fade much faster. My metabolism also increased, and in general, I felt healthier. The benefits weren't life-changing. 
I don't think I would be able to match even an authority two knight in strength. Any knight around my level would still be able to fold me with ease like origami paper. But I had been raised above the baseline, which came with comprehensive benefits that would make my life much easier. The attainment of mana, however, came with benefits much less obvious. As I had felt earlier, I seemed to gain a certain attunement with the world. It was similar to aura, except more mystical. It was like I could more clearly feel the currents of the air around me, the moisture of the atmosphere, the temperature, the textures and attributes of the wood chair I sat on, the intensity of the light and sounds echoing through the room, and more. One way of putting it was that I was gaining information about the world around me, but instead of getting that information through my senses, I was feeling it directly. When I thought about how warlocks worked, I realized how this all operated. Warlocks affected the world around them with spells. Well, the spells required you to collect information on everything you were going to affect. To create a little sphere of water, you needed to sense the moisture of the air around you, or pull water directly from a source. If you wanted to muffle sound like Amara, you needed to sense the sound and cast a spell to affect that sound in a certain way. And sensing things through the sensory organs wasn't the same. Instead, when I focused on it, it felt like each of the different things around me like the air, the wood, and the moisture all had different types of mana bonded to them. It was this mana that I sensed and, if I were a warlock, could affect. That's also when I realized that warlocks didn't rely so much on their minds as they did their feelings, as odd as that sounded. It was all exciting to feel and get used to. I felt like a completely new person. At some point, I stood up and left the ring, moving around Maxwell's study and utilizing all of my new senses. I also thought about dozens of new things, exercising my mind with wonder. I barely felt like my mind was my own. It almost felt like its own entity. In my stupor, I ended up walking about the study for half an hour, not to mention how long it took to do everything else. So when I found myself looking at Maxwell, who stood there observing me, I zoned in and asked a question. Was this method of advancement standard in any capacity? No. It was purely experimental. I derived this theoretical method a few years ago, but never had anyone to test it with. Luckily, you're the perfect person to do so with. So you used me for one of your crazy ideas? I did. In fact, the techniques you used to practice your call are also entirely new, made long after I created the call itself. But because I couldn't practice it myself, it remained untested. So far, you're proving all of my theories and ideas correct. I'm rather proud of myself. Hmm. I hummed with narrowed eyes. I was right. I was a guinea pig for this old man's crazy experiments. While the results couldn't be argued with, I didn't really like being lied to and unknowingly risking my life and future. But I didn't say anything about it. I very quickly realized that. Besides the dirt-cheap payment I gave him for teaching me, this was the price I paid for the power he gave me. The call of the fallen angel was, supposedly, one of if not the best summoner call there was. And he gave this to me. He gave me the techniques to practice controlling my aura. He gave me the white crystals to power my advancements. He bought my coat which had saved my life on numerous occasions, a coat which I still didn't know the cost of since it was so high. Now, he had provided eight authority for white crystals, along with a ring device to power an advancement that had brought me a dozen steps forward in power, and he would continue to guide me in the future. All that, just for being a guinea pig to some new ideas founded upon very tangible techniques and theories. To say I was benefiting greatly was an insult to his generosity. John, he called, catching my attention. His eyes were deep as he spoke. There has yet to be a single summoner that has reached authority 12. Did you know that? No. I shook my head, quite shocked. As far as I knew, there were multiple authorities twelves in the kingdom, and yet all of them were either knights or warlocks. Maxwell himself had reached authority eleven, but something happened to bring him back down. Still, it seemed his ambition never died as he gave me an explanation. We summoners are far behind the knights and warlocks. We are considered good for nothing more than being thinkers. While honorable, using our power for such mundane tasks is an insult to the majesty of Psyche itself. Our potential merely needs to be realized and across decades I have been trying to forge a path to the top. My call is the best simply because it utilizes an entirely different system of summoning, utilizing Psyche in a far more fluid manner that gives incalculable advantages. But that is only half the battle. The other half is the advancements themselves. I cannot explain it to you right now. You simply wouldn't be able to understand. But just know that right now, you are several steps ahead of any summoner at your level. You could easily match Authority 5 summoners an entire level above you. And yet, 
that is merely normal progress. It is every other summoner that has their growth and power stunted from the very beginning. Even I was not able to escape that fate. But you are the first to deviate from that path. I can already see the difference. Maxwell's eyes glowed as he looked at me. It felt like he could see through me completely, his aura blossoming with power I couldn't fathom. Before him, there was nothing I could hide. Did you know that your spark is different as well? The formations I have given you are all my own creations. Normal summoners have sparks as well, but they develop only two throughout their lives. The first is started as an Authority 3 and finished as an Authority 5. And the second one is only created at Authority 10. But you will go through three phases of evolution, completing two sparks and then amalgamating them, evolving them, expanding them until they envelop your entire mind, ascending it to another level entirely. This will be done by the time you are in Authority 10. How could any other summoner possibly compare? I recoiled a bit at Maxwell's aggression. It was a bit scary, but I completely understood him. Summoners were too far behind. We were weak. Even with our power of the mind, across so many decades and centuries we had failed to figure out a better system and produce an Authority 12. Compared to the knights and warlocks, we were pathetic. And it was ironic since we were supposed to be the smart ones. But Maxwell was paving the path all by himself, despite no longer being in his prime. He was devoting his life to finding the light at the end of the tunnel, something which nobody had been able to do before. He was the saving grace of the entire summoner class. It was no wonder he engaged in his study so fanatically. And compared to all that, who cared about lying to some random kid to test out the theories? The results would be worth far more than even his life. I understood all this, and so my perspective flipped. But after his excited outburst, Maxwell caught himself. And never mind. Forget what I said. Look, the formations I've given don't deviate that much from the standard. There's minimal risk and I've run personal tests as best I could. I dash. Maxwell. I called, putting a halt to his ramblings. It's fine. I understand what you're doing. So don't worry about it. I'll cooperate with everything fully. I'm okay with being the experiment. Are you sure? The risks are indeed minimal, but should something go wrong, it may harm your future and talent. What I do is for the future of the entire summoner class, even going so far as to potentially be the last bolster of strength humanity needs to defeat the scourge. But, you are your own person. I will not force you down this path, which may seem hypocritical considering my half-truths. But everything you've done up until now is completely sound. From here on out, I am no longer as certain. Are you willing to take the risks and place your future in my hands? He looked me in the eye solemnly, clearly concerned about my answer. I could tell how important this was to him, but I wasn't doing this for that reason. Instead, when I thought about the scourge and the prospect of defeating them, I realized that what I was doing was something with importance beyond myself. This wasn't just about getting stronger. It was about blazing a path to hope for all summoners, maybe even humanity. Because even if I had to sacrifice my future, I would provide crucial information that would allow other summoners to garner success where I failed. History and success were paved through sacrifice. Ancestors before us would give their lives so that their sons and daughters could become better than them, live better than them. What I was doing was no different. Maxwell had sacrificed decades so that his successor would be able to go farther than he did. I had stepped into that role, now. However, there may come a time where I would need to sacrifice something in order to pave the way for someone else, because it wasn't certain that I would succeed. So I wouldn't back down now. I looked back at Maxwell with a strange sense of confidence. I'll place my future in your hands, even if the outcome is uncertain. I just hope that I can meet your expectations. You already have, son. I froze up a bit as Maxwell looked at me with uncharacteristic love in his eyes. But then his own eyes suddenly widened as he cleared his throat. My apologies. Forget that. Now, tell me everything different you feel. After that you can go home and rest. Sure. Deciding to look past that awkward moment, I did my best to explain everything I was feeling with my mind and body. After that, I was let go. When I left the Polaris headquarters though, I saw that the sun was rising. Checking my clock, I saw that nearly nine hours had gone by. Damn. And he stood there for that entire time. I whistled a bit, impressed. Since it was morning, school was about to begin, and I was no longer on vacation. Thankfully, I felt completely awake, like I had slept for two days straight. So I went directly to the Magisterium where I finally got to see my wonderful girlfriend again. Chapter 54. Date. This girl is actually going to class. What a nerd. I laughed when I read the message on my aerial. I got to the magisterium a bit late, 
so classes had already started and Amara was a diligent student. I had wanted to skip school with her, but since she was already there, I decided I may as well go through classes too. Funnily enough, I was completely engaged. I felt like everything was far easier to understand. When I recalled all the information I had been taught, everything just slid into place. Because of that, all those subjects became so much more interesting to me. Thinking about those things also led me to think about all the classes and subjects I had studied on Earth. Another feature of my advancement was better memory, which allowed me to remember and recall things with much greater clarity. It wasn't perfect, but I was pretty sure there would be a time in the future when I really would have perfect memory. So when I recalled several different topics and scientific disciplines, I was able to both understand them and get some ideas. Earth was well into its modernity. At least, America was. But that meant that all that information was at my disposal. Even though I couldn't recall everything since I didn't know everything to begin with, that didn't mean I couldn't introduce certain things to this world. Electronics, industry, even some obscure scientific concepts. I was pretty sure I had invaluable knowledge to contribute to any industry in this world. I just needed to pick which one, and I already had some ideas. San had already shown me the door to his company. If I went to him with some knowledge he could use to either improve his products or completely revolutionize the industry, then there was no reason he wouldn't take me in on the spot. Of course, this would all be for money. There really wasn't any other benefit to doing it. After all, it would take an entire lifetime for certain pieces of technology to develop and mature. I wouldn't be able to see the finished products in my lifetime, so I could only benefit from short-term innovations. Not that any of that would happen right now. My top priority was simply increasing my power. For the foreseeable future, that's all I had to care about. Money wasn't an issue for now. With those thoughts, I ended the school day. That's when I texted Amara to meet me somewhere on campus. I waited around, leaning on a wall near a doorway that students used to exit the classroom building. Soon, I saw Amara walk out. I whistled at her. Whoa, who's that hottie? Hmm. Amara spun around, as did several other people nearby. They all looked at me, then at Amara who realized what was happening and started to flush red. She dipped her head and walked over, headbutting my chest. Why? You're cute when you're embarrassed. I can't help it. I laughed and gave her a hug. Hey, so how about a date tonight? Wait, really? Tonight? MHM. But we're going to skip training. Since your mother said I can take you on a tour, I've decided to do so. I smiled and recalled one of our conversations. Amara and I hadn't gone three days without talking to each other. In fact, we were texting at almost every available moment while calling during our nights. During the time, she had told me about what her mother told her. I intended to take Duchess Teleria's warning very seriously and keep Amara out of my business, and not just because I was scared of her warning. I understood Amara's identity clearly now and knew that there were certain lines she couldn't cross. Getting involved with the black market was one of those lines. But you didn't have to get involved to be there. With me by her side, Amara would be able to expand her horizons without worrying about shady business. Of course, not only did she not certainly know that it was the black market that I was involved in, but she also had no idea what the black market even represented. It would be a jaw-dropping experience, surely. Skip training. Amara asked surprisedly, making me smirk. What, are you scared? Shut up. I'm just concerned about what the puppet master will say tomorrow when we finally show up. Eh, who cares? Now let's go. Wait. I should get dressed. No need. I laughed and dragged her out of the magisterium. Who needed to look good for the black market? She could be dressed in rags and fit in just fine. Like that, we made our way to the entrance. Along the way, I started to explain some things. So, did your mother give you a definite answer on what I do? No. Then since we're going there, allow me to enlighten you. I operate in the black markets. I gave her the answer clearly feeling a bit weird as I said so. And she nodded slowly. I had a feeling that was the case. Yes, I'm a delivery man, and the cargo I deliver ranges wildly. I don't ask questions, simply bringing a package from one place to another while collecting payment. Oh, so what's the weirdest thing you've delivered? That's a hard question. I'd say one that's definitely up there is a finger. Huh? A finger? Yes, an actual severed finger. You. She cringed, making me chuckle. Yeah, well, that was only once. Anyway, the place I'm bringing you to now is the largest black market in the kingdom. There are only a few ways to get in, and this is one of them. I think you'll like it. Making my way down a street with Amara's hand in mine, we promptly arrived at our first stop. 
Welcome to the Golden Trading Post. Oh, I know this place. Omara jumped excitedly, and her knowledge of this place didn't surprise me. It was an extremely popular trading spot, and it wasn't actually within the black market. Her knowledge of it saved me my breath. All right, makes my job easy. This place is popular, but it's also a front. One of the official entrances is here. Come on. Pulling her along, we arrived at a busy food shop. That's where I called out. Chef Black. Huh? Oh. It's John. Ha uh ha. -huh. How are you, kid? The big chef walked over to us, giving me a handshake and looking at Amara beside me. And who's this? This is my girlfriend, Chef. I'm Tally. Pleasure to meet you, Chef. Ho ho, how fun. The chef chortled as Amara gave a curtsy with an alias, bowing a bit in response. Then he chuckled at me. A girlfriend, huh, John? It's about damn time. Well, had to find the right one, you know? Ho ho, how bold. Well, anyone who can catch John's eye must be something special. Here, allow me to treat you. Marching back, Chef Black grabbed us both kebabs with some juicy cubes of meat on it. We took them with smiles, taking a bite. Oh, it's good. Ha ha, much appreciated. Chef Black gave a fancy bow, making us laugh. After that, he waved us through the door in the back. All right, I won't hold up your date. Head on in. Thanks, Chef, for your troubles. Ting. I flicked a gold coin at him, which he caught before raising his hat toward us. Many thanks, friend. With a wave, I pulled Amara into entrance. I also shifted from holding hands to linking arms, which she took happily. Before I even arrived, the secondary door was opened for me. The man on the other end greeted me. John. Hey, Gavin. Enjoy your time inside. He ushered us in, and like that we entered the black market proper. I whispered to her. Prepare to have your mind blown. Is it that amazing? Ho hoo. You'll see what I mean. I chuckled, and soon, we arrived at the main plaza. Bang. Both of us suddenly stopped walking as a man flew out of a bar door and rolled across the floor at our feet. Another man then came running out, barreling toward his adversary with hate in his eyes. You better pay for that fucking beer, you cheap sack of shit. Fuck you. Sheesh. I clicked my tongue. There was always someone fighting out here. Amara was observing with shock too. I pulled her along though, not particularly caring to watch a drunken brawl. After that, I brought her through a few streets that were lined with establishments of all kinds. It was like the city, except not nearly as orderly. At first glance it seemed festive with all the floating lights and activity, but most of the people here were always looking for something exciting to occupy themselves with. This plaza was where those people came together and had what they considered fun. As we walked, I pointed out some of the unique places. That's a smithy. They can make armor, but it's cheap crap. That's a tailor. They're actually pretty decent. Oh, that restaurant made me vomit, so I wouldn't recommend it. And that place is where I bought my citizenship. How interesting. Omara mumbled with barely disguised disappointment, causing me to laugh. Haha, -ha, you're so cute. Come on, let's keep going. I pulled her along, and she followed almost reluctantly. It looked like Amara was having her worldview shattered in real time. The more I showed her, the less impressed and more disgusted she became. Sure. The black market had some cool stuff, but it was all surrounded by degeneracy and idiots. Her face was especially great when we passed by a brothel street. Although we didn't go through it, just one glance made her face warp into a sight to behold. We walked around for around an hour, and it was only when I brought her to a nice dessert place that she finally got some relief. I watched as she chowed down on a small slice of cake. So? Mind blown. You're so mean. Here I am thinking it's some mysterious haven for rich people and then you show me what I can only describe as a scummy rat hole of the city. Pfft. Well, that's not totally inaccurate. I chuckled and poked my finger out, taking some frosting off her cake. I tasted it and nodded. Mm, that's good. Here. Suddenly, she raised her fork with a piece of cake on it. I smiled and opened my mouth, letting her feed me. Mm, yummy. Hee what a dork. She giggled while taking another bite. I continued to watch her for a bit before muttering. So, your first assumption isn't entirely wrong. Hmm. This is just one of the markets. It's called the Founder's Market. The other one is called the Black Spider Market. And it's basically exactly what you're expecting. Damned rich, over-the-top fancy, and ushers some of the most influential people in the kingdom. Oh. We should go there. Don't worry. That's our next stop. I just wanted to show you where I work. Well, I don't really work here, but you know what I mean. Where do you work then? She asked while finishing the cake, both of us standing to leave. 
I shook my head. It's a place called the trenches, and we're not going there. It's basically everything you've seen except 100 times worse. It's dangerous, headed by a psychotic asshole, and you get high on whatever drugs are in the air just by stepping foot into its territory. That's the last place I'd ever bring you. Oh. So why do you work there if it's so bad? Because I get paid like a pimp. What? The paychecks are large. Anyway, we should head out. Linking arms, I led Amara out of the founder's market and back into the city. We didn't go straight to the hotel, though. Instead, I brought her back to the magisterium. Back here? Is the date over? As if. Now's the time to get dressed nice. We're heading to dinner. Oh. All right. I'll go get ready. With a rosy face, Amara ran to her room while I retreated into mine. I threw on a nice suit after cleaning up, applying just a dash of cologne that I bought from the tailor I got the suit from. Once I felt I was ready, I left my room and headed toward the magisterium's gates, tapping my aerial and pulling up a number. Soon, Amara exited the dorms. When I saw her, I was actually stunned. She came out in a dark purple dress that wrapped around her torso before flowing down into a slim, free skirt. It was simple, with no flamboyant frills, sparkles, or accessories. Yet, it seemed to be expertly handmade to fit her body perfectly. And it matched her purple eyes so well. Alongside her done-up hair and a hint of makeup, she looked so amazing that I was rendered speechless. She brushed her hair behind her ear while walking over to me. I didn't overdress, did I? You're absolutely beautiful. T, thank you. She smiled as I took her hand, entwining our fingers and making our way to the gates. There, a carriage awaited, when I had called on my aerial. It was luxurious, one that I had seen diplomats and rich merchants use while riding through the city. And our destination was the same as many of those influential figures. Black Spider Hotel. I spoke, and soon, the carriage moved. I felt hardly any vibrations while we drove, making me smile since many of these rides could be uncomfortable. Then, I looked back at Amara. I couldn't seem to take my eyes off her. Damn, you're making me feel like a bum. In nonsense. You look great. I just feel like I've gone a bit too far. I picked out one of my nicer dresses. No, no. I need to be able to match my girlfriend, not bring her down. I just have yet to go to that tailor and buy a good suit. I thought about the tailor the key master recommended to me. I didn't care about the cost, but I had been occupied lately with fending off hunters and advancing to authority for. I regretted that I didn't make the time earlier. My suit was still nice. I had a white shirt, black slacks, nice dress shoes and a blazer. I definitely wasn't underdressed, but a dress like hers could only be matched by a fancy tuxedo. Well, I didn't worry about it that much. Still, I would need to correct this small issue the first chance I could. After a bit more talking, we arrived in front of the Black Spider Hotel. Before getting out, I took out my platinum bank card tapping it on a device the driver used to receive his payment. He spoke when I did so. Have a good night. You too, man. With a wave, I stepped out and took Amara's hand, helping her down the carriage before linking arms. And so we stepped into the hotel, the first person to greet us being the key master. He smiled widely as he saw me approach. Good evening, John. And good evening, Lady Amara. Hello, key master. Good evening, key master. Amara curtsied making the key master clap with a smile. You both look dashing. Off to taste the delicacies of the black spider market. And a little tour. I wish I could bring her to an auction, but we missed the last one. Well, they happen every month. Surely you'll be able to make one soon. Until then, there is still much to see. Definitely. I nodded, and suddenly, one of the elevators nearby dinged and opened. The key master waved us toward it. I won't hold you longer. Please, enjoy your night under the stars. Will do. We bowed toward each other a bit before separating. After entering the elevator, I inserted my key and dialed in the numbers. Like that, we were taken to our destination. While that happened, Amara asked, Who's that? You two seem friendly. That's the key master. He's responsible for providing rooms in the hotel, as well as handing out the keys to allow entry into the market. He also helped me a lot when I first came here, so I owe him. I see. Also, I saw that card you pulled out in the carriage. My mother has one of them that looks just like it. That doesn't surprise me. I smirked a bit as the elevator doors suddenly opened, and we stepped out, greeted by the floating lights and stone brick streets of the Black Spider Market. Amara's eyes sparkled as she looked around at the opulent buildings and rich individuals that walked down the sidewalks. Welcome to the Black Spider Market. It's nice. Now this is what I was expecting. 
She laughed as we started walking, excited to see a mystical place that didn't resemble the slums. Along the way, I pointed out some of the places we passed like the Polaris Bank. I also explained some things to her, such as my bank card and the auctions I had mentioned. The auctions sound interesting. Are the items really valuable there? Let's just say that the people who buy stuff from it are far richer than I am. Oh, and just how rich are you? Hey now, what if you just want to use me for my money? I poked her in the side, obviously joking around. She could probably move far more money than I could any day. Sure enough, my words made her chuckle mischievously. Ho ho, maybe I just want to know if my boyfriend needs any help. After all, the bill for tonight is sure to be big. I can handle a restaurant bill no problem. You needn't worry. And I've only stashed what I could from all my jobs. It's not enough to live like a king, but enough to pay for everything I need along with a bit of luxury. I at least don't need to work while I'm at the magisterium. Hmm, sounds like you've worked hard. Unfortunately, I can't relate as the daughter of a duchess. How spoiled. I am not. I've worked very hard for my power, and unlike other nobles, I don't get showered with stipends or rich allowances. The most valuable things I have are my robes and staff. I know, I know. I wrapped my arm around her and squeezed a bit in comfort. After that, we approached the caviar restaurant. At the door, there was a host who smiled at us in greeting. Chapter 55 Kiss Good evening, John. Your table for two has been prepared. Thank you. I nodded as we were let in. Once inside, we heard the music of the small orchestra that was playing some upbeat, jazzy music. We were taken to an elevator on the wall, ascending to the 11th floor just below the private floors. There, we found a dozen or so booths with many guests occupying them. It was private enough to not worry about eavesdropping or wandering eyes, but still a public space where many people could enjoy yet another orchestra. Here, though, there was a pretty singer up on stage. Her voice was soothing as she sang to the rhythm of a piano and violin. Here you are. I will be back with refreshments soon. Thank you. We took our seats. The booth wrapped around three sides of our table, partially exposing us to the stage up front. Amara sat across from me. So, do you know everyone or something? I think that host just assumed. I did make a reservation for this time. Still, we've come across a dozen people who know you like old friends. For who? You should see the hospital. Everyone there knows me too. I chuckled a bit before explaining. I'm quite notorious in the founder's market, but I've made just as many enemies as friends. After all, with my weapons, it's even easier to kill people than scourge beasts. Kill people? I thought you made deliveries. Amara looked rather shocked, making me sigh. I do, but you saw what the market was like. If I grab a box of moonshine from some drug dealer and take it to another person's house, it's not always guaranteed that they'll give me the money I'm owed. That's when I need to persuade them, and most of the time, it gets violent. Not only that, but in the trenches where everyone is drugged out of their mind, someone might just see me walking by on the street and attack me. I risk my life every time I so much as step foot into that place. Oh. She frowned at the revelation, and I watched her carefully. I was curious to see what she would think because I didn't regret anything I did for a second. I was just doing my job. It wasn't my fault that it was made dangerous by the people around me. I sure as hell wasn't the one going out and robbing people. If she really had a problem with it, then I could only regret that she wasn't mature enough to see the truth. But my judgment of her wasn't off the mark. I kind of wish I could join you on a job. Imagine how easy it would be to get rid of annoyances with me there to support you. Haha, -ha, that's true. But I wouldn't want to put you in that kind of danger. Hey now, that's not what you should be thinking. I trust that you'll keep me safe, just like you should trust that I can do the same for you. If you wouldn't bring me there, then you shouldn't be there either. And if you would go there, then you should want to keep me by your side. I'm supposed to be your partner, and not just when it's convenient. I was silent as she solemnly finished with dead seriousness. She brushed her hair back as she continued. That's actually something I wanted to talk with you about. That day during our patrol, I failed to protect you. I almost let you get killed just because I got distracted. That wasn't your fault, Dash. It was, and I'm not making excuses, so don't make them for me. You were two seconds away from leaving this world forever. What should I have done then? Should I have blamed Vetsmon? Tana? You? Nothing would have mattered because no excuse would have been good enough. Regret doesn't bring back the dead. You're here because Fiden was fast, and we were all lucky. That's it. The fact I ever said that I would support you before makes me look like a complete joke. My mouth closed shut as I listened. And her words made me realize something. On Earth, soldiers were all brothers. There were no women, 
simply because they couldn't be relied on in the field to operate as well as a man would. That was simply the truth. But here, there were just as many women who became magi as men, and they were very much capable of rising to attain godlike strength. The magical weapons given to them as magi leveled the playing field, and Amara would become a soldier, just like I would. After this year at the Magisterium, we would enter the kingdom's military and fight the scourge every day. We would be exposed to the same threats. I wasn't giving her due respect by protecting her, even though that was my instinct. As weird as it was, if she was going to be fighting by my side, I needed to treat her as a fellow soldier, my equal. Of course, she would be my girlfriend first. But certain situations called for certain perspectives. She spoke to me with conviction. Thankfully, I'm lucky enough that I don't have to regret. Nothing like that will ever happen again. I want you to be able to trust me. Trust that even when the enemies get close, I'll be able to stop them from harming you. All right. I nodded, the two of us looking into each other's eyes. We'll work on that. I think we'll all be working on our squad's cooperation this month. And the puppet master knows exactly what we need, so we'll get our time. I just don't want you to worry so much about it. It'll work out. I'll worry as much as I need to before I can trust myself as well. But, thanks. We smiled at each other, and then, our waiter came around. What drinks can I start you with tonight? Oh, I'll take some Vesania wine and water. As for her, Indigo Caspa, and some water. Coming right up. We gave our orders. At the bar during our trips to and from Calatrop Base, we had tried many drinks and found some good ones. Vesania wine was a rich berry wine, very tasty. And Indigo Caspa was a vodka drink that glowed blue and tasted oddly like pomegranate. Before long, we received a bottle for each, the waiter setting and filling the glasses. I took a sip, smiling at how good it was. I also watched Amara take two entire gulps of her drink, making me chuckle as she shook her head a bit. The drink's not going anywhere. I'm just warming myself up. She refuted before calming down and taking a regular sip. After that, the waiter came by and took our food orders. I got myself a large platter filled with eight different types of meats. And Amara got herself a large slab of steak as well as a salad filled with a dozen different exotic vegetables I'd never heard of. And while we waited, we both talked endlessly. She asked me more about the black markets, along with some of my experiences. So I indulged her with stories while asking some of my own questions about her life as nobility. I learned some interesting things as a result. Nobles were people with several responsibilities. They had to manage their territories and people while lots of them were executives in the military which required constant attention. Duchess Teleria was one of those people, in fact. Apparently she used to be a brigadier, which was an Authority 10 infantryman. But there didn't exist any ranks for Authority 11 infantry since those people were expected to take on greater responsibilities. Well, the Duchess wasn't interested in getting educated to become a marshal. So to make use of her after she became an Authority 11, she was put in charge of a warlock corps. Other than the Kingdom's Authority 12 warlocks, she was the leading expert, especially when it came to military applications. But it wasn't like she was constantly busy. She had a certain amount of freedom, mainly because nobody could seem to tie her down to anything boring or mundane. Instead, it was her husband who had to deal with a lot of the paperwork. He had been a full-fledged rank 10 general and an Authority 10 knight. It seemed he ended up using his nightly stamina working late nights taking care of correspondence on his wife's behalf. Getting to this point, I also learned that Amara wasn't an only child. She had a little sister, and not one that was only a couple years younger than her. Apparently this sister was 14 years old. Amara was 20 years old, 6 years older than her sister. I remembered that the more powerful someone was, the more difficult it became to have children. But it didn't become impossible even if siblings may be far apart in age, so given enough time, two strong parents would be able to have multiple children, but their talent wasn't guaranteed. From what Amara said, only the first three children had a strong chance to inherit the strong talent of their parents. It was proven that any more after that, and the chances of a child having any talent to even become a magus was random. So families were very important. Steps were taken in order to breed strong warriors regularly. Noble households always had strong parents and families, so being able to step into one was extremely difficult. Unless you had a relatively open-minded mother who let her daughter pursue her own chosen mate. I quickly realized that I had done something pretty rare, as the noble class would almost always pick their spouses from well-known circles. Even Amara had a whole list of suitors. Hearing that, I couldn't help the chuckle. As if there was even competition in the first place. 
This was a monopoly, and I was dominating the market. Amara and I continued talking even as the food was served. Although the food was amazing enough to warrant salivating silence, we also seemed to have too many things to talk about. We had already talked every day for a month now, spending hours in each other's company, texting, or calling. But we never had a dull moment. Even in times of silence, we comfortably enjoyed each other. I had never been so in tune with someone before, even Rayla it felt like. It seemed that with every day that passed, I only continued to like her more, especially since I knew that she liked me just as much. At some point, we finished our dinner. That's when Amara looked over. In front of the stage where the musicians played was a dance floor, and there were a few couples out there. The music had turned slow to accommodate them. It seemed to be the time of the night. So after a few minutes to make sure we were both finished, I stood from our booth and put out a hand. Care to dance? I would love to. She smiled radiantly as she took my hand, the two of us moving to the dance floor. Since coming to this world, I had learned to dance a little. At the very least, I knew how to keep pace with my partner. Besides, we were slow dancing. The most important thing was that we were in each other's arms. My left hand held her right, and my right hand went at her waist while her left hand moved around my shoulder. We didn't speak a word as our bodies came close, practically hugging each other. Her bust pressed slightly against the upper part of my abs, giving me an intimate idea of how full it was. We rocked back and forth with the music. While she seemed a bit embarrassed at first, she was eventually able to look into my eyes with rosy cheeks. The only thing we could see was each other. After that, I simply did as I felt. When a kiss happened, someone had to make the first move. It didn't just happen, especially the first time. One of the people involved had to take the first step in, and it wasn't going to be her. She was nervous. As far as I knew, she didn't have any experience. So when I took the first step, I started by intertwining the fingers of our clasped hands. My hand on her waist then moved up, getting a hold of her back. And then, it was as simple as getting closer. Through her back, I could feel her heart beating erratically. And I didn't go all the way. I wanted her to meet me, cross the little bit of distance I left between us to seal the deal. I barely held back a smile as she boosted herself up on her toes a bit, my hand supporting her back, helping her towards me. And our lips locked. It was shallow, but sweet. I could immediately tell that she had zero experience with this. So I helped her, taking it slow and letting her feel around. We separated a few times as well, adjusting before going right back. Over time, she got more eager, pushing herself against me, her tongue going deeper and deeper. I was the one who had to stop after almost two minutes, pulling away reluctantly. For a moment her eyes begged me for more, but when she regained herself, she once again realized that we weren't the only ones here but she also didn't seem to care much. Still, I wasn't interested in making out on the dance floor, so I walked her back to our table. Seeing the table full of empty plates and half-drank bottles, I looked at her. Are we done here? Yes. Let's go then. I grabbed her hand and my bottle of wine. She also grabbed her bottle of Caspa. Like that, we went back down to the entrance of the restaurant where I quickly paid for everything with a tap of the card. And so we left, making straight for the hotel while taking sips from our bottles on the way. Soon, we reached the elevator where I punched in the number for my room. We ascended, standing side by side in tense silence. When I glanced at her though, I found her stealing looks. And as if we could read each other's minds, we went straight back to kissing, unable to even wait for the room. When the elevator arrived and opened, we pulled away and walked out. I led her to my fancy room, pushing the door open and welcoming her in. She didn't say anything about how nice the room was or even the fact that I had it. Instead, she jumped on me, wrapping her legs around my waist and taking us both down to the bed after I threw the door shut behind me. I was surprised by how bold she was. It seemed she had flipped a switch, because I couldn't sense a hint of shyness, embarrassment, or shame. Not that I minded. We had been saving our first kiss for this date because it sure as hell wasn't going to happen on the military base. It was an unspoken, but definitely real agreement. So when else would we do it? The third date? The tenth? If not now, while we were hotter than ever for each other, then when? I would have done it earlier if the circumstances had been better than crappy, but a military base didn't allow that. I knew that both of us had wanted to for quite a while, but only now were we finally in the position to let loose. So we tumbled across the bed, Amara constantly learning and exploring new ways to use her tongue. It was exhilarating and passionate filling my head with so much dopamine that I felt I was going to explode. And Amara couldn't seem to control herself as she hounded me for more. For a moment, I started to doubt if she had really done this before or not. 
but she was definitely new at this. With Rayla, there was no mistaking her experience. But with Amara, there was zero familiarity to speak of. Ah, fuck it. I stopped questioning things, simply indulging in the moment. And we never stopped. Even if we weren't rolling over each other, we were laid down beside each other, constantly kissing, sometimes momentarily, sometimes deeply. But we didn't go beyond that. It wasn't time yet. Not even I wanted to sleep with her right now. We would simply need time before reaching that step. Yet I couldn't help but feel that this was damn close to it. It was basically sex with our mouths, our tongues dancing around, pulling, pushing, intertwining. We communicated without words, feeling the other with unseen clarity. And it went on for so long. Glances at the clock on the wall told me that two hours passed before I knew it, but I simply never felt like I wanted to stop. Not to mention the boost in stamina from my recent advancement that kept me energetic. But I could tell that after a while, she started to get tired, even if she didn't want to. So I slowed it down, the two of us cuddling more. Besides, I was tired as well. I didn't forget that I hadn't actually slept the night before. Both of us started to cool down after that, no longer so ravenous. It was only at that point that she was able to talk again, her voice soft as a whisper. We don't have to go back, do we? No. We can sleep here. M.M. That's good. I had fun today. She let out a light breath that graced my nose and shifted her body, pressing closer while resting her head on my chest. I combed back some of her hair as I responded. I'm glad. Now I can properly call you my girlfriend. Hmm. And I get to call you my boyfriend. She leaned forward after saying that, giving me a kiss on the cheek. I returned with a kiss on her forehead. After that, her heavy eyes closed as she fell asleep in my arms. I joined her not long after, falling into a deep slumber supported by the rich comfort of my hotel bed. Chapter 56 Long Day When I woke up, I was enveloped by comfort and ease. I felt amazingly rested. I had been up for almost two days straight since, during the time I was supposed to sleep a night ago. I instead advanced, and my mind was overloaded with energy. I couldn't go to sleep even if I wanted to. But now, I had finally slept and reset my system. That rest seemed to have completely solidified the effects of my advancement, making me feel even stronger than before, perhaps smarter as well. But my mind was preoccupied with the girl in my arms. Once my eyes opened and cleared, I saw her still dead asleep. In fact, she had started drooling on my arm at some point, leaving a puddle on my sleeve. I just chuckled a bit and continued to lay there. Honestly, sometimes it felt like the touch of the person you liked or loved was just as intoxicating as any drug. Simply looking at Amara made me happy. Was I head over heels for this girl? Nah, no way. I'm in complete control of my emotions. After a while of staring and enjoying her comfort, I suddenly saw her shift a tiny bit, indicating her awakening. I smiled and leaned forward a bit, kissing her forehead. Then I kissed her cheek, her breathing hitching a bit. And then I kissed her chin, causing her hand to clutch my shirt. When my lips were planted on her neck, her breathing came out like a shiver. J. John. Ha. Huh. Hmm. Good morning. I pulled away and looked at her with a smile, her ears burning red as she let out a few harsh breaths. Unlike last night though, she was no longer so daring and bold. In embarrassment, she turned and buried her face in the pillow. I laughed while climbing out of bed. Both of us were still in our attire from last night, not having bothered to take anything off or change. Perhaps we would need to engage in the walk of shame back to the magisterium. Then again, I had my coat in my spatial sack, so throwing it on would make me look normal. I looked back at Amara. After some silence, she went from embarrassed to curious about the room. Is this your own room? Yeah. The key master gave it to me back when I had nowhere to stay. You were homeless? Temporarily when I first came to the capital. I didn't have a single coin to my name back then, but the key master was generous enough to give me this room for free. Well, honestly, it's nicer than my bedroom at our family mansion so you got a pretty good deal. I would agree. I nodded and looked around. This place was befit to house the famous, rich, and influential. To get a place like this anywhere else in the city would cost a massive sum of money, and I had gotten it for free. Well, I've gotten everything I have now through the generosity of many people. It will take a long time trying to repay all of them, but it'll happen one way or another. Letting out a small breath, I pointed to the bathroom. If you need to, you can clean up in there. Do you have a change of clothes, or do you want to go out and buy some? No, I have my robes. Oh, good. Well, you take the bathroom first. I'll order some breakfast. All right. She nodded and jumped out of bed, heading into the bathroom. 
While she did that, I ordered some room service, getting a breakfast platter. And it didn't take long to get here. I heard a knock on the door by the time Amara came back out in her robes. Here you go, sir. Call if there's anything else you need. Thank you. I took the cart that was rolled in, bringing it over to my dining area. The wall closest to the dining area was entirely made out of glass from floor to ceiling, so we were able to eat while taking in the view of the morning city from so high up. Oh, smells good. Amara smiled and sat down, digging in with me. While we ate, though, I looked out toward the two most eye-catching buildings in the city, the Royal Palace and the Magic Spire. They were the tallest buildings in the city, the Royal Palace being particularly bold and grandiose with its golden exterior and artistic depictions across the pillars and walls of its construction. The spire was similarly prestigious, created of dark crystal and enchanted profoundly. The Magisterium wasn't far from that place, but the two seemed worlds away. I had heard much about the spire. It was a place most warlocks aspired to go. It was humanity's single greatest magic innovation center. I believed Son worked from there as well. However, since warlocks were coveted in the military, it was difficult to get into the spire. It was mainly for the dedicated researchers. In fact, I believed that the majority of people within the spire were summoners, not warlocks. Suddenly, I remembered something and broke the silence. Hey, I wanted to ask you about something. Sure. Summoners have sparks that that strengthen our mind and psyche. What do warlocks have? Oh, we have mana hearts. We accumulate mana in our hearts and that mana gets circulated through our blood, allowing us to intimately connect with the world around us. But there are different systems of spellcasting dictated by how we layer our mana hearts through our advancements. I see. So, is the term tempering familiar to you? I asked, thinking back to Maxwell's explanation. Warlocks and knights were supposed to have a system of tempering, something summoners didn't have which stunted their growth. Sure enough, Amara nodded. Yes, though it's a very rare path to take and not exactly well known. My mother allows me to but she tells me that I can't tell anyone about it. But, how do you know about it? Maxwell, my teacher. He helped me carry out some tempering during my recent advancement. Ah, I knew something felt different. So you advanced. Congratulations. Amara smiled in cheer but after a few more seconds, her face suddenly fell. Wait, summoners don't have tempering. I'd like it if you kept this a secret for now, but my teacher has created a way to temper a summoner spark. Oh, that's revolutionary. Summoners are notoriously weak because they're unable to temper themselves like knights and warlocks can. It has prevented them from ever reaching authority 12. If that changes, the whole of humanity will benefit. Maybe. But I wanted to ask about how warlocks temper themselves, see how my tampering would match up. I asked, wanting more information. I didn't know much about how knights and warlocks worked, and Amara started describing her own tempering experience. It seemed similar to mine. By gathering multiple white crystals above your own authority, you could concentrate Magicka and use it to temper yourself during an advancement while your body was completely open to its power. However, it seemed that Amara's tempering was drastically toned down from my own whereas I was surrounded by eight white crystals, all of which had their powers concentrated by a device, and had all my psyche drained in its entirety, she only had three white crystals and also didn't drain herself of mana. Apparently the ring device was common enough for those who had the money and connections to get one for advancements, but everything else about her tempering was watered down. I felt like I was going to die at one point during the tempering, but she had very mild pain. Not only that, but she didn't even know that she could enhance her body with psyche and vigor. Since her tempering was easier, it was arguable if her body was enhanced by those two energies at all, though I was inclined to believe she still received some. So it begged the question, why was her tempering so much more mild than my own? Maxwell was basing the tempering according to how the other magi did it, merely adapting it to summoners. Was he just being more extreme? Or was Amara's tempering not extreme enough? Because we were both aware of tempering, there wasn't any need to hide things. I told her about the differences between our experiences, and she too quickly figured out that something was wrong. I created a mana core during my authority two and three advancements. Then I merged them during my advancement to authority four to create the foundation for my mana heart. That's when I conducted the tempering with my mother. So it seems like tempering is supposed to occur during every third advancement, but I don't know why mine was weaker than yours. I don't believe my mother would withhold anything from me. Maybe you should ask her. Perhaps there's something different about warlocks and summoners that requires different intensities. I doubt it, but I'll wait to ask. No matter what, my first tempering has already passed. 
In fact, I'm close to authority 5. Oh, that's good. Think you'll have it before the next trip. M.M. She nodded while taking a bite out of some eggs over easy. I smiled and watched her, going through the rest of breakfast before deciding to head out. By now, classes had already long started. Not that I cared. As a good delinquent, I took my sweet-ass time going back to the magisterium where me and my girlfriend went straight to the dorms. Once inside, she nudged me. Hey, let me see your room. You got to see mine. Huh? I don't mind, but we were just in my other room. I think it's a lot nicer than here. Just show me. Okay. I looked at her weirdly while entering my dorm room. And as soon as the door closed, she jumped on me while sealing our mouths. Oh, so that's what she wanted. Chuckling as she wrapped her legs around my waist, I went and placed her back against a wall, propping her up and going to town. And that's when I learned that she was a very fast learner. Compared to last night, she seemed like a pro. Still, I was shocked at how eager she could get. With how embarrassed she always got when I teased her or showed her some love, I figured she was just more innocent or reserved. But my goodness, this girl could get dirty. After pinning her against the wall for a while, she eventually pushed off and brought us to the bed where we continued. And we didn't stop until one of my alarms went off around an hour later, signaling the time to head over to our training. So after we reluctantly pulled away from each other, we cleaned up and left the dorms. Oh, we should go see the leaderboard. That's right. I wonder what place you're at. Suddenly remembering how I was now an elite, we both went and checked the leaderboard where I would be placed. The leaderboard was located in the school's secondary plaza near the West Wing. There, the board was held between two marble pillars. I looked at the silvery white metal frame that had 32 names atop it. And there, in 11th place, was my name with 490 points next to it. I nodded with a pleased expression. Not bad, if I do say so myself. M.M., for only going on one trip, it's amazing. Keep going like that and you'll reach the top of the leaderboard. Though, I'm surprised that there's also three others who become elites. Amara looked at the bottom of the leaderboard where three more names were added along with mine. While she was occupied though, I suddenly turned and looked around. There were always plenty of students within the plaza, but I was noticing how many eyes the two of us were pulling. With my aura I could sense the curiosity in the gazes of all the younger students, wondering who I was. I could also sense a lot of boys staring at Amara. At first, I was simply amazed at how acute my senses and attunement to Aura had become. But the next moment, I found myself smirking. I suddenly took Amara's hand in my own, raising it and kissing the back of her fingers. W8. Why? She looked at me with a flushed face, her eyes darting around to all those around us, seeing all their whispers and giggles. I didn't respond, intertwining our fingers before pulling her to the training grounds. There, we found most of the other elites waiting around by the puppet master's outpost. The rest of our squad was included. As we walked over, I felt Amara's hand clutch my own a bit harder. I could imagine that it was a bit nerve-wracking to be so open about our relationship in front of friends, but at the same time, what would it mean if we let go? That we were afraid to tell people? Well, I think we were beyond that with everything that had happened in recent days. Still, even I was a bit embarrassed as I saw Vets Mon and Fiden chuckle mischievously. Look at these two. Where were you guys yesterday? I knew it. Tana shouted from behind the men, as if she hadn't been completely oblivious a week ago. I laughed a bit as Amara tried to hide behind me. We were having fun not getting our asses kicked by the puppet master. Yeah? Well, you're in for a good surprise. John. Suddenly, there was a yell as the puppet master came stomping out of his outpost. I scratched my head as he approached. Where were you two yesterday? Actually, I don't want to know. But since you skipped a scenario, your squad gets to do a hard one today. Now get ready. Well shit. I cursed as we were all mercilessly enveloped by a pulling force, teleporting into the scenario. Today was going to be a long day. Chapter 57, Fourth Dimension. The scenario we were given was rather straightforward. Two unkillable authority fives were thrown at us, both of them modeled after the gorilla that attacked us during our patrol. They were big, fast, and strong. And no matter what we did to them, they wouldn't fall. Not only that, but they were supported by some other monkeys that, while able to be killed, were constantly replaced when one died. So it was an endless battle that taught us not how to fight, but how to survive. Primarily, how to keep your team protected while under threat. The monkeys came after Amara and I who didn't move as much as our knights. And since Vetmon and Fiden were occupied with the gorillas, Tana was responsible for helping us and them. But there were so many monkeys that Vetsmon and Fiden couldn't be protected from, 
which would distract them and open them up to devastating attacks from the guerrillas. So Tana was forced to bounce between two sections of the battlefield, supporting her teammates where needed. When Fiden was attacked, he was forced to test his speed and retaliate while also keeping himself safe from the guerrilla. As for Vetsmon, he simply had to endure a beating. The guerrilla he faced was strong, even more than him. So he had to survive a two-pronged assault while also making sure the guerrilla didn't go and attack his squad. I, on the other hand, needed to constantly avoid those damned monkeys while killing as many as I could. Getting hit was considered a failure on my part, so I needed to release as much firepower as I could while being pressured. And Amara needed to support her entire squad. Sending spells my way to ease my pressure, assisting Tana, or throwing some rebuffing spells at the gorillas Vets Mon and Fiden were fighting. She had to take the most valuable course of action at every moment which required keeping an eye on the entire battle. It stressed all of us, pushing us to our limits. However, compared to the others, I was rather relaxed. Well, I was dealing with the most enemies. My speed of thought was stressed as a dozen monkeys would attack me and my squad at any given time, making me dodge, run, and shoot without break. I actually had to rely on Tana and Amara's support, and given what had happened not long ago, both of them were wholly aware of everything I did and encountered, not willing to let the slightest bit of harm befall me. In fact, I could feel the senses and gazes of my entire squad on me throughout the entire battle, like I was a child requiring babysitting. But, despite all the pressure, I wasn't all that serious. That was because of my recent advancement. I underestimated just how much power I contain now. Empowered shots that only a week ago would drain my stamina to nothing could now be fired with ease and volume. My body also had much greater stamina and strength than before, allowing me to utilize my speed of thought and avoid enemies with never-before-seen agility. Even I was surprised by it all. My reactions were faster, my dexterity was more accurate giving me faster reload times, and I could run for much longer. At some point I was backpedaling while firing two peacemakers. Not only that, but my senses were sharper, the most obvious one being my vision. With better eyes combined with all the other benefits, my ability to aim and hit moving targets jumped significantly. My accuracy was through the roof. Everything simply became easier. By the time I got used to all the changes, I was killing so fast that the monkeys couldn't keep up. The puppet master had to spawn a lot more to keep up the pressure. My only regret, however, was how I hadn't actually fully completed my advancement. The dimension for my fourth authority had yet to be opened. Technically, I could do it whenever I wanted so long as I had all my energy. But I had been so preoccupied with Amara that I had forgotten. I was making out instead of finding some new guns to commune with. The horny was getting in the way of productivity. I made a note to fix that tonight. Since when did you advance? Since two days ago. I responded after arriving back at the outpost where the puppet master was waiting. The rest of my squad was on the floor. The knights were fighting for every particle of air they could get while Amara looked like she had been drained of all her spirit. While I was also tired, I was definitely doing better than them. The puppet master grumbled. You ruined my plans to kick your ass into shape. But whatever. It seems your advancement was rather significant. I've never seen you perform so well, and from a cursory glance, your psychic capacity has increased by a magnitude. For an authority four, you're exceptionally powerful. I've only seen Authority 6 summoners who can match you in terms of sheer power. Thank you. M.M. Just don't let it get to your head. Summoners are considered weak for a reason. You're on par with the rest of your squad now, but your defenses still can't compare. If I were you, I would be trying to find something that can help protect you a bit more. Go talk to Maxwell about that. I will. I nodded seriously. My coat was great, but it couldn't protect my head or hands. So long as I wore it right, which I hadn't been before, I also shouldn't have to worry about my torso or most of my legs being hurt. I needed to find something to keep my head safe. As for my hands, I didn't think I actually needed to worry that much about them. The only reason I had lost a few fingers last time was because I was using my arms and hands to defend my head against the monkey. If I didn't need to do that, they would be safer. Not only that, but Rayla's gloves, which I still continued to wear, were shockingly tough. I only lost my fingers at the point the fingerless gloves no longer covered, which was just below the first knuckle. Other than that, the rest of my hands didn't have a single injury. So the gloves did their job. As for the risk of my fingers not being covered. Sometimes, style was a bit more important than safety. And if I really needed to, maybe I could get the gloves modified to cover the entire finger. But I didn't intend to change them. They were a personal gift, and I would wear them as long as I could. 
so a helmet was most important. I would indeed need to ask Maxwell about that. The puppet master asked another question. By the way, your summons look the same. I'm going to open the next dimension tonight. I got distracted and forgot to yesterday. Heh, <laughs> distracted my ass. I had guesses about what the Duchess of Joffrin had talked to you about. Seems I was correct in my assumption. And that's none of my business, not until it starts affecting you professionally. Do whatever you want, but when it comes time to battle, you need to be completely invested. Of course. I smiled at him knowingly, causing him to scoff. Whatever. Tomorrow, I expect you to have opened your new dimension. I'll give you all a hunting day so you can test things out. Now get out of here and recover. Okay. I waved and walked off. The rest of my squad also pulled themselves off the ground and followed me. We all went back to our dorms to clean up before heading out to the Magisterium's restaurant to eat. After our time on base, we had become a lot closer. We decided to hang out whenever we could. It was unfortunate that I didn't take the same classes as them, but that wasn't too big of a deal. I felt I was learning a lot more by actually hunting and killing the scourge than I was at school. Sure, there was a lot of sheer knowledge that was good to know like the thousands of different types of beasts, combat strategies on certain terrains, standard procedure for scourge encounters, medical knowledge, and more. But there was nothing like a good battle to teach you exactly what you needed to do. While the school wasn't teaching useless knowledge, there was still only so much you could learn academically. Experience was the best teacher. I suppose that's why the puppet master was there. It was only unfortunate that not everyone could utilize those training grounds. Since our training ended later in the day, we ended up spending a few hours together before separating. Amara and I ended up in my room that evening, doing the obvious. But we couldn't for long because as soon as I was recovered, I prepared to break through my dimension. Amara was understanding. So when night fell, she sat on the end of my bed while watching me. I sat at the head with my eyes closed. Inwardly within the mystical space that was my mind, I could see thirteen stars. Three were bright, inside them my dimensions. The other ten were dim. I targeted the fourth star, and with a thought, all my psycho flooded toward it. It was almost too easy to break through the barrier, the dimension being blown open and the fourth star brightening with power. Disregarding the sudden drop in energy, I instantly sent out some psychodrones to scout the dimension. And the immediate findings made me excited. The Springfield 1903. Colt 1911. Winchester M97 trench gun. And most surprising of all. Grenades. My eyes brightened with excitement. These weapons were primarily used during World War I. A time when the industrial war machine was beginning to bear its fangs, only overshadowed by the extreme development of its successor war. I had a feeling that there was a lot more to be found as well. The potential for variant weapons was limited before the Great War. Firearm technology was slow to develop without that immense pressure. So now that my summons have reached this era, I should be able to find some more specialty weapons. My versatility and destructive power would reach new heights. How unfortunate that I couldn't test things out right this moment. Especially the grenades. With a thought though, I suddenly summoned one. The canister appeared in my hand its body composed of 40 serrations. I felt the trigger as well as the pin hanging from the top, feeling a bit inexplicable. What's that? Amara shifted on the bed, looking over at the unfamiliar object. This is a grenade, a fragmentation explosive. Pulling this pin and releasing the trigger will light a fuse and cause this thing to explode within about four seconds. Explode? How big of an explosion? If it were to explode right here, it would kill both of us. When this thing explodes, it causes its metal shell to blast into dozens of pieces, all of them flying outward and shredding anything they touch. The explosion itself has limited effects. I showed her the grenade's features while mumbling, and she looked at it a bit warily knowing that it was a deadly weapon. I couldn't help my smile though, feeling eager to start using these new weapons. After admiring the grenade for a while longer, I willed it away and grabbed Amara, bringing her to the sheets with me. Tomorrow is going to be fun. You always look happy when you get to use your guns. That's because they're totally awesome. More awesome than kissing? Yes. Ugh. No hesitation. She exclaimed in playful anger, making us laugh as we ended the night with a bit more romance. The next day during hunting, I grouped up with my squad. And I spent four hours doing nothing but putting my weapons to the test. Beforehand, I requested the puppet master to send me some non-aggressive beasts so that I could simply gauge the destructive capabilities of my weapons. The puppet master complied, sending all manner of beasts of varying levels that simply wandered around without attacking. Naturally, the first thing I tested was my grenade. Like bullets, grenades consumed a certain amount of psych up front. 
It wasn't like my weapons where I could commune with them and give them a steady stream of energy to maintain them, and grenades took a decent chunk of my Psyche to summon. Not only that, but they could contain a lot of Psyche while empowered, increasing their destructive capabilities to an unseen level. Upon testing with various beasts at Authority 4 and 5, I found that the grenade did fantastic single-target damage. A beast like the gorilla, against an empowered grenade, would be heavily wounded if it exploded in close proximity. Entire limbs could be blown off depending on where it landed, and the shrapnel would scramble its insides, causing excessive bleeding. However, against groups of beasts, the effect of the grenades was limited. Sure, it could injure multiple if they were crowded around, but it simply wasn't worth the energy it took to summon and empower it to fight groups of more than five. Still, even the others were shocked by how effective the grenades were. Even Amara didn't realize just how good it was until she witnessed it. Basically, anything less than Authority 5 would be blown to chunks. And it wasn't like I had to shoot it either. I simply threw it and hid behind cover. It was easy. Well, that was every weapon of mine. Guns made killing easy, and as I continued to advance, I would get better weapons that made killing even easier. I could already imagine what was in store for me later. In fact, Amara seemed to be catching on as well. With each of my authorities, my guns evolved. She seemed to be able to see that to some extent, even though she didn't really know how they worked. After working with the grenades for a while, I went and summoned some of the other standard weapons. The most important guns I found were the Springfield rifle, the trench gun, and the Colt 1911 semi-automatic pistol. The Springfield 1903 was a bolt-action rifle with a five-round billin magazine. Using loading clips, you could easily load five rounds into the magazine. The rifle was chambered in 30-06, which while lighter than the 45-70 government that I currently used with my Remington Lee, was also more reliable at distances around 300 meters. The heavier 45-70 would slope downward significantly beyond 100 meters, whereas the 30-06 had a much flatter firing angle at the same distances. Not only that, but where the 45-70 would lose its velocity and deliver less force, the 30-06 would retain a significant amount of its initial force even up to 300 meters. So for distance targets, it was the better choice. Not that it was a slouch with close-range targets. With the magazine, the Springfield could inherently shoot more rounds per minute than the Remington Lee, which was perhaps the most important aspect I had to worry about. The only issue was the lack of a scope on the Springfield, but it still had iron sight which, within 200 meters, was technically sufficient. Not to mention that I was often shooting large beasts anyway, not humans, making long-range shooting easy. Perhaps my favorite gun out of the lineup though was the trench gun. This shotgun was a tube-fed pump action system, like normal shotguns. However, this shotgun had a notorious reputation due to its slam-fire receiver. This meant that, if I held down the trigger, I could fire the weapon by pumping the shotgun slide. This gave it the ability to fire off shells at an alarming speed, only limited by how fast I was and how many shells were in the tube. The weapon was so dreaded that historically, when Americans got their hands on this weapon during the trench warfare of WW1, Germans were so scared of its use that they formally bitched about it and attempted to outlaw its use. Naturally, their protests and threats were met with nothing but scorn and derision. The hypocrites who threatened to execute anyone found with the gun yet continued to use poison gas and flamethrowers lost their balls and could only cry about it. And so the trench gun became a staple of the American war machine, a weapon so terrifyingly effective that all those during its era feared the very mention of it, almost as much as the man behind it. To say that I wasn't excited to hold the sexy steel babe of a weapon would be nothing but bullshit. When it first appeared in my hands, I couldn't help myself and ended up kissing it on the receiver. Twice. I tried to not notice Amara's weird gaze as I took out the last weapon. The Colt 1911. Created by John Moses Browning, as many of the greatest weapons were, the 1911 pistol is one of the most iconic weapons ever made right next to the Colt revolvers of the Wild West and some more modern rifles like the AR-15. Chambered in .45 ACP, this magazine-fed pistol was America's standard issue sidearm for over seven decades. And even after it was replaced by the Posh Beretta M9, it remained so popular that it continued to be used across all fields into the 21st century. Upon equipping this weapon, despite Amar's warning gaze, I still kissed it. The others also found it weird, but I couldn't expect them to understand the significance of this legendary weapon. Otherwise, they would be kissing it too. Besides those primary weapons, 
I couldn't find anything else noteworthy without first digging deeper into the dimension, which would take time. And so, I spent all day training with my new toys that only increased my ability to kill faster. I was sure that during the next trip we went on, I would be able to perform even better than previously. Chapter 58. Suits. After our day of hunting, my schedule went back to normal. We had three weeks until the next trip out to another military base. During the second week, though, I took care of a few orders of business. First, and most importantly, was my advancement formation. I could now begin making my way to Authority 5. So far, my advancements haven't taken me more than two months each. But when I received the next advancement formations from Maxwell, I realized that there was no way I would be doing this in just a month or so, regardless of how I progressed over time. The advancement formation to Authority 4 looked like a complex circuit board. The one for Authority 5, however, was several times more convoluted. But even that wasn't enough to describe it. For one, the formation actually had three layers to it, resulting in me receiving three large sheets of paper the size of my torso from Maxwell. Each sheet of paper looked like the schematics for a CPU, and they were all supposed to layer on top of each other, interconnecting between thousands of different points. Comprehending the entire thing would only begin the process of creating another spark and usher me into the doorway for Authority 6. It wasn't until I became Authority 6 that I would finalize the creation of the second spark. So for three authorities, I would be trying to create a single spark. Of course, it wasn't as simple as just repeating the process I used to create the first one. First of all, because I already had a spark occupying my mind, creating a second spark would introduce conflicts. The first spark was constructed by creating an engine of Psyche. This meant that a vast majority of my Psyche now resided within the spark. As for the rest of my mind, it was like an ocean powered by currents, the first spark likened to a boat which could be purposefully driven. But the boat and ocean were intricately connected. Although there was the entire ocean that was my mind, all its energy had been focused around the boat. This meant there was nothing else to give to an additional boat. So in order to advance, one had to not create another boat, but turn the ocean and its currents, the memories and computational power of the mind, into something more direct and functional like a river. At least, that was how Maxwell described it. The way I understood it, the next spark would be turning my hard drive of a mind into an SSD. And with an SSD, all of the information within my mind would flow far faster. The components of my mind would likewise function faster proportionally to the increase in information flow rate. The next three advancements would restructure and upgrade my hardware, so that it could accommodate a much stronger technology, which was the second spark. By the time I was finished, I would already be climbing beyond many powerful summoners, even those above my own authority. The power that these advancements would grant me were radically better than the standard. But of course, this also meant that it came with more discrepancies. Unlike the standard formations that had been improved upon and utilized for centuries, these formations were completely new. It wasn't certain that they accurately described the path forward. So unlike the narrow and clear path I had been on previously, the way forward was now a bit blurry and winding. But thankfully, I wouldn't be without a guiding light. Maxwell knew more than anyone how his formations weren't completely refined. Although he had been working on them for decades and he wielded a mind that I couldn't even fathom the power of, there may still be some small errors or inconsistencies. While I would be on my own for the most part, simply trying to comprehend things in the first place, he offered me help should I absolutely need it. If there was a part of the formation that simply didn't feel right no matter what angle I took it from, then he would give me advice and explain things. Not only that, but he told me that even without him, there was only so far off the path I could go before nature itself stopped me. Advancements were by no means a mistake or man-made creations. They were firmly rooted in nature, and humanity's development of magi, and the system of advancements were actually all discoveries, not inventions. Sure, it took a lot of trial and error. But the perfect system wasn't dictated by the Magi themselves, but the feelings they garnered when hitting certain milestones. Like in everything else, nature would always let you know when something was off. There was a reaction to every change, good or bad. And if something was bad, then nature would resist and attempt to correct it. This applied to Magi as well. Going down the wrong path introduced several negative effects, the most obvious of which was pain. I had forgotten it since I hadn't experienced it in a long time, but when I used to deviate from the formations back during my second authority, I would feel a searing pain in my mind. After all, one needed to circulate Psyche according to the formations. If you circulated that energy incorrectly, it would cause a backlash, 
like an engine misfiring. What this meant above all was that Maxwell's formations, while definitely not the standard, were validated by nature itself. The very fact that I didn't feel pain when circulating the authority for advancement formation meant that it was technically correct. This meant that the standard formations that created weak summoners were also correct. That fact caused me to question several other things, like why there were multiple routes of advancement and what they meant. But that was beyond me right now, so I didn't bother thinking about it. Anyway, I at least felt more reassured about my decision. I said that I would help Maxwell and be his guinea pig for this new system of advancement. That might have been mainly driven out of my desire to be a part of something bigger than myself, maybe my desire to be special. But I had stuck by my words, even though I was also a bit nervous about it. Maxwell's explanations gave me more solace. I at least knew that I would achieve some success, and failure wouldn't be permanent. If I encountered an obstacle, then I merely needed to work with Maxwell to find the correct path, because no matter what, the path was in fact there. And along with the formations I was given, Maxwell handed me an Authority 5 white crystal which would be the engine for my cultivation. Although I was significantly more powerful than a summoner at my level, compared to knights or warlocks, I was only average, maybe above average. Sometimes I forgot that this path wasn't actually making me better than the standard, just better than the weak baseline for summoners. So an authority 5 white crystal was more than enough for me. After receiving my items, I sighed a bit. I didn't want to have to start all over again on comprehending a new formation, especially one that seemed impossible to figure out but I didn't exactly have a choice. Thankfully, studying these formations was mildly interesting. I simply enjoyed using my powerful mind, and gaining results from the formation was rewarding. So I didn't have an issue spending at least a couple hours a day studying. So with all that, one of my biggest orders of business was checked off. But there was yet another that I needed to take care of. And it involved Amara. When we both had some free time, we headed over to the tailor I was recommended by the key master. It was naturally located within the Black Spider Market, but it wasn't one so easily accessed. Maxwell had recommended to me a tailor a while ago, one that I used for some more basic formal clothes equipped with mild defensive and convenient enchantments. Back then, I had spent over 30 gold bullion on a single suit, which at the time felt like a price gouge. Now though, I would be making my single largest purchase to date. I approached a building in the market. It was entirely unmarked and made of pitch blackwood. I almost couldn't see the floor with how dark it was. It seemed to absorb all light, leaving only the faintest indications that there was something there. And from the entrance, there were two white strips of light that drew a path toward the receptionist's counter. A man stood there behind a curved podium. There was nothing in front of him, and he looked like his only job was to simply wait there for the occasional rare guest. Good day, Mr. Cooper. Oh, hello. I was surprised that he already knew my name, but at the same time, I couldn't find it that odd. I was already numb to this kind of thing. If I may, can I see your golden key? Sure. With his request, I pulled out the golden key from the key master. He nodded when he saw it before waving a hand. Please, follow me to meet the couturier. Thank you. I smiled and followed, Amara linking arms with me as we were taken down another drawn path. It took us through what I could only assume was a hall before we arrived at a large double set of dark gold doors. After opening them and stepping through, we entered a room that was all black like previously. In the center of the floor, however, was a bright white ring. There was also a man waiting within, who looked at me with bright eyes. Greetings, Mr. Cooper. I'm the couturier Hans Meyer. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. Likewise. Now tell me, what can I create for you today? Flash. As he said that, several more rings of light that wrapped around the ceiling lit up. The walls also revealed several mirrors, allowing me to see every angle of the room. I glanced around while responding. I need a suit, fit enough for the highest class gatherings. Of course, sir. Anything else? I didn't have anything else in mind, but if you let me know what else you provide, I wouldn't mind getting more. Then allow me to display our selections of features. He smiled and clapped, and from the ground, a few hatches opened up to reveal several sets of clothing. There were standard suits, noble suits, and royal suits fit for a king. The glamour could ascend to any level and I knew there was more to these suits than I knew. After all, with higher quality materials and design came inherent capabilities. My other suits, which were far cheaper than these, came with defensive and comfort features. There was no way these didn't also come with those. Hans listed some things off, describing several of the suits. We offer just about anything you can think of, but most clients come to us for the longevity and integrity of their clothing. 
Our most basic suits can resist authority for attacks, and we are capable of constructing coats that can withstand the onslaught of even authority tin beasts. Due to our special materials, every piece of clothing also comes with a certain level of self-mending capabilities. And besides defensive properties, our suits provide only the most comfortable features. As for its appearances, our fabrics can sport anything from basic colors to the most eye-catching or profoundly deep visuals. I see that. I was mesmerized while looking between the suits. Magic on this world did things that science hadn't yet been able to do on Earth. And what I saw on these suits seemed to defy all common sense. One suit looked like it was a portal to the depths of space. I could see stars and explosions of colors, and the image wasn't static. It would change with my perspective and position, shifting as I moved to reveal more fantastic images. Another suit looked like the incarnation of fire. It burned, but there was only a bit of warmth coming off of it. It looked just like real fire, and I couldn't fathom how it was doing so. Another looked like it was crafted of a single piece of fogged glass, while another looked like it was made of amethyst. It was flamboyant and not something I would wear unless it was a joke, but nevertheless, it clearly displayed great skill and ability. So my imagination was the limit, but I also couldn't say that I was very artistic. While my mind functioned faster, that didn't suddenly make me good at everything, but I realized that I at least had to have an idea. That caused me to look at Amara. Technically, I was getting this for her in the inevitable situation where I would have to dress nicely for a bunch of nobles. I was committed to her, and that would involve making certain decisions around her. But part of me wanted to make these suits a bit more versatile. I didn't have the money to buy a new suit for every occasion, nor a dozen of them. So I thought about it for a bit before pointing at one of the more basic suits. I need something that can fit multiple occasions, not just a single party. Ah, so we seek versatility. Worry not, Mr. Cooper, the suit you take away from this place won't be worn but once. Our selections come with the ability to change certain aspects of their visuals. For now, how about you give me a selection of colors? I will design four different suits, and you can tell me how you like them. All right, let's go with black, purple, red, and gold. Understood. Give me a moment. With a smile, all the suits in front of me disappeared. Then, for blank suits took their place. And with a wave of the hand, he began casting several spells that enveloped the suits, warping their shapes and colors. One spell also surrounded my person, seemingly measuring the different portions of my body using a series of notches. With that, the suits conformed to the general shape of my body, yet they all had different styles. The first of them was the most basic suit type worn by thousands of others throughout the capital during their day-to-day -day lives, sporting basic dark colors. The second was a step above designed for normal formal events put on by the lower class. This one had black pants, a red shirt, and a black coat with some red trim. It looked really refined, but not so outstanding as to be out of place. The third was a step above that, designed for the most formal events a normal person could go to like Vatsy's Gala. This suit was quite a bit more dazzling with the same black foundation, but now with gold designs and trim. It looked more like an art piece than a suit. And finally, the fourth suit was the most stunning of them all, clearly designed to be worn to noble gatherings. This suit was black paired with a purple shirt and vest along with some purple shoes. The purple vest had subtle black designs woven into its fabric, and these designs seemed to meld together with the designs on the jacket. The black jacket shimmering purple designs flowed across its entire body. But despite being obvious, the designs weren't overwhelming or showy. Only when looking closer at the suit would you be able to appreciate its intricacy. Not only that, but inlaid into the entire design was thin golden lace. However, this golden lace couldn't be seen under normal circumstances. If you weren't looking directly at the suit, you wouldn't be able to see it. But as soon as you did, you would be able to see an odd glittering gold that didn't seem to be a part of the suit itself, almost as if it were shimmering beyond the fabric. It even looked like it was flowing, as if they were tiny veins pulsing with light. I took a step back and looked at all of the suits. They would all fit different occasions. I wouldn't really need anything other than these four if I were to buy them all. At least, that depended on whether it was frowned upon to wear the same thing to multiple noble occasions. I didn't exactly give a damn, but I had to for Amara's sake. Hey. Hmm. Amara tore her eyes away from the suits when I called her, letting me ask. At your noble parties, am I going to have to wear something different every time? Ah. Oh. Well, yes and no. Some parties have themes, others are standard gatherings, and some are holiday events. The girls are really the only ones that have to worry about having a ton of dresses. I don't think the men care enough to worry about that. 
but for certain things they have to. For holiday events, you can wear the same thing every year since it's the same holiday. For gatherings or more personal affairs, you can just wear something nice depending on how well you know the host. But for the biggest events like the annual King's Court Ball, nothing but the best is required, and all the girls and most of the men have something new every year. Hmm. I hummed and thought. At the very least, I wouldn't have to worry about buying everything now. If I needed something, I had time to get it. Suddenly, Amara spoke again. Why you don't have to worry so much about that? That last suit over there is more than enough for the nicest events you'll have to go to. The others also check just about every box for varied events, though I would recommend getting some color variations of the second and third ones, just for a bit more variety, if I may. At that moment, Hans chimed in, waving toward the second and third suits. The third suit can have its color scheme changed at will. While it can't shift its design, because of our special fabrics, their colors are capable of becoming any of our predetermined palettes. This is changed by the handkerchief. Observe. With a wave, Hans took out seven different handkerchiefs, and he put a white one into the chest pocket of the third suit, making it flash and change its color to a white variation. He also had red, blue, dark green, violet, gold, and the original black. When slotted into the chest pocket, it could shift to any of these base colors while simultaneously changing its trim and design colors to match. It amazed me, and I realized that this single suit was actually seven suits in one. Then, he went on to display the same thing with the fourth suit, just with a bit more limitation. Instead of being able to turn into any color, it was restricted to white and black, the color schemes basically flipping to their opposites. As for the others, well, they were cheap enough to buy multiple sets of. Not to mention that the first suit was standard, and I already had a few pairs of regular suit wear. Plus, my coat was already nicer than even the second suit, and I wore it daily. Would you like to try on the last suit? Hmm, sure. Hearing Hans, I nodded. That prompted him to wave to the side, revealing another room. Along with our suits, we offer special undergarments. Step inside the room and change into the pair already selected for you. Once you come back out, we can dress you. All right. I followed along and entered the room. It was basically a changing room, and after the door closed, I stripped myself and put on the singular pair of what seemed like spandex underwear. It hugged my body, but wasn't all that tight. It was also black just like the entire building was, eliminating the ability to make out any curves or definition when looking at it head on. I walked back out in just that, my gaze going straight toward Amara. She's already seen me shirtless, but she still got rosy cheeks while trying to divert her gaze and failing. I chuckled a bit and stepped back into the circle. Then, Hans brought over the suit pieces one by one. Pants, shirt, vest, jacket, shoes, and a necktie. I put everything on while he straightened whatever he needed to, and I looked between the mirrors, feeling like a new man. I almost couldn't believe how good I looked. And that wasn't out of my own narcissism. This suit was just so well made and fit me in the perfect way, making me look like some kind of rugged royal fit to rule a kingdom bringing out all my good points as if they were obvious. I fell in love immediately. I felt like it was perfect. Chapter 59. Unfortunate. I was more than satisfied by the suit. I didn't even want him to change anything. With one look, he had created what seemed like the perfect suit for my appearance and personality. But now, it was time to bite the bullet. So I asked, how much is this? That depends on the material it will be made out of. If you want defensive properties capable of stopping Authority 6 attacks, this suit will cost about 500,000 coin. Ouch. Now, if I were in a situation to wear this suit, would I really need to rely on its defensive properties? That depends on your own securities. I've tailored many knights and warlocks who fight in the suits and dresses they bring out of this place. Our pieces are more than capable of acting as a full set of armor, along with it bringing comfort, convenience, and style. So for someone like yourself, a summoner who may rely more on his armor, it might be wise to always be prepared. Hmm. I didn't immediately agree, looking at the suit a bit more. I had no intention of fighting in this thing. I had my coat for that. So I suppose my only hesitation in not asking for something less came from the fact that I didn't want to seem cheap and sparing. But when I looked at the other suits, I just shrugged. With authority for defensive properties, how much are the second and third suits? That would be 50 and 150,000 coin respectively. And the fourth with authority five properties? 300,000. All right. Nodding, I looked to Amara. She was gawking at the prices, but I ignored that. What do you think about the latter three? HM? Oh, I have no issues with any of them. 
but try them on. I want to see you in them. M.M. After I agreed, Hans went on to help me dress in the others. I also got to try out the color-changing functions of the third suit. In fact, after I dressed in them, he made a few other small alterations to make it fit me better. Amara seemed satisfied, so after making sure I was good with everything, I decided to pull the trigger. After redressing in my original clothes, I went back out. I'll take the latter three. Understood, sir. Follow me to finalize the sale. Hans let me out to another private room where Amara and I were seated for a few minutes. We were served drinks and some snacks, of which I indulged, before Hans came back with a card. This card will be our method of contact. When your suits are finished, this card will flash gold. Come back with it, and you will receive your suits. All right. Now, the total for your purchase today will be 500,000 coin. If you don't mind, please deposit the coin here. Sure. With a nod, I took out my platinum card from the Polaris Bank. I then designated the amount to be taken out, and just like that, stacks of gold bullion were withdrawn. I set them all on the table between us. Before long, ten stacks of coin were arranged before us. Before I could make the trade, though, I felt Amara's hand grab my arm. I am sorry, Hans, but could we have a moment? Hmm. Hans looked up at Amara, then at me. I was confused, but nodded, prompting Hans to leave for a moment. Once the door to the room closed, Amara spoke. John, you don't have to get the suit. I am in fact going to bring you to noble gatherings. Events like the King's Court Ball are included, even though you aren't a noble. Simply being my boyfriend, or more like my potential husband, will demand your presence. But, I didn't realize how much this was going to cost you. Look, we can get you suits for the occasions that come up. I don't know how much you have, but there's no way this isn't a lot for you. Hell, it's a lot for me. Only my mother has spent more than this in a single sitting, and she's the Duchess. It should be fine. I smiled at her, thinking it was nice to have someone so considerate with me. She looked worried, and I didn't blame her. Though she didn't know it, I was spending half of my savings on three pairs of clothing. Granted, these suits could be worn for the rest of my life. I may never have to buy another pair again, so this could be considered an investment. But I was still buying this because of her. We've already had conversations about the events that we would be going to, and in fact, one of them would occur before our next trip out to a military base. That was only two weeks away. But even so, I didn't feel like I was making a mistake. If I had done something like this on Earth, people would think that I was moving way too fast with this girl and couldn't think straight. And I had never done something so drastic with her for a girl before. But that was because here, things were different. The very fact that Amara had just called me a potential husband proved that. Here, relationships were taken far more seriously, especially with nobility. Hell, throughout history on Earth, it was also like that. Chastity and exclusivity were a given. People got married before or during their 20s, and there was hardly any such thing as a divorce since keeping the family together was more important than anything else. Amara had also spoken to me about many of the noble customs and unwritten rules. I wanted to learn since I was getting involved, and basically, every relationship was a big deal. It represented new alliances, shifts in power structures, and the ushering of a new generation of powerful children. And it was especially taboo to break commitments. Marriages were always final, divorce was unheard of, and to have sex and break up would ruin the reputation and prospects of the involved parties, including the parents. So no relationship was started casually, and it sure as hell wasn't advanced easily either. Every step forward took very careful consideration and would come with an increasing amount of strings and consequences. What this told me is that Amara was taking me very seriously. I was her potential husband even though we had only been on a single date and had been cuddly for a month. While she was taking a lot of unseen pressure, she was still moving forward with me. And all I was doing was enjoying her. So I saw this as an opportunity. I was investing in both high-class garments as well as her. Because I too took her seriously. Besides, I was never that afraid of spending money. If I knew that I could handle the expenditure, I didn't hesitate much. And just because I was spending a large chunk of my savings didn't mean I couldn't handle it. I sat there for a little while looking at Amara. Her slightly pale but beautiful face, her worried purple eyes, her ashy gray hair sloped in front of her shoulder. I remembered how gorgeous she was in that purple dress during the date, how she stunned me into silence and made me look subpar. And I decided that I should be more than capable of matching her. That was a matter of principle. I smiled at her, taking her hand into my own. It'll be fine. There's no reason I shouldn't be wearing them at some point, right? All right. 
but it's still 500,000 coin for some suits. You could use that for so many other things, like armor to protect yourself. That's true, but it's not like I'm going broke with this purchase. You want to know how much I have? She didn't answer, probably because she didn't want to pry into something personal. I could already tell that, despite being the daughter of a duchess, she was money shy. So I brought out my bank card, tapping it a few times and showing her the amount within my account even after withdrawing so much. Her eyes widened. 530,446. That was how much coin I had stored. What I had taken out was actually a bit less than half of my savings, though not by much. I had spent months saving all that up, and now months of work was turning into three pairs of suits. But I didn't mind all that much. So after letting Amara see the number, I put the card away. You think we could find some good armor with that? Yeah. All right. I smiled and stood, going to the door and bringing Hans back in. Once he sat down, I motioned to the coin. Sorry about the delay. I'm going to get the suits. Of course. Allow me to assure you that none of my clients have ever been dissatisfied. In this place, quality is placed above all else. And when you go to put on that suit for the first time, I know you won't regret it. M.M. I nodded and leaned back a bit. At the same time, Hans clapped, ushering in a butler who collected all the coin and left. Then, we all stood, Hans and I shaking hands. Pleasure doing business with you, Mr. Cooper. If you ever need a couturier in the future, our doors will always be open. That includes the lady. Thank you. With that, we were led out of the establishment. It was a bit disorienting when we exited, going from absolute pitch black to normal daylight. And once outside, I pulled Amara in and kissed her. Her mouth opened, letting me in for a deep kiss that lasted only two seconds before I pulled away. She looked at me, shocked and embarrassed. Why? I just wanted to. Come on, we still got the whole day left. Good for a date. Oh, okay. She smiled and linked arms with me as we took a stroll through the market. When morning of the next day came, I woke up a bit early and left the magisterium. I decided to stop by a certain apartment. I arrived just as the sun began to rise above the horizon, making the sky a faint blue, light beginning to wash away the fatigue of the night. And I waited outside the door. I seemed to have good timing, because not long later, Rayla appeared. She stiffened a bit when she saw me, but I just smiled and waved. Hey. Hey. What an unexpected surprise. Well, I haven't heard from you in almost two weeks. I thought I should check in. She was silent, standing there for a second before walking over and unlocking her door. We both walked into the dark apartment. I couldn't help but feel nostalgic as I looked around. It seemed the same, but it felt like I had last visited years ago. The first thing that caught my eye, though, were the six empty wine bottles sitting on her counter. It made me sigh. I knew she hadn't taken it that well. Sorry about the mess. It's fine. How's work been? Well, same as always. Although exciting, things don't exactly change much. Though, I've picked up a few jobs in the trenches. Seriously, I don't know how you managed all that time working there. I feel sick just thinking about that place. I can't say I had much choice. I guess I just because a bit numb to it after a little while. M.M. So, what brings you by? She asked while taking out another bottle of wine, popping the cork and pouring two glasses. I nodded when she handed me one, taking a sip before speaking. I wanted to ask, though I didn't expect things to go that way. What do you think of Amara? Her? She seems nice, but I was surprised to hear that you were dating the daughter of Duchess Teleria. I suppose I can only say that I'm impressed. Still, being her boyfriend will come with its difficulties. Yeah, it will. Things are calm now, but we're going to be attending a certain event soon. I've been told that it'll stir things up. Oh, what event? Her red eyes glanced at me curiously. It has something to do with the magisterium. Basically, it's a gathering of the noble students in the fourth year. I'm not exactly sure what its purpose is other than to socialize, but regardless, Amara and I will be appearing in an official capacity, which is apparently a big deal. I can imagine. She nodded softly before glancing down, seemingly lost in thought. I watched her for a few moments before continuing. Anyway, I just wanted to come here and make sure you were okay. I know my news came suddenly and in a crude fashion. Why wouldn't I be okay? I didn't respond to that, watching as she lifted her gaze and gave me the slightest smile. Why wouldn't she be okay? We both knew exactly why she wouldn't be, and it was obvious she wasn't. In fact, ever since we walked through the door, I felt nothing but distance from her. It was clear as day how she was already treating me differently, not to mention how she hadn't said a word to me since the day we came back from our trip. But she was making it seem like it was nothing like I had come over here, 
worried about her, for nothing. I felt a bit of indignation, but I didn't show any of that on my face. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't mine either. This was simply how she felt about the situation. Perhaps, all this time, she was hoping for a different outcome. Maybe she had spent all that time being friends with me in hopes that we would eventually take it a step further, that I would become willing to take that step. And now, I had shattered all hopes of that. I made it clear that we wouldn't go beyond anything other than good friends, and she was upset. For a while I stood there, processing a lot of different things, mainly about why I hadn't chosen her. Her trauma, the depressive atmosphere, our radically different paths in life, and how they would only continue to diverge until we stood in two entirely different worlds. For the foreseeable future, I would be fighting the scourge, whether it was at the magisterium or in the military. In my mind, I was prepared to be doing this for the next decade until I could reach whatever limits my talent had before retiring and perhaps working with Son. And Raylo would continue to remain in the capital at Divine Distribution, delivering packages and making tons of money until she finally decided to get a home and retire for good. Even if I wanted to, making our relationship work would be extremely difficult. For me, not entering the military wasn't really a choice, mainly because I felt called to fight the scourge. I wouldn't forsake that calling. Rayla had a lot of good points, but there were also many cons that weighed too far into the negative for me. It was unfortunate for her. I couldn't say that I was losing much. For me, it was simply a relationship that never came to be. For her, it was the loss of a potential lover who could replace her late husband. I wouldn't be him, and by now, I no longer felt sorry about that. I suppose that's why I so easily pursued Amara. So I wouldn't blame her, nor myself. After several seconds, I smiled at her. You're right. Never mind. I raised my glass as she stared at me, downing the rest of my wine before placing the empty glass on the table. Then, I turned and walked toward the door. I'm glad you're okay. Since I need to go to class soon, I'll take my leave. She was silent as I opened the door, but I didn't immediately leave. I lingered in the doorway for a bit before speaking. You know I'll always be there for you, right? Once again, I heard no response. So I left, closing the door behind me and walking away. I sighed while walking through the Capitol, taking out a cigar and lighting it. How unfortunate. Chapter 60. Dress. Flash. Hmm. Sitting in class, I suddenly felt something and reached into my pocket. I took out a golden card, my eyes widening. They're done. Hell yeah. I smiled and suddenly stood from my seat, walking across the classroom to leave. The teacher looked at me weirdly. John. Sorry, have some business. I smiled and waved while striding out. After running through the magisterium, I made my way out and toward the black spider market. I passed the key master on the way and before taking the elevator to the market where I found the unmarked black building. And inside at the reception desk, I saw Hans, my couturier. Ah, Mr. Cooper. I see you've made haste. Haha, ha, that's because I'm excited. I'm pleased. Go ahead and give him your card, and I'll take you to the back to try everything on. M.M. I nodded and placed the card on the reception desk, the concierge taking it as I walked off with Hans. He brought me to the same room as before where there was a single floating platform in the center, one that looked like it was made of light itself. On top of that small square platform were three rings. I stood before them, a bit confused. Hans explained. These three rings each contain your three suits. These rings are special in that by putting them on, you can easily equip each piece of your suit without so much as raising your finger. Each suit has been handcrafted to perfectly conform to your body, and by using that information we can develop rings tailored to dress you in but seconds. When activated, the rings can also store any clothing currently on you, allowing you to swap wardrobes at your convenience. Oh well. I was genuinely surprised. Talk about convenient. I was beginning to understand why all this costed so much. Go ahead and try the ring on the left. Sure. With a smile. I grabbed the leftmost ring and slipped it on my right index finger. After that, I could feel the ring make some kind of connection with me, so I tapped into that connection and activated it. And with a flash, I could feel the clothes on my body shift as my existing clothes were stripped and new clothes were placed onto me. I looked at the mirrors around me, seeing the least expensive suit that I had purchased. It felt amazingly comfortable, and it fit so well that I almost couldn't believe it. It was no different than a second skin. Not only that, but the special undergarments designed to pair with these suits was also equipped. After several seconds, I unequipped it and saw my original clothes reappear on my body. After that, I grabbed the second ring, and I saw the second most expensive suit appear. 
It looked exactly as it did before, if not better. I felt amazing seeing the intricate designs and deep colors. I also tried out a few of the other paled as, mesmerized by all the different ways this single suit could look. But I almost couldn't hold in my excitement when I tried on the last suit, a 300,000 coin piece of clothing. And when it appeared, I laughed. Han smiled beside me as I smiled as wide as I could. I felt like a damn king. But it wasn't long before I took the suit off. I would save its full glory for when it was time to show it off before other nobles. With that, I took all the rings, looking at Hans. Thank you, sir. I'm completely satisfied. You honor me. Just remember that those rings are capable of being stored within your spatial sack. Oh, even better. With surprise, I threw the rings into my spatial band eternally sitting on my arm. And they went in without issue, despite being something similar to spatial sacks themselves. Then, Hans bowed a bit. It's been a pleasure doing business with you, Mr. Cooper. I guarantee that even nobles will be awed by your presence. After all, not even royal tailors can surpass the art imbued within every strand of fabric composing my works. Indeed, you deserve that pride. I didn't deny him at all. It wasn't narcissism, but self-awareness to say that this man was a master at his craft. After that, we said our goodbyes. I left the building with a spring in my step, heading straight for the magisterium. It hadn't taken long at all to run this errand, but I wasn't planning on going back to classes. Instead, I simply decided to walk around the city for a bit. All right, gather around. After completing a scenario, the puppet master called all the teams. We all stood around, many teams looking battered. But it wasn't like he cared as he scratched his beard and spoke. The day after tomorrow, all of you will be attending that ball, so there won't be any training tomorrow. Take the day off and recover. Dismissed. Oh. Nice. I pursed my lips, happy with the news. Then, I looked at Amara. She stood by my side. She was tired, her creamy white face just a bit paler than normal, but otherwise untouched. I reached over and rubbed her back. Ready for that? Yeah. Are you? I don't see why I wouldn't be. I shrugged as we started walking off. At that moment, though, we both heard something. Fiden. It was a shout, so we turned and saw a girl running toward Fiden. He smiled as she caught up to his side, making my eyes flash in interest. Oh, look at these two. Did something happen? Hey, Vetsmon, did something happen? I turned toward the big man a little ways behind us, making him smile. Higi, he, he doesn't want to admit it, but I think he's taken a fancy to that girl. So he finally did it. Who is she? Rank 9, Valerie Revenon. She's the daughter of Marquis Revenon, so she stands equal to Fiden in status. She's also a knight who uses an axe. Well, she must be strong then. I nodded while watching them walk off, deciding that I would need to have a chat with Fiden. Well, the upcoming gathering would be a good opportunity. I turned back to Vetmon. You're going to be at the ball, right? I will. Good. I can't wait to see you all dressed up. Of course. I don't get to go to very many of these. I'll be bringing my best suit. Vetmon smiled widely, his large grin making me chuckle a bit. After talking a bit more, I walked off with Amara. The two of us went back to our rooms to clean up before meeting again in mine. We cuddled on the bed, and that's when I thought about the event some more. This event wasn't for all the fourth-year students. It was rather exclusive. Only nobles and the elites were allowed to be in attendance, and even then, an elite who wasn't a noble may not attend. It was supposed to be a noble party. The students would bring their parents and everyone would mingle for the night. The event would begin at sundown, and it would be nice enough to warrant my second-best suit. Not only that, but it was also the signal for the true start of the year. Certain elites and noble children who had yet to be seen would show up. For example, the rank one knight was supposed to make an appearance, and from then on, he would join us on our trips. Why they seemed to operate on another schedule, I had no idea. Regardless, there would be a lot of big names and powerful people there. And I would be faced with all of them in their scrutiny as Amara's new boyfriend. I could already imagine the pressure but I had no intention of shrinking away from it in any capacity. But there were still some things I needed to know like proper etiquette that Amara had been teaching me. I was able to pick up on most of it pretty easily, but there were some things that I simply didn't care to do. In fact, there was one thing I warned Amara of. I would refuse to bow my head to anyone, no matter who it was. She was confused by that, and I didn't explain myself very much. I basically left it at a difference in culture. Other than that though, I didn't mind following some basic decorum. Of course, I thought many things were simply excessive or idiotic, but I did my best. I couldn't be too rigid. 
I was rather excited for the event too. It was a new experience, being among nobility. While I had some biases, I understood that even in America, there was a world composed of the rich and famous that I couldn't fathom nor step foot into. Now, I would be getting a taste of it, stepping into it in an official capacity and facing all the consequences of that. Thankfully, my curiosity didn't go unsatisfied for long. A day and a half passed, and the evening of the event arrived. As the sun was setting, I was inside my room at the Black Spider Hotel. I looked at myself in the mirror. After simply showering and grooming my hair, I put on a ring and equipped my second best suit. It was an art piece, to say the least. The base color was black, and with a handkerchief, I changed all the accent colors to purple. The jacket had some designs across the chest, back, and sleeves. They struck the perfect balance between adding some tasteful art to it and keeping its noise down. Designs on something like a suit could be too much or overly eye-catching, but on this suit, each line was drawn with purpose and went no further than it needed to. As for the fancy vest underneath the jacket, it hugged my torso like a glove. Both it and the shirt were fitted to show off my build without restricting any movement. The pants were the same, not hugging my legs but also not flowing with much excess space. And everything had designs that matched the jacket. It seemed like the designs flowed into each other as well, drawing all the way down from my chest to my feet. I don't think I could ask for or conjure up a better suit besides my best one. I really didn't regret my purchase. And so, after dressing, I prepared a few more things and left my room. While in the elevator going down, I received a message. I didn't even have to look at it to know what it was. After arriving at the lobby, I saw the key master standing behind his desk as always. But there were also two other people nearby. The first was Duchess Teleria, the other being Amara. It seemed the Duchess was talking with the key master, but they stopped their conversation upon seeing me. Amara smiled knowingly, having already seen me in this suit. But the Duchess seemed surprised, looking me up and down as I approached. I greeted her. Good evening, Duchess. Yes, good evening, John. And good evening to you. You look stunning. I turned to Amara, taking her hand and kissing it while looking into her eyes. She currently wore a dress similar to the one she wore for our first date. It was subtly gorgeous like the last, except black was now its primary color instead of purple though it still had purple accents. It was meant to match my suit, something we had naturally agreed upon beforehand since being a couple demanded matching dress. She smiled a bit bashfully, her face turning rosy. Thank you. You look handsome too. Now I feel like the underdressed one. You can't say that when you'll still be catching all the eyes. Ahem. I lifted my head when I heard the Duchess interruption. She looked at me with a smirk. I see you found a good couturier. How much did it cost you? Just this suit was 150,000 coin, and it isn't even the best. I see. Well, if you're in that, you'll have no trouble. Now come, we need to head over. All right. I nodded, but before leaving, I turned back to my favorite concierge. I appreciate you, Key Master. You have a good night. Likewise, John. Enjoy your night. He gave me a wave as I left with the Duchess, and faintly I could feel her watching us in the corner of her eye. Like that. We made our way outside where there was a huge, fancy carriage waiting. It was emboldened with the regalia of the Duchess herself, making a very clear indication of the personage inside, and the interior was lavish. Upon entry, I sat on one side with Amara while the Duchess sat on the other side across from us. It was large enough to fit two couches and still have plenty of legroom. She stared at us with a small smile, embarrassing Amara a bit. But I could also feel how Amara stood her ground, not shrinking back or hiding from it. In fact, since I saw her in the lobby, I could feel the confidence and sense of nobility she gave off. Tonight, she wouldn't be allowed to show any kind of shame or embarrassment. There was no room for weakness, and I had to match her. Not that I needed to be told. Regardless of her presence, I would never carry myself as anything less than the best. I didn't give a damn what anyone else thought of me, and they would know that. This was simply what we had to do, because although I didn't like it, our relationship was subject to public opinion. The degree at which it affected us was up to the Duchess, but if we didn't show her that we were serious, she may step in. Technically, there was absolutely nothing stopping her from ending our relationship whenever she wanted. It was only her respect for her daughter's choices and her opinion of me that was keeping her at bay. But if either of those things went away, then we were done. This was all stuff that Amara and I had discussed. Honestly though, I quite liked the challenge. It made things fun and exciting. I liked how cute Amara looked too heading to the event as if about to declare war. And soon, we arrived at the venue. 
The Mansion of Duke Yatrakarian, the President of the Magisterium. Chapter 61 Hasn't even begun. When we arrived at the mansion, we were directly ushered to the front of a long line of carriages. A duchess naturally couldn't be forced to wait, so when we stopped, we directly stepped out onto a tiled stone path. Amara held my arm as we walked up the entrance, and at the door was the president himself, Yatra Karian. He was dressed in a grand white suit and side cape. His presence was valiant, like a general who a million soldiers might follow into battle. I couldn't help but notice though how he was actually my height. When he smiled at the duchess, I could sense faint superiority. It wasn't malicious, but simply a matter of fact. Although Carrion and Teleria were equal in status and authority, it seemed there was more than met the eye which might deepen a divide between them. But the Duchess didn't seem to care, simply approaching him, as if they were two friends meeting for a drink. Greetings, Duchess. I'm glad you could grace us with your presence tonight. I'm glad you're having us, Duke Carrion. Please, allow me to show you in. Carrion waved, guiding us into his home and toward the event area. There were two halls that would be the focus of tonight's gathering. One seemed to contain all the parents and guardians, while the other would be where the students themselves mingled. Of course, there was nothing stopping anyone from moving between, but it seemed that the parents wanted to maintain some distance and allow their children to take care of themselves. We didn't walk for long. At some point, we arrived in the hall where more parents than students resided. Carrion led the Duchess to a table, and once there, I felt him turn to look at Amara and I, or, more specifically me. I could feel his curious gaze on me, his aura a bit stifling from so close. You're John Cooper, right? I've heard many things about you. Your performance thus far has been eye-catching. Oh, thank you, your grace. But I could never do as well as I have without the support of my squad. I have them to thank for keeping me safe. Indeed. As a summoner, you naturally rely more on your team. Nevertheless, you've become an elite in record time. It is lucky that you earned your spot so quickly. For some time, I had been worried that you were biting off more than you could chew considering you were directly inserted into the fourth-year class, not to mention working with the elites while lacking merits. I'm glad that you are at least up to standard and won't hold your team back. Thanks. For a second, I was a bit baffled. Could he at least try to hide his attitude? I could almost taste the derision. The night hadn't even begun. After I gave a late response, Carrion faced Amara, who was also a bit jarred by his obvious distaste. Amara, it's good to see you well. I can imagine your mother has taught you plenty in the way of spell formations. Enough to put me to sleep, your grace. Haha, -ha, indeed. I don't know how you warlocks manage. Still, I hope your amazing progress can continue through the year. It would be a shame to get distracted by those unworthy of your time and fall behind all those who are about to emerge. Indeed, your grace. Thankfully, the people around me are more than worthy of my time and attention. Hmm. Carrion nodded as Amara tightened her grip on my arm a bit. Suddenly, I wasn't smiling as much. I looked the Duke straight in the eye, but all I got in return was a dismissive glance. It seemed the president was a passive-aggressive asshole. How fun. After a second or two, Carrion turned to the Duchess and gave her a smile. I'll take my leave. Please, enjoy your night. Likewise. She nodded back as he walked off. I also watched his back as he disappeared from the hall. When he finally left my field of view, Amara mumbled. His son was one of my suitors. Oh. So he's bitter. Nice. I chuckled a bit, my mood being boosted. It seemed my very presence here would piss people off, but I was okay with that. Although the Duchess' support couldn't be wholly relied on, seeing how she did nothing to defend me from the President's verbal attacks, that didn't mean that I couldn't somewhat use it. No matter what, I was with her daughter. The name Teleria demanded a certain level of respect. To slander my name would be fine, but Amara couldn't be easily touched and there was only so much they could do or say to me without also slandering Amara. I had a certain bubble of protection, but I knew that to some people, that simply wouldn't matter. I couldn't wait to meet those people. A grin appeared on my face as the Duchess suddenly tapped Amara's shoulder. Go mingle. I'll call for you if I need it. Okay. She responded before the two of us walked off to the other hall. Our carriage didn't arrive until well after the stated arrival time, so there were already plenty of people here and I recognized many faces, including those of my squad. I saw Fiden, that's Mon, and Tana lingering around one of the tables, and they all stood when we walked in. John. Hey guys. Damn, you look good. Vets Mon came over and pat my shoulder while checking out my suit. I just laughed a bit as his huge paw hit me like a hammer. Thanks man. You look good too. Well, 
It's my best suit. I initially thought it might be too much, but now that you're here, I don't have to worry. He took a step back as if admiring a work of art. I checked him out at the same time. Instead of black like mine, his suit was pure white with blue trim and designs on it. There was also a symbol on his chest of what I could only assume was his peerage. The white made it a bit flashy, but otherwise, it wasn't particularly spectacular. Still, with how large he was, I couldn't help but think there was nothing else to look at but this bright statue of a man. After that greeting, I looked at Fiden. His suit was a bold maroon with some black designs across it, literally the opposite of Vetsman's suit. It was slim and defined his figure, making him look like some kind of devilish lady killer with that pretty face of his. And then there was Tana. I was surprised at how pretty she looked as she wore a medium-length green dress with some frills. Her blonde hair was curled and done up in a bun as well. She looked refined, contrary to how she normally was while fighting. In fact, it was such a stark difference that she looked older, like a mature woman. I smiled and nodded at her. Good evening, Tana. Hi, John. Nice of you to finally show. Fashionably late. I smiled and gave her a hug. Fiden chimed in after, coming over and giving me a handshake. With a suit like that, I can understand. How much did that thing cost? Take a guess. Hmm, 20,000. Nope. 50. Nope. 80. Nope. 110. Getting closer. 150. Bingo. I laughed and smacked his shoulder while he gawked. Vetsman and Tana looked shocked too. If only they knew that was just a fraction of the true bill. Even Amara sighed knowingly. Are you actually a noble? I'm not. The fact that a normal man has a better suit than most nobles here speaks volumes. I wouldn't exactly call him normal. All right. I'm getting food. Dodging their banter, I left Amara with the group to go grab some snacks. Dinner was supposed to be served here, and I didn't intend to let the good food go to waste out of pedantic decorum. There were a dozen long tables just filled with all kinds of meats and delicacies that were calling my name. So I loaded myself a huge plate, grabbed a drink, and went back to the table my squad had claimed. The others had also gotten food, and deciding she didn't want to be the odd one out, Amara ended up getting some too. So for a while, we all sat and ate while observing all those around us. I especially was keeping an eye out. Ever since I had walked into the mansion, I felt like I was constantly being stared at. And few of the gazes were merely curious. I felt hostility, mostly from those I didn't know. As for the elites, I knew most of them, and we were relatively friendly. So unless they were just being two-faced, then I shouldn't have much issue with them. But the unfamiliar outnumbered the acquaintances. There seemed to be plenty of nobles that hated my presence here, especially by Amara's side. I didn't know why they had issues with me when most of them probably never had anything to do with Amara anyway, but I also knew that some people simply didn't need a reason to hate somebody. I could disregard it for the most part, simply ignoring everything I felt through my aura but I had to admit that it was irritating. Unfortunately, the night hadn't even started. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Suddenly, President Carrion stepped up to a podium, overlooking all his guests with a bright smile. I thank everyone who has graced this annual event with their presence. Tonight is a celebration of a new year and the beginning of a long road of achievement for all those talented enough to make it to their fourth year at the Magisterium. Some familiar faces are also coming back to participate in the upcoming excursions. We welcome them as well as those who have recently joined the ranks of elites through great feats of strength. Clap, clap. Everyone applauded as he paused, going for a few seconds before settling. After that, he gave the rest of his opening speech, little of which I cared to listen to. And once he was done, a nearby stage was populated with some musicians who started to play music. With that, everyone began to mingle, walking between tables and chatting with familiar friends. Sorry, I'm going to go say hi to someone. Tana stood from her seat suddenly walking off to go greet what looked like a good friend. Not even ten seconds after, a girl walked over. She was dressed in a slim red dress, a simple one without any frills or designs on it. Yet, she still looked amazing. She walked over to Fiden, tapping his shoulder. Hi. Oh, Valerie. Fiden quickly stood, giving the girl a hug before both of them turned to us. Valerie waved. Hello. Nice to meet you all. Good evening. Hello. We all smiled back, Valerie looking between us and Fiden. I was, hoping we could grab a drink. Oh. Fiden didn't immediately respond, looking toward us first as if we needed to give him our approval. I scoffed a bit. What, are you going to say no? Hurry up and take care of your lady. All right. 
Fiden scratched his head in embarrassment before putting his arm out and letting Valerie take it. As they walked off, Valerie gave me one last smile and wave, which I returned. Vetsmon chuckled as they disappeared. What a good friend. Hey, you guys did it for me. Isn't that right? Why yeah? Omara dodged my smile as I hugged her. Getting some alone time was always essential for a budding relationship. Sometimes, friends just needed to take a step back and let things happen. Of course, there were the exceptions. Fiden had to be led around. Thankfully, it seemed that Valerie had a good grasp on that and took the initiative, otherwise Fiden would sit in a corner all night by himself. After that, it was just Amara and I plus Vetmon. Just when I started to get worried about the third wheel though, Vetsmon stood and pat my shoulder. Hey, I want you to meet my parents. Your parents? At least take me to dinner first. Haha, <laughs> come on. I've told them about you and they're curious. All right, all right. Amara, you go on ahead. Amara unlinked her arm from mine, smiling. I have some friends to meet too. Okay, I'll find you later then. M.M. She waved as I walked off with Vetmon. The two of us crossed halls, heading to where all the adults were lounging. There were some students there as well, talking with relatives or the parents of friends. Most people here knew each other in some fashion, so there was lots of social activity. And around one table, there was a group of adults dressed in white. I took a guess and assumed that they were all related to the church in some way. We approached, catching their gaze. Once there, Vetsmon spoke. Mom, Dad, this is John. Ah, Mr. Cooper. Our son has spoken a lot about you. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. I shook the hand of a man and woman, both of which were rather huge. Vetsmon was pushing seven feet tall himself, and it seemed he got that from his father, because the man was just as big. He looked more grizzled, though. If Vetsmon were a pure man, then his father was a veteran who looked like he'd seen it all. Through his brown beard and bushy eyebrows was a deep gaze that almost looked like a thousand-yard stare but he still seemed relatively lively as he smiled while shaking my hand. As for the mother, I honestly thought she was Vetsman's sister. She looked amazingly young. The only indication of her age was the way she carried herself. But even that was overshadowed by her smile which made her seem like a youthful woman in her prime. Seeing her out of context, I wouldn't place her a day over 25. She was dressed in a white dress with lace sleeves covering her arms. It was modest but she was without a doubt a beautiful woman no lesser than any other noblewoman here. However, she was as tall as I was, throwing me off a bit when she stood. This whole Verga family was a bunch of giants. After greeting them, I looked toward the others. Vetman's father introduced them. These are the parents of another fourth year. He's not an elite, so I'm not sure if you'd know him. Probably not. But it's nice to meet you all anyway. Likewise. I shook hands with another pair of parents. After that, Vetsmon and I sat down at the table. Mr. Verga spoke. So, John, are your parents here? Oh. No, they aren't. Ah, unfortunate. But I can understand. Being in the presence of so many nobles must be suffocating. Especially for you. Even we've heard rumors about you and the daughter of Duchess Teleria. There are a lot of very unhappy suitors here. Yes, there are. I suppose it's quite unfortunate for them, suffering where I've succeeded. Hoo-hoo. How bold. He gave a deep chuckle. Even his wife couldn't help the smile. She chimed in. You're not a fan of nobles, are you, John? Well, I didn't have much of an issue before. But I haven't even been here an hour, and they've already gotten on my bad side. So yes, my already low fondness is decreasing into the negative. Yes, I can understand. In recent years, the noble class hasn't been kind to those of the church either. All I can say is, they're going to find an issue with you anyway. So if you can't avoid the hate... I may as well do as I please anyway, feelings be damned. Exactly. She almost shouted in agreement, making me laugh a bit as her husband pat her shoulder. You're getting excited. Ahem, I'm fine. Anyway, there's no reason you shouldn't just continue. But do be careful. There are very few things a noble won't dare to do to a commoner when they're upset, regardless of your relationships. So if you need help then just call my son, he'll give you some assistance. That's right. Can't let anyone touch the best summoner in the magisterium. Vetsmon smacked my shoulder, causing me to grunt at the heavy impact. Yeah, thanks. So you're a summoner, John? What type? Mrs. Verga suddenly asked, causing me to turn to her with a bit of curiosity. I'm a cold summoner. Oh, I'm a cold summoner too. John's summons are amazingly lethal. He has even more killing power than I do. Vetsmon explained a bit, and with each word, his mother became more interested 
staring at me with brightening spirit as if meeting a long-lost friend. Chapter 62 Escalate I let Vetsman explain my guns from his own perspective. His mother listened intently the entire time before chiming in. So your summons are ranged. Mine primarily consist of swords, but I can also summon spears and knives. Look. She waved her hand, and in it appeared a knife. It was masterfully crafted, looking like it was carved from some kind of obsidian rock. The blade was so sharp that I felt like it could cut me from a distance. And the golden hilt had intricate carvings across its body, including some inserted gems. These knives herald from some other world, and that world contains master craft is even better than those from here. Another world? Why do you say that? Well, I've retrieved many weapons with unfamiliar writing. Even this knife has it. It's definitely a language, but even after searching I've found no language in our world's history that looks like this. I see. I nodded as she showed me some of the script engraved onto the flat of the blade. I also couldn't recognize it, but it definitely wasn't something randomly generated. This meant that all summons came from another world, and well, my very existence also backed that theory up. After a bit of thinking, I also took out one of my summons, a Colt 1911. Here, this is what mine looks like. Oh, I've never seen anything like this. How does it work? Well, bullets are inserted here, and this hammer slams down to fire it out of the barrel when you pull the trigger. I showed off several parts of the gun, taking out the magazine and racking the slide a few times to show how it worked. Her eyes sparkled as she watched. Amazing. Well, it seems your summons are built for the express purpose of fighting at a range. That's good. If it were like mine, you wouldn't be able to do much. Did you fight in the military? Briefly. I've risen to Authority 9, but even with legendary weapons, I was never able to do much. Most of my fighting was done in my early years. After that I married my husband and left for the church. However, there was indeed a special technique I used that kept me valuable in the military. John, did you know that summoners are actually able to pass off their cold summons to others? That's possible? My eyes widened a bit. It wasn't a topic widely discussed, mainly because there was nothing to say about it. A cold summoner's weapons couldn't be utilized beyond their body. I had figured this out rather early. If a weapon were to fall out of my hand or get thrown, then it would disappear as soon as it left a certain boundary around my body, going straight back into the dimension. The only exceptions to this were the fired bullets and more recently my grenades. But even the bullet shells and magazines would vanish when dropped. There was simply no way for me to hand off a weapon to someone like Amara. But it seemed like Vetman's mother was capable of doing the impossible. If she could hand her legendary weapons to a knight, then that knight would have their combat power boosted significantly and cold summoners would become walking armories. Something like that would change the entire dynamic of the summoner class. They would become some of the most valuable magi around. And in a way, being able to do something like that made sense. As Mrs. Verga just said, what good was a legendary weapon if it couldn't be used by a suitable warrior? So then, what point was there to having summoners? They seemed good for nothing other than being smart. But if this were possible, then that wouldn't be the case. Cold summoners, the most useless and weakest summoners, would bring weapons from other worlds to equip the warriors of this world against the Scourge. I wanted to know more about this, but my hopes were quashed when I saw Mr. Verga place a hand on his wife's shoulder. Dear, please don't spill the church's secrets so easily. It's not a secret, though. And it's not like I was going to teach him anything. Huh. John, I apologize. My wife gets excited and doesn't realize when she's speaking about things she shouldn't. Oh, no, that's fine. Anyway, tell me about your trips. I've heard that your squad encountered plenty of beasts during your time. The topic was changed, and I reluctantly went with it. Betsman chimed in as I continued to think about the implications of what was said. And the only conclusion I could come to was that, if cold summoners learned to master such a technique allowing them to share their weapons, it would lead to a system where summoners, although valuable, were destined to be used no different from the weapons they conjured. This would naturally introduce a significant amount of conflict involving the fate of the class and that would be the reason why such a thing might be kept a secret by the summoners who would know about it, or at least, why they wouldn't investigate it thoroughly. I thought about my own views on it for a while, but after about an hour, I suddenly got a message on my aerial. It was from Amara. Come help me. Well shit. I cursed and stood from my seat, catching everyone's attention. Vetsman asked. What's wrong? Amara wants help. It seems like it's time to draw some lines in the sand. Do you need help? No. I've got some experience dealing with people. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to deal with this. I spoke while buttoning my suit, 
adjusting myself before walking off. I crossed into the other hall and looked around at all the noble students. And at one particular corner, there was a group of men huddled rather close together. With a sigh I walked over, crossing the entire hall with an unhurried stride. As I did so, I could sense an increasing amount of gazes falling on me. And as I got closer, I could hear Amara's voice. There was no panic or fear in it, simply annoyance as she dismissed all their attempts at conversation or ignored their questions. So since my girlfriend was being hounded by a bunch of men who couldn't take a hint, I wasn't polite to them. I looked toward one man a few inches shorter than me. He had mana within his body, so he was the first I reached out for. My hand went for the back of his neck, gripping it so hard that he let out an involuntary yell. Ack, what the hell? Back off, please. I said that and threw him behind me, disregarding whether or not he went tumbling to the floor. As for the others, I put my hand on their chests and pushed them aside. Hey. Hi. Amara. Let's go. I grabbed Amara's hand after shoving another man off to the side, opening a gap she could slip out of. And then I started to walk away. Right as I did though, I felt my free arm get grabbed by the wrist. My immediate action was to let go of Amara and pull out my pistol, pointing it while turning around. And I met the eyes of a familiar individual. A knight, or as I knew him, my unwelcome mailman. He was the one who had delivered my welcoming letter on my first day at the magisterium. Having had a rude awakening and considering he had been a total asshole who threatened me, I ended up placing a gun against his head to drive him off. Later, I had found out that he was ranked 20 on the elites, someone who went by Raven and had the nickname Severing Blade. He was blonde like Fiden and was generally handsome, but he carried himself like he was above all. Still, when I saw him again, I smiled a bit. Well, isn't it my delivery boy? Come to give me another letter. Excuse me. Ah, you said that back then too. So? Where's my letter, boy? You've got a loose tongue. He snarled and started tightening his grip. It wasn't much for him, but I could feel my forearm begin to compress more than I'd like. So I frowned and placed my gun right in front of his eye socket. Be careful, or I'll do what I said back then too, and tear your pretty face a third hole. You just harassed a noble, and you think you can just walk away? I think you need to learn your place, John Cooper. You're a commoner, nothing more. Yeah? Is that why I so easily passed up your rank in the elites? I gotta say, I was disappointed to learn that you were so low on the board. You son of a dash. Hey. Amara stepped in just as Raven started to tighten his grip again. I could feel my arms start to tremble as pain racked my bones. Raven, back off. Amara, are you really dating this disfigured troglodyte? I could name a dozen men off the top of my head who were better in every way than this fiend. What, like you? John already has a higher kill count than you and he started just last month. I'll be coming back, so it'll be easy to surpass him. Surpass me. I chimed back in with a chuckle. You had a year's head start, and you still fell behind. Did you have your thumb up your ass the whole time? Watch yourself, peasant. You're nothing more than a cold summoner, and you're in the hands of a knight. I have you at my mercy, so if you want to feel as your arm is slowly crushed in my palm, just keep talking. I think you're the one who's misunderstanding the situation here, dickweed. I lowered my voice as my arm felt like it was going to fracture. You may have my arm, but I have your fucking life. If you did your fucking research, then you'd know that there is nothing you can do in this very moment to save yourself if I wanted to kill you where you stand. Do not make the mistake of thinking that I jumped into the elites out of luck, or that you are in any way stronger than I am. So, let go of my arm. Or break it, and watch as I tear your fucking face in half. We were both silent while staring at each other, the stalemate continuing. I usually wouldn't be so aggressive, but being in the hands of a knight as a normal man was one step short of signing my life away. There was a reason I never let it happen, habits ingrained into me after spending long enough in the trenches. The few times that I wasn't able to do so, I was very close to dying and relied on my coat's powers to save me. And I didn't have my coat on, so to put it lightly, the fear for my safety was screaming at me to simply put a bullet in his brain. But the reasonable part of me was suppressing that fear and keeping my itchy finger in check, making sure I wouldn't make an irreversible decision. But then, right as I wondered if he would really crush my bones into splinters, I heard a voice. Get your hands off of him. Who? Ugh. Fiden flew in like a shooting star, grabbing Raven's face and relinquishing his grip on my arm. And with righteous justice, he picked him up by his head and slammed him into the ground face first. Boom. Ouch. I cringed a bit as the floor was cracked by Raven's hard head. Simultaneously, while I sighed a bit in relief, Vetsmon ran in from behind. Are you okay, John? Yeah, I'm fine. 
are you? Amara spoke and grabbed the arm that Raven had been squeezing, pushing up my sleeve. I flinched at the pain, and once rolled up, I could see my forearm now purple from wrist to elbow. Shit, did he break it? He what? Fiden lifted his head at Amara's words before gritting his teeth and looking back down at Raven. In his hands, Raven seemed like nothing more than a rag doll to be yanked around on a whim, like he was an ordinary man and not a knight. You're going to pay for that. Bang. Ack. Fiden sent out a punch straight into Raven's face, instantly creating a bruise as blood flew out of his nose. Then he shifted his focus and lifted his foot, slamming his heel down onto Raven's arm. We could all hear it. Pop. Ah. Foo dash. Listen to me very carefully. Fiden grabbed Raven's face just as he started to scream, turning his head toward him. Touch our summoner again, and I'll tear your damn arm off. That goes for everyone here. If John doesn't kill you first, then I'll hunt you down and make you regret ever hurting him. He is so drunk. I mumbled in surprise. I had never seen Fiden so angry before. So although his flushed face seemed to be due to anger, I could definitely tell that he had more than a few drinks. The next moment, though, there was another voice that interrupted Fiden's ramblings. What's going on? The president came walking over with measured steps. Next to him was the puppet master, surprisingly. Seeing them, Fiden tossed Raven aside, standing up and adjusting himself so he looked proper again. The puppet master watched Raven's tumbling body before ignoring him and glancing at me, seeing my arm. Is it broken? Almost. H.M. Thank you for not shooting. Pay for the healing and we'll call it even. All right. Just go find Vizen at the hospital. Tell him I sent you. He nodded without question, causing President Carrion's eyebrows to raise. A moment later, though, the president took in the sight of a beaten raven, frowning. John Cooper, you started this altercation after blatantly attacking your fellow students. That's grounds for punishment. Wait. I was being harassed, and John was just helping me. Amara stepped in front of me, her very presence acting as a shield. But he gave no more than a cursory response, as if she had nothing to do with the situation. I can hardly call a conversation harassment, Lady Omara. On the other hand, throwing a student to the floor and threatening the life of another is unacceptable behavior at this institution. But President, John didn't dash. This isn't up for discussion. The President shot a glare at Fiden right as he tried to explain, his aura exuding a deep pressure that nobody around could refute. Fiden had no choice but to retreat. Not even Amara could say anything. Despite me having done the least amount of damage and having actually gotten hurt, he was clearly targeting me and wouldn't stand for any challenges to his authority. But by this point, I was already beginning to see red. These nobles were really starting to push all the right buttons. Hey, President. John. Omara turned around, perhaps warning me after sensing how pissed I was. But my patience for bullshit was run through a while ago. Sure enough, the president turned to me with that high and mighty grin of his. It was a good thing that he wasn't any taller than me. I could face him on equal grounds. What is it, Mr. Cooper? Perhaps you would like to offer an apology to Raven? Please, I would sooner shoot myself in the foot. In fact, I should be offering you the chance to apologize to me. Hmm. The president was surprised by my words, and it was clear from his frown that he found them to be quite insulting. I continued before he could refute. I was grabbed by a knight. You might not understand, but a summoner like myself feels very threatened when a knight manages to get a hold on them. Any normal summoner would be at their mercy, not to mention how my arm feels half broken right now. You see that? I raised my arm, exposing the swelled bruise that was my left forearm. I could barely clench my fist without shooting pains. Regardless, the evidence was clear. I was injured because you failed to uphold order in a timely manner. More than that, a student from your magisterium has obviously failed to learn not to threaten or attack their fellow students, especially while at a party. That responsibility falls on your shoulders. So perhaps an apology is in order, to myself and Amara for being harassed, and to all the other students here who may have been failed in their education at your institution. Be careful, Cooper. To dare question my ability makes me question your right to be at my institution at all. Ho ho, President, you're misunderstanding something. I chuckled a bit as his aura started to become more ominous. I'm not questioning anything. The bruise on my arm is hard evidence. The only reason it's there is because of your oversight. There has been no such thing. And I will not stand for your slander or accusations. And I won't stand for your prejudice. You don't want accusations? Then put your dog on a fucking leash, or don't be surprised when I put him down after he ruins my nice night. Now, I think you're the one misunderstanding something. 
The president suddenly stepped forward, pressuring me with his presence, standing less than a foot away. My jaw clenched a bit. He was a knight, not to mention a duke at Authority Eleven. He could kill me with less than his fingernail, and I could clearly feel that looming death over me through his aura. But I continued to look him straight in the eye as he growled with a low voice that only I could seem to hear. You are a student at my magisterium and a guest at my mansion. In both places, you have no authority nor right to dictate the law. I alone hold that right. My word is king here. And your very existence is a disturbance, let alone your feeble attempts at maligning my name. That's feeble? And yet it still gets you so worked up. Compared to that, your ridiculous attempts at pinning the blame on me are outright pathetic. I'm starting to doubt whether or not your word really is law. Yet another failure at educating your students. Then to teach you, I'll give you a 10-day suspension. You can take that time to reflect. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Speak more, and I'll simply expel you from the magisterium. Hey. I smirked, almost willing to take up the offer. Before I could talk more though, Amara stepped in between us under the eyes of everyone in the venue. Stop. President, let's not cross the line. Amara, do not tarnish your name by stooping to defend him. And do not tarnish yours by acting like you're a king, even within your institution. Your hospitality here has led to nothing but harassment toward me and injury toward my boyfriend. Do not make the blunder of thinking you can treat the daughter of Duchess Teleria in such a manner, nor the mistake of thinking that my boyfriend should not receive the same respect I demand as my equal. You've already done and said enough, so let's put a stop to this now before this escalates into something most undesirable. Everyone was silent, including me, but not out of a cold attitude. I was surprised. I had never seen Amara step up and demand the respect inherent to her name. She didn't ever flaunt her status, so this was a first for me. And she was protecting me from President Carrion. While she was assuming the authority of her mother, she technically had the right to. It was her birthright as the daughter of a duchess. She held status within the wonderful world of nobles. And within that world, she could demand certain things and make others take a step back, or outright bend to her will. Only someone like President Carrion couldn't be cold by her words, but he also couldn't disregard her. If he pushed any more, then he would be invoking her mother by insulting her authority. And as she said, such a thing would escalate a situation that didn't need to be. But there was also a slight complication. She was doing it on behalf of a commoner, so if he took a step back, it would be no different from admitting that I held the high ground. His pride wouldn't allow him to. And sure enough, he didn't take a step back. We continued to stare eye to eye, equal in height, but not equal in presence. Maybe I had won the battle of words, but at a certain point, that didn't mean anything. Still, it spoke volumes about his own character. I thought, if I were at that level of power, and some could not even half my age came up to me and started challenging me, I wouldn't give him the time of day. The fact that he got so offended and enraged by my words only helped me understand that in their mind I was so far beneath them that to even attempt to besmirch their name was unacceptable and I wasn't surprised. Dictators didn't tend to accommodate criticism. But, despite my insistence on escalating this situation thus far, I could tell that it was time for me to take a step back. With Amara having stepped in, I couldn't only think about myself. So with a smile, I gave the president a wink before turning around. Glancing around, I could see that every eye, both adult and student, was on us. We had attracted quite a bit of attention, though I wasn't sure how much everyone heard. Still, this would be a story that got passed down for a while. I didn't know whether I felt good about it or not. I was simply challenging the unexpected tyranny of the magisterium's president. Where I came from, such a thing was not just allowed, but expected. To defy corruption is a virtue. After seeing a few familiar faces, I found the Duchess. She stood in the center of the doorway between the two halls, watching us with a neutral face, as if she were unconcerned about anything going on. I wondered, was she just apathetic to a squabble, even if it involved her own daughter? Or was she testing us? She didn't hide her intentions to ensure that I would be able to handle life among nobles. It came with the position of Amara's boyfriend. So perhaps making sure that I wouldn't simply bend over at the slightest threat from a noble was a part of why she didn't interfere. Then again, I took this quite a bit further than it should have. It was intentional, but that also meant that her opinion of me may not be very high. Oh well. The only thing I could do now is leave. I surely wasn't welcome. I took measured steps out of the hall toward the exit. My shoes were the only things to make a sound as I did so. Halfway there though, I heard the president's voice. I don't go back on my word. If I see you on magisterium grounds before 10 days are over, I will expel you on sight. I didn't respond. 
I didn't even acknowledge him with my gaze. I just kept walking. I felt incredibly isolated as I approached the exit. Before I could leave though, there was another pair of feet that scampered on over to my side. I looked and saw Fiden catch up to me. Then, Vetsman ran over as well. He was followed by Amara. As for Tana, well, I hadn't actually seen her in a while. I wasn't sure where she was. So the four of us walked out the door. We were silent for a while as we walked the stone path through the mansion gates and onto the street. Before going any farther, I stopped and turned to the others. You guys don't have to worry about me. I ruined my night, not yours. You can stay. Stay just to get fucking surrounded by guys again? No thanks. Amara spitefully rejected, causing Vetmon to chuckle. Hey, I wasn't really having fun either. I don't have many friends besides you guys. I would probably spend the rest of my night talking with my parents. Me too. Fiden chimed in after him. Hearing their excuses, I just smirked. Well, you guys don't get the 10-day vacation. You mean suspension? Same difference. You know, I've never heard of someone getting suspended from the Magisterium before. I guess you'll be famous as the first. Vetsman pat my shoulder with his bare paw, making me flinch. Yeah, I guess. You also challenged the president. That's definitely never been done. I thought you were going to get kicked out on the spot. Amara mumbled, going quiet for a second before suddenly punching my non-injured arm. Oh. Why? You scared me. You were reckless. We're supposed to leave the Magisterium together, and you just went and challenged the authority of the Magisterium's president in his own home. And it wasn't even necessary. Not true. What? How is that not true? We could have just let it be and left. Why did you have to talk back? You said it yourself. Carrion was speaking as if he were the king. He's drunk on power, and he needed a slap to the face to bring him down a notch. Doing so is absolutely necessary, and apparently I have to be the one to do it since nobody besides you seem to have the balls to. Besides, I told you that I don't stand for that kind of bullshit, no matter who it comes from. Amara went silent, remembering my earlier words. I took out my cigar case with a sigh, preparing a stogie. The president is an old bitter asshole because his son is a little bitch who can't get a girl, so he holds a grudge against me and twisted the situation to pin all the blame on me. Not to mention how I'm a commoner who dared to speak to a noble like him that way. Unfortunately, he made it too easy to call him out not expecting that I would, so he got butt hurt when I did. Hey, it was quite satisfying seeing him so pissed off. You should try it sometime. I think I'll pass. Amara smiled a bit, taking a calming breath. She gently linked her arm with mine, resting her head on my shoulder. I understand why you did all that, and I thank you. But if we want to stay together, you need to avoid getting expelled, even though I never thought such a thing would ever be an issue. Even if just for me, I ask that you try to exercise a bit more restraint from now on, at least in front of people like the president who can take things away from you. I suppose I can do that. Thank you. In exchange, I'll take care of all the dogs who can't seem to leave me alone. Kiki, woof. Be bad guy. I laughed while hugging her from behind, planting a kiss on her cheek and making her go red. Chapter 63 Tease After walking down a few streets, I took out my cigar case and lit a stoga. The breath of smoke I took and washed over my body, dampening the pain of my arm. After that, Amara paused and looked at her aerial. Tana just texted me. She's wondering where we are. If she doesn't want to stay, then she can come find us. If she does, though, just let her be. She says she's with Valerie. They want to join us. Oh. All right, then. I shrugged, finding a building to hang around. A few minutes passed like that, and soon, the two girls found us. Hey, guys. Hi, Tana. Hey, Fiden. Valerie walked over, cutely taking up a spot beside Fiden. He smiled at her, but noticing my gaze, he got a bit embarrassed. I laughed as he scratched his head with a red face. He was probably still a bit tipsy. So, what happened? Tana asked, prompting Vetmon to explain. When he finished, she looked at me incredulously. Why would you talk back to the president? That's suicide. I don't care. Besides, I'll be back soon enough. Still, the president is one of the most powerful and respected people in the entire kingdom, and you brought embarrassment to his mansion. That can't end well. You'll become the target of every noble's ire. I think I already was. I let out a breath accompanied by a long plume of smoke. At this point, I honestly didn't care what happened. In my mind, I thought about the worst case scenario. If I got expelled from the magisterium, while well, I would be left with a bad record, it wasn't like I couldn't go and make money. It also wouldn't stop me from joining the military where I could follow Amara. 
and I was pretty sure that the church was also an avenue from what Maxwell had told me, though I wasn't sure exactly what they did. So the magisterium was really just a way to gain experience and time to advance my authority. It was in no way my lifeline. I could always fall back on something, and that put me in the position where I could shove a middle finger in the president's face and not regret it. I was quite satisfied with my actions back then. It was fun telling tyrannical authority to go eat a dick. Tana smiled wryly. All right, so you're suspended, and we've all left the party. What now? The party was boring anyway. How about we find a nightclub? A nightclub? I've never been to one. Me neither. First time for everything. Come on. I know a good one. Wait, what about your arm? Amara stopped me with an important reminder before I could lead the way, causing me to chuckle a bit. Oh, right? Here, I'll send you all the location. Head over there and I'll meet up with you guys later. It shouldn't take me that long to get patched up. I'll go with you. Amara stepped up, and in the moment I just shook my head. You can stay. I'll be right back. No, I want to go with you. All right, fine. I shrugged and started walking off with her as the others made their way to the nightclub. Since I didn't feel like walking the distance, I hailed a carriage and had it take me to the Golden Trading Post. That's where we entered the Founders Market. Heading to the hospital I frequented since going to the Magisterium to cash in on the Puppet Master's offer was now off the table. Along the way, we also changed into our regular set of clothes. For me it was easy, and apparently Amara had those special rings as well that let her equip clothes with ease. So we didn't attract tons of unwanted attention with our kingly attire, arriving at the hospital smoothly. Ah, it's John. And a girl. Hey Kayla. How's the night? Going well. Can't complain. So what happened? Another run-in with friends. No. Had to deal with an annoying night. He crushed my arm. I pulled back my sleeve, showing off the massive purple bruise that covered my entire forearm. Her eyes widened. Wow, he got you good. If you're here though, that probably means he's dead in a ditch. All right, come on back. I'll grab the healer. Thanks. I smiled and grabbed a room with Amara. And within just a minute, the healer came. Hello, John. Broken bone, I hear. Hopefully not completely broken. I showed him my arm, prompting him to cast a complex spell that lit my arm up like an x-ray scan. I see a few fissures going down both forearm bones, but no complete fractures. There's also a dislocation that I need to manually slip back into place first. First? Yes, it's going to hurt since moving a cracked bone usually isn't painless. All right, just get it over with. I handed him my arm, which he took in both his hands, smiling. I'll count to three. Ready? Sure. One dash. Pop. Ack. I grunted in shock as he jerked my bone back into place. My arm trembled for a while, the pain a bit overwhelming. Why you said three? Ha ha. It's better if it's a surprise since you don't tense up. All right. I'll start the healing now. Take this pill. He handed me a large pill that dissolved the moment I put it into my mouth. After that, he cast some more spells that healed my bones, fusing them back together along with repairing a few ligaments. After about five minutes, the spell stopped. All right, you're all done. Give it a few days to rest and you'll heal without issue. Thanks, Doc. How much do I owe you? Give me a coin and we'll be good. M.M. I nodded and retrieved a gold bullion, flicking it to him. Getting the services of a healer who could fuse bones in a matter of minutes actually cost more, but because I frequented this place so much and treated them nice, I was a valued customer who got discounts occasionally. Ting. Got it. Have a nice night. John. You too, Doc. With that, Amara and I walked out of the hospital. We went straight out of the founder's market, but instead of heading to the nightclub, Amara pulled me somewhere else. Where are we, Dash? Just come. She didn't answer me as she linked with my arm and pulled. Eventually, we happened upon the Black Spider Hotel, which he pushed me into. Oh, it's John. How unexpected. You're as surprised as I am. Hikey Master. Excuse us. Amara didn't give us the opportunity to talk as she pushed me straight into an elevator. Your room. Hmm. I gave her a side eye before inserting my key and punching in the numbers. Before long, we arrived in front of my room, which when opened, was slammed shut as soon as we walked in. And the moment the door closed, Amara jumped on me, wrapping her legs around my waist and planting her lips on mine. We kissed for several seconds before I barely managed to separate and spit some words out. Damn. What's got you going? Just shut up and kiss me. MMPH. She jumped back on me, the two of us tumbling to the bed. After that I wasn't allowed to talk. And needless to say, we didn't end up making it to the nightclub. He's not answering. They ditched us. 
Well, maybe John's injury was pretty bad. It's been two hours. I said maybe. Fiden scratched his head with a wry smile. Vetsman could only grumble, crossing his arms. They had arrived and entered the nightclub. It was a loud and dark place filled with alcohol and fast music. After being seated in a more private booth, they got several bottles of alcohol and started the party. Along with all the other people in the club, they danced, sang along to some popular songs, and drank. The place was new, but they quickly blended right in, enjoying themselves. But two hours later, everyone but Vetsman was half drunk and John and Amara had yet to show. It was obvious what they were doing, but Vetmon still wasn't happy. Not only that, but he was beginning to feel a bit out of place. After some moments of silence, in the corner of his eye, he could see Valerie and Fiden subtly kissing in the corner. It made him scoff inwardly. It was like they were trying to hide it, but because they were drunk, they did a very poor job. The first few times it happened, Tana had spoken up and interrupted them. But after she had a few more drinks, she didn't even care. From the side, Vetsmon saw her stealing glances with a flushed face. He watched her, finding it curious how she could stare at something like that so easily. But then, he suddenly saw her look at him. Uh. He whipped his head away far harder than he should have, his ears burning. In his mind, he reminded himself about how irresponsible it would be to engage in a relationship, especially during this phase in his life. They were fighting the scourge, and there was no room for distractions, only training to make sure they could keep their lives. But then, a voice came that seemed to shatter those thoughts as if they were nothing more than delusions. Hey. That's Mon. Why yes? Ah. Uh. The big man flinched when Tana's hand curled around his arm, her chin resting on his shoulder as she looked up at him. He saw her slightly messy blonde hair and her deep green eyes, and in that moment, there was nothing he could think of except how beautiful she looked. He hadn't really thought about that before. His mind was so filled with his training and strengthening that he never paid any heed to the women around him. And because he was from the church, it never seemed like anybody outside of that circle wanted to engage with him anyway. They held certain standards that needed to be met by anyone wishing to pursue them. But now, in this nightclub, he was captivated by this drunken blonde beauty whose breath reeked of cheap liquor. I want to do what they're doing. I, uh, I don't. Vetman's words couldn't seem to come out as Tana leaned in. Her lips approached his. He was so nervous in that moment that he froze like a statue, watching her face get closer in slow motion, every one of his senses working in overdrive and his adrenaline surging. He prepared himself for his first kiss, thinking that he would be fine if it was her. No, he wanted it to be her. But then, just as he thought of the future and what it might hold for them, Tana's eyes widened. And Vetsman watched as she jumped away from him, leaning over the booth and vomiting. Bleg. He sat there, his heart in shambles as the blonde beauty spilled the contents of her stomach all over the floor. And slowly, he turned his head to find Fiden and Valerie continuing to make out. His head fell slamming into the table dispiritedly. But deep inside, his heart pounded like it never had before, brand new thoughts surfacing like a fire and unable to be quenched. Ring. Hmm. My eyes fluttered open as I heard the sounds of a call on my aerial. I groaned a bit before tapping it. Hell dash. John. Ack. Why? I groaned more as Vetman's shout shook my ears. He continued. I need to talk to you when you get the chance. Huh? Why? What happened? Nothing urgent. I suppose I just need advice. Can we meet for lunch? I guess. I answered back confusedly, hearing a relieved sigh on the other end. Thanks. Bye. Click. The call ended. For a while I stared at the aerial, but I was too tired to figure things out so I just fell right back into my pillow. After some time, last night's memories came back, making me smile. And thinking about Amara, I turned around to see her. When I did though, I felt a jolt go through my body. There she was, sprawled out on my bed, in a nightgown. We had changed at some point during the night since we didn't want to roll around in bed in a suit or uncomfortable robes. Turns out Omara had brought clothes for another one of these occasions, the naughty girl. But now, after rolling around in her sleep, the loose shirt she wore had slipped. I saw an entire exposed boob, and unlike Vetsman's shout, that sight woke me up almost instantly. The size, the firm shape, the perkiness. I don't know why, but I felt my head spin a bit. Holy seas. Fuck. I suddenly reached over and pulled the sheets over her before jumping out of bed, my movement waking her. H.M.? John. Good morning. M.M., come here. She beckoned me over, but I just continued walking away. I'm at half-mast. Just give me a minute. What? 
She responded confusedly as I entered the kitchen where I couldn't see her. Then, I tapped my aerial and ordered some room service. After that, I spoke. Vitmon called and he wants to see me, so I'll have to go after breakfast. Oh, all right. She chimed back before yawning, simultaneously shifting in the bed. I could hear the sheets move. And after that, everything went silent for several seconds as if she were frozen. I then heard her jump out of bed. I am going to use the bathroom. Go for it. After I spoke, I heard her scamper through and shut the door behind her. I just waited in the kitchen, channeling my innards in and waiting for breakfast. Thankfully, it wasn't long. So once I brought it in, I diverted my focus and went to town on the platter. Amara also came out in her normal robes, her face a bit rosy. More noticeable was how she didn't make much eye contact. After calming down though, I looked straight at her and grinned. You look gorgeous this fine morning. You, stop it. She quickly covered her face with her hands, making me break out in laughter. She was too easy to tease. Chapter 64, Shattered. I need advice. With what? Courting a girl. I went silent, staring at Vets Mon across the table. We were in a nice cafe, and honestly, I expected him to have called me here with something a bit more serious in mind. But the topic was as flowery as the cafe around us. The big man needed some relationship advice. It was a bit comical, but I didn't give him anything more than a smile. All right, you have someone in mind? Who is she? I'm not sure if I want to say. Spit it out, you big luck. I can't really help you otherwise. Fine. It's Tana. I was stunned into silence once more staring at him incredulously before covering my mouth. He. Ha ha. Don't laugh. Hiki. I am sorry. Ahem. All right. I suppose Tana is one of the good ones. But I gotta ask. What changed? Something happened at the nightclub. And nothing happened. I've just finally noticed her womanly charm. Charm? I guess that's a nice way of putting it. I chuckled a bit more. Whatever charm Vetsmon saw, I was apparently oblivious to. But it wasn't like Tana wasn't pretty, and she at least had her good points. Any bad points were merely preference issues. All in all, she was a good pick. There were definitely far worse out there. There was only one issue, though. Tana has no idea you like her, huh? No, she doesn't. That's what I thought. And she's the densest girl I've ever met. So you've got your work cut out for you, buddy. Anything less than slapping her in the face with a very clear confession probably won't get it through her thick skull. But that might also scare her. So what do I do? Hmm. I scratched my head while lounging back into my seat. This was indeed a tough nut to crack. After a bit of thinking though, I flicked my finger and pointed at him. You're gonna have to wear her down. Bit by bit you need to grind through that thick shell until she realizes that you guys like each other. Is that what you did with Amara? Aha, uh -huh. hell no. Amara had been a bit flirty with me until one night she just came and confessed. The rest is history. Well, you're lucky. Maybe a little. You're the one who picked Tana, though. I just smirked a bit while taking out a cigar. Betsmon sat there, brooding as I took a few puffs. Hey, don't be so serious. You're a good guy and Tana is lucky to have you interested in her. Sure, you'll have to work for it. But I have no doubt that once she manages to actually conceive of the concept, she'll fall right for you. Thanks. But how do I, you know, grind her down? Well, I'm not sure what the difference is between what I would do and what courting is. You tell me. What usually happens when a man wants to date a girl? I don't know much, but I suppose the man would appeal to her before asking her on a date. That sounds good, so do that. I told him simply. At the same time, a waitress came and brought us some drinks. I took a sip as he thought about it with a frown, not so much as touching his drink. The sight made me smirk. All right, don't fry your brain trying to think about this. I'm just trying to think about how to go about it. Well, you have time. You've got the entire year at the Magisterium to flirt and ask her out. But you need to be pretty straightforward with it. You can't beat around the bush with Tana. I can also do something, though. Maybe I'll get Amara to talk to her. Plant the seeds, you know? I would appreciate it. Sure. Ha ha. I'll have helped two of my friends get a girl. How fun. I chuckled while taking a sip of my drink. Then, Betsmon asked, What do you do that might be different from normal courting? With Amara, I mean. Me? Well, since we both like each other, it's easy to push our relationship forward. And I'd say she's been pretty responsive. Yeah, she's all over you whenever you two are together. She even left the party with you last night. It's obvious that she likes you a lot. I wouldn't say it's a matter of liking. Look, I have my own standards and I'm going to do what I do regardless of what anybody says. Take last night, for example. 
I put Amara on the spot by making a scene at a noble party. I may have just ruined my own reputation along with her and her mother's. You would think that if I liked her a lot, I would have just let them trample on me for the sake of keeping the peace and not embarrassing her. I guess. Betsman agreed with a frown, still looking a bit confused. I shrugged. Hey, all I'm saying is that I pursue Amara the way I feel like doing so, and I don't worry about trying to be perfect. And neither should you. The biggest hurdle is actually doing something, so don't make the mistake of sitting back and waiting. Have some faith in yourself, you know? Yeah. All right. I'll think of something the next time I see her. Betsman smiled, looking encouraged by my words. And I smiled with him. After that we continued to talk for a bit longer. So, what are your plans now that you're suspended? Eh, just waiting in. And, Betsman looked at me weird when I went quiet. Frowning, I sat there for a few seconds as my aura picked up some nefarious intent. Someone was looking at me, and they weren't friendly. I could barely tell their direction, so when the feeling sharpened, I looked outside the cafe through its glass front. And in the street outside, I could see a man standing there with a bow on his back. He noticed my gaze quickly, and without hesitation, he equipped the bow and knocked an arrow. I suddenly communed with a Springfield rifle as he pulled his string back, feeling it appear in my hands before taking aim. And I fired just as the bowman did. Boom. Ah. There were screams when the explosion went off. I saw as my bullet shattered the glass window and sailed straight into the abdomen of the bowman. As for his arrow, I barely managed to shift my body utilizing the time-dilating effects of my jacket's power, preventing it from piercing the center of my chest and instead making contact with the jacket around my shoulder. But the force behind that arrow was shocking, and although it didn't pierce through, it threw my body back like I was kicked by a horse. Ack. John. Betsman jumped out of his seat, barely realizing what happened as I landed against some furniture. I'm fine. Help me up. All right. He reached out, grabbing my outstretched arm and pulling me back onto solid ground. I felt a few bruises, especially on my shoulder, but nothing that serious. I immediately looked out the window again, the bowman nowhere to be seen. But there was in fact some blood, so I went and sprinted out. Betsman, go down that alley and find a bowman. All right. He answered quickly, his powerful legs launching him like a cannon as he dashed ahead of me. I followed as fast as I could, following a faint trail of blood. And several seconds later, I heard a yell. Got him. Over here. Coming. I answered back and followed the sound, taking a few turns before arriving in a secluded alley. Betsman had the bowman pinned to the floor. All bowmen were knights, so they were strong but apparently this one wasn't as strong as my squad's tank. I walked over, nodding to Vetmon. Thanks. Eh, he wasn't fast enough. And the blood was easy to sniff out anyway. Are you a hound? I chuckled a bit while squatting down toward the bowman. Did someone send you? Or are you looking for the pitiful bounty? Fuck you. Well, you don't reek of drugs, so you're not from the trenches. Clockwork? Actually, they wouldn't hire a weakling like you to kill me. Whatever. I stood and took out a shotgun pointing it at his head. W8. You're going to kill him. Betsman suddenly stopped me, causing my brows to raise. Right. He's only ever fought the scourge. Definitely never killed a fellow man. I took out my cigar and blew out a bit of smoke. In the distance, I was starting to hear a commotion. Definitely the city guard. So I made a decision and pulled the trigger. Boom. Betsman was shocked as the man died underneath him, standing with some blood splatter on his white clothes. Leaning down, I took the man's spatial sack before grabbing Vetsman's arm and walking off. Walk with me, before the guard comes. He was silent as he followed. And after making our way to another street and hailing a carriage, we boarded and set our destination to the Magisterium. As we rolled, I took a puff of my cigar. Surprised? You killed a man in an alleyway. Yes. He's what's known as a hunter. They kill people for the bounties on their head, collecting money once the job is done. I happen to have a recently increased bounty on my head, so hunters will occasionally try to kill me. And believe me, letting them go only causes more trouble down the road. You have a bounty on your head? Why? He lifted his head and asked. He didn't look angry, but he did look like I had shattered his view of me. I let out a sigh of smoke. If you haven't guessed already, I work in the black markets. I've made some enemies there, and since they haven't been able to kill me the conventional way, they pay a price to get others to do it for them. As you can guess, it hasn't worked so far. How many people have you killed like that? Does it matter? I looked him in the eye with that question. I suppose this was a question of morals, and as far as I knew, Vetsman was a man of principle. It was easy to fight against the scourge. 
You could do so blindly because they were such an easy enemy. But killing other humans would test your own principles. I didn't care because for me, it was a matter of survival. It was simply the world I lived in, and I was already in too deep to avoid it. Not that I wouldn't make the same decisions again anyway. Still, it also wasn't like I killed anyone who didn't try to kill me. Regardless of if they deserved it, they tried to kill me, so I killed them. If I didn't, they would keep trying to kill me until eventually, they would succeed. I had no illusions that I was invincible, so I did what I needed to do to keep my life. After Vetsmon remained silent for a while, I spoke again. Vetsmon, what kind of person do you think I am? I mean from your perspective about five minutes ago. You're a courageous man who I would entrust my life to. Yeah, well, I've been doing this for a long time now, long before I even came to the Magisterium. It's only now that you've seen it. I can tell you now that I've never killed anyone who hasn't tried to kill me first. And for the most part, nobody who has died under the barrel of my gun was a good person. Believe me when I say that I'm not some secret underworld criminal. I'm just a guy trying to make his way in this place. And if you trusted me back then, you can still trust me now. He was silent, brooding over my words. Then he asked, Does Amara know about this? Oh, yeah. I told her about all this a couple weeks ago. Are oh, really? I see. He leaned back, seemingly comforted by the fact that Amara knew about it and was okay with it. Not long after, we arrived at the gates of the Magisterium. All right, go clean up your clothes. Try not to be conspicuous. Since I'm suspended, I probably won't see you guys for a while unless we find some time to hang out. Still, remember what you said and do something with Tana. I'll be checking in with Amara to make sure you aren't being shy. I'll be fine. And keep yourself safe. I will. Oh, and try to keep this little event a secret for me. I don't need more infamy than I already have. I said that while shutting the door to the carriage, letting Vetmon go. After that, I set my destination for the Black Spider Hotel. There were 10 days before the next trip, exactly how many days my suspension was, so I buckled in for a nice vacation. Chapter 65, Science The day after my cafe date with Vetmon, I met up with Amara for an early dinner. After a nice time at a decent restaurant, we went to my room at the hotel. But it wasn't to passionately make out for two hours. Instead, Amara wanted a comfortable place to focus on her advancement. She was close and just needed a bit more cultivating before jumping to Authority 5. We had the entire evening, though. Amara wasn't going to the Puppet Master's training since she was focused on her advancement, so after classes she would come find me. And for the first two hours, I let her use my bed for her cultivation. Afterward, though, she got distracted and came to talk to me. And our conversation went toward interesting topics. Specifically, how a warlock's power worked. It was no secret that there was no more dynamic power than the magic of a warlock. It could do seemingly anything, limited only by the complexity of the spell and the imagination of the warlock. However, there were a few things that imposed relatively strict rules and methods by which magic could be employed. Specifically, the system of elements they used and how magic was truly engaged. For warlocks, their spells were classified in two ways. There were the creation spells and the manipulation spells. The manipulation spells were the easiest. With those spells, one could draw on the elements around you and utilize them whichever way you wanted. But in different areas, there were differing amounts of elemental mana. For example, an ocean would have prolific amounts of water mana and little to no fire mana. The opposite was true near a volcano or maybe even around a wildfire. So sometimes, certain spells couldn't be used since there simply wasn't enough of a particular type of mana. That's where creation spells came into play. With those, you could generate a specific element and thereby generate something like fire in an ocean or water near a volcano. However, creation spells used far more mana than normal, and the spells to engage them were several times more complex. Unless necessary, creation spells were very seldom used. Manipulation spells were always preferred, at least until one became powerful enough for it not to matter. This was easy to understand, however. It was the way spells manipulated the elements that was a bit more difficult to understand. Spells were like a set of instructions for an element to follow, like software driving the hardware of a machine. And the more complex the software, the more precisely and effectively you could control the hardware. But increasing the complexity of a spell wasn't as simple as adding more instructions. For warlocks, creating a spell wasn't a matter of drawing the instruction set, but feeling the elements and beckoning it to follow your will. And there were two things that determined how complex you could make any given spell. Your affinity for an element, and your understanding of an element. Interestingly, warlocks weren't born with set affinities. Instead, 
it was their advancement process that would grant affinities. When they first awakened, a warlock would choose which element they first wanted to start building. Omara told me that she first picked air, hence why she was so good with dampening sound. And for her first three advancements, she built her mana core. And the quality of the mana core's development was determined by her understanding of the air element. If she advanced without a clear understanding, then her affinity wouldn't rise beyond a certain point. However, having inherited her mother's talent and receiving her guidance, she wasn't allowed to advance before she achieved a perfect affinity for the air element. Apparently, this was the only reason she wasn't well into Authority 5 by now. But the solid foundation was important. She now had a perfect affinity for the air element, and now, she was working toward building the fire element. Her next advancement into Authority 5 would lay the foundation for another mana core that would grant her a higher affinity for the fire element. The affinity had already grown as much as it could during her time at Authority 4, so she was ready to advance. The way it all worked interested me. An element wasn't simply what its name was. For example, the water element didn't only encapsulate water. It encapsulated all kinds of liquids as well as certain concepts like healing, dissolution, corrosion, poison, and more. It was the same with air, which represented things like the wind, convection, polarization, pressure, and breathing. However, there was something I noticed about everything that Amara told me about her understanding of the elements. All she was doing was describing scientific concepts. And in a way, that's really all she needed to know. If you wanted to muffle sound, you had to know that sound propagates through a medium, most notably air. If you knew nothing about how sound worked, then you wouldn't be able to muffle it. It was just that warlocks understood these scientific concepts intuitively, whereas I understood it academically. But that led me to an interesting thought. What if I taught Amara about all the scientific concepts pertaining to her elements? If she understood it as it was, then how easily would she be able to figure out how to control things intuitively? While the two might not directly translate into each other, it would still be an incredible advantage to have, especially for her decision-making during battles. Not only that, but she would be able to develop special spells that achieved great effects only because she knows about obscure scientific principles. For example, if she knew that combusting different gases would result in flames of different temperatures, or that simply feeding oxygen to a fire would speed up the combustion process, then she could wreak untold devastation. What about water? If she knew how the human body was composed mostly of water, especially the blood, would she be able to make spells that could manipulate blood? Could she create vacuums of air, depriving her enemies of the ability to breathe? Could she amplify sounds so much that they burst the eardrums of anyone that heard it? Could she use something like sonar to do long-distance scans of different landscapes? The possibilities were endless, and since my mind had been strengthened to an amazing degree, I was better equipped to explain this stuff to her. So I brought it up just to test it out. Hey Amara, how difficult is it to modify a spell? Modify? It depends, but generally not too difficult. All right, I want you to try something with your sound spell. Okay. She nodded and came to where I was, the two of us sitting down in front of each other. I explained. All right, you obviously know that sound travels through the air, but do you know what sound is specifically? Kind of? It's hard to explain, but as far as I know, it's like a wave that spreads through the air. That's true. But that's not what creates sound. Here, you know how the ground can vibrate. Yeah, well that's what sound does. It vibrates through the air, oscillating back and forth really fast. And we hear it because our ears have a bunch of little hairs that vibrate with the sound. Do you understand? I suppose. Not really the ear part, but the vibration part, yes. She nodded, thinking intently as I continued. All right, well, those vibrations in the air can also go through other things, like water or the ground like. Here. I suddenly got up, going to the kitchen and grabbing a utensil and a cup. I filled the cup with water before setting it on the table. Amara came over when I waved. All right, you've definitely noticed before. But when I tap the edge of the glass, the water ripples. Ding. I tapped the glass with the utensil, sending ripples across the water that disappeared in the center. Those ripples are sound, or more technically pressure waves, or a mechanical wave. Anyway, the water can conduct sound much better than air can. As for solid things like wood or metal, they conduct sound even better than water. So, here's what I want you to try. I sat her back down and laid out my idea. I want you to make a spell that can transfer the sound in the air into the ground. Okay, I'll try. Amara nodded and sat down, closing her eyes for several minutes. After thinking for a while, she started to conjure spells in the air. She even brought out her staff. 
Her staff was a short wooden stick that held a cluster of crystals at its top. The crystals were meant to act as a stabilizer for her spells. Without it, it was easier for a spell to dissipate. So while it technically wasn't needed, in the heat of a battle, it acted as an important buffer. I watched as dozens of spell formations appeared in the air. Her eyes closed in deep concentration. In fact, I also heard some odd sounds from some of the formations, as if she were testing things out. And then, her breathing suddenly hitched before she smiled. After that, a single formation appeared, riding itself out before activating. After that, it was like I lost my hearing. No sound reached my ears, even when I spoke. Amara opened her eyes, looking at me while speaking. But I couldn't even hear myself, let alone her. With a thought, my eyes suddenly brightened as I grabbed the cup of water, placing it on the floor. Then, I yelled as loud as I could. And I watched as the water in the cup vibrated just slightly. It was a success. Even Amara jumped and clapped. Then, the spell deactivated, letting us hear normally. It worked. I figured it out. Ha ha. You did. I laughed as she jumped toward me, wrapping me in a hug before jumping off again. I realized what you meant as I was making the formation. It really is just a vibration through the air. So all I had to do was direct all the sound into the solid ground without letting it escape. So anything within or beyond the sphere of influence can't be heard. Yeah, I couldn't even hear my own voice, though I could feel the vibrations in my head. That was because the vibrations coming from your throat were grounded as soon as they came out of your mouth. I made it so the spell causes any agitated air to direct itself downward straight into solid ground. It was never allowed to make it to your ears. Very impressive. I have such a smart girlfriend. Well, it's not like I could have done it without your knowledge. We smiled as she hugged me, the two of us giving each other a long kiss before she separated again. So what else? This is new so I need to work on it. But what else can tell me about air? I told you about sound, not air. But other than that, I'm not sure. You'd need to give me something specific. What other spells do you have? Oh, I have a book. With a wave of the hand, she brought out a large book as big as her torso, slamming it on the table. It radiated mana with a thick leather cover and black pages. When she opened it, I saw all the dozens of spell formations inside, each of them labeled and described. It was a spell book, perhaps a grimoire. This is my grimoire. Oh, I have tons of spells in here. A lot of them are from my mother. She made me cast certain ones before hitting milestones as a way to gauge my knowledge. Here, I'll tell you what they do, and you can tell me if there are ways to improve it. All right. I nodded and listened as she flipped the pages, going between tons of different spells. As she landed on some of them, I started to get an idea of what she needed to know. In particular, there were some basics that she found valuable. For instance, there was an entire periodic table of elements, each element a different atomic configuration and most elements had a solid, liquid, and gaseous form. I told Amara how the air around us was composed of several different elements that had different properties. I also told her how there were gas compounds like water vapor that could become airborne. The point was that the air wasn't simply air. It was a gas, and there could be countless different gases. I told her of the main ones under the assumption that this world's atmosphere was similar to Earth's, speaking of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, and others. I even ended up drawing out the entire periodic table of elements. I had been forced to memorize most of it in school, so with my empowered mind, I was able to recreate it with no problem. Like that, I went on a science lesson for close to three hours. The only reason I went on that long was because I got rather excited to share my knowledge, and because Amara was so genuinely interested. The entire time, she would occasionally generate new spell formations to test certain things out, often coming back with resounding success. However, as more time passed, she began to go from smiling to frowning. She looked concerned as the night got deeper, so I stopped the lesson and asked, Are you alright? I don't know. As I learn more, specifically about air, I'm figuring out that my perfect affinity isn't actually perfect. Well, that doesn't sound good. But how do you know it's not perfect? I thought you could feel whether or not it was perfect. I could, and back then, I did in fact achieve a perfect affinity. The mana core gets created a certain way when perfection is achieved. Not only that, but with a more perfect mana core, one's mana pool increases. I got mine measure multiple times and it's been proven that my advancement was in fact perfect. But, I feel like there's more there. More than perfect? I asked with confusion. How could you do better than perfection? But I did also agree. If she didn't know about even some basic concepts, then how could she know all there was about the air element? How could perfection be achieved like that? 
However, I noticed something else. Most of the things I taught her, while able to be applied to air, were still general scientific principles. I suddenly spoke. What if it's not that your air element isn't perfect, but that your understanding of all the elements is getting better? I'm not only teaching you about air. I'm also teaching you about liquids, solids, and plasma, the other elements. Maybe. Air is only one part of a greater whole. To understand how it might relate to the other elements would be beyond perfect, since strictly understanding air by itself, even if perfectly, still isn't everything. It's the difference between knowing the pieces and knowing how they connect. Yeah, I think that's it. Amara slowly started to smile, her eyes brightening. You're a genius. That's it. I, oh no. What? Advancement. Amara shouted, and I watched as her body suddenly started to suck in all the surrounding mana. My eyes widened. She was actually advancing. Crap. Uh, I know where to go. I, I can't. Amara's eyes started to blur as she collapsed. It was like she was in a trance, unable to think straight. I caught her before bolting straight out of my room. I ran without hesitation, making my way back down the elevator to the lobby where I saw the key master. He looked over with surprise. An advancement? I need to get to Maxwell. Can we get a carriage? Oh, certainly. Head to the market. It'll be there. Thank you. Of course, John. He smiled before I bolted back into the elevator. Then, I dialed in the numbers for the market, the elevator descending. Before long, we arrived and I saw a carriage pulling up to the plaza. I ran over where the driver had opened the door, jumping in. Polaris headquarters. Quickly. On it. The driver shut the door and the carriage started moving, barreling down the street. As we rolled, I tapped my aerial, making a call. What? Maxwell? I shouted. I'm on my way to you. Can you prepare the stuff you had for my advancement? What? Why? It's Amara. She's advancing right now. He was silent for a bit before sighing. Fine. I'll prepare it. Does her mother know? No. Not yet. You're making things difficult for me. Whatever. Just get over here. Almost there. M.M. With a groan, he ended the call. I then just waited anxiously. Once we arrived, I threw the driver payment before rushing into the headquarters. Since the guards knew me well enough by now, I was able to head straight in. And I saw Maxwell standing at the door, waiting for me. Get inside and put her in the chair. Hurry. Yep. I ran inside and saw the chair, setting her down on it. After that, Maxwell stepped in and set up the ring, loading it with authority five white crystals. Then, he tapped a few buttons before it activated. Once that happened, her body was hit by an overwhelming amount of mana. After that, her eyes began to sparkle as the mana flowed through her body like a river. With that, Maxwell sighed. It's not perfect, but you got here fast enough for it to end very well. She just needs time. Right. Thank God. I let out a deep breath, leaning against a bookshelf. I was tired from the running, but more than that, relieved that her advancement would go well. Then, Maxwell suddenly dropped some interesting information. Warlocks go through things called enlightenments. I've seen this before. She's gone beyond perfection in her element. This isn't actually an advancement. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah, more secrets. Anyway, we need to get in contact with her mother. She's close to advancing anyway, and this will trigger it soon. Can you contact her? No, I never exchanged information. Then contact someone who can get it. Like your friends. Maybe their parents can contact her on your behalf. All right. I nodded and thought for a second before dialing a number. Hello? Fiden? It's John. Oh, hi John. I need your help. I explained the situation to Fiden. And as soon as he understood, he hung up. After that I waited as he called his parents. And it was several minutes later when I got a message from an unknown number. Hello John, this is Fiden's father. Use this number to contact Duchess Teleria. I hope the situation is resolved well. Nice. I smiled and saved the number. And once dialed, I called and heard the voice on the other end before long. Who is this? Hello, Duchess. This is John Cooper. John? How did you get my number? I got it from Fiden's father. Listen, I'm with your daughter, and she's going through an enlightenment. She'll probably advance soon, so I wanted to let you know. Where are you? Polaris headquarters in the Black Spider Market. Very well. I'll be there soon. With a hurried voice, she hung up. After that, I took a seat nearby, waiting. Chapter 66 Luna Maxwell sighed from behind his desk. Boy, you better be careful, getting entangled with the daughter of that warlock. 
I already heard about the stunt you pulled during that elite party at the president's mansion. If you continue to act like that before you have the power to support your recklessness, then you'll be killed sooner rather than later. That old man was being a bitter asshole, so he deserved a bit of pushback. I agree, but believe me when I tell you that I know better than anyone how malicious nobles can be. They're a group founded upon generations of constant supremacy, and in the last two centuries they've never been able to be challenged by anyone except the church. There are extremely few cases where someone is able to do what you do and use a relationship to stick a hand into that circle. Just that is enough to warrant unsavory attention. But if you go out of your way to actively challenge their authority, they'll gladly take the chance to stick a blade against your neck. Yeah, I sighed with a nod. I understood that just being Amara's boyfriend was dangerous, and that testing the tolerance of those snobby nobles was asking to be killed. The wonderful world of nobility was even darker than the black market, mainly because the darkness of the black market was created by them in the first place, even if only through their demand for it. I was under no illusions that those godlike people didn't have a hand in everything that went on in their kingdom, good and bad. The influence they wielded should never be disregarded. But even knowing all of that, I still didn't care. I spoke my thoughts. Right now, they think I'm just an idiot who doesn't know what he's dealing with. They won't do anything to me yet. The parents won't. But the children will. Let them try. Raven is lucky I didn't shatter the right side of his skull. He'll think twice before testing me again. And besides, I have more experience fighting people than scourge beasts. There isn't a single student at the magisterium I couldn't kill. Perhaps that's true. But don't walk down the path of no return. If you keep pushing, they will find an excuse. So if you don't want to live the rest of your life hiding inside that fancy hotel room of yours, then learn to either bear with the harassment or avoid it. I didn't respond. Although I understood that, I didn't like it at all until I had the power to face them on equal grounds or at least survive any underhanded machinations they sent my way, I couldn't be so brazen. Suddenly, I had a thought. Tapping my aerial, I activated the rudimentary browser and searched for the Black Spider repository. From there I searched the bounties before finding my name. And perhaps unsurprisingly, my bounty increased. From a measly 40 to a clean 100,000 coin, over double the previous amount. There were also a few more details on me and my whereabouts. It seemed some people had decided that my existence was annoying, so they were contributing more to take me out. First it was only those from the trenches, but now, it seemed that my notoriety was rapidly spreading through the noble circles. There would be more eager hunters, and ones not so easy to deal with. Perhaps that hunter who attacked during my date with Vetsmon had jumped at the opportunity, hoping I was an easy target, and he would only be the first of many. The details under my name said that I was Authority 5 as well, so I would be getting hunted by those at or above that caliber. There was a very real threat to my life, not that there ever hadn't been. I would need to start taking more precautions, even when around my friends. And I had a feeling that Aura would be my most important lifeline. No different than a radar for hostiles, it would be a crucial source of immediate information. My breath was long as I pondered the future. But soon enough the entire Polaris headquarters was interrupted by the presence of a rather esteemed but unannounced guest. I could feel her presence before she even arrived. Maxwell was more perceptive than I was, and together, we left the room as we heard a commotion outside. A dozen guards had responded as Duchess Teleria stormed into the compound. And at the helm was someone I had never seen before, yet someone who very obviously held a high status. Or, I should say the highest status. I quickly recognized her from one of the bounties on the repository. The head of the Polaris family, Luna, an authority 10 plus warlock. She was a woman with bright platinum hair. The evening moon seemed to highlight her gorgeous locks like a spotlight, perhaps the origin of her name. And she wore a gentle set of white and blue robes held up by a thick sash. Her hair was bundled up around the collar of her robes, and together with her button nose, she was shockingly cute for a woman who should be rather old but her regal was even above that of the Duchess. She stood before her as an equal yet the grace by which she carried herself made it seem like she held dignity well above the other. One looked too high to be touched or challenged, while the other didn't give a damn. The Duchess also wasn't in the mood for delays, so she came with a certain level of hostility. Thankfully, we had appeared before any of those hostilities could be exchanged. When the Duchess saw me, the direction of her gaze also attracted the Polaris head, both of their gazes landing on Maxwell and I. The Duchess jumped, her figure bounding over the heads of everyone present and landing before me. That's when her gaze flickered and shot past me, sensing the fluctuations in the nearby room. So she walked past me too, 
entering Maxwell's study with hurried steps. The two, no, three of us followed and entered the room. Maxwell sighed as he did so, and I could clearly sense the head on my heels. Everyone's sight landed on Amara in the chair, and an audible sigh could be heard. It seemed that after finally getting a read on her condition, the Duchess was okay. Then, she looked at Maxwell, her first words being spoken. Thank you for taking care of my daughter, Sir Albrain. M.M. John didn't give me much of a choice after he came barging through my door. But rest assured my tools are top quality. Yes, I noticed. She nodded before turning her gaze to me. Thank you as well, for your quick thinking, though I'm not sure how I feel about you being with my daughter this late into the night. I was just helping her train. I didn't even know anything about enlightenments either. I thought it was an advancement, so I brought her to the only place I could think of. Well, it's certainly an unpredictable event. I will ask her about it afterward. But for now, I have no more worries. Lady Luna, I apologize for my intrusion. The Duchess turned back around, facing Luna in the doorway. She stood there with a smile on her face, undisturbed by the sudden events. It's of no consequence. I suppose I should congratulate you instead on your daughter's enlightenment. At this age, she's no less than a prodigy to achieve such a feat truly a surprise to reward. Not that I don't believe in my daughter's talent, but even I didn't expect anything like this to happen, not for a long while. Nonetheless, thank you for your hospitality. Of course, please enjoy your stay. And, you are John, correct? Luna suddenly turned her focus to me, but it wasn't like I didn't expect some attention, so I just responded normally. Yes, pleasure to meet you, Lady Luna. I've heard a lot about you. I imagine your tutelage underneath the esteemed Maxwell Albrain has been more than fruitful. Yes, it has. I thank you for the opportunity back then to receive his teachings when I was just an upcoming summoner. Well, Tavera had been merely fulfilling one of my old requests to provide me with a talented but new summoner. I had started to believe that he would just ignore it for another year, but then you came along and impressed him. Who would have thought that you'd grown into such notoriety so quickly? Even I have heard of the American bringing just havoc to the trenches. Heh, I was only trying to stay alive. I just chuckled as she looked me up and down. Once she seemed satisfied, she nodded to all those present, giving a goodbye before seeing herself out. The Duchess took a nearby seat with a sigh, crossing her legs while watching her daughter. She obviously didn't plan on going anywhere. And since that was the only seat besides the one behind the desk, I sat against a wall. I didn't plan on leaving either. Maxwell looked at both of us before shooting me a glare and sitting behind his desk. And so all three of us sat in silence. I did some work on my advancement formation since I was waiting anyway. But after another hour passed, we all felt some changes. Amara groaned while all the nearby Majika started getting sucked into her body. Dear? Can you hear me? Ack. Mom. Expel your mana. Quickly. The Duchess tried to help her, and Amara seemed to gain enough of her mental faculties back to listen. She started wielding her mana and casting several spells all at once. All of them were air spells, and I started to notice various effects. At first, I heard some vibrations, like a low resonance frequency similar to bass. Then I heard nothing at all as the ground started to shake, bookshelves being rattled. It was the spell I had inspired her to create. Even the Duchess was surprised by its effects. However, after some time, even the ground shaking stopped. Yet, the spells that were releasing a constant low frequency were still active. My eyes widened. There was a new spell being cast, and however it worked, it cancelled out sounds entirely without releasing any of the energy into something like the ground. Speaking of noise cancellation, I couldn't help but remember some modern technology. I remembered a term called destructive interference whereby one noise would combine with another and cancel each other out. I didn't know the specifics, but if that was what Amara was doing, then I would be incredibly impressed. I had mentioned something along those lines but didn't get into it much when I was teaching her. Most of my knowledge was basic, like how sound wasn't just a vibration but a wave of pressure traveling through a medium. It had highs and lows, frequencies and amplitudes, even if we couldn't perceive them. But it wasn't like I had a PhD in physics or acoustics. I taught her a lot, even things that seemed completely unrelated to sound. I just wanted to get my knowledge out. But it seemed that in her efforts to translate that knowledge into magical insights, she had discovered more than I knew. Warlocks probably understood scientific concepts intimately. I wouldn't be surprised if there were warlocks out there who could turn lead into gold because they knew all about the fundamental forces, atomic configurations, fission, and fusion. But that didn't mean they could put it into words, which was why technology in this world was still lacking advancement. 
It would take summoners to study science and realize that more could be achieved without magic in order to take this world further. And I was sure once they did, they could even surpass Earth and quicker at that. Magic was too useful. If Earth suddenly gained magic, then the already exponential technological growth would increase by another magnitude. We would probably be colonizing planets not long after, maybe even terraforming them given a few decades to get used to the changes. But even disregarding the technology, as proven by Amara, science could help warlocks understand their magic, or their elements, in different ways. It would help them directly, not just in making spells, but by increasing their understanding of the element and making them stronger. For them, knowledge was power. Except, all their knowledge came in the form of feelings instead of hard math. It also meant that my modern knowledge was far more valuable than I thought. If I could spread scientific knowledge to the entire kingdom, then the entire warlock class would jump in strength. That meant that humanity's combat power as a whole would increase by a significant percentage. Enlightenments, which were considered rare, may become merely uncommon, perhaps even a standard. And as my girlfriend, Amara would benefit the most. She would no doubt hound me for more knowledge later, and I wouldn't hesitate to oblige her. Even disregarding our relationship, she was a battle partner, someone who I would trust my back to, someone who stood by my side under siege. The more powerful she was, the safer I would be. Not only that, but I was curious to see how far she could take my knowledge. I was also eager to spill my knowledge anyway. After all, the information in my head brought over from a modern Earth was what set me apart from everyone else on this planet. Perhaps it was a bit childish of me, but it made me feel special. Especially when Amara was able to understand it. Whenever she was able to grasp the concepts, I felt like a new bridge was built between us that could close the gap in our relationship. A gap that was no doubt created by my own psyche. In the back of my head, I was always aware that everyone around me was naive to many of the things that I took as common sense. While humans had always understood the world around them through instinct, it was our academia that brought us far beyond the animals which could do the same. This world hadn't even had an industrial revolution, and at the rate it was going, it would take another couple centuries for it to begin one. Even then, it was advancing more in the magical sector than the science sector. While I understood that magic could do a lot, I was inclined to believe that science could do even more. A magical revolution? Was that even possible for them? Unlocking magical abilities required a powerful caster, so they would always be stuck behind a wall unless the few Authority 12 warlocks were able to enable the rest of their lessers to break past it with some esoteric practices. Even then, it wasn't like they could just pass their abilities down. There was only one thing I could think of that might trigger a magical revolution similar to an industrial revolution. Enchanting. Take my aerial as an example. Magic could be programmed to do complex tasks just like a computer. San was already creating a magic internet, but I had yet to see any factories full of automated machines. I felt like he was skipping a few steps, but it wasn't like he could be blamed for nobody else innovating like he was. Or perhaps I was just ignorant, and there was much more going on than I was privy to being a mere consumer. Nevertheless, if enchanting was a craft that didn't rely on the authority of a warlock, but their knowledge and ability to create magical software, then it was possible that I had been brought to this world right as it was beginning something similar to an industrial revolution, but for magic. The only issue was resources. Every enchantment had to be run by a crystal, which could only be sourced from killing scourge beasts and purifying their black crystals. Their only advantage was how white crystals seemed to be an infinite source of magical power, at least from the little I've seen. It passively recovered its magicka without any input, something that defied all laws of physics. It simply generated energy out of nothing, or at least, nothing that we could perceive. And whatever its source of energy was, it seemed infinite as well. But even with that advantage, crystal supplies were incredibly limited and paid for in human lives. Even the least powerful ones were expensive, let alone anything above that. So unlike machines that could be built with the seemingly limitless supplies of metals from the ground, enchanted devices would always remain in short supply and would never be allowed to exceed a certain scale, no matter how amazing the field of enchanting became. So even a magical revolution was likely to only affect the noble class whereas the commoners would see little to none of its benefits. Unless, there was a way to create crystals. Scourge beasts grew them in their bodies. Who was to say that such a process couldn't be artificially replicated? And if it was, would this world create an infinite source of infinite power sources? If that happened, then the magical revolution might cause seismic shifts far more drastic than the industrial revolution on Earth. HM, more food for thought.
Chapter 67 Enlightenment Amara's advancement lasted several hours, through which she received tempering on the level of my own. It seemed that whatever tempering she had gone through before with her mother wasn't an actual tempering. In fact, her tempering was only prompted by her enlightenment. Did warlocks need to enlighten themselves to receive the tempering? I thought of this question and decided to ask the Duchess since she definitely knew about it. The answer was a surprising affirmative. To achieve a beyond perfection understanding of one's element will earn a warlock the right to open themselves to greater power, which we take advantage of through the tempering process. However, an enlightenment can only be achieved after one has cultivated a perfect elemental affinity through advancing their authorities. Ah, there was the limitation. Enlightenments couldn't be received back to back. The only reason Amara was able to get enlightened this time was because she already had a perfect affinity for air, something that had taken her three authorities to cultivate. She wouldn't be able to do so for fire, her next element, until after her advancement to Authority 7. But my knowledge would still ensure that she would have perfect advancements and achieve a perfect affinity in the first place. After a bit more discussion with the Duchess, I learned that the reason advancements became more difficult through higher authorities was because cultivating multiple affinities actually worked against the warlock. According to her, cultivating one element filled the world around them with a fog that was the elemental energy of mana. At first it was dim, becoming thicker until it became a perfectly precise but ever-present nebula. And, although it was precise, it still got in the way of clearly seeing the other elements. It was like putting multiple veils in front of your eyes and being expected to make out the sights in front of you. The more veils, the harder it was, even if the veils became clearer to you in the process. To cultivate the fourth element was the most difficult thing a warlock could do as they would have to see through three veils that all but made their final element imperceptible. In fact, it was said that the barrier to the tenth authority was harder to surpass than the barrier to the eleventh as the tenth authority required one to glimpse a dim. Barely perceptible fog behind the veils that already made it close to impossible to see anything behind them to begin with. At least an Authority 11 could see a fog at all if they made it to that level. However, there was one respite that increased the chances of one being able to start cultivating their final element. One thing that made it a tiny bit easier. Enlightenments. To achieve a beyond perfect understanding of an element would also make the veil it created not as blurring. Instead of seeing something that blocked the view of the rest of the world, an enlightenment would change their view into something that was a part of the world, not atop it. They would see the element as it was in nature, not as some magical fog all around them. This made it so that their view wouldn't be blocked, and they would be able to glimpse the new fogs of other elements with greater ease. However, enlightenments weren't easy. A talented warlock was lucky to be enlightened once, let alone twice or three times. What Amara did with my knowledge made her nothing short of a genius that couldn't be described by the elite status she had earned at the Magisterium. Even her own mother hadn't expected this to happen for a long while, and she knew her best. The two were almost twins. But beyond the first enlightenment, the addition of other elements made a subsequent enlightenment much harder. That was because it required not just the understanding of the second element, but required them to reconcile their knowledge with the first as well. Basically, they had to achieve beyond perfect understandings of both and then figure out how they connected to each other, elevating both to the same level. The difficulty didn't simply add, it multiplied. But Amara's chances of doing so as the daughter of the Duchess, who inherited the talent of her mother, was already high enough to begin with. There was little doubt about her reaching Authority 10, and to do so would require an enlightenment or two to begin with. And now, with her having completed the first so early and now getting access to my knowledge, her chances were even higher. Dare I say, if we took this far enough, she would surpass her mother. While I didn't know about my own chances to reach such a level, Amara's talent was already apparent, and inheriting talent from parents was already a known and regular phenomenon. It was why the noble class was such a tight-knit circle. They were able to pop out generations of powerful warriors with certainty so long as certain practices were maintained. So even if I didn't reach that level, Amara would be able to rise above me so long as I was able to feed her the knowledge. And with my growing smarts and memory that was being perfected with every advancement, my ability to do so was rapidly solidifying. So long as our relationship continued down a positive path, there was no reason why I wouldn't empower my partner. I thought of all this as Amara began to finish her advancement. By the time she was doing so, it was early morning. I looked at her drowsily as she began to groan and calm down. My previous advancement and tempering ended with me having an energized mind that forced me back awake. But for her, it seemed that, although she was bursting with power, 
her mind had been drained of all its energy. Not only that, but she ended up covering her eyes, complaining about oversensitivity. It seemed that whatever enhanced awareness of her element she gained was overloading her, not to mention being empowered with psyche and vigor. Her mind must feel like it was running a thousand miles per hour right now. And the Duchess understood her plight. She scooped up her daughter in a princess carry, which was comfortable enough to cause Amara to pass out, and gave me a deep look. Once again, I thank you, John. To have missed out on her tempering would have been a rather disastrous disadvantage for her future. You have my gratitude. I'm her boyfriend, so it's a given. If she is to fight beside me in the future, I want nothing more than to be confident in her strength. Her power is my happiness. I'm glad, not only that you would fight for her, but that you seek to empower her so she can fight for herself. I am more confident in your relationship so long as you continue to display the necessary talent. If you can't keep up, then your chances to pursue her are automatically reduced to nothing. I understand. It stung a little, but I knew that was the reality. My being a commoner was already enough to cause discord, not to mention how I'm also a cold summoner, the weakest magus there is in this world. If I were also talentless, then there would come a day where I would simply be killed for overstepping, let alone if I were also being rebellious like I recently had been. All the cards were stacked against me, and there was yet another reason for me to focus on getting stronger. I couldn't let my girlfriend leave me behind. How was I supposed to protect her then? But I was still confident in myself. I was already punching well above my class and I had Maxwell to back me up. The road ahead would be trying, but I was never one to back away from a challenge or risk. Quite the opposite. So you know, I am already receiving pressure from several noble families whose suitors are demanding I rid Amara of your presence. She has yet to know of this pressure since I wanted her to focus on her advancement. But now that it's over she will be forced to deal with this. That's her responsibility since she pursued you. Just like you must meet the standard, she must also weather the consequences of her actions. Be prepared, because as her boyfriend, you will be dragged into it. I'll take it as it comes. And she will have my full support. M.M. I at least know that you aren't a coward. She nodded and turned, leaving the study. I felt nice getting a compliment like that, smiling through my exhaustion as she disappeared from view. I heard a groan not long after hearing Maxwell rise from his desk. I'm too old for this. Get out of here so I can finally go to sleep. Sure thing. Thank you. Also, you saved my ass. I expressed my heartfelt thanks as he grumbled his way to the door. I know. But you should be thankful that Duchess Teleria is reasonable and well-mannered. She seems very open to your presence. Any normal noble, especially on that level, would have simply forbid you from so much as speaking to their child, let alone fornicate. We haven't fornicated. But yeah, I seem to have struck gold. And it'll be the catalyst for your rise or the harbinger of your downfall. Play your cards well, John, and be diligent. Fail, and your little boat will be overturned by the wrath of the ocean as it feeds you to its behemoths. Or kill the behemoths. You don't need to kill them to beat them. You just have to refuse to die. So hurry up and get better. I'm giving you until the end of your time at the Magisterium to advance to Authority 5. That is around seven months from now. After that, you'll be released into treacherous waters, but by then, you should be capable of at least weathering some storms. He dispensed wisdom while leaving the study. Beyond that, he didn't say anything else, waving me off so he could get his beauty sleep. I left as well. Still, I wondered about Amara. If the Duchess was made aware of my knowledge and understood that it could actually enhance the knowledge of a warlock, would she seek to take it? Would I have to write her a bunch of science textbooks? I would have to be a bit more careful from now on. That, or duck under the wing of Son Industries faster than I intended. So do you want to tell me what happened? Hmm. Amara hummed as she stuffed her face full of food. She was starting to realize why John always ate so much. If his body was enhanced like this, it was no wonder he needed so much fuel. Still, she felt better than she ever had. She could see how John had managed to perform so well just after advancing once. Sure, she couldn't use vigor or psyche, but it still gave her benefits. Small benefits but for her who had nothing before, it felt like a transformation. After satiating the worst of her hunger, Amara glanced at her mother, who sat at the side of her bed patiently. Neither she nor her mother were stupid. She shouldn't have been enlightened this fast, and the only outlier was John. She had already spoken of his esoteric knowledge before, and now Amara understood that it was far more valuable than she initially realized. It gave her an entirely new understanding of the world around her and became the catalyst for a beyond perfect understanding of her element. It was revolutionary knowledge that could affect the entire warlock class, 
and if she wasn't careful, she would put John in a bad position. And both of them already had a lot on their plate. But she trusted her mother. Trusted her enough not to chain John up and force him to spill all his knowledge. At the same time, though, she decided that in this moment, she had the advantage. Duchess Teleria was as shrewd as she was direct. Not just anyone could run the second most economically successful city in the kingdom without having profound business acumen, even if they had a whole host of advisors to help them. But she struck a balance between the economics and the militarization of resources. As the commanding power of the Warlock Corps, she naturally knew how to demand certain things of certain people, how to simply supersede the negotiation table without degrading or devaluing the person in front of her. And Amara, as the firstborn daughter and someone who inherited her mother's psyche, had learned about all of this extensively. Her own acumen was rarely used since she was biding her time at the Magisterium. But that didn't mean she didn't understand how to take advantage of the things she had. So for the first time in a while, she started to scheme ahead. While eating food, of course. Remember when I spoke to you about John's weird knowledge? After your return from your first trip? Yes. Well, he was telling me about some things, seeing if it would help me make some better spells. He had to explain it with some examples and a lot of flailing arms. But he got the point across and before I knew it, I figured out another way to cancel out sound. How? By simply redirecting it into the ground. She raised her hand knocking on the wood of her bed frame. Sound is a vibration, and vibrations deliver force onto all tangible objects. When it vibrates the air, we hear sound. When it vibrates something solid like wood, it simply sends the force through the object. Same with a liquid. Ting. She tapped a glass cup with her fingernail, causing the water within to vibrate. The fluctuations of the water are merely visualizations of sound. So, using all this knowledge, I figured out how to simply redirect the vibrations in the air into the ground. There, it would simply dissipate into the world, never to be heard by any living creature beyond or within the field I created. Even John said that he couldn't hear his own voice, though he still felt the vibrations caused by the yelling in his throat. That is certainly interesting. The Duchess leaned back, pondering her words. Redirecting vibrations. The only issue I can see with it is how the ground doesn't absorb all of the vibrations. Like when you tapped your bed frame, we still heard sound. Though it obviously just sent out more sound. But the ground does absorb sound. My not creating sounds was simply a release of energy caused by the impact which also caused vibrations. The vibrating would create vibrating air which created sound. But if I force the sound into the rigid object, all that energy will be dispersed into it and anything around it, eliminating sound. Especially the ground, which can absorb limitless sound. The Duchess leaned back in thought while Amara began to come to her own understanding. She was beginning to realize how John felt while explaining all of this to her. She believed in his words and didn't have a hard time accepting it, especially how there were plenty of mysterious things about him anyway. Some knowledge about the world around them wasn't all that difficult to wrap her head around. But warlocks didn't understand the world around them in words. They understood it by their feelings. Just sitting there she could feel all the sounds and movements of air around them. She recognized the oscillating waves that collided with her window meaning there were sounds coming from the outside. Even the breath of her mother caused sound waves to form. Some of the energy she released became movement, or as John called it, kinetic energy, while everything else turned into vibrations that propagated through the air around them. Through her enlightenment, she was able to rectify John's knowledge with everything she felt. But the only reason she found those feelings in the first place was because of his education, and her mother had gone through an enlightenment for her air element as well. She knew more than herself. But even then, she still had a hard time understanding what was being said. It went to show how wide the gap was between the science and a warlock's personal understanding. Omara scratched her head. She didn't know everything that John did. He obviously had a much deeper understanding of everything himself, so she wouldn't be able to explain it like he did. She had learned about all different types of energy and those associated with acoustics and gases. But she didn't quite know why everything was that way. For now, she was simply believing in him blindly mainly because she had verified it in her own special way as well. All right, think of this. Amara went back to trying to explain. She even explained the theories behind her noise cancellation, not just redirection. And it was only after some time that her mother started to understand. She could already do all of this with her spells, far more than Amara could, but only now is she finally starting to describe it in regular human terms. Chapter 68. Charity. After the Duchess whisked my girlfriend away, she didn't return for the next two days. And since I was suspended, 
I had nothing to do with the magisterium and didn't have much to do. So in the meantime, I spent most of my day working on the new advancement formation and searching through my dimension for any cool weapons. I didn't find any, mainly because higher dimensions were deeper and much more difficult to search unless my psyche became powerful enough to project further into it. So it would take time to scour and find new or exotic weapons within. But I couldn't stay cooped up in my room all day, so since I had free time, I decided to take on some jobs. Of course, when Plex heard that I wanted some work, he sent me straight to the trenches, the petty bastard. So I had my work cut out for me, but it wasn't like the money wasn't good, so I didn't complain that much. My weapons were also better, so I had a much easier time. The only thing that could pull me away from those two things was when a friend wanted to hang out. Fiden often talked to me and invited me out, and Vetsmon would usually tag along. Speaking of the big guy, Vetsmon seemed to have come to terms with what I did after a day or two of thought. At the very least, we were able to interact normally. He didn't seem to have any issues with it, or maybe just not an issue with me doing it. He might not like it, but it wasn't like I could just tell all those after my head to leave me alone. Besides, the big lug was constantly worried about courting Tana. Sure enough, she was denser than lead. Betsmon had actually managed to plan a date, but she didn't take it as a date at all from what he told me. I wished him luck in his endeavors. Ten days of no school was nice besides the fact that I didn't get to practice any scenarios. While I didn't technically need it, my squad was supposed to be working on our coordination. Ten days worth of scenarios and hunting was a lot to miss out on. The puppet master worked around it. I heard. Scenarios like protecting a stationary target from an onslaught seemed to be the favorite right now. He wanted them to know how to protect me, the most fragile person in the squad, so that's all they worked on. Well, it wasn't like I didn't get practice in the trenches, so I wasn't that worried. The day before we were supposed to leave for the next trip was the end of my suspension, so I just waited until then. Besides the occasional scare from an unwelcome hunter, my life for that week and a half was uneventful. Even when Amara came back, our time together was largely spent talking about science. I was right. She wanted to know everything I did. It was good that my memory was becoming better. I could remember the science and math better from all of my high school and college classes. Those days of slogging through chemistry, physics, and engineering work for my degree was actually being utilized, albeit only conceptually. All the math-like calculus was close to worthless for Amara. But since she only needed conceptual knowledge, all those thousands of hours I'd spent looking through articles about obscure scientific topics I found interesting on the internet or in videos came in really handy. Falling down those rabbit holes of intellectual curiosity was too easy, much to the dismay of my sleep schedule back then. So I was armed with a wide array of knowledge about dozens of topics that might help her. The only hard part was remembering specific details, which my strong mind was helping with. Otherwise, I'd be screwed. So I didn't know everything but I did know plenty to help Amara. Right now, her biggest focus was everything related to the fire element, or in other words, thermal energy, plasma, and combustion. It was a good thing that I found joy in spilling all this knowledge, yet sometimes it could still be a bit of a chore, mainly because I had to explain the most basic scientific concepts about the world around us for her to begin understanding the more complex ones, which took hours. At least she knew how to reward me for all the hard work. Those hours late into the night were always fun. Three days before leave. As per our discussion from the night before, Amara and I went out shopping. Not to prepare for the upcoming trip, but to buy an essential item. So long as I wore my coat properly, it would protect everything from my neck down to my shins. So the only vulnerable parts of my body were my feet and head. I had tough boots and in general, my feet weren't much of a concern, though Amara still insisted that I buy another pair. So I bought a jet black pair of combat boots. They were shockingly comfortable, completely immune to the elements, slightly temperature regulated, had some features to enhance grip on all kinds of surfaces, and most importantly, durable. The leather it was made out of was known for its durability without sacrificing flexibility. It was made in such a way that I could maneuver and run all I wanted yet was rigid enough to survive the crushing attacks from an authority ape beast, preventing my lower legs from becoming paste. And if I encountered something stronger than that, I would have bigger problems than protecting my feet. Those boots cost me 170,000 coin, taking another chunk out of my savings. I didn't actually believe I needed such good boots, but Amara insisted that I get them. And she insisted pretty hard, which had me a bit confused. She didn't want me to save money on them, going for something rather overkill. And I agreed that I needed to keep myself safe, but her attitude toward it threw me off a bit. 
like she was planning something. I threw that to the back of my mind as we arrived at another shop. It was a place that specialized in helmets and hats to protect the head, something I needed right now. But there were a few issues I had with anything that covered my head. For one, it could reduce my field of view. That was significantly detrimental to my ability to shoot and maintain awareness. But apparently, that was only an issue with cheaper helmets. Most helmets beyond a certain price point had features to fix that problem. After all, knights couldn't get tunnel vision either. With that in mind, we entered the store and immediately saw several items on display. I looked between several shelves, but I didn't find anything that looked familiar. There were hats similar to bowler hats, even top hats. But the selection of hats in general was rather slim. I could imagine why. Protecting the head was nothing to be half-assed with, and fabric or leather hats simply didn't offer good protection against claws, crushing, or projectiles. Or, it didn't seem like there were many hats that were built with that in mind. Welcome, sir and missus. How can I assist you today? We're looking for head protection. For a summoner. A summoner? I see. The clerk seemed a bit surprised, but ran with it anyway. I could imagine they didn't get many summoners in general. Well, a piece for a summoner immediately narrows down the selection. Come, let me show you. He waved us along, the two of us following to the back of the store where he showed off a single shelf with some mannequin heads wearing various pieces of headgear. Knights have heads hard enough to wear solid metal helmets. But put a summoner inside the same helmet, and his brain would be turned to soup with a single blow. For warlocks and summoners, we choose to utilize softer means of protection. We do in fact have rigid headgear with pure impact reduction in mind, but at the higher price range, we offer hybrid pieces that are rigid yet flexible, mitigating impacts like a helmet without delivering it all to the head inside. This piece right here is one of our best. He grabbed a head with a hood on it. It certainly was flexible like a fabric, but I could also tell from the way he moved it that it didn't simply bend when told to. Seeing that Amara was interested, he described it. This hood protects everything except the face. We offer pieces that are meant to be paired with this hood, like a mask. As you can imagine, different pieces need to be built in different ways. Anyway, the hood is capable of mitigating the impact of a piercing arrow shot by an Authority 5 knight and preventing all trauma to the head. That might not seem like much, but you have to keep in mind the piercing aspect. If it's a blunt object, like a rock or a bludgeoning blow from a scourge beast, then this can mitigate far more, up to Authority 7. What do you think of a hood? Amara suddenly asked me making me ponder. Besides the fact that it needs a mask, it seems good. Better than a metal can. Don't you have that one or mask? How good is it? Not sure. I brought out the air mask, showing it to the clerk. This thing gives the wearer greater stamina and filters air. Ah, I've seen similar functions. But this mask isn't built for much protection. The leather looks basic. Its value is in its enchantments and crystal. All right. Would you be able to upgrade this mask? Keep the filtering and stamina properties but make it stronger. I could, but if you're looking to pair it with this hood, then it'll be a significant change. This only covers half the face, and you surely don't want to leave the rest of your face exposed. I can already see you've had some experience in that regard. Hey. I chuckled when he pointed out my scars. By now everything had healed over, but they still looked gnarly and were unmistakable. He inspected the mask a bit more before rubbing his chin. How about this? You buy the hood and I'll give you a discount on a custom-made mask. I'll strip this one for its materials and reuse them, giving you something similar to our masks but retaining the functions within this one. That sounds good. Very well. Come see our selection of masks. He brought us over to another shelf, showing some masks off. The ones that were meant to be worn with the hood were all semi-rigid. If hit with a projectile, it would focus on deflecting it using the curves of the face. So it was more rigid than the hood but not on the level of a metal helmet. I pondered for a while before Amara tapped my shoulder. Hmm. Keep looking and come over to the counter when you decide. I'm going to talk to the clerk. Why? About your hood. Just some of the details like the materials and fit. Or do you know about all the different types of materials? Fine. Hiki. She chuckled and tiptoed, giving me a kiss on the cheek before walking away with the clerk. I looked around a bit more before choosing one particular type of mask. It was one that integrated with the hood well yet didn't cover anything above the cheeks. It was more flush against the face and protected two-thirds of the face instead of just half. I chose it for less intrusiveness, keeping my field of view unobstructed. Besides, the hood would come down to just above my eyebrows anyway, so technically everything but a thin area for my eyes would be covered. There were full face coverings, 
but those were far more expensive due to the complex enchantments that retained sight through the mask. I didn't feel like paying that much. So after I chose the mask, I went back to the clerk where Amara seemed to have finished her discussion. I handed it to him. This one. Ah, uh, good choice. Your partner also said that this hood would be worn with the coat you're wearing. That's right. Very well. It will be built to accommodate that. On top of all this, the two items will come stored in the form of a neckband for easy deployment. Now, if you don't mind holding still for a moment. He spoke while waving his hand, a measurement spell appearing around my head and neck. Once he got those measurements, it disappeared. All right, with the mask, I have everything I need. Okay, so how much is the order? Doesn't matter. Omara answered for him, causing my brows to raise. What? Don't worry about the price. I'm paying. A moment, please. I grabbed my girlfriend and pulled her to the back room where we got some privacy. And I narrowed my eyes at her. What are you doing? I'm paying for this piece of gear. Look, you spend all that money on a suit because of me. And I don't want you spending any more. So I'm taking care of it. You know I can't let you do that. I can already tell this is going to come out to a few hundred thousand coin. So just let me pay. No. Just as I turned to go back to the clerk, Amara grabbed my arm with a shockingly strong grip. It seemed her tempering brought her rather close to my own level of strength. She spoke in a dead serious tone. You're letting me do this, John. I'm not asking. No, I'm not. I should be paying for myself, and I can, so I will. Then consider this a gift from me, because you're not taking out a single coin. Think of it as repayment for the enlightenment you gave me. You would have done it yourself anyway. It's nothing to repay me for. You're obviously not realizing how big of a deal an enlightenment is if you're saying that. But besides that, why are you so reluctant? You've already spent close to half of your savings. I just want to help you. She pulled me back toward her, looking me in the eye. I felt myself frowning, my mood darkening. Was I money insecure? No. I could spend money rather easily, mainly because I didn't spend it on stupid crap. If there was something I needed or wanted with good reason, I got it but that didn't apply to others. If there was one thing I didn't like about my time in this world, it was all the charity I had to receive from everyone. I looked at Amara's concerned eyes and sighed. I can't take any more. I've already been given too much. It feels like I'm not doing anything for anyone else despite being taken care of so well. And now I finally have the money to at least take care of myself. So unless I have no choice, I won't ask anyone for help. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to take care of everything myself. I didn't realize you felt that way. So you're fine if you're the one that's going broke. But as soon as anyone else wants to help you, you get defensive. I dash. Look, John, allow me to explain what makes an enlightenment so valuable. She looked me in the eyes, not allowing room to refute. For one, enlightenments can't be paid for. And if they could be, my mother would spend hundreds of millions of coin if it meant I could get one, especially this early in my life. Yes, I would have gotten my enlightenment eventually but it would have been within the next decade. What you've done has brought me incalculable benefits and advantages for the future. So buying a mere hood that might preserve the life of my boyfriend is a worthwhile exchange. To deny me this is an insult to my generosity. Do you understand that? I didn't respond, the two of us staring at each other and neither willing to stand down. I understood it, but I didn't like it. Yet another thing being given to me. A home at the nicest hotel in the city, given for free. A coat that saved my life more than once, given for free. The best summoner call and an entirely new advancement path capable of bringing me to heights never before seen by summoners, given for free. A job that allowed me to make substantial amounts of money and brought vast connections with people who have opened doors and given me opportunities for betterment, all for free. How much more did I have to take before I could finally start giving back? Or maybe it was just my pride getting in the way. Perhaps both points were valid. I closed my eyes, feeling the conflict within my mind and unwillingness to come to a conclusion. When I opened them, I didn't see Amara before me. Turning, I could hear her conversation with the clerk as she undoubtedly took care of the bill. How pathetic. I can't even get my own armor. I sighed and walked out. She wrapped up the sale as I did so, and soon, we left the store. She took my arm as we took to the streets of the Founder's Market. We headed out and back toward the hotel. As we crossed the city, I bounced between ideas, rectifying the issue in my mind. And the conclusion I came to was that I needed to get better. If I didn't want to rely on others and instead help them, then I need to get better than I am now. I need to get to the level of all those who have supported me all this time if I wanted to give them the help I received. Whether it was making a lot more money than I ever have, 
or being able to utilize power far greater than I could currently imagine. It would take time, but damn if I got lazy while living on someone else's dime. Let's go train. I pulled Amara along, deciding that there was no time to waste. Chapter 69, Nagalev Bastion Would you like to explain the recent expenditure? Amara heard her mother's voice over the aerial. It was a good thing she didn't decide to stay the night at John's place. She sat up in her bed, looking out the window and seeing the moon hanging over the city. It was a gift to John. A gift that cost 950,000 coin. It was a piece of headgear for him. You know he needs it. That's not the issue, dear. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt because I trust your judgment and know that you don't make such decisions without careful thought. So give me a good reason for the sudden loss of a million coin. I'd like not to insult you by saying that your rationale has been completely clouded by your love for this boy. Amara frowned, thinking about her words before spitting them out. Mom, if you could purchase an enlightenment, how much would you spend for it? That's what this is about? You seem to be trying to sell me on the value of John's knowledge the other day. You think he actually directly caused her enlightenment? Yes. He gave me a new way, the correct way, to understand and view the world around me. Or do you believe that my talent is enough to have been enlightened so early in my life? Now it was her mother's turn to be silent. Admit that your daughter is far more talented than yourself, or that John's knowledge is that valuable. Amara inherited her mother's talent. It was possible that she was in fact more talented than her mother, but the chances were slim because she had reached every milestone about as quickly as her mother did. The Teleria family line was long and their talent consistent. They were a very combat-oriented family, as many were, and there was very little deviation from the normal timeline of a child's development. That was the reason all noble families were so tight-knit. They could go generations and constantly produce talented offspring, offering no room for another talented commoner to insert themselves into their ranks through sheer strength. Amara's enlightenment was an irregularity, and the only outlier in her life was John and his supposed knowledge. The Duchess sighed. I admit he may have played some part but only the future can tell us if that really is the case. Well, one of those possibilities is correct. Either way, I see no issue with this purchase. So long as you don't push your luck. Pull another stunt like this, and you'll hear from your father next. I'll trust you. Don't give me a reason not to. I won't. Thank you, Mom. M.M. One more question. Does he know how much was spent? No. In fact, he was pissed that I was paying it all and I had to force it. If he knew I spent that much. I'm not actually sure how far he'd go to reject it. Fine. Click. The call ended, leaving Amara smiling. That meant her mother approved. For now, both of them were still in the green. The day of our leave approached. With my suspension over, I was able to return to magisterium grounds. I didn't bother with checking in on classes and simply prepared for the trip. I went shopping with Amara beforehand and bought myself some more essentials. Primarily stuff for the inevitably crappy bed and other niceties that I found to be lacking at the last base. I made sure I had any and all medical supplies for myself. Changes of clothes in case I got bloody, and the new piece of armor we had picked up the day before. As little as I like letting her pay for my own gear, I had to admit that it was gear that I needed. It also looked amazing. The surface was actually made of scales, but the scales were small, making it look like a solid material until you looked closer or bent it around. The inside also had a whole swath of enchanted lines, along with an implanted white crystal at the base of the skull. As for the mask, it integrated into the hood by wrapping around the bottom half of my face and neck, protecting everything but my eyes. And when it was stowed, it morphed and hung around my collar like a thick chain necklace. The mask retained its effects of filtering air and boosting my stamina. It was also replaced with black leather that, like the hood, matched my coat so it didn't look out of place. It was also just as durable as well. It was covered in tiny scales similar to the hood, and the air that came through went through imperceptible slits in the scales that minimized weak points. It was an amazing piece of work, which made me question just how much Amara actually spent. It shouldn't have been that much since it was only supposed to protect against Blunt Authority 7 attacks, but the quality made me think otherwise. Well, she wouldn't tell me no matter how much I asked. I decided there wasn't anything I could do but use it and make sure she wouldn't regret the purchase. And so, the time to leave for our next trip arrived. I packed a chest and met with all of the fourth-year students at the gate. Like last time, there were plenty of carriages to take all of us to the terminal. I boarded one with my squad as the rest of the school waved us away. A quick trip to the terminal and we were on a rail headed for a place called the Nagalev Bastion. 
This place, unlike the last, was much closer to what would be considered the front lines. It supposedly faced constant battles, and the level of beasts there was generally much higher. It wouldn't be a surprise to find Authority 7 beasts, maybe even Authority 8. That meant the soldiers stationed there were equally strong. The ride there took an entire day and went through three stops before arriving. And this time, we weren't the only passengers. The Magisterium was only allowed to take two cabins as the rest were filled with supplies or other soldiers. So we filled the cars with rows of seats. It felt like riding an airplane. But I was okay with being cramped with Amara. Fiden did the same with his girl. It seemed he and Valerie were making some good progress. Valerie was the daughter of a Marquis like Fiden, so unlike Amara and I, their relationship was completely acceptable and encouraged. If time passed and they loved each other, I would be wishing him a happy life at his wedding sooner rather than later. As for Vetsmon and Tana, well, the big guy was trying. I cheered him on from nearby as he tried to put the moves on Tana while they sat together. She looked like she was having fun but it was difficult to watch knowing that everything was blowing right over her head. He was getting more comfortable though. Knowing that Tana wasn't really judging him, he was able to gradually come out of his comfort zone. Amara and I didn't talk much on the trip, just resting and sleeping in the comfort of each other's arms. And we arrived at the base with rested minds. Welcome to the Nagalev Bastion. The puppet master shouted as soldiers crowded through the terminal around us, speaking through all the chatter. All the fourth-year students stood before him as luggage was unpacked. Soon, a major general, an authority aid officer, came to speak with us. It was the same as the last trip. He welcomed us, and since it was noon when we arrived, he went on to give us a tour. This base was much bigger than Calatrop Base, at least triple the size. It had huge walls and several two-story buildings just for housing along with all the main buildings for logistics and commanding. The armory was massive. There was an entire field dedicated to holding a fleet of armored personnel carriers. And when we arrived, we could already hear the sounds of battle. Soldiers along the walls were operating magical cannons while warlocks rained down hell from above. There were also knights securing the gates, occasionally launching their own attacks to soften the front lines of the enemy. There was much more activity here, especially since the population of soldiers was far bigger than Calatrop base. The Major General expressed his appreciation for our help, telling us how there was always work to be done. There were apparently three outposts several miles from this base, outposts that occasionally needed reinforcement. They suffered attacks often, so we would no doubt be going to help. The patrol missions were also frequent, as were extermination missions. Sometimes a patrol would spot groups of beasts, sending out the order for their extermination. All missions were done in at least two groups, and ones that involved scaled conflict would often be assigned a platoon of soldiers. Everything was much more dangerous but at least for the elites with squads of Authority 5s, it was nothing we couldn't handle within reason. If there was a chance to encounter something beyond our capabilities, we wouldn't be sent out without sufficient firepower. Once we finished the tour, we were let go to find our housing. And once I found our room, I was thankful to have bought the bedding that I did. Like the Calatrop base, each room could fit two people. But the room was about half the size and the beds weren't as large, enough to fit a man plus a bit of room to roll around in. There was at least enough room to fit our chest and store our stuff, but that was about it. I wasn't even sure if it was bigger than the kitchen in my hotel room. On top of that, in this two-story housing complex, all the girls were right above us. It was rather noisy hearing all the footsteps above us, thankfully not enough to be too irritating. Fiden and I decided to group together again, unfortunately leaving Vet's mom to fend for himself. In the end he managed to snag a room all to himself though, the lucky guy. When evening of our first day came, everyone seemed mostly situated. My squad had also taken a look at the walls and I found a few good vantage points for shooting should we come under siege. After that, we simply waited. Everyone knew that being on a military base involved nothing but boredom with short moments of excitement sprinkled in. It was just a game of hurry up and wait. The only thing I did on the second day was perch myself up on a tower and take shots at any surrounding beasts, getting a bit more practice with my Springfield. Also, I learned an interesting detail. Turns out, we wouldn't be at this base for the full month, only three weeks. The end of the year was approaching. Although I didn't often notice, it was in fact getting much colder outside. We would be released early for Christmas, which, unlike Earth, marked the end of the year and start of a new year. People would go to sleep on Christmas Eve and wake up on Christmas Day, celebrating the birth of Christ and the birth of a new year. It was the most popular holiday in this world. Every city would be celebrating it. 
especially the capital. I heard that the midnight countdown was rather bombastic. Well, it was at least nice to know that we would be here for one less week. But that also meant we would get more work. Sure enough, it was on the third day that we got a mission. And not just us. Two elite squads were being sent out. The first was ours, and the second. Perhaps they were even stronger than us. The five of us arrived at a large briefing room. Inside were several officers as well as the other squad. The squad of five sat at one of the tables behind the officers. We took another nearby. We eyed each other. I saw two people I recognized and three that I didn't. The two I saw were the rank five and nine elites, a knight and warlock respectively. And Amara told me about the other three, pressing up beside me with a whisper into my ear. Those are the rank one, three, five, nine, and thirteen elites. I'm sure you can pick out the rank one. M.M. I nodded subtly, looking toward one particular man. It was like somebody combined Fiden and Vetsmon. Tall, but not hulking, yet very obviously stronger than anyone in this room. He carried a long sword on his back and was dressed in slim and masterfully crafted armor. He's Pontek Goliard, the son of a duke, and one of my suitors. You've got a lot of suitors. I'm the daughter of a duchess. In any other circumstance, the list would have been tripled and I'd be married by now, likely to the highest bidder. What? You get auctioned off? Not technically, but a marriage happens when a party is willing to offer a more beneficial alliance than all the others. It may as well be an auction. Unfortunately, Ponette comes from a family rather close to mine, as do many of them. And given the fact that we're almost the same age, he was the most viable suitor and likely one of the most hurt by your appearance. Fun. I let out a small sigh, continuing to observe Pontek. Sensing my gaze, he looked over as well, giving me a rather fierce eye. I just smiled and waved as if he were a close friend, causing him to frown and roll his eyes back to the front of the briefing room. Amara squeezed my hand under the table. Don't worry about it. If he tries anything, you know I'll back you up. Hmm, we'll just have to wait and see what he tries. Or maybe he'll be a good boy and just keep his paws to himself. Like a dog. I think he's closer to a bear, but yeah. We both chuckled, hanging around a bit more until the commanding officer finally arrived to brief us. Listen up. One of our forward outposts has been hit with a scourge tide. Right now it's still gathering, but they will need assistance soon. Everyone here is a part of the platoon we're sending out. So gather enough supplies for three days. Now, if you take a look at this map, you'll see your entry area in relation to the outpost and tide. The commanding officer went on to give a battle plan. We would be coming in from the eastern side of the outpost whereas the tide would be coming in from the north. There was a high chance that we would be attacked while trying to enter the outpost, so that was something to be prepared for. All right, you leave in an hour. Dismissed. As soon as he gave the word, everyone rushed out of the briefing room. Time was tight. The longer we took, the higher the chance of the outpost taking considerable damage. We had to get there before the bulk of the tide hit, and the outpost was, by vehicle, about three hours away. We should be getting there right on time. With my squad, I went to the armory to gather some supplies before grabbing a few of my own belongings from my chest before storing everything in one of the several supply trucks going with us. After that we entered a Hummer just for our squad, waiting a bit before our driver arrived and took us away. A dozen armored vehicles rolled through the gates, speeding off into the distance. After that, we waited. I prepared some of my own weapons while the others prepared some of their armor. I chuckled while looking at my Springfield. There was one variation of this rifle that I found. While the one I first grabbed had standard iron sights, another I discovered had a ladder sight. And when I played with it, I found that it could actually zero to a whopping 2,875 yards. I chuckled and showed Amara. Look at this. This gun is only really accurate to about 300 yards, and yet this sight makes you think you can even aim at something 10 times the distance, let alone hit it. Really makes you wonder what they were thinking when they made it. HM. I guess. I wonder about something else though. What's that? You speak of the people who made those guns like you know them. As far as I know, summons come from other worlds. Yeah. I went quiet. Surely she wasn't really thinking that I was from another world, right? That would be preposterous, though true. I quickly thought up an excuse. You know that I get some memories from these weapons, right? There's a lot of knowledge that comes with that. After all, how are you supposed to use something so complex when you don't know what everything on it does? That's true. She smiled smugly and left it there making me feel weird. I looked around, seeing the others watching us as well. Why did it feel like I lost? I suddenly looked back over and put my hand on Amara's head, 
tilting her back and planting a fat kiss on her mouth from above. She flushed red when I pulled back, making me smile. Why? You're getting cheekier. Gotta keep you on your toes. Shameless. Ow. She headbutted my shoulder, hiding her face from the rest of the squad. I just sat there in victory, enjoying the rest of the ride to the battlefront. Chapter 70. Telepathy. You should probably wait to start shooting until we get into the outpost. All right. I nodded at Vetsman's words and relaxed. We were fast approaching the outpost, and I could already feel the scourge tied in the distance. Prepare for contact. The driver shouted, Amara rising from my embrace and sticking her head out through the top hatch. Since she was a warlock, she could launch ranged spells, ones that didn't produce as much noise as I did. We didn't need to attract more attention than we already would, so for the sake of the entire convoy I refrained. I watched Amara's robe shift as she waved her arms and cast spells. Recently she had been eager to exercise her magic due to her new enlightenment. She would always come to me with new spells and new ideas, pulling on my knowledge to try and create more devastating magic. We had discussed quite a lot, and although I could only ever inspire her with my knowledge, she was really good at taking it and making something new. Not to mention that she had her mother, who herself contained vast knowledge of all kinds of spells. And she was more equipped than I to help directly, so Amara had more than enough to keep her occupied for months. Now, she could unleash her power without restraint. Sieges were unique in that you didn't have to worry about friendly fire like during other missions working with your squad. It was really a contest to see who could do the most widespread damage. I could hear the explosions from outside the car, including the whistling from Amara's own spells as she launched them into the hordes. This went on for several minutes until at one point, I felt the car roll onto a paved road. Disembark. The driver shouted, prompting us all to rush out. I helped Amara down, letting the others go first before the two of us jumped out together. Our CO spoke to another commander as we all grabbed our gear. After a bit of shouting, he turned back to us. Platoon 8, listen up. All warlocks and ranged fighters, follow Captain Austin up the walls. All knights, follow me to the gates. Move out. Over here. We were waved over, my squad splitting up as Amara and I followed the captain up the walls. The battle was ongoing. There was no time to waste as we hurried up the stairs. Those of us from the Magisterium, including two warlocks from the other elite squad, were kept together and assigned a northeastern position. Our designation was Section 13 of the Wall, and there was an officer giving firing commands to all the warlocks in intervals. After all, they couldn't be expected to cast spells continuously for an entire day. Longevity was important. This was a battle of attrition. Section 8. Prepare to Fire. The officer shouted not long after we arrived. Amara planted her staff and prepared six different spells. I could feel the mana radiate from her body. Since we were up in the walls and there was enough going on, I didn't particularly need any noise cancelling from her. Besides, I wouldn't hamper her excitement anyway by asking her to do something so mundane. I propped my gun up on the wall after setting up my portable seat in front of a crinal. Up above us was a roof protecting our heads, and it did its job well as dozens of volleys of elemental projectiles sailed toward us from within the hordes. I let out a long breath. The siege here was actually bigger than the one that hit Calatrop base, and the most powerful beasts were not mere authority fives. I could spot what seemed like 100 huge beasts. All of them were at least authority five, with some feeling like authority six. And there were others in the midst of the horde that moved with erratic steps, traversing the distance to the walls so fast that I could have sworn they were flying. Fire. I heard the shout, and all of the warlocks beside me let loose their spells. Amara's spells kicked up the wind while other spells radiated heat. Fireballs and spikes of rock all flew into the hordes before us. And Amara's spells weren't meant for attacking, but supporting the spells of others. Fireballs exploded, releasing plumes of fire. And Amara's bolts of air exploded within those fires, expanding them, spreading them and feeding them fuel. The explosions turned into wildfires as they spread across dozens of beasts, scorching their fur and meat, causing the horde to go rabid in pain. A portion of the oncoming tide was stunted as the magical fire burned some of the weaker beasts to ashes and melted the hides of the stronger ones. Amara was already Authority 5 herself, and with her enlightenment, she could fight well above her level. And in the crowd of warlocks atop the walls there were some with Authority 6 and 7 strength launching devastating area spells. There were thousands of beasts rushing forward, threatening to topple the walls and overrun this outpost. Each spell didn't seem like it did much as when one died, another simply came to take its place. But nobody here was going to roll over and become monster food. 
I assumed that this place had defended itself more than once before against tides, so I simply buckled in and did what I could. I targeted anything large and strong. While the memories I received from the Springfield were brief, it was more than enough to understand how to wield this weapon properly. I selected one with a ladder sight, adjusting the zero to 100 yards before taking aim. After the warlocks fired their spells, I fired my own. Boom. The explosion shook the battlefield as the empowered 30-06 sailed toward a large beast about 200 yards away. The round disappeared into its body, causing it to scream and buckle toward one side. Boom. I fired again, finishing it off on the floor. And right as I pulled the bolt, I heard a shout. Holy shit. What was that? You. It's my weapon. I responded to the officer who came pointing at me. Chapter 70. Telepathy. You should probably wait to start shooting until we get into the outpost. All right. I nodded at Vetsman's words and relaxed. We were fast approaching the outpost, and I could already feel the scourge tied in the distance. Prepare for contact. The driver shouted, Amara rising from my embrace and sticking her head out through the top hatch. Since she was a warlock, she could launch ranged spells, ones that didn't produce as much noise as I did. We didn't need to attract more attention than we already would. So for the sake of the entire convoy, I refrained. I watched Amara's robe shift as she waved her arms and cast spells. Recently, she had been eager to exercise her magic due to her new enlightenment. She would always come to me with new spells and new ideas, pulling on my knowledge to try and create more devastating magic. We had discussed quite a lot, and although I could only ever inspire her with my knowledge, she was really good at taking it and making something new. Not to mention that she had her mother who herself contained vast knowledge of all kinds of spells. And she was more equipped than I to help directly, so Amara had more than enough to keep her occupied for months. Now, she could unleash her power without restraint. Sieges were unique in that you didn't have to worry about friendly fire like during other missions working with your squad. It was really a contest to see who could do the most widespread damage. I could hear the explosions from outside the car, including the whistling from Amara's own spells as she launched them into the hordes. This went on for several minutes until at one point, I felt the car roll onto a paved road. Disembark. The driver shouted, prompting us all to rush out. I helped Amara down, letting the others go first before the two of us jumped out together. Our CO spoke to another commander as we all grabbed our gear. After a bit of shouting, he turned back to us. Platoon 8, listen up. All warlocks and ranged fighters, follow Captain Austin up the walls. All knights, follow me to the gates. Move out. Over here. We were waved over, my squad splitting up as Amara and I followed the captain up the walls. The battle was ongoing. There was no time to waste as we hurried up the stairs. Those of us from the Magisterium, including two warlocks from the other elite squad, were kept together and assigned a northeastern position. Our designation was Section 13 of the wall, and there was an officer giving firing commands to all the warlocks in intervals. After all, they couldn't be expected to cast spells continuously for an entire day. Longevity was important. This was a battle of attrition. Section 8. Prepare to fire. The officer shouted not long after we arrived. Amara planted her staff and prepared six different spells. I could feel the mana radiate from her body. Since we were up in the walls and there was enough going on, I didn't particularly need any noise canceling from her. Besides, I wouldn't hamper her excitement anyway by asking her to do something so mundane. I propped my gun up on the wall after setting up my portable seat in front of a crinal. Up above us was a roof protecting our heads, and it did its job well as dozens of volleys of elemental projectiles sailed toward us from within the hordes. I let out a long breath. The siege here was actually bigger than the one that hit Calatrop base, and the most powerful beasts were not mere authority fives. I could spot what seemed like 100 huge beasts. All of them were at least authority five, with some feeling like authority six and there were others in the midst of the horde that moved with erratic steps, traversing the distance to the walls so fast that I could have sworn they were flying. Fire. I heard the shout, and all of the warlocks beside me let loose their spells. Amara's spells kicked up the wind while other spells radiated heat. Fireballs and spikes of rock all flew into the hordes before us. And Amara's spells weren't meant for attacking, but supporting the spells of others. Fireballs exploded, releasing plumes of fire and Amara's bolts of air exploded within those fires, expanding them, spreading them, and feeding them fuel. The explosions turned into wildfires as they spread across dozens of beasts, scorching their fur and meat, causing the horde to go rabid in pain. 
A portion of the oncoming tide was stunted as the magical fire burned some of the weaker beasts to ashes and melted the hides of the stronger ones. Amara was already authority five herself, and with her enlightenment, she could fight well above her level. And in the crowd of warlocks atop the walls, there were some with authority six and seven strength launching devastating area spells. There were thousands of beasts rushing forward, threatening to topple the walls and overrun this outpost. Each spell didn't seem like it did much as when one died, another simply came to take its place. But nobody here was going to roll over and become monster food. I assumed that this place had defended itself more than once before against tides, so I simply buckled in and did what I could. I targeted anything large and strong. While the memories I received from the Springfield were brief, it was more than enough to understand how to wield this weapon properly. I selected one with a ladder sight, adjusting the zero to 100 yards before taking aim. After the warlocks fired their spells, I fired my own. Boom. The explosion shook the battlefield as the empowered 30-06 sailed toward a large beast about 200 yards away. The round disappeared into its body, causing it to scream and buckle toward one side. Boom. I fired again, finishing it off on the floor. And right as I pulled the bolt, I heard a shout. Holy shit. What was that? You. It's my weapon. I responded to the officer who came pointing at me. I explained to him that I was a ranged summoner and that my weapons were loud, but effective. After he got over his surprise, he just waved and walked away. So I went back to shooting. Unlike the warlocks, I didn't expend so much energy each time I shot a bullet. I could shoot for hours without rest, even if I didn't always operate at peak strength. Well, I knew myself best, and I was curious to find where my limits lay. During my last siege battle, it took me almost a day to kill over a dozen authority five beasts. And now, I just killed one without breaking a sweat. Seriously, these guns were too good at this. Pulling a portable chair out and getting comfortable, I zoned in and went to town. Crack. Shit. I suddenly ducked as a piece of shrapnel bounced off the wall next to my head. I then felt a hand smack me. Put on your hood. I know, I know. I smiled at Amara and tapped the band around my neck. Given a second or two, a hood had bloomed over my head and a mask covered my face. Taking a deep breath rejuvenated my body with energy. Shockingly, this mask was even more effective than the last one. Perhaps it had been upgraded a bit when the crystal and enchantments were moved over. Another plus was how the hood didn't narrow my field of view. It almost looked like it wasn't there at all, but I could clearly feel it. I also closed my coat, engaging its fullest protection measures before settling in once more. Bang. My gloved fingers continuously racked the bolt with every round fired. Stripper clips would appear in my hand whenever I went through all the ammo in the internal magazine, making reloads fast and easy. The magazine could only fit five rounds, so reloads were frequent. But as I fired more, I became more in tune with the weapon. I developed a rhythm, moving fast but not faster than the gun would allow me. I remembered a saying, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Rushing something only leads to mistakes, which slows you down even more than if you simply did it properly the first time. Although I treated this weapon a certain way according to the memories I gained, I also noticed how the weapon was rather perfectly made. For one, it wasn't worn and old. In the case of my Remington Lee scoped rifle, I had gone through hundreds, potentially thousands of rounds and never oiled nor cleaned it. And when a gun wasn't being taken care of, it would let you know by jamming up. I've personally encountered cases with rifles on earth where a bolt simply wouldn't move, a clear case of forgetting to oil it up. But I never encountered any of those imperfections. The guns I used all worked perfectly, giving me the most ideal performance they were meant to give. Every pull of the bolt was smooth, Every stripper clip slotted in perfectly, every pull of the trigger was crisp, and every bullet looked fresh off the assembly line. Although all summons were from other worlds, perhaps they weren't directly pulled from those worlds. They were spirits, so maybe they were simply embodiments of those weapons, mimicking them. My mind drifted as I sat there for a few hours. Amara was there with me, looking down at me sitting comfortably. I could feel her gaze after the third hour passed. It grew stronger with every passing minute only drifting when she was called to fire more spells. At some point, I had to zone back out and check on her. Are you okay? She stared at me without responding, glancing down at my legs. I looked down with her, seeing nothing particularly out of the ordinary. When I looked back up at her, I sat there in thought for several seconds, wondering what the hell she wanted, until she finally let out a huff and pulled my arm out of the way, taking a seat in my lap. Oh, you could have just said something. I'm tired. Eh. So am I. 
Hopefully we won't have to be up here for much longer. I mumbled and shifted our bodies, allowing her to use one of my knees as a chair while still being able to shoot. We were like that for another hour. Whenever she was called on, Amara would just extend her arm and fire a few spells from her palm. Since I didn't move from my little seat, she didn't have to either. Compared to all the other warlocks, we were rather comfortable. Still, as I watched her fire her spells, I got curious. If I was correct, mana circulated through the cardiovascular system in warlocks, meaning that spells were often cast from the body, mostly the palm. However, Amara told me that warlocks with fine control over their aura could use it as a medium as well. This was primarily how they cast multiple spells around their body, like Amara who cast six at once earlier. It was like aura was an extension of the body. Wait, I froze a bit. An extension of the body, huh? Knights, who used vigor, being able to extend their vigor beyond their body to attack something at a range. Warlocks, casting spells by extending mana beyond their body, forming spells in the air, allowing them to form more than one or two at a time. A summoner like myself, who extended Psyche beyond the body to trace out formations. All of these things were facilitated by Aura. The three magical energies that were normally contained within the body could be brought beyond it with Aura. That meant Aura was, almost literally, an extension of body parts. But not physical body parts. The mind. The body. The spirit. Psyche. Vigor. And mana. Something clicked for me, causing me to look over at Amara. And, somehow, I reached out and felt her. Hmm. She turned to me confusedly. I could feel surprise, embarrassment, a tinge of excitement, and stress. When she looked at me, I could feel her curiosity as her aura touched my own, as if they were our hands. She couldn't control hers, like she was fumbling around in the dark. But with me there, she had something to feel for. Before, using aura around other people made it feel like I could do everything short of reading their thoughts. I could feel and read their emotions, even predict their future actions within the next few moments, like I was sensing their subconscious. But now, looking at Amara, I could feel her so much deeper. I could feel her mind directly, her emotions feeding into my own aura, and all of the subconscious thoughts rambling about inside her head. And she could feel me too. She could only read what I gave to her, but she still felt it, like I was inside her brain. We sat there for almost a minute, even disregarding the shout of the officer who commanded us to fire. And, with a thought, I spoke. Not physically, but with my mind. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. She spoke out loud, but I could pick up her voice within her own mind. My eyes widened. Was this telepathy? Chapter 71. Lay Low. Amara closed her mouth and utilized her internal monologue. John? What is this? I don't know. I'm just using my aura. You're reading my thoughts. Something like that. We stared at each other. For me, it wasn't particularly difficult to do what I was doing. I had simply discovered another way to use aura, and it came as if completely natural. But Amara looked like she was struggling to control her thoughts and refrain from speaking aloud to communicate. I could clearly feel her nervousness grow as well. She obviously wasn't used to worrying about controlling her thoughts in case someone read them. I could even feel a bit of resistance from the small amount of psycho within her, not enough to do anything to me, but enough to let me know that she wasn't very comfortable with me inside her mind. When I noticed this, I pulled away and retracted my aura. She took a few deep breaths once I did, composing herself with an apologetic expression. I am sorry. It's not like I don't trust you. I know. It's fine. I still need to practice too. I smiled at her. Inserting myself into her mind and reading her thoughts was a whole other level of intrusion, or intimacy depending on how you looked at it. I would say it surpassed sex, even marriage, in that regard. After all, no matter what, everyone always had their own thoughts their own mind that they could seclude themselves into, a place that was theirs and theirs alone. I had suddenly taken that away from her. If she had done that to me, I would be a bit nervous too. Well, it wasn't like she couldn't feel it happening. As for whether she could forcefully stop it, I wasn't sure. We would have to see after practicing some more. Section 8. Dismissed. Oh, perfect timing. I grabbed Amara and stood with her, packing my chair. I need to get one of those. Amara mumbled her eyes on the chair as it disappeared. I chuckled while putting my gun away, walking with her off the wall. I had a bit of a headache from all the shooting, but it was overshadowed by the discovery of my new ability. It felt like my aura became more tangible, more like a limb instead of some fleeting feeling. 
When I reached out to Amara, it was almost like pushing a cloud of my aura toward her and then connecting to her mind by transmitting electrical signals across that cloud, like lightning. It was definitely odd, but that was simply the way I visualized what was happening. And if I failed to visualize it, the aura became much more difficult to control. Interestingly enough though, controlling my aura didn't take energy, only concentration. While concentrating took energy in its own way, it still meant that I wasn't expending Psyche to do something you'd think would cost quite a large amount of it. Or maybe I just wasn't trying hard enough. Either way, basic telepathy seemed both easy and difficult to carry out. Despite it happening rather seamlessly, it was a challenge to actually read Amara's thoughts, specifically what she was trying to say. Her mind felt like a mess of quiet chitterings, and only when she utilized her internal monologue did I finally hear something I could pick up on like a voice piercing through a thick veil of static over a radio. It was up to me to get better at tuning in, but it would take practice to figure out how. Still, I couldn't help but think of the possibilities. What if instead of a voice, we could pass on visuals? Would I be able to directly give her my memories of science? Would she be able to understand it directly? It was another level of communication surpassing anything else in this world and even on Earth. I was eager to use it. Amara and I left both of us tired from several hours of fighting. Thankfully, everyone's efforts managed to drive off the tide. There was no need to worry about it anymore. We went and found some of the rations, eating them while hanging around our platoon supply cache. Since we were visitors at this outpost, there weren't any proper bunks to house us. We would need to set up camp within a dedicated field for the night since we definitely weren't going back to base today. Hey. Omara tapped me, drawing my gaze. That thing you did. How? I just used my aura to reach out into your mind. I had been thinking and it occurred to me somehow. I went on to explain what went through my head. How aura was like an extension of magical powers rather than a separate entity. I told her to think of it like it was a limb, a medium to extend her powers through. She could already use her aura to cast spells beyond her body, using the space around her instead of her palm which enabled her to cast several at once. I told her to use that feeling. But finding a way to use aura wasn't so simple. After all, what else was she supposed to do with it besides what she was already doing? Finding an application for it was harder than using it. And I couldn't really help her with that. I didn't know how to use mana. It would be up to her for inspiration, and all I could really do was give her ideas about Aura itself. She sighed after a while, realizing nothing would just come to her like it had for me. I'll have to work on it. We should also try practicing whatever it is that you did. Telepathy. Telepathy. Yeah, that's what speaking between minds is called a nonverbal method of sending information directly to another person. I see. Then we should practice your telepathy. It should be very valuable in combat. M.M. So long as you're comfortable with it. She nodded as I glanced in the distance, seeing the rest of our squad walking over. Their armor was covered in blood and grime. It seems they had been busy. I will admit that I was quite nervous suddenly feeling your aura within my mind and knowing you could read my thoughts, but there's no reason I shouldn't try to work with it. And if I really were against it, then I should learn how to counter it anyway. I admire your commitment to becoming better. Still, I'll know when you're not up for it. I'll be in your mind, after all. So long as you don't disregard my determination. M.M. I smiled at her. Then, the others arrived. I looked at their bloodied selves and chuckled. Put you to work, huh? Something like this is normal for us. What's not normal is how easy you make missions when you're watching over us. I don't miss defensive formations. Tana grumbled while stripping her armor, revealing her thin clothing that stuck to her toned body slick with sweat. Fiden and Vet Mon were the same. All three of them looked tired. It was just that their tired looked different from mine or Amara's tired. Like many others in our platoon, we decided to set up camp on the dedicated field. I pulled out several items for that purpose and finally experienced my first camp out in another world. All squads were given a single tent large enough for six people. It wasn't very luxurious, just large and the fabric thick enough to protect against the elements. Everyone was required to sleep under the same tent for safety reasons. Being separated was just asking to be picked off. Gender separation was also non-existent. There was no cooking equipment and only a few large wool blankets. Other than some basic necessities and the rations, this was all we had. Though it was technically all we needed, living like this for any longer than a week would be rather horrid. However, Amara brought out something that would make longer-term campouts far more bearable. I have this water tap if anyone needs it. She held up a white crystal surrounded by a metal encasing engraved with complex spell runes. It was capable of generating water like a hose. How convenient. 
A warlock capable of water spells alone would be able to sustain an entire team by themselves for weeks so long as they could find a bit of food. The most valuable resource in the world produced with the wave of a hand. Vetsmon thanked Amara and took the crystal, using it to wash his armor. Tana and Fiden used it after him. I made final preparations as the sun started to set, painting the sky a pleasant orange and purple. John. As I started to relax while admiring the sky, I was called. I came back down to earth and glanced over at the puppet master, who was shockingly here. Do you mind heading up the walls and helping with the remnants? I stared at him in silence for several seconds before rising from my seat and walking over. The others watched me go without a word. I ascended the wall, communing with my gun, setting up my chair, and getting settled. At least there wasn't much more daylight. I wouldn't have to do this for more than an hour or so. Boom. I took my shot, sending echoes across the landscape and startling the entire base. The beast at the end of my sights fell unceremoniously. Then, I felt a presence approaching me. It was the puppet master. He leaned against the wall beside me, his arms crossed, and his gaze overlooking everything beyond the walls. I took one more shot before letting him speak. There are a lot of unhappy individuals, and rumors are being spread. Uh huh. I'm not a fan of Carrion either. He's been in his position for decades and has quite an impressive ego, not something that can be lightly challenged by a new student who bent the rules to get in. You're under Alberain's tutelage, so I'm not completely worried. But I know you and think some things are better laid out clearly. Bang. Another shot, and another beast collapsed. For a 200-yard shot with iron sights, it was pretty good. My gaze remained within the confines of my sights. You're walking on thin ice, kid. I had wanted to talk to you earlier, but Carrion kept a close eye on me. A lot of people now want you dead, though they still think you're nothing more than a nuisance who tried to slander their name. A commoner who doesn't know how deep this shit goes. And I suggest you keep it that way. I know you're not naive, so use theirs. And so long as you don't go out of your way to cause trouble, I'll do what I can to make sure they don't force your hand. Boom. I took one more shot and lifted my rifle, pulling away from the wall and glancing at the puppet master. I couldn't hide the smile. I appreciate it, Mr. Puppet. Really? So long as you're aware. I'll be damned if I allow you to let this get to your head, but the truth remains that you're incredibly talented. You're easily the most powerful summoner who has ever stepped foot into the Magisterium. If you were a noble, you'd have your path paved with gold and marrying someone like Amara would come with but a word. But you're a commoner, with a head harder than knights yet as intelligent as a summoner should be. So please, don't waste the gifts you've been given. At the very least, wait until you no longer need to. M.M. I'll do as you say. Wise. And so long as you're underneath my wing, I'll make sure the rest of the children stay obedient. We just have to get you to the military and the issues of nobility will disappear rather quickly. It'll be no more than seven months from now. Can you last seven months? I'll give you my best. I smirked, thinking about how funny this whole situation was. The puppet master grumbled after that. In all my years, I've never lost an elite. I will not have the first die by your hand just because he didn't realize he was staring down the barrel of death. Nor will I let your talent be squandered, even if simply for the good of humanity. Hmm. I doubted I was good enough to affect humanity as a whole. Perhaps Maxwell's advancement path would change the dynamic of the summoner class, but I was still merely the trial run for that. But the thought was nice. It was comforting to know that I had the puppet master to look out for me, a sail to guide me through the rocky waters, diverting the animosity of loathsome noble children. I owed it to him and Amara to try and lay low. Maybe I would have to swallow my pride, but with his reminder on top of Maxwell's, I was becoming more understanding of the fact that these nobles really would end me for even small things. Damn this world and its insane power gaps. What happened to guns being the great equalizer? So much for my ideas of world domination. Chapter 72. Expect the worst. Two days passed at the outpost, the commanders keeping us there just in case there was another follow-up attack. And there was, but it was hardly a threat. A few thousand monsters that were wiped out in half a day. After that, the other Magisterium squad was sent out with a dozen other soldiers to go hunt the commanding entity. Once they came back with its head, we were allowed to go back to base. The day after we did so, packing what little supplies we had left and making the drive back. The next couple days after that were uneventful. All the other squads, elite and regular alike, were sent out on constant missions. Many of them were hunting missions, some of them were reinforcement missions to other outposts. We were allowed to recuperate before getting sent out on regular patrols. Unlike at Calatrop base, each patrol had three vehicles of soldiers. If we were ever ambushed, 
we would always have a fighting chance unless some freakish enemy suddenly appeared. And during all the downtime we had, I simply worked on what I needed to. Whether that was practicing my shooting, working on my advancement formation, or training my telepathy. Amara was very receptive to my telepathy, willing to train it with me. And at first, she had some issues with it. I could tell that she got anxious with the level of interconnectedness, and I decided to break the connection a few times. After all, I was reading her thoughts, and to a certain extent, she couldn't stop me. Her own aura wasn't strong enough to directly counter mine, and she didn't have enough psycho within her mind to block me out forcefully. She had to learn how to compartmentalize her thoughts, how to hide certain things by simply refusing to acknowledge a thought. There were a lot of mind games to play, and, thankfully, I was able to guide her through a lot of it. After all, with my psyche and spark, my mind was freakishly amazing. It simply wasn't the mind of a human anymore. With faster speed of thought and a better memory, the sheer amount of information going through my head at any given time was several times higher than before. And I had discovered a lot about myself over time, especially about how to micromanage my mind. I pulled on these experiences and helped Amara. Because to some extent, learning how to counter mind reading would be valuable. There were all kinds of magic in this world like the lie detector spell Duchess Teleria used on me. If the day came where someone tried to use one on us, then it would be valuable to know how to prevent it from gaining anything. Because unless it directly extracted memories or information, those spells could attain nothing but the subjective opinion we gave it. It was the difference between reality and someone's own truth. They weren't always the same. But it was clear that Amara would need some time to get there, because she definitely wasn't right now. There were some thoughts that leaked ones that I was able to pick up on, and ones that embarrassed her greatly. Some of it was rather radical, and a lot of it was sexual. I ignored it, pretending that I couldn't read all her thoughts clearly even though my ability grew by the day. It eased her mind, but there were times that she slipped up, and I had to cut the connection to give her space to collect herself. I learned a lot about her over the course of just a few days. To put it lightly, I had no need whatsoever to doubt the integrity of our relationship. If anything, she made it seem like I was going too slow but both of us knew that we couldn't move forward so recklessly. I might be able to read some of her thoughts in the moment, but her impressions and subconscious leanings were still a mystery. That would take time to solidify and bring forward, and doing something extreme just because of a fleeting thought could flip those same thoughts very quickly. I had to learn to navigate the intricacies of the mind if I were to try and use my powers of the mind better. Practicing with Amara taught me far more than just how to tune into her thoughts better. It gave me access to the mind of another person, a source of profound insights into the nature of the human psyche. The notion to let Vetsmon and Fiden in on this crossed my mind as well, but for now I decided to keep it private. Not because I didn't trust them, but simply because keeping this a secret power between Amara and I made our relationship feel more special, which she liked. Once I got much better at it, I could use it in a more practical way with the others. For now, it remained an intimate bond with my girlfriend. Not that it also wasn't practical. My aura was honed massively in the short time since I discovered telepathy. Whereas before I could sense the emotions of others, I could now sense them with far greater detail. It was the difference between sensing anger and knowing who or what it was directed toward. It was a step below directly reading thoughts with a cursory glance. Not only that, but I could sense how the mind connected with the rest of someone's body. I had tuned into this feeling while watching Vetsmon and Fiden spar one day. I knew where they would move around a second before they actually did. However, because they moved so quickly in the mere span of a single second, I sensed the entire backlog of actions within that second. And the only reason it was only a second was because of the amount of movements. Things changed dynamically, and an action Fiden was planning to make two seconds ago could change. If anything, a single second of prediction was the best case and might only apply to the things they wanted to do, and that could change depending on the actions of their opponent. Reliably, it was only about half a second in advance where their movements would almost always fall according to my predictions because changing their actions within that tiny span was incredibly difficult if they were already committed. Not only that, but when I tried to predict the movements of them both, although things became far more complex, I was able to understand them better and increase the accuracy of my predictions. Naturally, this led to me understanding certain things about how knights fought and the differences between their combat styles and techniques. How they held their spears, the way Vetsmon shifted his weight around his shield, the way Fiden directed his momentum between the ground and the tip of his spear, and how their center of gravity shifted constantly. It was a lot to take in, and I could only begin to do something so crazy because of the power of my mind. 
but it was clear that it was still beyond me to some extent. I couldn't see the flow of battle and wouldn't be able to predict who won. It would take more observation over months in order to get a grasp, and that was only on those two. For another person, I would have to start from scratch. It was a good thing that my memory was getting better. I couldn't imagine trying to work with such a fast mind if I just forgot everything the next second. As for how this worked with beasts, I wasn't entirely sure. I would need time out in the field to get some data. At least for people, though, it worked pretty well. What was especially great was how I could sense all the gazes around me, and sense whenever someone directed hostility at me. Whether it was silent judgment or outright hatred, I could sense it all, and it came rather frequently. I could now easily tell who it came from, and it was always a noble, elite, or otherwise. Or maybe one of their goons, of which there were many. But I could tell that they were always too tired to do anything. It was clear that the puppet master was working them pretty hard, constantly sending them on missions and keeping them off my back. Couldn't be mad if you didn't have the energy to. Ever since our conversation that day, I hadn't had a single altercation. I kept to myself and my squad, simply doing as I was asked and refraining from being social. Still, I couldn't help but feel that something was brewing in the background. So in order to try and hone in on that feeling, I had to change my thought process and look at things differently. To the rest of the noble class, Amara was an extremely valuable asset to acquire. She was the daughter of Duchess Teleria who herself had access to one of the largest markets in the kingdom. Her city was an economic power in and of itself, and as its leader, she wielded massive amounts of money and influence. Marrying her daughter was like snatching a golden ticket. You would gain access to not just the Duchess, but to her markets and her connections. Unless you had nothing, you would gain immeasurably. Even other dukes would feel the prosperity. If it were anyone else below that level, they would be elevated to a whole new level. Even a royal child would gain access to a huge sponsor. And here I was, taking Amara for myself. And I wasn't even in the position to gain much of anything from her. Sure, she had money to spend. But even if I were willing to take advantage of that, the monetary gains couldn't come close to the financial gains of an entire business being given wings by the deep connections her mother held in the palm of her hand. So Amara was being completely wasted on someone like me. In the eyes of nobles, there was very little reason not to get rid of me. They simply had too much to gain. The only reason they weren't killing me outright was likely because of optics. It was clear that Amara liked me a lot, so getting on her bad side would only ruin the chances of other suitors. If I had to guess, they were waiting for our little fling to fade out. Once Amara was no longer interested in messing around with her boy toy, they could kill me without consequence. That would take time. How much time, though, was the big question. The puppet master stated that as soon as I entered the military, my issues with nobility would dissipate. I could only assume that touching the soldiers of the kingdom's military was taboo. So they would have to find other means besides assassinating me, but that would also make it far more difficult for me to die so easily. So then they had seven months until the time I left the magisterium. Would they kill me within that time? If Amara never looked like she was losing interest in me, then there would still be consequences for killing me. But that still didn't outweigh the benefits. Sooner or later she would get over my death and they would have their way. So at what point would they become desperate? And by then, what measures would they take to kill me? Perhaps they would have one of their children do it. Just maybe, that swordsman, Pontek Goliard, was my biggest threat. As the strongest elite, son of a duke, and one of Amara's suitors, he had every reason to kill me and enough backing to get away with it. So either I had to be extra wary of his blade, or he would find someone else to kill me and take the fall so he could swoop in later on. There were seven months left for everyone to get stronger. Maxwell believed I could hit authority five before then, and maybe I would have to for my own sake. For now, I didn't believe there was any reason to be concerned about those around me. It was still too early. They wanted Amara, or more specifically wanted me gone, but doing anything right now would cost them more than if they just waited. They probably didn't believe Amara was actually serious about me. I was nothing more than a commoner leeching off of her wealth, a parasite trying to bite off more than I could chew. I was scum in their eyes, that much was clear. I had a pretty good grasp on how the topmost echelons lived their lives and viewed those underneath them. Duchess Teleria was an exception to that. She was turning out to be very wise and open-minded, raising a daughter with good taste and a smart head on her shoulders. But the others weren't like that. I couldn't assume the best until they proved it. So every noble was to be treated as if they looked down on everything and everyone below them. I had to expect the worst. But they also weren't stupid. They had mind-boggling power but they knew when and how to use it. If I wanted to keep myself safe, 
I needed to accumulate as much as I could, lay low for as long as possible, but keep an eye on everyone around me. Through the malice of nobles I would be able to gauge when they were reaching their limit. What I would do when the bell tolled would be decided at that time. Chapter 73 Run I haven't asked in a while. Hmm. Duchess Teleria looked at her husband, curious about his sudden question in bed. Tonight, having finished his work early, he was able to have dinner with the family and go to bed at a reasonable hour. She had been reading a book, but his interruption made her shut it. Amara's boyfriend. You know more about him than I do. You only said that he's at least genuine. I intend to meet him soon, but until then I'd like to know if there has been any news about him. Oh. Well, there was one interesting happening a few weeks ago at the ball. The Duchess went on and described the events surrounding John's suspension. She talked all about John's altercation with the noble children and then his verbal battle with the president. Icor's eyes widened with every word. He did what? You heard me. It was lucky that he didn't do anything beyond throwing insults. Omara told me later that he could have killed that boy easily if he wanted to. You believe that? That kid is a knight and as far as I know, rather talented. I do. I guess I haven't shown you his record yet, hmm. The Duchess raised her aerial, tapping it a few times before sending a message. Icor opened his own to see the Black Spider repository, specifically the bounty on John's head. Below it was also an investigation report containing all the information the Duchess was able to find on him. His eyes bulged even more, reading what seemed to be a small biography of the kid. A kill count in the triple digits? He's a killer. Don't be so dramatic. He was basically forced, and none of the people he killed were innocent. Most are from the trenches. You forget about the human conflicts, distracted by the scourge. At the very least, I can tell you he's not a bad person. You seem to stick up for him. Considering he's a commoner, the very act of letting him date our daughter is beyond gracious. I know, which is why I did nothing to protect him from the president's ire. I let both of them take the pressure. If they can't handle it, they have no right being together. Well, it seems he handles himself just fine. Icor smirked, scrolling through the bounty a bit more before closing it, having seen everything he needed to. He thought in silence for a while, his wife remaining silent beside him as he formulated his thoughts on the matter. The smirk never left his face. What a ballsy kid. Not bad. If he can face the president, he's got enough guts to date our daughter. You approve. The Duchess' eyebrows raised in curiosity, causing her husband to scoff. Telexia, neither of us like the state of the noble class as it is right now. As far as I'm concerned, this kid is a breath of fresh air. I'll leave my first impressions for when I meet him, but for now he seems like quite the candidate. Although I have my misgivings about that awfully high kill count, I'm not naive. So long as he doesn't drag our daughter into his business, I have no issues. M.M. I've already taken care of that. As I figured. Make sure to invite him over for Christmas. Invite his family too. He doesn't have a family. No. Icor was shocked once again, feeling great sympathy. How pitiful. My condolences to this poor child. What happened? I'm not sure. There are no records of his family ever existing. I've never found a record of his own birth either. It's like he appeared out of thin air. And from Amara's vague words about how he'll never see them again, I can only assume they died. Or maybe he came from an outlander settlement. That's a bit of a stretch. If he did, how would he come so far by himself? And why would he leave his family all alone in the first place to make such a treacherous journey? I have no idea. Either way, he's shrouded in mysteries. H.M. Well, I don't see any major issue with it. Just invite him when they come back. Since he doesn't have a family, he can spend the holiday with us. Icor waved and shifted into bed, obviously desiring sleep. The Duchess went under the sheets with him, but still asked a question. Are you sure that's okay? He's Amara's boyfriend. Spending the holiday here as if he were family may be more than the relationship warrants. Some might think that we endorse his candidacy. Have some sympathy, dear. Can we not set aside petty politics for three days? Since when did you become so concerned about the greed and judgments of others? Don't accuse me like that. She sighed and relaxed into her pillow. But you have a point. I'll have Amara give him the invitation. M.M. Icor grunted, closing his eyes and falling into a snooze within mere seconds. The Duchess chuckled, admiring her husband for a while before cuddling against his body and going to sleep with his warmth. I wonder what this hunting mission is about. Who knows? But we only have four days left, so let's not end this with injuries like last time, okay? Amara tilted back her head and looked up at me. The cramped bed meant she had to lay against my chest, her body between my legs with little room to move. I sat against the wall at the head of the bed, 
looking down at her serious face with a smile. I'll be fine. This time, I'm completely covered. Even if we encountered that gorilla again, I would be able to kill it by myself. I believe it. But it's not always the strong ones we have to worry about. I know. Everything is strong against me. But I've got too many tools that help keep me safe, including the support of my squad. If I get hurt despite so much being in my favor, then either we'd be screwed regardless or I'm just that much of a dumbass. Well, I'll admit that you're at least kind of smart. Just a little. She turned and pushed herself against me, making me grin. Just a little? A teeny, tiny bit. A numerically infinitesimal amount. You and your weird words. She smiled before kissing me. We ended up staying like that for a few minutes. But then, both of us heard the door click. John Dash? Slam. Right as Fiden's voice came through, he slammed the door on himself. Amara and I glanced over. I suppose he wasn't expecting to see Amara straddling me in his own room. I chuckled and spoke. Come on in. Are you sure? Just come in. I rolled my eyes as he opened the door again, Amara going back to laying against me. He seemed a bit awkward looking at us. We report in ten minutes. All right. Hey, you should go get ready. M.M. Amara nodded as I pat her leg, swinging her legs over the bed. After she left and shut the door behind her, Fiden mumbled. You two get closer every time I see you. I sure hope so. What about you? How's Valerie? She's good. We aren't as close as you were with Amara, but I'm trying. Hey, don't put too much pressure on yourself. If she's the one, then things will work out. Don't worry about what ifs. Right. He smiled before digging through his chest, putting on some clothes and prepping his gear. I did the same. A hunt could last an entire day, and I needed to prepare accordingly. Before long, the two of us were walking to the briefing center. We met up with the rest of our squad along the way. And when we arrived, I saw the puppet master standing outside the door. He glanced at us. The rest of you head in. John, stick around for a second. The other looked at me before entering the room. Once the door closed behind them, the puppet master sighed. They went over my head. You're being paired up with another elite squad, and all of them are nobles. I wanted your squad to go alone with the other soldiers, but the major general rejected my suggestions and made his specific choices. They ignored you, which never happens, I'm guessing. There have been very few instances, but yes, something like this has never happened. I'll keep my head on a swivel then. M.M. I'll trust in your rational judgment. I hummed as he left those words, walking into the room. After seating with the rest of my squad, I saw the other elites we would be fighting with. Three out of their five looked at me with disguised hostility. It was nothing I couldn't feel with my aura, so their malice was clear. My face remained neutral throughout the briefing. Our objective was to hunt a scourge scout. These scouts were beasts dedicated to getting a read on targets and handing data back to the scourge. Their appearance was usually followed by an attack or siege. We needed to kill them, which wouldn't be easy. They were slippery and usually escorted by powerful beasts. The officer gave us some images of the beasts and what we should expect. The scout was a lanky bipedal entity with one massive cyclops eye and four tiny eyes around it. It could see things at a distance and could easily detect enemies no matter where it was. Normal stealth didn't work against it. Its observational abilities were top-notch, but it had little to no offensive power. Its scarily long fingers were similar to a monkey's, allowing it to swing between trees. And when it ran, its short legs combined with the sweeping range of its arms made it surprisingly fast even on flat terrain. It was a creepy son of a bitch, but otherwise didn't pose much of a threat. Its escorts would always protect it, but that was expected. Get rid of them, and it was a chicken on a chopping block. However, there were varying levels of these scouts. High-level ones, while not holding greater offensive power, were much more sly, intelligent, and had a few tricks up their sleeves. The different levels could be determined by the amount of little eyes around their singular large eye. Each little eye denominated its authority. The higher the authority, the stronger the escorts. And apparently, anything with strictly a single eye was to be avoided at all costs. If we saw a scout like that, running for our lives was the goal. Bang. Suddenly, the door to the briefing room was thrown open, everyone turning to the officer who came panting. Sir, we just got a report of the scout's location from Patrol 3. If we want to strike, now is the time. Good. Everyone gear up. Straight to the gates. Go. Everyone jumped from their seats, the briefing coming to a premature close. We all ran out, having already prepared, and boarded two vehicles by the gates. Both of them were APCs, enough to fit ten men each. It was also shockingly fast. After the back hatch closed with a click, 
The APCs sped off through the gates and into the distance. We arrive in 15 minutes. Be ready for immediate combat. The driver yelled, the truck rocking with the terrain. After settling for a few minutes, I looked across from the side of the interior where my squad sat. The other squad was directly across from us, the two sides entering something of a stare-off. I recognized three of them, elites I had previously worked with. In that squad, there were four knights and a single warlock. I was the only one of two summoners in the elites, so I couldn't be surprised when I never saw any. I didn't recognize two of them though, probably some nobles who came late to the game. Nobody said anything as we drove, but inwardly, I made telepathic contact with Amara. Hey. Hey. She twitched a bit when she felt my aura. By now we had gotten far more comfortable with this, so the process was close to seamless. The two of us kept looking forward though. We had decided to make it a habit of pretending as if nothing changed whenever we engaged in telepathy. It took some practice, but both of us had pretty good poker faces. This other squad. Keep an eye on them. The puppet master warned me and the situation is a bit fishy. Are they going to give you trouble? It's possible. I can already taste how much they don't like me. They're hiding it. But the malice is there. I understand. Keep your telepathy active just in case I need to warn you. All right. I smiled a bit. Omara and I had also been practicing long-term telepathy. And I had figured out a rather ingenious way to keep my telepathy active indefinitely. With my spark, I could allocate brain power toward maintaining the connection. It was difficult at first, but the spark was a second mind, so I was able to train it and make the ability run itself. Of course, it took the entire concentration of my spark since it was controlling my aura, but it wasn't a bad trade-off. I still had the rest of my mind, which was more than enough. So I handed off the telepathy to my spark, using the rest of my mind to focus on the task before us. Scout spotted. The driver suddenly shouted, the APC coming to a screeching halt. The back hatch then flew open. All the knights jumped out first, then the warlocks and myself. We assessed our surroundings. We had arrived at the top of a long hill that sloped down into a valley. The valley was filled with tall rock formations, monoliths that seemed to sprout out of the ground like trees. Each monolith was at least as tall as a four-story building and separated by an average of 150 yards. The valley was a beautiful geological formation. The monolithic rocks were covered in huge vines that seemed to grow all kinds of immature fruits, but other than the vines there wasn't anything else besides grass and the occasional flower. After taking several seconds to admire the valley, I shifted my focus to the other APC that was giving chase. The scout was making its way down our hill and into the valley among the rock formations. Around it was its escorts, about twenty-five spiked wolf beasts as fast as they were deadly. The other APC managed to roll down the hill and deploy its knights and warlocks, all of the soldiers rushing toward the scout but being blocked by the wolves. The scout continued to flee, its uncanny movements throwing it several yards at a time. From the hilltop, I suddenly rushed to a nearby ledge and laid down, taking out my Springfield equipped with a ladder iron sight. I took a deep breath, calming myself even as it continued to run further and further away. It would soon go beyond my effective range, but I didn't panic. I ticked the ladder up, increasing the zero distance before getting a steady aim. My sight trailed its figure, waiting until it reached my zero distance and estimating its average movement speed. It was lanky and erratic, the furthest thing from an easy shot. The only thing harder than this was picking off a flying bird. But the intuition of a human was a rather amazing thing. We understood the world around us inherently. It was necessary for survival. So despite needing to make several adjustments as the scout ran across varying levels of terrain, shifting up and down as it ran across the occasional boulder, I still managed to find a sweet spot. And I fired. Boom. The rifle exploded, the recoil pushing into my shoulder, but my body remaining still as if it never even moved. And I watched as blood flew, the bullet tearing the scout's arm off. I smirked as Amara got behind me. Holy shit. That was an amazing shot. I agree. I chuckled. Amara probably understood my guns better than anyone by now. We had talked about them extensively. So she also knew how hard of a shot that was. If I was correct, the distance to the scout was about 280 yards when I fired, a bit more than the zero of 250 yards that I set for myself. But it didn't kill it. The scout, although injured and bleeding, still continued to run. But at the very least, it wouldn't get far. I wouldn't be surprised if it collapsed from blood loss eventually. Killing it would be easy once they got rid of those wolves, which would only be a matter of time. Vetsmon chuckled from behind. All right, let's go and help them. 
John and Amara, you can relax up here. Don't have to tell me twice. There was no way I was going to run up and down a hill if I didn't have to. Before Vetsmon ran down though, I looked to the other squad composed mostly of knights. Hey, you guys should go with them. There's no reason there should be any casualties. They were silent, a few of them looking at me with frowns. I could clearly feel their growing hatred and annoyance, like I had ruined some plan of theirs. Vetsmon, Fiden, and Tana also looked at them, expecting their cooperation. There was no reason they shouldn't, and that put even more pressure on them. But then, we all heard a shout. Board the APC. We'll drive down there. Oh. I scoffed a bit, all of us running back to the truck. Right. Why should the knights have to run as well? Why don't we all just drive down together? That's obviously the smart thing to do. It wasn't like I was trying to separate myself from a threat to my life or anything. Thanks, driver. I grumbled while boarding, the APC rolling down the hill as soon as the hatch closed. Once we arrived, though, I didn't move from my seat. The knights had no choice but to embark and join the battle. The other squad looked hesitant at first, but unless they wanted to get yelled at, they would have to go. They also wouldn't attack me in front of everyone, especially my squad. So I watched them leave with even more indignation. Some even waited outside for me and Amara, but we just stayed put. I waved at them as they left. This is a job for knights. Have fun, you all. They were silent as they left, leaving our sights. I could hear the sounds of battle beyond, and it was nothing but a slaughter. Without having to worry about the scout, everyone could simply focus on the battle without taking any risks. I had made this mission several levels easier with that single well-placed shot. Well, I guess boring missions are good missions. Amara crossed her arms. I could tell she was eager to let some of her fancy magic loose, but she was staying by my side just in case. I hugged her close, smiling as she automatically snuggled into my chest. Inwardly though, I had the random thought that perhaps I should try and find a guitar. I used to play it on earth all the time, so for moments like these, it would be good entertainment. Besides, chicks love the guitar. Maybe this world had one. Otherwise, I'd have to get one custom ordered. Though I didn't exactly know everything about a guitar's design, I knew enough of the important details like the types of strings it used. In my head I started to ponder, but as the battle continued outside, I had an odd feeling grow into an ominous one. Using my aura, I felt around but couldn't sense the presence of anyone nearby. But the threatening feeling within me kept growing until suddenly, it screamed at me. My coat activated, bringing everything to a slow as I grabbed Amara, throwing our bodies out of the APC. Boom. It exploded behind us, a wave of Majika washing over our bodies and launching us several more feet. I looked back, seeing a massive hole going from the front of the APC to the seats that we had just been sitting in. It was like a laser had melted a hole through it, destroying the white crystal powering it in the process of trying to kill us. My mind instantly processed what had happened and started hypothesizing. Was this the doing of those nobles? The other squad was still out there fighting, so did they hire a third party? Did they hire a hunter? perhaps a warlock or a knight with an enchanted bow. But the strike was instantaneous. The only thing I could liken it to was a laser. There was no arrow, so if it were a warlock, they had to be incredibly powerful. However, after thinking for a few seconds, I took a glance through the melted hole. And in the distance beyond, on the side of a hill, there was a tall, uncannily gaunt entity staring at us. And it had a single massive eye that covered its entire face, obvious even from a distance. My hair stood on end, a single word running through my mind, something reiterated during our briefing several times. Run. Chapter 74. Confidence. Even as I realized that the lives of every person here may be forfeit, I still maintained my telepathic connection with Amara. And it seemed that she was able to feel my panic. It's the single-eyed scout. Shit. I could sense Amara's initial panic turn to dread. At the same time, I suddenly saw a twinkle from the direction of the scout. I grabbed Amara once more throwing ourselves behind the cover of the truck. ZZT. The laser shot right past us, burning a hole where we were not even a second ago. After that, there were several shouts. That's an Authority 7. Everyone retreat now. Scatter to the hills. Fuck. Run. All the knights started to sprint. The fastest ones were already halfway up the hill before anyone else could even get to the base. At the same time, I tapped my aerial, pulling up the Puppet Master's profile. But when I dialed in, the call never went through. Fuck. John. Amara. Right here. I yelled in response, subsequently hearing a thud as Fiden, Vetmon, and Tana all landed near us, taking cover behind the truck. With a thought I grabbed Fiden, pulling him in. 
You grab Amara. We need to run to cover. This thing's attacks land instantly, so you can't expose yourself for too long. There's a forest nearby, so head to it. Got it. That's Mon. I'm with you. Tana, I have a mission for you. I grabbed her next, bringing her close. My aerial isn't working, and we need to contact the base. Do you remember the way back? Why yes. Good. I need you to get there as fast as possible. Deliver the message, and get us a rescue team. Can you do that? Yes. She looked hesitant, perhaps not wanting to leave us behind. But I had to at least guarantee that, so long as we survived long enough, we would get rescued. Without getting the message over, we might not survive unless we made it back to base ourselves. And I didn't think we would be able to outrun that scout so simply. After all, who said the other scout wouldn't have escorts? If the escorts were on the same level, I couldn't help but think we were fucked either way. But we had to try. After nodding to Tana, I looked at everyone else. Attract the attention of anything looking at us. Tana, you focus on getting out first. Use people as bait if you have to. Just get to the base. Ready? Yes. All right. Go. I yelled, and everyone shot out from behind the truck. Fiden, the fastest, grabbed Amara and held her against his body while dashing like a bolt of lightning. Vetsmon grabbed me as well, bounding with obscene strength to ascend the hill. He wasn't as fast as Fiden, but that was exactly why I had him carry me instead. And as he seemed to fly through the air, every impact with the ground causing me to grunt in pain, I managed to peek over and get a look at what we were dealing with. The other APC, which some people had tried to start and run off with, was rapidly decommissioned with a laser. After that, several beasts emerged and tore it open. These beasts were much bigger than the other wolves. They were clearly of canine origin, but instead of being as large as a wolf, they were as large as a bear. They weren't as fast due to that, but they seemed impossible to kill with their fur that looked like metal bristles. And their ferocious look was by no means an exaggeration of their abilities as they tore the APC apart like it was plastic. As for the scout, it was undoubtedly the fastest of the group. It was able to charge up and down the mountain with ease, firing its laser at any escaping soldiers. And what I saw clearly painted the difference between an Authority 5 soldier and an Authority 5 elite from the Magisterium. The student knights all scattered in different directions, their legs carrying them with uncanny agility. Whenever the scout tried to fire at them, they were always able to dodge. They didn't have to even take a glance back. They simply kept running, and because of that, they were the first to evacuate the immediate range of the beasts. The soldiers, while strong, weren't as amazing as the students. They didn't match them in strength, agility, or stamina. There were only two soldiers who were able to make decisions fast enough to escape immediate death and keep up, and those two were Authority Six. This hunt wasn't supposed to surpass a certain level, and it was nearby the base as well. Anything as strong as the Authority 7 Scout wasn't supposed to appear, especially not this close. Even then, an Authority 7 Warlock was still assigned to our detachment as our leader. However, he alone couldn't handle all those beasts, let alone save us in the process. He had already ascended the hill, launching out various spells to try and suppress the Scout. But it was clear that the laser was a great threat to him as he always hunkered down whenever he attracted its attention. Soon, everyone who wasn't killed in the first several seconds was able to ascend the hill. And in the distance, there was a dense forest. Everyone made a beeline for it, having the same idea as me. More coverage meant that we would be able to prolong our lives. Fiden and Vetsmon didn't need to be told anything, dashing off as soon as they saw the forest. As for Tana, she was already well ahead of us. Although she couldn't compare to Fiden's sheer speed, she had more stamina and could cross a longer distance faster than anyone on the team. It was exactly why she was our scout. She didn't even bother with the forest, diverging in another direction and disappearing over some hills. A few lasers were fired her way in the process, but she was able to dodge them all. Her aura definitely wasn't lacking. Once I lost sight of her, I turned back to the scout. It continued to try and kill soldiers and students and it managed to get a few of the soldiers while they ran to the forest. By now, eight of the initial twelve soldiers had perished, only the best of them surviving, and none of the elites had died. I felt that we had done pretty good. However, as I looked back and focused on the wolves, I suddenly felt my neck tingle. I yelled, Dodge! Ha! Huh. Vetsmon and Fiden jumped without hesitation. However, I still saw that beam of light flash right under me. It pierced straight into Vetsman's leg, as if his armor didn't even exist. ZZT. Ack. Shit. We went tumbling through the tree lean, but the big man kept his hold on me and jumped right back up despite the injury. 
Keep going. He yelled, pushing through with even greater strength as we disappeared into the trees. We lost sight of all the other soldiers and elites, only the sound of that Authority 7 warlock doing light battle with anything that came near him. We slowed down considerably having to dodge all the plant life. But after a while of running, we got to a point where I no longer felt threatened. That's when I announced. Hey, we're good. Stop here. Ugh. Vetsmon grunted as we came to a stop, putting me down before going to the floor. His breathing was labored and his face scrunched in agony. Let me see. I jumped around and took a look, seeing how the armor had basically melted to his skin around the entry wound. The hole wasn't large and didn't go all the way through, but it was still deep and couldn't completely seal itself up. Under normal circumstances, I would tie off the leg so it would stop bleeding, but the wound had been mostly cauterized by the attack anyway. Plus, Betsmon was a knight. Certain medical practices simply wouldn't work on someone like him. Still, I looked inside the wound to assess the damage, and I saw a little bit of white, an indication of the bone. It grazed the femur, but only slightly. The only real damage is to the muscles. Do you have recovery pills? Yeah. He nodded, waving his hand and taking one out. Mine weren't potent enough to do much for him. It was good that he came prepared. I did have something, though. I took out my foaming device, locking a canister into place before spraying it into the wound. I filled it completely, letting it foam up and seal it. It had some numbing properties and would at least prevent anything undesirable like bleeding or infection if that was even possible for someone like him. All right, that'll prevent bleeding even while moving. It'll hurt, but it's still functional. You can push through it, because I sure as hell can't carry you. Huh, yeah. He let out a shuddering chuckle, beginning to calm down as the wound stabilized. After that, I looked up, scanning the forest around me. Asterisk Awu. Asterisk. The call of a wolf echoed, likely indicating that it had found some unfortunate prey. We had to avoid that if we wanted to live. I let out a long breath. I don't know how long it will take for help to come. We need to keep making distance, though. Scouts are meant to find people regardless of the terrain. This forest won't help us that much. Besides, I have a feeling it was particularly interested in us. I noticed that. Amara suddenly chimed in. Of all the people it could have targeted out in the open, it had to choose us, who were inside the APC. It shot at us again afterward. I have a feeling it deliberately targeted the white crystal inside the APC first since its shot wasn't actually directly toward us. But the second time, it was definitely going for us. I don't know why, but we have to assume the worst. We can't let it find us, or things will become much more difficult. Let's go then. Betsmon grabbed a nearby rock, pushing himself up. I stood with him, looking in the direction opposite from where we came. And we started walking. I focused on my aura as we did so keeping track of anything negative that I felt. We likely wouldn't be able to see our enemy if it started to come close, so I was now acting as a living threat detector. Unfortunately, we didn't even pass 10 minutes before I suddenly felt my spine shudder, turning around. Dodge. Shit. Everyone jumped as my coat suddenly activated, dilating time. With a glance, I saw the scout about 50 yards away, looking right at me. I used all my strength to move behind cover, but it wasn't fast enough. I couldn't move faster than light. And I watched as its eye flashed, a laser suddenly appearing and shooting straight for the center of my chest. It hit my coat, and for a second, I felt utter dread and desperation. But it faded just as quickly when I saw smoke rise from the leather, feeling no pain in my chest. Huh. John. I heard Amara scream as my momentum threw me to the side behind a rock. I almost couldn't process it for a second, but my coat had in fact eaten that shot like it was a laser pointer on a keychain. Eh. He he he. I couldn't hold back the laugh, feeling inexplicable. A coat that could block the laser attack from an Authority 7 scout that could pierce through Vetsman's armor. Maxwell, you son of a bitch. How far into your debt was I? Several thoughts and emotions ran through my mind all at once, but none of it could compare to the overwhelming confidence that had appeared because of this piece of clothing. So with a thought, I jumped out from behind cover and found the scout. And without a word I sprinted toward it, weaving between the trees, and reaching it in mere seconds. And my hand appeared a grenade. When I was only ten yards away from it, I pulled the pin, loosening my fingers and letting the trigger fly off with a cling as a large chunk of my psycho was stripped away. I held it for two seconds before tossing it toward the scout and dipping behind a nearby tree. Bang. S-C-R-E. The scout screamed, not dead, but injured. After that I grabbed a trench gun and flew out from behind the tree. 
I found the scout, still stumbling from the impact of the grenade but still getting ready to escape. However, with a bit of time dilation, I was able to aim right at its leg and pull the trigger. Boom. SCRE. Boom. After I blew off its long leg, I targeted its torso and arms. It stumbled to the floor while trying to defend itself, but my shotgun only blew off chunks of its flesh in the process. Then I saw its eye flash. I reflexively turned my head right before the beam appeared, letting it singe my coat instead of my face. I felt warmth as it lasered me for several seconds in desperation. But once the light disappeared and I appeared unscathed, I went right back to shooting it. I let off six rounds in quick succession, the slam fire working its magic as two more of its limbs flew off. It continued to scream all the while, probably calling for help as it had bit off more than it could chew. This thing was an Authority 7, but it was dedicated entirely towards scouting, shooting that laser beam, and running. It had no defensive abilities at all, especially considering how it was a warlock-type beast. Boom. Asterisk scree. Asterisk. That's right, you lanky piece of shit. I walked up to it after it had already been blown to pieces. Blood sprayed everywhere as it unsuccessfully scrambled around. It didn't even have the energy to shoot. And without hesitation, I took out a shotgun shell and slotted it directly into my empty chamber, closing it before placing the barrel against the top of its chest where its neck sat. Boom. With that shot I separated its head from its body, leaving its giant eye completely untouched. And I grabbed the head by some loose skin, throwing it into my spatial sack before running back. I appeared covered in blood, but didn't give my squad any time for questions before yelling. Let's go. We need to get the hell out of here. Chapter 75, Stark Difference Amara stared, her eyes wide and her mind going blank as John was hit with that laser. She didn't know what his coat was capable of. It had only ever defended itself against Authority 4 beasts, and even he didn't know how expensive it was. But there was no way it could defend against an attack that melted through both the armor of an APC and Vetsman's personal armor, which was undoubtedly of extremely high quality. How could that soft leather possibly compare? All she saw was the flash, and then, he fell back over some cover, disappearing from her view. She wanted to run over, but Fiden grabbed her before she could, pulling her behind some trees. After that, several seconds went by, and each second, she felt like she was screaming inside of her head, desperately trying to get John to respond. The fact that his telepathy, which was supposed to be constantly connected to her, was silent made her realize that this time, he really might be dead. The last time, he had almost died due to circumstances that had been entirely preventable. Now, it was like fate had simply decided to take him from her, leaving no room for contest. It was unfair. It was damnable. She felt overwhelming hatred. It was unacceptable for something like this to happen. The scourge wasn't allowed to hurt those she cared about, let alone kill them without consequence. It was a cancerous tumor that needed to be excised from this world, yet doing so demanded a price in blood and she was suddenly willing to pay it. Mana exploded within her body as she pried herself from Fiden's grasp. The air under her feet then carried her forward, ready to shoot her toward that scout. The elements around her began to respond to her hatred, priming themselves to explode forth with power backed by her mana. The very atmosphere bent to her will. It didn't matter if it would cost her life, she would kill that beast. But then, just as she made her conviction, she saw John dash out from behind his cover. She froze watching as he ran over to the scout and pulled out a grenade. She could sense his psyche fill it to the brim as he pulled the pin and threw it. And she saw as the scout did little to defend itself against the odd weapon it couldn't recognize. And as if they didn't exist, her worries faded away. Bang. The grenade exploded, and John pulled out his trench gun. She watched from the side as he dismembered the scout, watched as it writhed on the floor after he blasted off an arm and a leg, desperately trying to flee. And it let off another laser making her panic once more. Yet John did nothing to dodge it, simply letting it hit him. And the laser landed on his coat for several seconds, the beast screaming in anger, yet not damaging even a single hair on his body. He was completely immune to its attacks. After that, she simply stood there as he killed it and took its head as a trophy. How simple. It was almost effortless. Its head was removed from its body as if it were never a threat in the first place, like it hadn't killed ten other soldiers before it. She didn't know what to say. Even when he ran back, giving them the order to start running again, she remained silent. Was she shocked? Was she relieved? Was she scared? The emotions within her rampaged. From having lost her boyfriend, her lover, to watching him kill that beast like it was a chicken sent inexplicable waves throughout her mind. 
the sorrow, the hatred, the happiness. All of it coalesced as she was carried. And when she felt his telepathic connection reappear in her mind, when it spurred the memories of his figure as he killed what should have been a lethal threat to their entire convoy, she seemed to realize what she felt. Yet it felt so natural that she almost didn't acknowledge it, as if there was nothing to acknowledge since it should have always been there. She turned her head, seeing Vetsmon strenuously carry John on his back. It was putting the big man through a lot of pain, but it was still faster than if John ran himself. She watched John, seeing his green eyes through the narrow opening between his hood and mask. He didn't look back at her. He was too focused. He always seemed to flick a switch whenever they entered combat. There was no room for any romance during that time. He didn't even have sympathy for the guy carrying him, simply ordering it since that's what they needed, and since he knew Vetsmon could do it despite the pain. And when she calmed down and thought about it, she decided to save her words for later. It was something that she wouldn't regret no matter when she said it, but it might still place John into a bit more of a precarious situation. But it didn't matter to her when she did. All that mattered was that they were together and that the time would come in the future where she wouldn't ever have to worry about the thoughts or opinions of others. There would come a time when anyone who dared to challenge their relationship would be put down by her personally. And until that time, anyone who dared to undermine her position by his side, or his by hers, would be met with the full wrath that her status afforded her, the very same status that they were all trying to greedily claim for their own gain. Now, even the tiny amount of doubt within the deep recesses of her mind had been washed out like a dusty corner and she smiled contentedly, staring at him as if there were no other person in the world. I tapped my aerial, calling the puppet master. And sure enough, the call went through this time. John? Yeah, it's me. We're on our way. Where are you? I'll send you my location. I scrolled through the screens in front of me. Normally, without connection to a node, an aerial would lose its ability to geolocate since it required the node as a reference point. But because I regained my lost connection, it worked as if I were in a city. Soon enough, I sent our location to the puppet master. After that he hung up, saying he was only five minutes out. I sighed in relief. I no longer felt any threat to my life, so my squad had stopped running and started relaxing. Without the scout, the rest of the beasts probably weren't so eager to pursue us. Even if they were, they had obviously lost us. I saw Amara casting some air magic, so she had probably dispersed our scent or scattered our trail. Regardless, I felt perfectly safe, so I had no issue acting like it. I let Vetmon relax. That foam came in handy, otherwise he would have started bleeding again with all that movement. And although it was painful, he got through it well. The man was tough as nails, as a knight should be. All of his training was paying off. As I took a seat though, I saw Amara walk over to me. She didn't say a word as she straddled me, wrapping me in a deep hug. For a while I was worried but my telepathy told me that she wasn't fearful or stressed. She was calm. After a few minutes she shifted from a hug to a cuddle, allowing me to stroke her hair, which I enjoyed doing. Her pale face underneath her ashy hair looked positively beautiful. I smiled, thinking of nothing but how pretty she was and how much I adored her presence. The only thing that could interrupt us was our rescue. Three APCs rolled up to the tree lean that we had stopped by. Once we saw them underneath the afternoon sky, we all got up and met with them. Are you guys okay? Tana came running over first, checking on all of us with a worried expression. I could clearly see how tired she was. To desperately cross such a distance knowing our lives depended on it must have put extreme strain on her body. She already looked sickly, her legs shaky and weak. Yet she quickly noticed Vetsmon and his wounds despite that, hurrying over to check on him. Oh God, what happened? The scout got me, but I'm fine. Are you sure? Tana worriedly asked about him causing me to openly jump and cheer silently nearby. What the hell are you doing? That excited to see me. Oh, hi. My mood disappeared as I turned to the puppet master, giving him a handshake. Thanks for coming. M.M. Good job surviving. Those Cyclops scouts are extremely deadly, yet they always like to linger around. They rarely show, but when they do it's usually a bloodbath. Where are the others? No idea. Everyone who survived the initial assault dispersed into this forest. They could be anywhere probably being chased by the escorts. I see. A moment. The puppet master suddenly walked off, standing in an open area before taking out a staff. After a few seconds, he raised it and tapped it on the ground, causing a ripple of light to spread out. It highlighted every animal and creature in the forest for miles around, dead or alive. We could all see it, as if we had all been granted x-ray vision. 
and it revealed some ongoing fights as well as several human corpses. He yelled, Go assist our men. Move out, now. Roger. All of the soldiers from the APCs ran off, several of them being Authority 7, two of them being Authority 8. They disappeared into the distance within moments, assisting those who were still alive. After that, the puppet master pointed to one of the corpses before waving. I saw as the Cyclops Scout's corpse flew over from the distance, landing before him, every dismembered limb included. He stared at it for a few seconds before looking at me, and I took out its intact head, causing him to scoff. What a fucking monster. Did you kill it by yourself? Yes. How? I silently responded by lifting the collar of my coat. It couldn't hurt me. TSK, talk about buying a second life. Well, I gotta be able to match those rich nobles somehow. No shit. Hey, all of you. He suddenly called the rest of my squad, grouping them together. I'm required to ask, did John single-handedly kill the scout? If any of you contributed even slightly, I need to know. Yes, he killed it by himself. MM, we didn't help. Everyone confirmed the reality, causing him to sigh. Very well. John, you're about to accumulate some more notoriety. Yeah? How many points is this worth? It's not about the points. You're the first person in Magisterium history to personally kill an Authority 7 while being three levels below it. Although this is one of the only enemies of the Scourge that have defenses so slim at such a level to even be capable of dying by your hands, that fact still remains. Not to mention that you're a mere summoner. However, this will not go through easily. He grumbled, taking the head from my hands. At least it's completely intact. Still, you all will be questioned under truth to confirm what happened here. I'll be keeping the remains as evidence of your fight with it as well. Vizen, come heal Vetsman's wound. He called, and Vizen brought Vetsman over to one of the vehicles, inspecting and treating his leg. The puppet master turned back to us. Go rest. You won't have any more missions for the rest of your time here. Once we find everyone, we'll bring you back to base. All right. We all walked off, gathering around one of the APCs. Fight and pat my back. Congratulations. And thank you. There's no reason to thank me. Don't be so humble. That thing might have been the death of us if you hadn't handled it. Even I was scared for a bit. He mumbled, causing me to nod. I had been scared too. Faced with something that could so easily kill us, that had so easily killed several soldiers, I was afraid for both myself and my squad. I had ignored that fear as soon as we started running, but it was still there. If anything, the fear fueled my focus and determination. And as soon as I discovered that I could fight that thing, I did so without hesitation. If I didn't, we would still be on the run, and we couldn't have done that for too much longer. Betsmon had been reaching his limits, and there were wolves that none of us could kill on the way. The fact that I could kill it was a miracle, one that I had capitalized on perfectly. Still, I didn't necessarily face it because I hated the scourge and wanted to kill them. I faced it because the fear of being overwhelmed after running ourselves down to our limits was scarier than the fear of fighting the core of the threat head on when I had the advantage. Not to mention how all of this was only possible because my life had been paid for and secured by Maxwell back when he gave me this coat. He bought me a second life, as the puppet master stated. I was grateful, but also painfully aware of my own mortality and how a beast just a few levels above me could so easily kill me. And it would take power far above even that beast in order to secure my life against those kinds of surprises. The leather of my coat came from a beast that could easily defend against the attack of an Authority 7. I truly wondered what kind of monstrous creature Maxwell used to make this thing, and how much it cost to make this coat. Millions? Tens of millions? Either way, I owed him far more than I could ever repay. Amara continued to cling to me as we waited for the survivors. In the process of the rescue, several of those beastly wolves were killed and brought back. And after about an hour, the casualties had been counted. All elites from the Magisterium survived. And of the thirteen soldiers who left, only three survived. It was unfortunate, but the stark difference was apparent. There was a reason Magisterium students demanded respect even when they left and entered the military. This was the reason why. They surpassed those of a similar level, especially the elites. Only the Authority 7 and two Authority 6 soldiers had survived. Every one other soldier, 10 Authority 5s, had been killed. And most of them had been killed in the initial attack or while running into the forest. Everyone was solemn as all the recoverable corpses were loaded. After that, we drove back to base. I was glad to have Amara there with me to soothe my soul. I knew that things would only get worse as I continued down this path, but so long as I was going to walk it, I was grateful to have her by my side. 
Chapter 76, Target I woke up to the sound of shallow breathing, as well as some moisture on my chest. My eyes fluttered open to see the rail car around me, filled with couches and chairs and tables, of which were occupied by sleeping elites. And laying on my chest was Amara, the drool from her mouth being soaked up by my shirt as her light breath tickled my neck. I smiled and shifted, hugging her body comfortably as I simply relaxed. Over the last few days on base, I had noticed a bit of a change in her demeanor. She looked at me with a bit more passion. It was also a bit more difficult to get her flustered. Usually my public shows of affection caused her to blush profusely while attempting to hide. It was pretty easy to tease her that way. But now, it was like she didn't mind. She still got embarrassed, but she no longer hid from it. If anything, she seemed to welcome it, starting to reciprocate by kissing me back or walking around with her arms linked. By all means, it was welcome. But I couldn't help but wonder what spurred the change and why. I could clearly sense her feelings, but she was more confident now, and our practice with telepathy meant that she had learned to conceal her deeper thoughts. The details I could glean were fewer. Not only that, but I had run some tests, both with and without her. For one, when she was sleeping like this, linking to her mind would immediately make her conscious. I had woken her from three naps that way, much to her irritation. I had a feeling that this phenomenon had to do with the lack of dreaming people in this world experienced. After asking her about it, I confirmed that dreaming was an extremely rare occurrence in this world. Whereas I had been dreaming almost every night, Amara had never had a dream before. The only thing close to that was when she was being enlightened, but that experience wasn't much of a dream. However, I also discovered that, maybe because there was no dreaming, they needed less time to sleep as six hours was enough for most people to feel completely refreshed. Regardless, linking to Amara's mind woke her up by activating her consciousness, whether it was a defense mechanism or not. Secondly, there was a certain range I could use our telepathy within. We had tested it on a field, maintaining the connection while slowly increasing the distance between us. The result was that I could maintain my telepathy with her anywhere within the base. Even when she moved beyond my sight and around buildings to reach the opposite end of the base, I was still able to communicate freely with her. However, disconnecting from that connection and attempting to reconnect proved to be impossibly difficult. The reason for that was due to the interference of other minds. My aura was visualized as a foggy medium, like a long, wispy cloud. I was able to extend this cloud to great distances, but because it wasn't very solid, it could be distorted by obstacles. This included the minds of others as well as their auras, at least the auras of those who were aware of theirs, which was uncommon. Finding Amara in that mess was beyond me right now unless there were no obstructions or interference. As for the maximum distance we could maintain the connection at, we hadn't yet found out. The only other experiments we carried out were in regard to the type and volume of information that could be sent over telepathy. For one, images couldn't be sent. Or, perhaps they could, but I wasn't able to see them yet. As for volume, that proved to be finicky. Telepathy inserted words directly from one mind into another. There was no need to process it like sensory information. However, things could get overwhelming very quickly. I've caught glimpses of Amara's inner thought process before, and the amount of information I received over mere seconds was enough to make me blank. Most minds were like that. Inner thinking, depending on the person, could happen at a speed far greater than anything we could communicate externally. Every thought was associated with the senses while simultaneously being linked to a dozen other thoughts and memories. A brain could process terabytes of information on a whim. And the only reason I was able to process some of her bursts of uninhibited thought was due to my own speed of thought which vastly surpassed hers. Still, a lot of the information was garbled, like files trying to reference others that didn't exist while forgetting others fractions of a second later. Still, it made me realize that telepathy had great potential. Only, I was reminded of one issue. Plex once told me that I had to carefully pick a path to take my aura, because once I found an ability for it, I wouldn't be able to go back and learn another. And I had a sinking feeling that telepathy was an ability that I had inadvertently yet irreversibly picked. I didn't mean to. It simply came to me, and I had been too interested in it to let it be. I had been training and using it every day since then, and it was becoming well-developed. It was possible that, from now on, this would be the shape my aura took, and the only ability I would have. So much for invisibility. Part of me felt like I was losing out, but it wasn't like telepathy was a bad ability. It was a high-level form of communication, and I knew that I was only scratching the surface of its true potential. After all, I had developed this power on the assumption that aura was an extension of one's magical power. 
and things were working in that direction. So this meant I might be able to exploit it. For example, if my summons were reliant on a direct connection to my mind and psyche, then by using my aura as a medium, I could separate them from my body and allow them to function in the hands of another person. Perhaps my telepathic connection would be the thing to allow something like that. After trying, I found that I couldn't, but that didn't mean I wouldn't be able to in the future. Extending Psyche and the abilities of my mind beyond my body. That was my power, and I intended to do much more with it than just telepathy. These thoughts all ran through my head as I relaxed with Amara in my embrace. I glanced down at her, letting out a small chuckle. Not a single thought between those eyes, huh? I combed back some of her hair before stroking her scalp. At some point, I sensed her wake, but she simply kept her eyes closed and enjoyed the sensations. We were like that for another hour until everyone around us started to wake as well. The ride home took about a day, and when we docked in the terminal, it was late in the afternoon. We disembarked and went back to the magisterium where we were welcomed by students and parents alike. Elites, gather. The puppet master shouted, drawing us all in. He scanned all of us before announcing. Congratulations, especially to our top two squads, who survived an unexpected ambush by an Authority 7. All your training managed to keep you alive, along with the exemplary actions by John Cooper, who single-handedly killed that Cyclops scout. Let this be an example of how easily a situation can turn dire, as ten soldiers were lost in that ambush and several of our elites sustained injuries. You may be better than the average, but in front of your superiors, you are still no more than chickens. He spoke with solemnity, turning the mood serious. But then he sighed. Keep it in mind, but don't let it cloud your head with fear. Today, your Christmas vacation starts, so all of you are dismissed. Be with your families and appreciate what you have been blessed with. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We all chimed back, dismissed with those words. This time, the Duchess wasn't here, nor were my friends from work. So Amara and I took our luggage back to our rooms. That's when I received a well-timed call. It was from Plex. Hey Plex. Hello John. Since you're back early, I come with some news and a request. I sat down, curious about the news. The major auction accompanied by Vatsy's Christmas Gala is coming up in three days so as to end four days before the new year. This is the biggest auction of the year, and there's plenty of work to be done. I was hoping you would be able to come in and assist us. Oh. Sure. I accepted readily. I needed to make some money anyway and fill the fat gaps in my bank account once again. Good. I'll see you tonight then for the first set of jobs. The day after tomorrow we also have a job from Apocryon, so we'll all be tackling that together. Oh. Great. Indeed. It's amazing pay though, and this time, you'll be getting a larger portion. Anyway, I have another piece of news. Patriarch Tavera requests your presence as soon as you can make time. Go talk to him before you come in for work tonight. M.M. I agreed, wondering what the Patriarch wanted from me. Well, that's all the news I have for you. Clear your schedule because we'll be busy until the auction. Click. He hung up with those words, leaving me pondering. Not long after that, Amara knocked and entered my room. I looked up at her, smiling. Hey. Hey. I have a message for you. Oh. Yet another piece of news. I took an envelope from Amara's outstretched hands. Her face was a bit rosy, but I didn't think into it that much as I looked at it. The envelope was closed with a wax seal, addressed specifically to me, the seal carrying the regalia of the Teleria Dukedom. I broke the wax and pulled out a parchment, unfolding the white paper and reading the fancy cursive writing. John Cooper, you are hereby invited to the Christmas family gathering of the Teleria family, beginning two days before Christmas Eve and ending the morrow after Christmas Day. You will take up residence at the Teleria Mansion within the city of Joffrin and participate in any gatherings the Teleria family attends for the duration of your stay. Your transportation will be arranged for the evening before the day of your planned arrival, and you will be accompanied by the first daughter Amara Teleria. We look forward to your arrival. Signed, Duchess Telexia Teleria, Duke Icor Teleria. I stared at the letter for a few seconds after finishing before looking up at Amara standing before me. She gave me a weird smile. Merry Christmas. Heh, this is quite the surprise. No kidding. Rest assured though their intentions are genuine. You're being invited to spend Christmas with the family, no drama or politics attached. How nice. Let your mother know that I appreciate it and that I look forward to it. I will. I'm glad that we'll be able to spend Christmas together. I initially thought we'd have to celebrate early or late. She mumbled while taking a seat on my bed beside me, resting her head on my shoulder. I looked at the invitation some more before stowing it back into the envelope. 
I intended to keep this. Then, I thought about how my schedule would be rather packed from now on. I nudged Amara. I've got some business to take care of over the next few days. We're preparing for the Black Spider auction, so for the next three days I'll be delivering items. The day after is the auction itself. And speaking of, would you care to accompany me to it? Oh, yes. I'd love to go. She nodded instantly, making me smile. All right. The day after, though, is when we have to leave. At least it's in the evening, so we'll have some time to recover. M.M. By the way, the Knights and I were called in for questioning in regards to you killing the Cyclops Scout. It'll happen tomorrow. Sure. Let me know how it goes. I will. And... Oh, wait. She suddenly sat up, remembering something. There's a noble gathering the day of the auction. It's an early Christmas gathering, meant to occur during the evening. The auction goes off during the evening. Oh well. After thinking for a second, she just shrugged. I didn't really want to go anyway. Let's just attend the auction, if that's what you want. The auction is also accompanied by Vatsy's gala, so there will be a party afterward that will go on into the morning. That long? Well, everyone is usually gone or passed out by that time, but yes. Oh, sounds fun. She nodded, her eyes sparkling in curiosity. I chuckled, thinking how cute her inquisitive nature was. After discussing all the details of each event, we settled on a schedule that would make things work. However, there was still one variable that might put a spin on things. After hanging out for a few more hours, we separated so I could go make a stop. I entered the Founder's Market, making my way to the Tavera territory. Soon enough, I had an audience with Patriarch Tavera. Ah, oh, John, it's good to see you in good health, though I notice you've come back with some trophies. It's been an eventful few months. I shook his hand as he noticed my new scars, taking a seat with a smile. Indeed, I've heard many rumors. They're probably true. Haha, -ha. well, at least I know you've got balls. Which is good, because I have a difficult mission that I'd like for you to take on. The old man leaned forward, laying down a small stack of papers before me. I picked them up, seeing a picture of a man. This is Henneview Retz. He's a warlock affiliated with the Clockwork Association, not officially one of theirs, but a valuable asset. I want you to kill him. I was silent, my mood suddenly turning complicated. It was a hit, and I was being hired as the hitman. I looked at the man on the paper. He looked rather ordinary, with brown hair and blue eyes. He was a regular middle-aged man that wouldn't be noticed walking down a street. I frowned, looking back up at the patriarch. Sir, I have an issue. Go on. I've killed a lot of people, primarily in the trenches, but not entirely. If I recall, that number has surpassed three digits. I've got a lot of blood on my hands, but as far as I'm concerned, none of it was innocent. Every single one of those people wanted to kill me, and I simply killed them first. So I would never in my right mind seek out an innocent man simply to rid someone, even you, of a financial competitor. H.M., I see. The patriarch nodded, gradually bearing a smile. You have a strong set of principles. I respect that a lot more than someone who would do anything should it benefit them. Rest assured, John, this man is the furthest thing from innocent. Please, take a look at the other pages. I silently looked back down, seeing the other papers covered in images. Hinnevue trades in people. He's responsible for running a shadow company that provides the association with a constant supply of slaves and corpses to fuel all of their experimentations. Since it was founded, the Clockwork Association has made significant progress in the field human alterations. Their advancements led to artificial limbs and better medical magic. But in their quest to mimic crowns, they've killed thousands in horrible experiments. Today, this side of their organization is hidden deeply as they've expanded into other businesses. However, they're making progress, and we've decided to put a little roadblock in their way. If you kill Hennevue, it'll hamper their supply of people, halt their progress, all while erasing a bloody human being. I admit, we have something to gain from this which is why I'm handing you the mission at all. But he is not innocent, that much I can assure you. You would be doing humanity a great deed by killing him. I went through the papers, reading about all kinds of personal details and seeing plenty of images about his dealings and whereabouts. Apparently, he was preparing for the auction, which was why he was in town, making it the best time to kill him. However, he was also Authority 7. This meant that I had to utilize the element of surprise. But, what better person than me to do such a thing? I was still only Authority 4, but Warlocks had weak flesh like summoners. The only thing that could protect him was his magic, but if he didn't have that activated, he would perish all the same. I would still have to be careful, but it was definitely possible for me to pull this off. 
And since he really was a criminal, a human trafficker at that, then it was no question that he deserved to die. I read for another minute or so before looking up at the patriarch. All right, I'll do it. Fantastic. The payout for this job is twofold. This man has a bounty on his head. Just check the Black Spider repository. That alone is worth 190,000 coin. And my personal payment will match that, making for 380,000 coin. And if you happen to loot anything from his corpse, it will be yours. Well, that's very generous. And yet the benefits to the Tavera family will outweigh such a cost heavily. This man is smart, calculating, and meticulous. He has been the broker for the Clockwork Association for five decades, a veteran in his field. But my hopes are hinging on the fact that not even he could prepare himself for you. The name American has become a small legend within the market. So go and show them why. Will do. I stood with a smile, shaking his hand. I wish you luck and take all the time you need. Don't take this target lightly, and perhaps someday, the founder's market will be rid of this rat. Chapter 77 Stock After my meeting with Patriarch Tavera, I went for a few delivery commissions to kill some time and help out with the large list of gala deliveries since it was still early in the evening. However, I only completed a few jobs, receiving a total payout of 50000 before disappearing and starting my hunt. Hennevi Rents operated out of one particular warehouse in the city slums. That was supposed to be his holding area, but he didn't appear there often. He personally worked out of a nice housing complex within the Founders Market where he could easily make contact with the Clockwork Association. It wasn't uncommon for him to appear within their territory the few times he did appear. Thankfully, this major auction was bringing him out of hiding. The window to kill him would be small, but there was still something I needed to check. Trust but verify. The Devera family apparently stood to gain quite a lot from Hennevieu's death, though I wasn't sure how. But I wouldn't allow myself to be used to kill an innocent man. I would confirm for myself if this man was as heinous as Tavera made him out to be. It took me a while to get to the slums of the city. Even though they were called slums, they were simply less prosperous areas of the capital, still offering a modicum of comfort. Instead of tall stone buildings, people lived in short wood houses and ran small shops. It was far more modest than the flashy colors and materials of the kingdom's central areas, even making me feel a little out of place. However, it wasn't enough to attract too much scrutiny. My coat was still drab enough that, disregarding anyone noticing the pulsing lines across its back, it just seemed a sound investment in clothing. Anyone who recognized me would probably come from the markets themselves, so I didn't worry about getting spotted. Besides, I could feel every gaze through aura. At most, there was some mild envy mixed in with brief curiosity. If there was anything out of place, I would know. A few wrong turns and fallible directions later, I finally found a side alley that led into a more desolate place. Under the faint light of the moon, it looked like an actual slum. Seemingly abandoned buildings set derelict and caked in dust. Piles of trash forced me to navigate around them. Stray animals lay despondent under collapsing overhangs. The actual infrastructure reminded me of a more dilapidated trenches, but was a definite improvement over the ever-present haze of drugs. The warehouse in question was a larger building, a careful veneer of neglect torn to shreds by the fact it was one of the only structures in the immediate area not half collapsed. After confirming I was at the proper location, I looked around for an overwatch position. I laid eyes on a two-story shop. Scaling another building next to it and using my enhanced strength, I leapt onto its roof inwardly apologizing for the sudden thump that no doubt startled the inhabitants. Summoning my Remington Lee, I propped up the rifle in a comfortable position and laid down. Close to two hours later, I was starting to think Patriarch Tavera's intel had been mistaken. But just as I had resolved myself to move to another position, a wagon pulled up to a side door. A few people hopped out of it while another group exited from the building's side door. They exchanged a few words. One of the second group signaled to someone inside, prompting them to let the wagon through a large door. Thankfully, they didn't bother closing the door, possibly because they were in a hurry. Once the wagon stopped, they immediately started loading it. My heart rate, only just calming down from the wagon's initial appearance, spiked again. Two dozen people of all ages were herded from a cellar, all with various bruises and injuries. A few people, presumably knights, practically threw them in the back of the wagon sealing the seamless back doors like there had never been a human trafficking operation at all. After that, two drivers drove the wagon away, heading deeper into the city. From a cursory assessment, those two drivers were only Authority 5 and 6. I sensed the strength of a knight from the Authority 5 and mana from the other. If I wanted to, I could kill both. 
If I wanted to, 24 people could be freed. However, I had yet to find Hineview. Tavera's evidence had provided more than enough proof to irrevocably link Hineview with the worst of human scum. I was no longer worried about his connection in the slightest. My concern was alerting the man. If I ambushed his shipment midway, he might get worried. And the only way this assassination would work was if he was totally confident. I watched the wagon drive away, my reticle hanging over the unsuspecting backs of the two men, the confidence to kill them beckoning me to pull the trigger. I could do it. I could save those people, sparing them from their fate as human experiments. The tortures they, and many like them, would suffer to provide the knowledge the association wielded were known to none. This was the dark part of the black market. The truly dark part, not just the drugs or depravity. And yet, despite the fact I now held the fates of 24 people in my palm, I held back. I leapt off the building with a shuddering breath, assuming a steely expression. I didn't have a carriage, nor did I care to call and wait for one. Time was of the essence. I ran back to the founder's market, opting for side routes and shortcuts, occasionally glimpsing the carriage I was shadowing. My stamina boosting mass doing little to help the shuddering gasps my breaths eventually turned into. I slowed as I started creeping into clockwork association territory. Using my aura as a guide, I steadily made my way to Hineview's residence, losing sight of the carriage in the process. Like last time, I found a good vantage point about 150 yards away and two stories higher than my target building. And through my scope, I waited. After an hour, I saw the wagon from before roll out of the association headquarters. It had beat me here, and now it was empty. Those people I saw were now delivered, fated to be test subjects until they died because I chose not to save them. But I forced those regretful feelings down and waited some more. And I laid there, rifle in hand, until the sun came up. I saw dozens of people come and go, mostly warlocks, but none matching the face of my target. Yet I stayed until the sun started to rise higher into the sky. It even started hurting to blink. Damn you. Come out already. I cursed, and yet no matter how long I waited, any of you didn't come out. Perhaps he mediated the earlier exchange while I was on the way. Perhaps I had missed him, but I didn't want to leave. I needed to kill this man, and I wouldn't leave until I did. So I remained on the rooftop. My vantage point gave me a clear view of where he made his exchanges. Taking out a cigar from my case and a leftover ration from my spatial sack, I took an irregular breath of smoke, calming my nerves and refueling my body. After about ten minutes of that, I put the trash away while stowing the cigar. I allowed myself to take a short nap, but when the alarm on my aerial went off an hour and a half later, I forced myself from grogginess, started smoking my cigar under the afternoon sun, and went back to watching. I kept my eyes on that building and the clockwork headquarters. I checked the face of every single person, my reticle resting softly on each in turn. I ignored the texts I got from Amara, Vetsmon, Fiden, and Plex. Nothing was in my mind except for this mission. And I stalked the area for seven hours. Every hour, I would bring out the page with Hineview's face on it, reminding myself, despite the fact the bastard's visage was ingrained in my mind already. The sun set on the city as I waited. It had been almost an entire day. My joints creaked, my legs cramped, and my spine shrieked for relief, but I shoved their concerns aside. Hineview was bound to come out eventually, and I would not let my body's weakness prevent me from delivering righteous justice. And then, right as it started to become dark, my eyes widened. I saw him, Hineview, and two other men, walking into the headquarters. My agitation suddenly rose, compelling me to take the shot then and there. But rationality won, purging my mind of everything except grim professionalism. I watched them discussing something while walking. Hineview motioned to the area twice, likely indicating another shipment. He received nods of approval before the two parties separated. He was a long-time broker, so there probably wasn't much to discuss. The only reason he was out and about was because of the upcoming auction. Yet the man never stopped moving. I had confidence in my shot but wanted to be absolutely sure. One wrong move and I would lose my chance forever. So I watched as Hineview walked right back into the headquarters and disappeared from my sight. I didn't panic or regret anything. I simply stayed there, watching the gates as night came. What was a little more waiting? Midnight soon passed, and dawn's light once again pierced the night. The timing was different, but sure enough, another shipment came. There it was, the same wagon with more people in it rolling down the street. From where I could see, it had a few more streets to go before it arrived at the exchange point. And in that time, Hineview emerged. My heart pounded as I saw him walk out with another man. This man wore a heavily embroidered cloak, obviously high-level 
possibly even more so than Hinevu. But I didn't worry about him. He wasn't the target. All I cared about was killing Hinevu. The two strolled out into the street to wait for the wagon, utterly assured of their safety in the heart of clockwork territory. My heart rate increased once more. This was it. Taking a deep breath, I recalled the Remington Lee for my Springfield. A few ticks on the latter side was all I needed for a proper zero. Then, I calmed myself and took aim. 150 yards was a long way, but my senses were sharper and I could clearly see Hennevue. No matter what, my aim would be true, and even if I didn't hit his head, I would hit center mass. Very little would throw my shot off. I made sure even the worst deviation would still kill. Just one second of stillness was all I needed. I was patient, even as that wagon only a street away continued to roll another group of people to their doom. Hinevu crossed his arms, laughing at a joke his companion told. I didn't feel resentment at the fact that he was enjoying himself. I didn't need to. All I could see were the faces of the people loaded into the wagon. My finger was steady as it stroked the trigger, as smooth as all the other times I've fired this weapon. And I let freedom ring. Boom. The explosion cracked through the surroundings, startling dozens. I watched as Hinevu's head exploded into a long stream of red mist and flesh. The man beside him jumped in shock wildly flicking his head around as a defensive shield popped into existence. I crawled off the roof I laid on, unsummoning the rifle. I landed in an alleyway, preparing another ambush for the wagon going up the street. I waited for a short time, letting them roll up to me before summoning my trench gun and firing. Boom boom. The warlock of the two drivers had his hasty shield vaporized by the 12-gauge slug, blowing off his head, and the knight could hardly handle one of those shots to the chest, flying off the wagon and too injured to rise again. Barely alive, the knight tried to crawl to his feet, feeble hands struggling to grasp a sword. I simply walked around as he blindly struggled, placing my barrel against his throat and sending him to the afterlife. With that, I walked around and blasted off the wagon's lock before throwing open the door. Inside, I saw another unfamiliar batch of people. Children and adults, but no elderly this time. They stared at me, terror evident on their faces as I stared back. I spoke. Get out and run, if you want to live. This is all I can do right now. Nobody responded, so I simply took off running. I only had one destination in mind, my feet taking me right back to the city slums. I panted as I slowed down near the warehouse, out of breath but filled with more than enough willpower to compensate. Through my aura, I felt only one person at Authority 6 a night. Still, I walked up to the door with my trench gun in hand, placing it against the lock and pulling the trigger. Boom. The handle blasted inward, letting me kick open the door as I loaded a shell into the tube of my shotgun. The entire warehouse was alerted as people came rushing down. An Authority 5 warlock turned the bend on the stairs, a fireball already forming in his palms. I pointed my stick at him and squeezed. Boom. Splat. He folded over the new hole in his waist, collapsing into a bloody pool. Two Authority 5 knights rushed at me from a doorway, roaring in battle rage. I wasn't taking any chances. B-O-M-B-O-M-B-O-M-B-O-M. -B -O -M -B -O -M -B -O -M -B -O -M. A few seconds later, I realized I was racking the slide on an empty shotgun. A gory mess of armor was all that remained of the two. The Authority 6 was right behind them. Summoning as much Psyka as I could, I injected all of it into a grenade and lobbed it at the doorway. The knight arrived right as the grenade landed. Unfortunately for him, he didn't pay it any heed as he stepped forward, focused on me. You son of a dash. Boom. The grenade exploded underneath him right as I stepped behind a pillar. He somehow wasn't dead yet, despite collapsing on the floor. His armor had saved him, badly dented, but concussive forces were a bitch. He could hardly breathe from the sudden collapse of his lungs, nor was his face in much better condition. So I walked over to him and hand-delivered another grenade, stuffing it down his armor with a vengeance. His aura disappeared with another explosion. I couldn't feel anyone else containing power after that. So my legs guided me to a locked cellar door. With easy steps I went and broke the lock, throwing it open before seeing a stairway. I stepped down, getting hit with the pungent odor of human misery, disregarding it entirely as some lights flickered on. And there I saw it. Rows of cages, all of them containing people of varied ages. They all looked at me, more eyes full of fear. After a few seconds of processing what I saw, I put away the gun and stepped back up the staircase. I went over to the shell of the Authority 6, searching around before finding a barely intact set of keys. When I went back down, I simply went at each cage and unlocked them, throwing them open one by one. There were close to a hundred people, none of whom moved despite the wide open door. 
Once I unlocked the last one, I stood at the end of the cellar, the open stairway across from me. I've killed your captors. There is nobody here that can threaten you. Go. You are free now. I was met with silence. However, there were some people who had more confidence than others, willing to take their chances. Some of the men stepped out, looking at me before looking at the staircase. Before they left though, I suddenly reached out. Wait. They turned back to me startled. I took out my bank card and withdrew small gold coins. I walked over with ten in hand, worth one thousand coin total, and placed it into one man's hand. And I did the same for the other two before stepping back. Hopefully that can get you through the next short while. Now go. Everyone else, step up and I'll give you something. This time, people were more eager as the three men stumbled up the stairs. A crowd started forming around me as I rapidly deposited stacks of gold into their eager hands. One by one they went up the stairs, some in groups, others alone. I could feel the thoughts and emotions of every single person who walked up to me and slipped past me. Anxiety, hope, sorrow, dread, apathy. All of these people were ordinary. Not a single one had mana, vigor, or psycho within them. None could hide a single detail of their minds from me. It was all too vivid, like I was the one experiencing these things in their place. I could feel the pain of their bodies, the hunger, their beaten limbs, and I did nothing to stop myself from soaking it all in. Nobody spoke as each person came and went, all of them simply too scared to disturb the process on the slight chance that I might change my mind, too eager to receive and escape this place. But then I heard a soft voice. What's your name? I looked up, seeing a young emaciated woman who looked at me with determination in her eyes. Unlike the others, she carried happiness and hope, even some admiration. Whatever she had gone through, it hadn't broken her spirits yet. And she was the only one among this group that was both chained and had a crest on her hand, dozens of markings resembling slash marks, the indication of a knight. There was a bit of vigor within her, but it had been almost entirely exhausted. She looked like she was on the verge of death as she carried her heavy chains. Just call me the American. American. Thank you. I didn't respond. Instead, I took out a recovery pill and lifted it to her mouth. She looked at me and opened, letting me place it in so she could eat it. After that, I took out the keys that had been on the body of that authority six, undoing the chains that bound her wrist and ankles. They dropped with a clang, each of them incredibly heavy. She dropped to her knees on the side, recovering as I handed everyone else their money. Once she was feeling better, I handed her the money too. She looked at it for a second before clutching her hand and running out. I walked out behind her, exiting the warehouse. Everyone who had left already was gone, only a few in sight when I emerged, all of them rapidly disappearing behind buildings. I looked up to see the moon hanging bright in the sky. There was no happiness to be felt. Only regret over the fact that I hadn't been able to save more. That I had sacrificed a batch in order to secure my kill. That there were countless others before that one. And I didn't feel like receiving anything for it. So I simply walked home. I arrived at the Black Spider Hotel, entering the lobby where I saw the key master waiting, as always. His face was filled with concern and understanding. I had a feeling he knew exactly what had just happened. I recommend rest, John. Allow the night to cleanse your soul. M.M. Thank you, Key Master, for your hospitality. Of course. He gave a cursory bow, which I returned before heading up. The moment I hit the bed, consciousness was stolen away from me, like a candle in the wind. Chapter 78 Executioner Eh? My eyes opened to an endless wide expanse. There was no indication of direction, of texture, not even of depth. The mildly bright white gave no indications of, well, anything really. But it was not the apparent physical plane that caught my attention. A strange pull on my mind brought me, as a river might a boat, to my thoughts. I remembered all those children and adults from the warehouse, the ones I had saved. But those I couldn't save surfaced as well. Their faces, permanently etched into my memories, demanded retribution. Unbidden, a torrent of miseries erupted. I imagined hundreds, thousands who had all suffered the same fate. I imagined the atrocities committed in an attempt to discover the limits of the human body. But most prominently, I imagined endless rows of faces twisted into masks of agony, their eyes fearful and angry and confused. It was overwhelming. It was depressing. It filled me with determination. I could save even more. I just needed information, and there were plenty of people to get it from. Tavera was just one person. There were hundreds of bounties on the repository, and surely there would be traffickers on that list. If I could do it, then I would. My guns gave me the power to kill even an Authority 7 warlock. 
Anybody below that level wouldn't be able to stop me. As I made my decisions, my surroundings shifted. I saw another warehouse, one full of even more trafficked people. They were in an even sorrier state than the ones I saved. I rushed forward, forgetting it was just a dream, eager to put down more scum. I could feel their captors around the building. I just needed to kill them. But my body wouldn't listen to me. I simply stood there even as all those captors rushed down to meet the threat. There were Authority SIXS, even an Authority 7 Knight. They were strong, not people I could fight against. I watched as they rushed from surrounding passages, almost like rats from the woodworks. They rushed toward me, their hate-filled faces only loosely concealing a primal dread. They were scared. As if I wasn't there, they ran around and passed me. I turned around to follow them, watching as they stacked up into defensive formations, their typically unfazable authority showing large cracks. A large metal door was blown off its hinges, merely a pebble to the explosive force of nature behind it. A badly mulched body, hardly recognizable as human flesh, flew at the door, both staggering the hastily formed battle line. A figure loomed in the doorway, blood-stained axe in hand. Silent screams of battle rage and anger rippled across the battle line as they began advancing upon the figure rushing at them. In a dance of violence, limbs flew, blood gushed, and bodies dropped as the person blew through night after night, warlocks and summoners blown aside by the thrown bodies of their comrades. The bloody axe left craters and finely crafted armors, a strange explosive force magnifying its effect by many times. Their best efforts, an otherwise incredible display of teamwork stemming from years of fighting together, were child's play to the paragon of violence that silenced them in seconds. And, without fail, the figure's final blow to every enemy was decapitation, dead or alive. An executioner. I simply watched as they were all dispatched with impunity. When silence reigned, a simple blow to each lock freed the captives from their cages. I slowly came to an understanding as I watched the person go about their work. I wasn't needed. This wasn't my duty. Whoever that executioner was, they were enough. I watched the person stand there. They wore a coat and hood, very similar to my own. All of a sudden, as if struck by some divine inspiration, they reached into their coat and pulled out a cartridge. My eyes widened. I was the only person who could give someone a cartridge. Who was it? It wasn't the key master, that was certain. So who could possibly have ammunition from me? And then, a faint pair of wings bloomed from the person's back, shrouding them in faint light. Oh, I see. Guardian Angel. I smiled, letting out a long breath as I closed my eyes. And the next time I opened them, I was back in my hotel room. I laid there in my bed while my mind processed everything that happened. This injustice wasn't the one I was meant to resolve. There was somebody else out there who I could trust to do it for me. My mind was cleansed of torment. The faces of the dead, once debilitating, now inspired me to continue on this path of mine. And in that moment of inspiration, I decided to pull out my advancement formation. I pulled up the first page and raised my hand, releasing my aura and tracing channels through the air. I watched as my finger traced recursively complex channels into my aura, almost like there was some other force guiding my hand, and I was just along for the ride. The core of the formation sat before me a faint wisp of active aura still trailing from my finger to where I had left it off. An entire third of the first formation was done. When considered among the entire advancement formation, only a tenth had been drawn, but the effects were incredible. I had been studying it for a while now, and it seemed with this dream, I was able to make a leap. My mind churned as I finished what I could. My ocean of thought started to flow, small eddies and currents growing and merging into a whirlpool in my mind. Its movements were lethargic, considering the fraction of progress made, but the results were stunning. Everything about my thought process became faster, smoother, it felt like the cloudy barriers I once had to shove every thought through had finally been lifted and my mind could finally flow free. It felt amazing, and with this boost I finally wrapped my head around the situation. If it wasn't my calling, then so be it. I sat up after letting myself calm down. Several notifications from my aerial jolted me from my afterglow. The most recent one, from the key master on behalf of the Black Spider Repository, was interesting. John Cooper. For successfully claiming the head of Henneview Rents, your Polaris bank account has automatically received the bounty reward of 250,000 coin. In addition, on behalf of the Tavera family patriarch, an additional 190,000 coin has been deposited. Oh, my face was neutral. Money was always welcome, but I still wasn't sure how I felt about being paid for this. It seemed that the bounty had also somehow increased in the time I spent hunting him. Oh well. 
I had used a bit over 100,000 coin for the freed slaves, and I wasn't exactly in a position to reject payment. After that, I looked at everything else. Plex sent me a few messages in regard to our job from Apocryon, which was today. We would handle it during sunset, which wasn't long from now. Other than that, I had several messages from Amara, some of them about the results of their questioning, others wondering where I was. The messages from Vetsmond and Fiden were asking where I was on behalf of Amara. To ease her worries, I gave her a call after texting Vetsmond and Fiden reassurances. She picked up instantly. John. Hey. Sorry about the delay. I was a bit busy. That's okay. I was just worried. Were the jobs really that time-consuming? Well, something like that. It got a bit dangerous so I couldn't really respond. I decided to refrain from telling her about it for now. No need to spoil her mood with Christmas just around the corner. Still, her voice brought a smile to my face. I decided to meet with her and bring myself a bit more ease. I have some more business tonight, but I'd like to see you today. Do you have time? Of course. Just give me the location and I'll be there. Sure thing. With a goodbye we hung up. After I found a suitable place for a short date, I got dressed and sent her the location. We met up a little while later. She came dressed in some beautiful yet casual clothes fit for the chilled weather. Her head tilted though when she approached. What's wrong? Are you okay? Yeah. I let out a breath, the two of us hugging. Just realizing how lucky I am to be with someone like you. Oh, oh. Thank you. I mean, I feel lucky too. She stammered a bit, making me chuckle. Come on. Grabbing her hand, I pulled her into the nearby cafe. I only had a couple hours, but that was enough to talk about recent events. Particularly, she informed me about what was going to happen in regard to the Cyclops Scout. The testimonies of my squad all came back completely true, which means there was zero doubt that I had actually killed it single-handedly. And since I had broken some kind of record, I was going to be placed within the Magisterium's Hall of Fame. It was a place only the best elites could have their image enshrined. The body of that scout would be put on display, evidence of my kill, and my name would accompany it as the first Authority 4 to ever kill an Authority 7. Whenever something like this happened, there would be a big announcement and an award would be given out, though I didn't know when. I imagined that it would happen after Christmas since everyone was out anyway. Well, at this point I wasn't sure I cared. I had now killed an Authority 7 warlock, so the Cyclops felt a bit underwhelming. And after what I just went through, I simply wasn't in the mood to care. So as she spoke, I simply rested my chin on my hand and stared at her, appreciating her presence and realizing that I really really like this girl. Was it enough to say that I had fallen in love? A small smile rested on my face as I watched her talk. Ah, she was so pretty. Perhaps she noticed too, because at some point she stopped talking and started reddening. She fidgeted in her seat, occasionally glancing at me to check if I was still staring. So I could still tease her. Good. After a few minutes of that I finally laughed and diverted my gaze. We went on to talk for a while until I had to leave. I told her that I was going on a dangerous job so we ended our date with a long kiss. With that, I made my way to the Founder's Market. I looked at Rayla as we trudged through the trenches. Plex took the lead and Libidus tailed him. We made conversation along the way since we hadn't seen each other in a while, killing time as we trekked over to Apocryon's headquarters. Nothing from my aura tipped me off, but I knew that would change as soon as we arrived. I was especially curious to see Apocryon again. Back then, that madman was able to twist my mind with illusions. I saw and felt him kill me, yet it was nothing more than one of his tricks. I had thought it was just his magic back then, but now I wasn't so sure. Since I was with a group, even the most foolhardy opportunist could only sulk and glare from alleyways. So we arrived at the headquarters smoothly. And there, I saw Apocryon. He sat atop a particularly large APC modded with all kinds of scrap metal and mounted spikes. It fit the psycho vibe this place gave off. And he felt the exact same as last time. Waves of unrestrained power rippled off his body, nearly tangible in their force, carrying an aura of unhinged psychosis. His eyes were particularly stinging. My aura felt like it would be swallowed by his. Dressed in a dirty lab coat, he jumped up as soon as we stepped foot into his territory, entering the plaza in front of the headquarters. Ah, my favorite deliverer man. And John, you've made quite the name for yourself since I last saw you. A far cry from that little kid several months ago and I still vividly remember you tearing my chest open with your bare hands. Heh, a mere trick of the mind. I can see your aura. I've never seen someone progress so far in such a short amount of time, not since I did so myself. Let me see you clearly. I was silent. I had kept Plex in front of me to hinder line of sight between us, 
but now he was asking to meet head on, and I was curious myself. So I stepped forward, standing next to Plex as I stared him down. That's when I saw it clearly. His aura. It wasn't like mine, all foggy and malleable. His was like a storm of needles, capable of piercing through all. And at the center of that storm was an eye. A massive eye that peered straight into my mind. As soon as I looked into it, I felt my surroundings change. The surrounding people faded away, the ground turned black as spikes jutted from the floor all around me. They pierced my feet, my legs, my chest. Skewered me from every possible angle while tearing my body apart with bladed protrusions. But, through the arresting illusions, I was able to get a glimpse. The slightest indication that all of it was fake. The smallest sign that it was all planted into my mind instead. I was able to dissociate from the pain, just slightly, just enough for it to not be overwhelming. He really was a warlock, which made sense since he could concoct potions and medicine. But his aura's ability to tamper with the mind was inconceivable. There wasn't an ounce of mana utilized within any of these illusions. Still, I fought back. My resistance appeared in the form of that foggy cloud that tried to wear away at all the spikes. But it was nowhere near enough. It didn't so much as leave a scratch. The difference between us was incredible. And yet I was able to see the path forward. Suddenly, I raised my hand, and it a 1911. And I fired straight at him, the bullet bearing my aura tearing through the illusion, piercing through several spikes between us. But the bullet shattered before it could reach him, Apocryon's mere thought enough to reduce it to dust. Amazing. He mumbled and pointed a long finger at me. A needle manifested, soaring toward me. Despite being slower than my bullets, it advanced steadily toward my forehead, even my heightened awareness unable to pull me out of the way in time. It would have pierced my head if not for Plex stepping back in front of me. That's enough. Ugh. I collapsed as soon as the illusion fled, buckling as blood poured from my eyes, nose, and mouth. Someone caught me. I was barely able to tell it was Rayla. Without a word, she started mopping up my face. Focus on me. I stared blankly, my mind still recoiling from the sensation of having multiple needles driven through it. What an amazing power. Through the horrible illusions I could see the remarkable skill and profound knowledge behind it. He was capable of killing with his aura. It was clear that I wouldn't be going down that path, but my path wasn't much different. My aura was an extension of my mind, of my psyche. And I would use it as such, wielding my mind, my strongest attribute, as a tool to fight others. Previously, I had been worried about subterfuge. I wanted Plex's invisibility because it would keep me safe and allow me to use my guns with complete freedom but maybe I didn't need invisibility. Maybe I just needed an illusion of it. Knights, my most threatening foes, would be at the mercy of my powerful mind. Anyone else could be killed by my guns with relative ease. Yes, this was it. I lifted my head with this revelation, barely able to see Apocryon discussing something with Plax. When he sensed my gaze though, I sent out my aura once more, this time delivering a message to his own. I figured it out. Thank you. Ha uh ha. -huh. He suddenly laughed startling and silencing Plex. To think I've been used. Amazing. To think you were talented enough to use me for your own gain. Pray, John Cooper, that you are simply envied and not feared. Or be doomed to the path I have walked. Do you understand me? Yes. I nodded as he almost screamed at me. With every second, my mind gradually recuperated and I was eventually able to climb back to my feet. I watched Apocryon as he made the exchange with Plex, thinking long and hard about what he said. Be envied not feared. I could imagine why he said that. I was already dealing with such things from nobles. If they envied me, then they would simply hate my presence, perhaps taking some measures to get rid of me. If they truly feared me, then I was as good as dead. They would stoop to any level to remove the threat. My days would be numbered. Had he gone through something like that? Everyone already feared him, and perhaps the only reason he was able to survive was because he pushed his power to the extremes that he did. I had a feeling that he wasn't always the psycho everyone knew him to be. People were often shaped by their circumstances and environment. Maybe Apocryon was another victim. I took his advice to heart, starting to think that I needed to hide certain powers of mine. Apocryon threw Plex a box, its contents only to be revealed at the auction. A bag of gold, almost like an afterthought, was thrown over Apocryon's shoulder as he strolled back into his headquarters. Plex caught it only his hands and a knowing smirk visible before he vanished without a trace. Libidus, Rayla, and I could see the surrounding individuals start to advance on us. The other two started prepping for combat, but I just raised my gun up and fired into the sky. Bang. A piercing explosion cut out the once enthusiastic would-be ambushers. Everyone froze. 
By now, my guns had left a permanent mark on the residents of the trenches. I looked around, donning my hood. You know who I am. Fuck off. Silence prevailed. Some remained frozen, others backed off or ran. I let the tension pervade for a few more seconds, then walked off. The others walked with me, our very surroundings seeming to cringe back from our presence. Just like that, we left the trenches. Libidus chuckled. Just try strolling into the trenches, they said. Easier than I've heard. Shut up. Ha ha. I'll give you some of my cut as thanks for lending us your infamous name, Mr. American. Don't worry about it. Just buy me a drink tomorrow. Sure thing. He patted my shoulder as the pain in my mind shifted from stabbing pains to a hammering headache. At least it was better than earlier. I took out a stoga to help, but much of the damage was ore-based. A smoke could do nothing for mental debilitation. The reason I bled it all was because of a spike in blood pressure, my body reacting negatively to the crap going on mentally. If I had spent any longer within Apocryon's aura, then I probably would have had an aneurysm. For now, I just needed rest. Recovery would come naturally. Of course, we had to stop by our place of business first. Plex had already arrived at the warehouse, but evidently wasn't expecting us to return so soon. I put my hand out, making him smirk and throw a bag of coin. Inside was 150,000 coin. Hazard pay. Now get out of here and prepare for the auction tomorrow. Sure. I nodded before stashing the coin. When I turned, I saw Rayla looking at me. She smiled and squeezed my shoulder. Go rest up. I smiled back as she walked past and received her own pay. After wishing goodbye to Libidus as well, I left and headed to the Black Spider Hotel. I also texted Amara, letting her know that I was fine. Of course, she also came over once she heard that I was done. I hung around in the lobby for a bit and brought her up when she arrived. Unfortunately, I didn't really have the energy to engage with her. She saw the smeared blood on my face and helped me clean up before both of us went to bed. Thankfully, the cigar had at least calmed my mind allowing me to fall asleep relatively easily for someone who just had some needles driven into his brain. I passed out with tomorrow's auction in mind. Chapter 79. Auction. Come one. Come all. From all around the kingdom. Every color. Every crest. Every creed. Gather on this night and celebrate. The time of the year we've all been waiting for. The night of prosperity. Of generosity. Of salvation. Of love. Everyone let your hearts out. And rejoice in the glow of the midnight moon. That sea scala has begun. Cheers rose above even the sound of the fireworks going off behind the announcer, a thousand masked faces doused in multicolor light. The massive black spider plaza almost seemed cramped from all the festive cheer. I let out a few laughs as I watched, Amara jumping in excitement beside me. Both of us were masked like those around us. Taking a quick glance over at her, I once again appreciated the way her hairstyle highlighted her image, hanging strands accentuated her face, and a voluminous bun topped her head. I caught myself staring, thinking of earlier when I was once again stunned by how beautiful she looked. I almost started thinking myself inadequate. That red dress, full ruby lips, the pale nape of her neck, and the sharp but graceful visage she carried in public. Damn if I didn't think I was lucky after catching this one. Or did she catch me? I would say that I was a catch. She didn't even have to go fishing. This is so cool. So much better than that stupid noble party. I'm glad you're not missing out on anything. This is my first time at a Christmas celebration as well. You've never celebrated Christmas? No, I have. I've never celebrated it here though. Luminescent streamers and floating lanterns floated lazily about on faint air currents, buildings, trees, and lampposts occupied by the colorful decorations. Various magic kites shaped like animals also flew through the air, eagles, lions, and fish dancing among more fantastical beasts. There was even a rather realistic scourge kite, no doubt the product of some intrepid mind, satisfyingly misshapen from punches thrown at it. Dozens of servers roamed about with platters full of familiar and exotic drinks, offering refreshments at no cost. This fasty really had to be astronomically wealthy to hold such a massive celebration for hundreds of influential individuals, let alone not charge a dime for it. And the auction hadn't even started yet. This was just the pre-game. Spotting some familiar drinks, I grabbed two glasses and handed one to Amara as we walked down the road. There were several bands and orchestras playing at various areas along the sidewalks. Going from one place to another would accompany a change in symphony, most of it excitable, some of it grand. Between those were performers straight out of a circus. Most were warlocks who knew tons of party tricks, throwing up explosions of color and creating fake animals to prowl about the crowd. Amara wasn't the only one discovering something new. I had never seen such a festive place before. 
It was like the last gala was barely even trying compared to this. But this was also a celebration of both Christmas and the New Year. I could understand why they would pull out all the stops for this one in particular. And since there was so much to see and all night to do it, I let myself be pulled around by my girlfriend, experiencing everything the night had in store. That by itself took over an hour. From performer to performer, we watched dozens of stunts and tricks, the wide variety greatly expanding my impressions of magic. And from band to band, Amara pulled me in to dance to each one. Fortunately, she was a better dancer than me. So besides some intentional goofiness to tease a reaction out of her, I let her lead me along. Not that I couldn't be a little groovy. Although she received some second-hand embarrassment, I laid out some pretty slick moves on the dance floor guaranteed to catch eyes, for better or worse. It was only after I was dragged off three times that we finally started making our way to the auction. As the time approached, a huge crowd made their way inside. There were several doors to enter for varying levels of prestige. As the time grew near, the crowd near the entrance steadily grew bigger, crowding into several general entrances. Smaller groups and individuals peeled off the mass to enter through more exclusive doors. Since I wasn't interested in waiting and Plex wasn't here to guide me in, I linked arms with Amara and went toward the VIP doors. The bouncer stared me down, seemingly doubtful someone like me would be approaching the VIP entrance separate from a party, but remained professional and asked for identification. I was told this would be enough. I reached into my coat and pulled out my golden cigar case. His brows raised as he stepped aside. Enjoy your night. You too. I smiled and walked in. Amara nudged me with her elbow as I found the Devera suite. Look at you moving around like a big shot. You're like a noble in the black market. A small one, but I would agree with that. I smirked and found a door, opening it to the sounds of chatter. Once inside, I saw Patriarch Tavera, Plex, and his entourage mingling with almost two dozen others sporting Tavera regalia. John and his lady have arrived. Good to see you. You too, Patriarch. I shook hands with the man. And when the Patriarch greeted Amara, he simply gave her a nod. I had discussed with Amara beforehand on the protocol for these events, and the consensus was that anybody who didn't already know who she was didn't need to know. She already had an alias made up for greetings with strangers. As for those who knew, they would likely be courteous of her identity and do what the patriarch just did, act like she wasn't someone of any significance. Here, she was just my girlfriend and had zero notoriety to speak of. Perhaps Amara was right. In the black market, the roles were flipped. I was a small-time noble while she was just a commoner. John, remember me. Captain Ignov, it's been a while. I shook hands with this unexpected friend. Back when I had been called upon to help guard a convoy for Patriarch Tavera, he had been our commanding officer, an Authority 7 Knight who protected us from an equally powerful pugilist. He was now stationed at a branch base in the city of Joffrin, which was also where I first met Duchess Teleria. We smiled at each other. Here on vacation? Of course. Couldn't miss the year's greatest celebration. I know. I didn't expect it to be this amazing. Ah, oh, it's your first. Well, congratulations. It doesn't get much better than this. So it's all downhill from here? Ha ha, that's one way to look at it. He chuckled before glancing over, seeing Amara standing to my side. Who's this? I don't recall you having a lady last time I saw you. This is my girlfriend, Alice Vander. Pleased to meet you, Captain Ignav. Likewise. Ignav bowed as Amara curtsied. So, where did you two meet? At the Magisterium. She's my favorite warlock. And he's my favorite summoner. All right. All right. Ignav chuckled and waved as Amara and I pushed our noses toward each other. I'll stop you there before you two get all cute. Anyway, be sure to pay attention to the auction. Not everything is going to cost a million coin, and there's a lot of good stuff being put up. It's by far the largest auction of the year. What you'll see here may never be seen again. MM, I'll be sure to watch. We shook hands, giving a momentary goodbye. Inside the suite, there was an entire bar with a constant supply of snacks. So Amara and I hung around until Patriarch Tavera called for me. His other guests were just exiting, so we exchanged greetings and sat down near him. John, I wanted to congratulate you. For what? For killing him of you, of course. You haven't forgotten something so recent, have you? Oh, that. I gave him a small smile, noticing Amara's neutral face to the side. She kept a good poker face despite the subject. I wouldn't say it's anything worth congratulating. It's only regretful that he couldn't be killed sooner. He was slippery, cautious. Nobody was capable of doing anything to him. In the short times that he would ever appear, he would always be guarded heavily. 
and all other times, he was hidden and impossible to bait. Many attempts have been made before and by people with much higher authorities, trust me on that. But in just two days, you were able to do what nobody else had done before. The patriarch leaned forward. John, I gave you that job hoping it would merely catch your interest and that, in time, you might find an opportunity. I had hoped that your specialty might make things easier, but the pessimism in me didn't believe it would take any less than a year. And then one evening, I heard a single explosion. Small, hardly noticeable, but a sound no less infamous than the American who produced it. One shot, heard across the entire market. A man who had mastered his trade over the last five decades had been killed so quickly, so easily it would make the others before you puke. It's nothing short of a miracle and one not unnoticed. I heard about the slaves you subsequently helped escape. Already the name American is making rounds around the market, but instead of him being the terror of the trenches, he's the father of freedom. Hmm. A humored hum escaped my pressed lips. I didn't mind the ring to that name. Something about it made my American blood tingle pleasantly. The patriarch leaned back as he saw me ease up a bit. I responded with a diverted gaze. I'm not yet that amazing. Freeing those who have been kidnapped and trafficked is a given. They should never have been in that situation to begin with. And yet they were there anyway, the victims of those inebriated with power. So do you not at least take pride in doing something nobody else had been able to, or even willing to, before? Maybe. But it's not enough. More people should be tackling this issue. If I were able, just based on the things I saw two days ago, not to mention what really happens behind closed doors, I would be driven to dismantle the Clockwork Association and abolish it entirely. Those who run that mafia are disgusting. Indeed. But you'd have to be on the level of a duke in order to do so yourself. Yes, it's unfortunate that I can't simply put a bullet in each of their heads. But that doesn't mean nothing can be done about the trading. Are you thinking of fighting it? He asked with a curious glint in his eye. But my response was a shake of the head. No. No? Sounds hypocritical. Yes. Yeah, it is. But I don't believe I'll need to. I thought back, remembering my recent dream. It's simply not my calling. H.M., I see. Well, I know that you're a courageous young man highly unlikely to shy away from any battle. In this era, such people are dwindling. He suddenly reached over, placing his strong hand on my shoulder and looking me in the eye. You just keep on going. Great things lie ahead so long as you keep that good head on your shoulders. Thank you, Patriarch. Of course. His hand moved off my shoulder, lowering to my wrist where he tapped my aerial with his own. I was surprised as his contact info was transferred. If you ever feel the need to go and hunt some rats, let me know, and I'll point you the way. I can't promise that the slave trade will be eradicated, but you'll at least be suitably rewarded. Right. Thanks. Enabling good people should be a given. Now go have fun tonight. There is still darkness in the world, but there's no reason that should stop you from seeing the light. You are especially deserving, considering your work and helping others do the same. Without you, nearly 150 people would be living very dark lives right now. Remember that. I was silent, giving him a small nod before standing with Amara. He smiled at her once before we left. Take care of this one, little miss. Don't let him get in his own head. Don't worry, patriarch. I'm by his side whether he likes it or not. She smiled and intertwined her fingers with mine, causing him to laugh. After that we left, taking a seat at one of the many tables by the massive window overlooking the auction stage. The main event was about to start. Chapter 80, Katana. Are you okay? I'm doing better. I smiled while watching the auction stage. The auctioneer was almost done giving his opening speech, dropping sly hints about the most valuable items to come. Since Amara was next to me while Patriarch Tavera gave his encouraging words, she had caught the gist of the situation. Of course, since the topic had been brought up, my mind drifted to darker places and it ended up dampening my mood, despite the Patriarch's reassuring words. I suppose Amara noticed, and so she started to comfort me in her own way. The man you killed was a slave trader? Yeah. Sometimes I forget those kinds of people even exist. Most people can't even conceive of the concept. What's the kingdom's history with slave trading? I suddenly asked, wondering if it was anything like what I had known on earth. Amara gazed off into the distance and thought. Before, it was Magi who enslaved the ordinary. In the early days of the kingdom, there were several major territories that, although united, generally didn't consider themselves a single entity. And the ruling duke of those territories would own quite literally everything underneath him. You could say there were entire kingdoms enslaved to their king. 
I supposed it was quite like the feudalism of medieval Europe. Well, and what stopped that? Well, for one, the pressure of the scourge. This was centuries ago, and the kingdom was forced to grow as they and the scourge began to recognize each other as foes and do battle. However, what gave the ordinary people true freedom was the church. The church, huh? My brows raised as she nodded. They led the charge for the abolition of all slavery and slave trading. At first, when the kingdom first united under threat of the scourge, they pushed for their most powerful man, the founding king Abadiah, to take the throne. And he didn't like being pressured by the church, which, while a part of the kingdom, was a separate governing entity. So he brought together all the dukes and declared war on the church in an attempt to fight for complete sovereignty. And how did that end? Not very good because the church's paladins came in and killed him the day after he declared war. I was shocked, not thinking the church had the balls to do something like that, let alone the strength. They made it seem like the kingdom never really had any power at all. Amara continued. Anyway, the entire conflict ended in just a few days, and the abolition of slavery as a whole was written into law. This included servitude of any kind, because later on when old slavers tried to enslave through debt, it led the entire kingdom into such a bad economic depression that the church once again came in and outlawed things like interest on loans and certain banking practices which had led to the problem in the first place. Interesting. I never really understood the financial side of it, but that was around 170 years ago, and we're more prosperous now than ever before, so it apparently worked. Apparently. I reclined in my chair, thinking about the curious history of this kingdom. It seemed like the church played a major part in its development. They were more of a behemoth than I realized, even though I never heard much about them in my daily life. Still, it was the dominant, perhaps the only real religion that all of humanity followed in this world. It was no wonder that they wielded vast power rivaling the entire kingdom. The more interesting point though was how they didn't actually take the kingdom for themselves. I was sure that they installed their own people into positions of political power, but the king was still separate from the church, at least on paper. Like the father of a bunch of unruly children who didn't know better, they came in and whipped them into shape whenever they got out of hand. From everything I've seen, it's led to vast prosperity across the board. But then again, I didn't have any experience outside of major cities. Nonetheless, the monuments were massive and the roads were clean. Gold flowed like a river and food was plentiful. Sure, this kingdom probably didn't have much of a middle class. There were the rich and the poor, with the poor composing the majority. But that was more so due to the lack of skilled labor, or what I would know as some blue and white collar jobs. There was no industrial revolution, so most people still lived outside the city, probably farming, or they were in the military fighting. There wasn't much helping that. People needed food and water, and a lot of it. So most effort was devoted toward that since there wasn't any machinery to multiply it. Anybody else was either doing manual labor in something like a mine, or they got lucky enough to become a magus and enter the skilled labor fields under magic, comprising an extremely small middle class. It also didn't help that the nobility was the most powerful group of magi, giving them rich control over both the economy and the magic sector. I was able to benefit from the small amount of developed technology there was in the heart of humanity's only kingdom. My experience was by no means representative of the majority. Short of starting an industrial revolution, there was little I could do to help any of that. All these thoughts pulled my mind away from the dark topics of human trafficking. I had never properly learned about any of this world's history and found it rather interesting. Eventually, though, the topic shifted to the auction before us. The beginnings of these auctions were always slow, but the items shown were still interesting. Most of them were trinkets good for nothing other than their obscurity or rarity. For the first hour, everything was kept under 100,000. Each item appeared on a huge screen behind the auctioneer making sure that everyone could see the item clearly regardless of distance. The pelt of an Authority 5 unique eagle beast. Hunted near the front lines, this extraordinary piece of leather still maintains its inherent fire enchantments. Bidding starts at 40,000. The skull of a colossal needle bird. These extraordinary creatures have the longest beaks in the world, and to date, this is the longest one ever hunted. At 12 feet long, it'll assuredly be a prized part of any hunter's collection. Bidding starts at 50,000. A mysterious blade from a distant land. Its curved body contains no enchantments and indecipherable text unknown to any historian in the kingdom. It was found on the border of the kingdom in the outlands with a small booklet. Its subpar battle characteristics make it unsuited for fighting, but its curved form is sure to fill a unique hole in any collector's vault. Bidding starts at 50,000. 
Wait. I suddenly sat up, seeing the blade on display. Those characters across its body, the curved black blade, the wrapped hilt, and the tassel hanging off it. How could I not recognize one of the most popularized weapons on earth, the Japanese katana? My heart pounded in my chest as I raised my voice. How do I bid? You need a card. Attendant. Right here, sir. After the patriarch responded and called, a man came rushing over with said card, handing it to me. I immediately tapped it, sending out a bid. New bid of 100,000. Can I get 110? 110,000 for this refined blade of mysterious origin. 100,000 going once. 100,000 going twice. Clack. Sold. Once the count was up, my face brightened. Nice. What was that? Do you know what that blade is? Omara asked as I settled back down. I could feel her growing curiosity, how she normally got when she found something interesting to pry into. Maybe. My leg bounced as I watched the katana get taken off stage, the next item taking its place. A few minutes later, two people entered the suite, carrying the package. I stood and walked over. Bidding card, please? Here. I handed the card over, and once checked, they handed it back and gave me a box. Thank you for your patronage. M.M. I nodded and took the box, walking back over to my little table and laying it out. Omara sat up, observing it curiously as I popped it open. I could feel all the other curious gazes as well. Though they wouldn't buy it for themselves, that didn't mean they couldn't be interested in something novel. Even Plex walked over, standing over my shoulder. What's that? A sword. No shit. You know what it is. We're about to find out. I spoke while popping the box open, seeing the one-sided curved blade. And seeing the characters up close, although I wanted to doubt my eyes, I knew what I was seeing. Japanese characters written along the body in red, contrasting against the pitch black blade. It felt like a metal, but not entirely, making me wonder how it was made. But that was inconsequential. The point was that this was a sword that could only have been made by someone from Earth. I wasn't alone. After staring at the blade for a while, I looked at the tassel and frowned, lifting it with my fingers. On the high end of the tassel was a small colored piece resembling the Japanese flag, a white backdrop with a big red spot in the center which outright confirmed my guess. But then, below that, was a little fox girl charm from what I could only assume was an anime. It was so well made that I questioned its purpose. Whoever this was basically strapped a figurine to their sword. Who's the weeb that owned this? Show yourself. I rolled my eyes after a few seconds, setting the sword back down. This was a Japanese katana, no question. Whoever owned it or created it was from Earth. I wasn't the only one, though I started to question the unknown larger purpose for bringing people here from another world. If whoever did this wanted to save this world, then they surely didn't bring enough people. And if not, then why bring us at all? Or was this some freak interdimensional accident and at least two people just happened to get caught up in it? That was unlikely. Regardless, I had a new goal, which was to try and find the owner of this weapon. It was said to have been discovered on the border of the kingdom's territory, near somewhere called the Outlands. I didn't know what that was, but even Maxwell once told me that the kingdom was not the last bastion of humanity. There were more out there. We were just cut off from them. Perhaps that's where this person came from. As for what happened to them, I couldn't really assume. I just hoped they weren't dead. The sword didn't paint that picture, but I didn't know the circumstances of its discovery. I sighed and looked over, finding a small booklet. When I opened it, I saw nothing but gibberish. It was a combination of Japanese and some other language, perhaps the language of whatever kingdom they had been brought to. However, there wasn't only text. There were also some pictures. After skipping past some of the anime doodles that made my brow twitch, I found some obscure drawings that didn't quite look like any enchantments or magic spells, but close enough to make me think it was some different kind of magic. After a while, I just shut it, contemplating and ignoring Plex's questions. I had many questions of my own, none of which would be answered anytime soon. It wasn't like I could search for a Japanese person on my own, not to mention that they probably weren't within the kingdom anyway. I would have to get to the point where I had enough power to find any nations beyond the kingdom of Dragon Tongue. I needed to explore the Outlands, but that would only happen years from now at the least. So for now, I just needed to sit tight and train. Still, knowing that there were other Earthlings in this world made me question my own presence here. Something was going on, and it was bigger than anything I alone could dip my toes in. I was already in over my head in more than a few other areas. I didn't need to keep poking beyond my pay grade any more than I had to. After another long stare, I finally closed the box and threw it in my spatial sack, waving the curious plex away. 
Once he was gone, Amara leaned over. So? It's from my homeland. Oh. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. I'm not either. Its presence here is a miracle, but what it represents is a lot more important. I thought I had been the only one. Turns out I'm not. Well, from the little you've told me, I would assume that it's at least comforting. I didn't respond. I wasn't that concerned about the fact that someone from my home planet was here. I wouldn't know them, and while we might share a common origin to bond over, it wouldn't change much about what I would continue to do. I was concerned about what it meant for there to be multiple Earthlings here. I had already been curious about what it meant for cold summoners to be able to summon weapons from other worlds. At the very least, there were three worlds in existence and likely many more. I had seen weapons from Vetsman's mother, guns from Earth, and then this world itself. I had a faint feeling that it was all connected somehow. The ability to summon extra-dimensional weapons, people being swapped between worlds, and most importantly, the Scourge. The magnitude of each factor could change things for better or worse. That's why I wasn't concerned about this unknown kin from Earth. I was concerned about what their, and my own, presence meant. At some point though I stopped thinking about it. This changed nothing but my personal opinion. My goal remained the same. Now though, there was just one new thing added to my ever-expanding to-do list. Find a stick, and whack this weeb over the head with it for putting an anime girl on their sword in another world. Chapter 81 Heart While we were talking, the auction had continued, prices increasing exponentially from the seemingly large sum I had just spent. Anything from massive weapons and sets of artisanal enchanted armor to exotic animals and unique materials changed hands for millions of coin. An authority tin steel spear, a shaft as hefty as its head entwined in silver vines, a near-custom piece never to be seen on the open market, was sold for 10 million coin. An authority 11 knight set of armor, a gleaming amalgamation of shell and steel, sold for nearly 20 times as much. The numbers were as incredible as the items being sold. Captain Ignov's words seemed to be painting themselves true right before my eyes. Most of these items would never be seen again. They were one of a kind and exorbitantly expensive. Even Amara was stunned. Despite her family's dukedom and the incredible wealth it entailed, the sheer amount of coin that moved on a whim was still an entirely different scale. Well, we were both expanding our worldview. The only thing more exclusive than the high authority gear was a set of enchanting blueprints. The seller, much like Apocryon did with his enhancement pills sold only a few months ago, gave up production rights to a mass-market water production enchantment. The final price, set by an anonymous buyer after a tense bidding battle, soared to an even 300 million. But even greater things were to come. Tension built up in the audience as the end of the auction approached, the blacked-out spot at the bottom of the catalog generating more and more excitement. By the time the last few items had been auctioned off, murmurs and wild speculation rippled throughout the floor, the audience's anticipation at a boiling point. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you our final item, one unlike any ever seen on this stage before, one of the most powerful things you'll ever see. Badum. Something alien caused my aura to ripple as those words were spoken. Badum. I felt it before I saw it, my heart pounding in my chest even before it arrived on stage. It was following the rhythm of those beats. Two attendants struggled to heave a heavy metal card on stage. Whatever was underneath the tarp, its aura was overwhelming. It projected so much vitality it felt like I was drowning, even from the VIP booth. It just felt alive. Despite my dead-set conviction otherwise, I could tell whatever was inside was certainly not alive anymore. At most, it was a mere remnant of what it once had been. One attendant heaved to stop the cart. The other, with a grand flourish, tore the cloth from what it had covered. A collective gasp rippled through the crowd. A heart. The size of a head. The off-white organ sat suspended in a translucent blue fluid. Even when torn out from some creature's chest, it continued to beat undyingly. Everyone in the suite stood to get a closer look. Anybody who could even faintly sense their aura could feel a heavy weight upon it. The auctioneer flicked his hands towards the artifact, his motion essentially meaningless because of the incredible attention already on the heart. Behold before you, a still-beating heart plucked from the chest of the Authority Eleven Nemia. As a paragon, this being already sat at the top of the animal hierarchy, but this one was infamous for its dozens of repulsed capture attempts. Finally brought low by the efforts of our sellers, its nigh-immortal heart has resisted all laws of nature and continued beating, as it has for the past month since it was ripped away. It is the ultimate ingredient for a crown potion, undying vigor, endless mana, all at your fingertips to boost you to the heights of the world. So without further ado, bidding will start at 250 million coin. Holy shit.
I muttered, knowing that the starting price would be multiplied many times over. So this was the kind of thing I needed to kill if I wanted a crown? I could already tell that my goal would be more difficult than I ever imagined before. Unless I somehow became filthy rich with some business venture, then I would have to hunt my own crown ingredients. And anything that I killed had to be strong enough to provide me with a good crown, yet not so strong that I couldn't actually kill it in the first place. It was quite a treacherous balance, made even more difficult by the fact that I had to actually find a fitting beast or animal to hunt. The strong ones wouldn't throw themselves at me like fodder. However, that suddenly reminded me of something. The Cyclops Scout. Besides its laser, its eye was designed specifically for picking things out and seeing at long distances. Neither darkness, camouflage, nor distance could conceal from it. Nearly all of its power was concentrated on its observational abilities. As a sniper, having an eye like that would be incredibly advantageous. Would I be able to make a crown out of it? I had taken its head cleanly, so although I didn't know how crowns were made, I figured that would be enough. My only concern was whether or not it would be worth it. As I was, it would provide a huge advantage. But I would have to ask Maxwell first in case I was missing something. I made a mental note and slotted it near the top of my priorities. I would ask as soon as I could after Christmas since the puppet master was currently holding the corpse for me. It wasn't like I could do anything with it now anyway. With those thoughts I watched the bidding rise for the undying heart. 600 million. 700 million. 900 million. I heard that last bid from Patriarch Tavera, glancing back at him with a small smile. It was said that the Patriarch was around Authority 9, but I was inclined to believe that was false. Just like how Luna, the head of the Polaris family, was labeled as Authority 10, but easily stood on equal grounds with Duchess Teleria. The details under their names in the repository were false, no doubt. From the Patriarch I felt subtle power, but I knew he couldn't possibly be a mere Authority 9. He was probably pushing Authority 11, maybe not as strong as Luna, but not much weaker either. And considering the fact that the Tavera family had been expanding recently, it led me to believe that they contained deeper power than they let on. And apparently, they were filthy rich. After being contested, the Patriarch threw out another bid. One billion. One billion fifty million. One point one five billion. His competitor went silent, and for a while, nobody spoke. The auctioneer gave another small speech about how amazing this heart was, even about the advantages it would give in competition. But an entire billion coin was no small amount, not even considering the cost to make the crown itself. And finally, after it was clear nobody could afford to bid, the auctioneer raised his hammer. 1.15 billion going once. Going twice. Sold. The Immortal Heart. 1.15 billion. Congratulations to Patriarch Tavera. Hmm. The Patriarch hummed from his seat. He wasn't smiling. In fact, after he watched the heart get taken off stage, a scowl marred his face. Prepare for war. With haste. Captain Ignav left, as did most of those under the Tavera family. Patriarch. John. I'd like to offer my help, if you want it. He looked at me with a straight face, thinking for several seconds before shaking his head. No, go enjoy your Christmas. I will remember your offer, but right now, the risk outweighs the benefit. Plex, on the other hand, will be accompanying me on your behalf. Do I have to? Only if you want some of the leftovers, you slothful cur. Heh, just what I was waiting to hear. H.M., John really is better than you. The patriarch sighed while walking out, Plex following behind with a greedy grin. Plex was more powerful than Rayla, but looked less powerful than the Patriarch. He probably sat somewhere around Authority 9. I wasn't entirely sure because unlike many others, his aura was completely indecipherable to me. I couldn't even sense the man if he didn't want me to. His invisibility extended to his aura as well, making him a horrible opponent to half. What was I smoking back then to think I could ever hurt him? It would be a long time before I could even scratch him. At least he hadn't gotten me killed up until now. In fact, I think Maxwell was the one I should be more wary of. Well, since the Patriarch rejected my help, I decided not to worry about things for now. Still, I at least had to offer. He had done too much for me to not try and repay some of that favor in his time of need. But he was right. I couldn't do much for him. In the best case scenario, I could take out an Authority 7 Warlock, but that was it. The enemies they would deal with would be well above that, enough to threaten him personally. The black markets were about to become a war zone. I suppose it was a good thing we were getting away from it since I wouldn't be participating anyway. Suddenly, the announcer spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, I hereby conclude the Christmas auction hosted by the Black Spider Auction House. 
and in partnership with Harold Vatsi, the entire venue will be open for the final gala of the year. The night has just begun, so grab a drink and give a round of applause for your favorite orchestra, Lights End. I looked down at the stage as the audience cheered, seeing a dozen different musicians appear with their instruments in hand. As they started playing, I smiled at Amara. Most people within the suite were leaving, but that didn't mean we had to. We got the best view in the house, and she looked really excited to see this orchestra. The drinks were free, the snacks were plentiful, the music was invigorating, and the masks deflected all forms of judgment cast our way. With each rise in the pace of the music, I could feel the true spirit of the gala accelerate. Those who were here to spend money had received their goods, and those who were here for the celebration were finally getting what they wanted. It was Christmas, and this was an all-expense-paid after-party. Those who didn't unhinge were the weird ones. And Amara and I weren't weird. So with the encouragement of a few drinks, we indulged in this massive annual jamboree, letting almost completely loose and taking over the suite for ourselves. Down the rocks. Over the hills. When I found you on that night. When I fell in love. There was nothing on my mind. But your kisses on my shit? Thud. Amara slipped off the bar falling toward a large fort made of couch and seat cushions, but missing them entirely and kissing the floor instead. My head flicked toward her before I suddenly burst out in laughter. Bah ha ha. Ah. Get over here. Boy. Mama wants some kisses. What did you say about my mama? I said, ah. She squeaked as I dove over and picked her up, planting her back onto the bar before jumping atop it myself. There were a dozen empty bottles scattered across its surface, but that was nothing a few kicks couldn't fix. Amara jumped up with me, spreading her arms out as if she were balancing on a tightrope. We're gonna fall. I swore I wasn't gonna fall. Why was it all in vain? On that night you stole my heart. And then you gave it all. A-H. Ah. Ah. Amara grabbed a fistful of my pants, dragging me with her as she tumbled once again into the pile of cushions. She came up sputtering with laughter. Wah ha ha ha. You screamed like a girl. Lies. Deception. You can hit the high notes. You know who else can hit the high notes? I'm falling for you. My mom. Ha ha. Amara couldn't control herself as she laughed into the pile of cushions. I chuckled beside her, jumping up before pulling her out to dance some more. The two of us flew across the suite, dodging the massive mess that had taken more than a few hours to make. Scattered chairs, empty bottles and cups, and plenty of snacks littered the floor. We were all alone as we made up a brand new dance on the spot. It was only when we got dizzy from all the spinning that we stopped and looked at each other. I gave her a weird grin, my vision half spinning and my mind filled with a warm, fuzzy feeling. Hey baby, wanna watch my chest hair move in slow motion? What the fuck? It moves. Almost as well as I do. Now hear me out. You look pretty. I look pretty. How about we go home and stare at each other? Only if I get to carry you. Huh. I was stumped as she ran around, sweeping me off my feet like a princess. And then she started marching out of the suite. I relaxed as she moved through the auction house, crossing my legs as if I were in a chair. All around, there were butlers and attendants cleaning the place and helping drunken visitors out. Oh yeah, this is how I always imagined it. Take me home, baby. You're heavy. Ugh. How insulting. You will not degrade the majesty of stairs. Ack. My ankle. Shit. I threw my arms out as Amara tripped, the two of us rolling down a flight of stairs. Oof. Ow. I grunted as I landed at the bottom, Amara landing on top of me. I looked up, slowly concentrating from the disorientation and seeing a man standing before me, looking down with a neutral face. He was jacked, definitely a bouncer. So I let him know. Sir, I want to let you know how proud I am of everything you've accomplished. Thank you. Don't let society degrade you. Don't let the flame die out. I understand. Then I've done my job. I lay back down, closing my eyes as a small tummy ache started to appear. I can die peacefully now. John, no. The auction house is closing. Please drink this on your way out. It'll help cleanse your body. I thank you for this dash. Please move. I was pulled up, Amara clinging to me and crawling onto my back as we were handed two small cups from a nearby tray. After drinking it, both of us walked out of the auction house before recoiling at the light of the sun. Ugh, it's bright. What time is it? Three messages from mom. I said time. Our rail leaves three hours earlier to avoid delays. Time. I don't know. Amara shouted back, making me lift my arm and tap my aerial with my chin. It's eleven. That's nice. Time for bed. M.M. My ankle hurts. We need a healer. 
I muttered while walking down the street. There were many around us, most passed out or limp beside the road. Trash littered the streets everywhere, but the various attendants' work had cleared up a vast portion of it already. At some point in time, we found our way back to the elevator, going straight up to my room. Over time, whatever drink I was given started clearing my head. Although it brought me out of my drunken stupor, it left a splitting headache and an undesirable feeling in my stomach. Luckily, I made it back to the room in time before things got bad. I laid Amara on the bed before collapsing next to her. I had just enough lucidity left in me to set an alarm, passing out fast enough to avoid the wave of nausea surging up my throat. Chapter 82 Whenever We Damn Please Ugh. An incessant beeping in my mind pulled me from the sweet depths of rest. The horrible headache blasted away any vestiges of drowsiness I could take refuge in. Thankfully, it didn't seem like a hangover headache, more a dehydrated for an entire day type headache. Thankfully, I had no desire to pass out again on the bed, so I was at minimal risk of soiling the bed from a rapidly growing pressure on my bladder. I ran to the bathroom, relieving myself before walking out and downing enough water to make myself want to throw up. I felt a bit better after hacking out what water got caught in my throat, but also woke Amara up. She followed in my steps, stumbling through the same process I had. After about half an hour, we sat side by side on the kitchen floor against some cupboards, blankly staring off into space trying to reorder and make sense of the drunken memories of last night. At some point, I spoke. You dropped me down the stairs. I twisted my ankle. You sang on stage. You built a pillow fort for the bartender to sleep in. Hey, that was cool and I regret nothing. And he couldn't sleep there because you threw up in it. Ah. She cried out while burying her red face in her knees. I want to die. Just bury me in my grave. Hey now, it's not like they knew who you were but they will in fact remember it for the rest of their lives, just like I will. Ah. Uh, she toppled over, bundling herself under her ropes. I laughed and laid on top of her, wrapping her body up. The faint glow of the setting sun illuminated the two of us as we lay there together, at peace until, something, didn't feel right. It wasn't just Amara's hand, which had somehow wedged itself against my ribs. I lifted my wrist and checked the time. Hey, what time did your mother say the rail left? Amara froze before shifting around. 30 minutes. Shit. I cursed and jumped up. We gotta go. I need my chest. All my stuff is at the magisterium. Ah. I sprinted out of the kitchen and threw everything I could think of into my trunk before heaving it up, running over to Amara and lowering my back. Get on. Okay. She crawled up. With a twisted ankle she couldn't run, so I just decided to carry her on my back. Chest in hand. I crammed Amara and myself out the door while she called a carriage. I'll see you later, key master. Have a good trip, John. He waved while we barged out the lobby doors, seeing the carriage roll up. Swinging my trunk in, I lowered Amara to the seat before sliding myself in as well, tipping the driver some coin for speed. We careened through the streets in record time, rolling up to the magisterium to grab Amara's things. Thankfully, we had the foresight to prepare for the worst, so she had packed most of her things. Within a minute or so we were running back to the carriage to get to the terminal. Unfortunately, it still took a while to get to the outskirts of the city. When we arrived, our rail was scheduled to depart in five minutes. Thankfully, it wasn't Amara's legs or arms that were broken. She carried her own chest above her head, legs solidly clamped on my waist. I ran as best I could with two chests and a person in hand. The vigor provided through our awakenings and temperings helped massively in the process. I quickly scanned a hanging sign locating our rail terminal. The last few people were being led on. Hey, wait for us. Don't go. I sprinted over with Amara on my back, our strange duo catching many eyes. Most importantly, the conductor noticed us, although his face was filled with a strange, inscrutable emotion. I held out our tickets, which he took and snipped. Welcome. You're just in time. Ah, oh, thank God. I let out a relieved breath as we walked on. The conductor latched the door shut after we made it on passing us by and letting us get to our designated car. Thankfully, our car was nicer with private rooms, letting us de-stress and settle in quietly. I set Amara down on one of the small bunk beds and took a spot next to her. She grunted while lifting her leg. Damn, that hurts. Let me see it. I reached over, lifting her leg and resting it on my lap as she laid down. She was still in her shoes from before, some fancy slippers that went with her dress. I removed them, pulling a sheer sock off as well. She covered her face with her hands, peeking through her fingers with scarlet ears. I think it'll be fine. You don't have to really look at it. I'm checking how bad it is. 
Be but my feet smell. You don't have to. I held your hair as you vomited inside my pillow fort. You. She let out a weird embarrassed moan as I ignored her, checking her foot and ankle. Besides, she actually didn't smell that bad. Because of the magic crap, people in this world had better bodies and didn't smell nearly as bad, or at least, it took longer to smell like how people did on Earth. Basically, body odor was much lighter, and so I didn't mind it at all. If anything, her unique scent smelled rather nice. It wasn't so much an odor as it was an aroma and evenly emanated from her whole body, something I'd noticed after spending a lot of time with her. Hell, even my own body odor was better than before. It was still fun to see her so embarrassed as I inspected her ankle. Her ankle was probably twisted. Swollen flesh bulged outward, but she wasn't reacting negatively, beyond surprise, to my probing fingers, so nothing seemed broken. She also had a full, albeit painful, range of motion, so it didn't seem like any ligaments had been torn. It would heal with time, but given her status, we could get it looked at to expedite the healing process. After a few reassuring pats to her knee, I took out a cigar and offered it to her, grabbing another for myself. Both of us took a few deep drags, feeling waves of rejuvenation ease our sore bodies. For a while, I decided to just massage her leg, going from her foot to her calf and avoiding the hurt areas. She gradually relaxed until she let out contented sighs. I could feel her watch me as she lay there, but I kept my eyes down and simply let her do as she wanted. And after doing one leg, I couldn't ignore the other. With more freedom, I massaged her other foot, ankle, and calf. I was firm yet gentle with it, sometimes caressing, sometimes relieving pressure and stress through her muscles. I worked my way up bit by bit, going with and against her blood flow until I felt all knots disappear and turned her legs into butter. Of course, I didn't take it much farther than that. Otherwise, we would be entering dangerous territory. It was unfortunate, but both of us knew that there was a certain line we couldn't cross. We could generally ignore it, but had been pushing ever closer and closer. It would have to be confronted one day. And it wasn't like kissing wasn't enough, but both of us were getting a little greedy. Holding back was difficult, but in our best interests, and so we both made do. I felt Amara grab my arm and pull me down beside her. She planted her lips on mine after setting aside her cigar, giving me a slow, passionate kiss. My brain was clouded until she pulled away, peering into each other's eyes. She muttered with a rosy face. I love you. I almost recoiled at her words. They were far from expected and I was stunned into silence. Was it even okay to say something like that? Our relationship of three months was already under incredible scrutiny. But then again, why did I give a damn? Once I properly processed what she was saying, my mind was overwhelmed with so much love for this girl that I instinctively gave her another kiss before muttering in her ear. I love you too. MMM. She hummed as we continued to kiss, and for a moment, I almost decided to throw away all reservations and cross the line in the heat of the moment. But I knew better. My mind was too clear, damned spark, for love to cloud rational thinking. I not only rationally understood that our current position was actually beneficial for us, I also had the willpower to drive off temptations. If I fell to Amara's temptations, it would have to be a full dive of my own volition. It didn't help that she had brought us yet again one step closer to that line. There was nothing more we could do short of getting married that would advance our relationship any further. Despite that, I could tell that she got more heated as we continued in the small bed. Her grinding, the intensity, it all told me that she was seriously pushing. Man, she was really making this difficult for me. Not that I could blame her. The heat of passion was an addictive drug. The only reason I wasn't succumbing to it was due to the power of my mind that elevated me above the fleshly desires of my brain, to some extent. Not even being piss drunk could completely fog my mind. I found that out last night at the gala. And so, I was the one who had to exercise some restraint for both of us. Taking control, I rolled and got her off me before forcefully separating. She watched me with clouded eyes for a bit before her red face shifted into worry. Do you not want to? I am sorry. I didn't mean to dash. No, no. I put my hand on her face and stopped her lips with my thumb, smiling. God knows that there is very, very little keeping me from tearing off your clothes right now. Hell, I'm about to tear through my own, but we both know that we can't, not right now. What if I don't care? I could feel her squirm underneath me as she bit her lip, her thighs brushing against my rock-solid pants. I almost laughed, my remaining sanity barely keeping me in check. What if it's for us? For our future? We can do both. Can we? You know better than I. What would it really mean for us to have sex right now? 
I don't give a damn what anyone else thinks and hate the other nobles a lot more than you do. But if it keeps them in check, then I'm willing to wait. The future could hold a lot more. How much will doing this take away? She didn't respond, going from pondering to frowning. Through the horny, she started to get agitated before the anger surged. Ack. Damn it. Stupid fucking old assholes. Why should we have to care? Can they not just keep to themselves? My life is my own. I'm not some political benefit just so some elderly bitch can use my mother as a money bag. She stood out of bed as she started yelling, her arms flailing, and knocking stuff over. I just watched, even as the air was kicked up with magic. She was pissed, and I had no intention of stifling anything. I was angry too. Even more so than her. If anything, I was glad she was angry. Unfortunately, our lives weren't our own to dictate. Not yet. We would need to develop more power so that someday, we could tell them all to go fuck themselves. At that time, we could fuck whenever we damn pleased. Suddenly, Amara turned to me. Do you know why? Why we can't do this? Do you know how they'll take away our future? How? I sat straight and asked. I was genuinely curious, because she did in fact know better than me. She let out a sharp breath. My virginity. If you took it, then I would become less valuable to any suitors. But that doesn't help us. It would only mean that they can push the boundaries farther. I become little more than a product at that point, and because of that, they have all the more reason to simply kill you and marry me off. And there's nothing my mother would be able to do if you're dead. No matter how long it took, they would get what they want. I see. My response was succinct. I didn't realize that, but it made sense. Virginity was important, especially for women. That was simply how it was in these noble societies. And I knew that, but I didn't know what getting rid of that would do to us. Now I knew. It would only give them more leverage, more reason to kill me and take Amara. The Duchess could withhold her daughter because she was valuable. But if her value went down, then she couldn't, especially if I wasn't there to be a living excuse. In short, having sex would kill me. How fun. I sighed, standing up and hugging my enraged girlfriend. All right, let's readjust our position. We can't do anything now, but that doesn't mean we have to give them control over us. Let's think of it like this. We'll wait to have sex until we're married. All we have to do is hold ourselves accountable until that day comes. Nobody will be able to say that we didn't do something because we were afraid of them. Okay. I agree. Good. Now let's cheer you up. I don't like seeing you so mad. It's not my fault. I know it's not. And I'm sorry I can't do more. I rubbed her back as she started to calm down. One day we'll be able to do whatever we want. As long as you're willing, we'll work toward that together. I did just say that I love you, right? I thought that was a given. And I love you too. But I'm not gonna lie and say I don't have small doubts. About what? She looked up at me, worry painted across her face. I scratched my head. I've had a couple relationships in the past, and even though I thought they loved me, even after they said it, they still left. I just get worried that as time goes on, things might change. Oh. She looked down, thinking for a few seconds before raising her head back up. Then like on the battlefield, I'll prove to you that you can trust me. No. I already trust you. I love you. And I'll keep loving you, so long as I'm not alone in that. You won't be. In fact. She pushed herself up, giving me a quick kiss, red blooming across her cheeks. W when we get married. I'll make you feel stupid for ever having doubts. Oh my. I can't wait. Because we'll get to do some other stuff too once that happens. Why why you're just doing this for my body? Well you are the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I grinned and leaned down kissing her neck and making her hands tighten around my back. Be bad. Bad guy. Come on. I won't be able to kiss you so much while we're at your parents' house. We'll need to get in enough for a few days. That's tea true. That's so stop licking my neck. Ha ha. Chapter 83, Teleria Estate. As the rail slowed to a stop, I wiped some faint lipstick off my cheek and gathered my things. During the ride, we ended up changing clothes. Neither of us were completely prim and proper since we had gone a day and a half without really cleaning ourselves, but we still looked good enough. It wasn't like we were going to a party. A man in a tidy suit, quickly recognized by Amara, stood elegantly next to a pillar. Sir Himo. Lady Amara. Mr. Cooper. He bowed, gesturing to the terminal exit. Please, follow me. We have arrived. The carriage rolled to a stop, and I hopped out with Amara on my back. The massive Teleria estate sprawled before us. A terraced, balconied mansion spread itself across an area dozens of times smaller than the surrounding hills and dales comprising the entire plot of land. 
somehow simultaneously as shiny as wet polished slate and dull from constant surface weathering. Surrounded by lush bushes and multicolored flowers, the single-tiled walkway brought us before the three-storied mansion. It was on the outskirts of the city of Joffrin, but the surrounding area was incredibly rich. On the carriage ride over, I hadn't noticed a single shanty or even trash on the road. Even the wild country off the sides were carefully pruned into their current appearance. It seemed like everyone with money wanted to move near the Duchess' own residence despite its distance from the city center. Then again, maybe they just wanted to get away from all the noise. Of course, nobody could compare to how rich the Duchess was. The mansion wasn't even located near the wall, but from the back of the property all the way to the wall itself, there was nothing but fields of green. She had prohibited any construction back there for nothing more than the aesthetic, as if she lived in a rural mansion. With Amara on my back, we walked up to the main door. Sir Himo, the head butler of the estate, was a mere few steps in front, having sent a duo of servants rushing back to the doors to properly notify the family of our arrival. Not that they hadn't already expected U.S. Before we could even get to the door, the rest of the family arrived. Telexia Delaria, Icor Delaria, and Fie Delaria. They all stood garbed in casual but proper dress, looking much less disheveled than the two of us, strange looks on their faces as Amara waved at them. Hi, Mom. Dear, is there a reason John is lugging you around like a sack of rocks? I twisted my ankle. Why didn't you get it healed? We were running late. She dodged her mother's narrowed eyes with a turn of the head, deciding not to mention our incredibly rushed departure. As the Duchess sighed, I heard the scraggly voice of the Duke. John, you can put my daughter down now. Hmm. I hummed before kneeling, allowing Amara to climb off. Her shoe was off, so the fat ankle was clear as day for them to see. Although she didn't break anything, it was still painful to walk around on, and I didn't mind carrying her. The Duchess waved. Come inside. I'll heal you up. With those words, everyone turned and went through the doors. I was met with a large entryway that led to two huge staircases sloping up to both the second and third floors. The place, although rich, wasn't overly flashy. I could tell that the Teleria household was more pragmatic than they were worried about impressing people. The only thing that stood apart from the otherwise modest entry hall was the line of larger-than-life paintings, the stern faces of Teleria line heads staring into a void. They were an old family dating back centuries like many other noble households. They had ancestors well over a century old still alive and kicking, as well as many offshoots populated by aunts, uncles, and cousins. The main line, which Amara descended from, was most important and always ran the family as they were also the most powerful. But that didn't mean the branch families were neglected. They were in charge of the countless other affairs the family had to deal with be it running businesses or serving under the Duchess's command as a private army. Offshoots were nurtured with opportunities and financial support, but there were many measures in place to cut off branches that had diverged too heavily to prevent exponential hemorrhaging of resources. All of the pictures I saw while walking through the house were of important people who came before the Duchess, including special individuals who married into the family. When the Duchess passed the mantle to the next heir, she would become another photo on the wall, adding to the long chain and this estate was passed down through the generations. Currently, it was for the Duchess and her family to inhabit, but the rest of the family, who I would be seeing during the Christmas celebrations, wasn't far away. That would be fun. As I observed the place, taking in the refined architecture and tasteful artistry across the board, Duchess Teleria sat Amara in a room and started the healing process. A warlock such as herself obviously knew how to heal. Although it was, in theory, its own special field, it was all magic in the end, specifically water and fire. How that worked, I had no idea. But put simply, healing was a combination of the two elements. They were difficult spells to learn and utilize, so any healer was an incredibly respected professional. Amara would only be able to learn healing later since she was only now beginning to develop her fire affinity. After a few minutes, Amara's ankle looked much better. The swelling went down entirely, and she said it only felt a bit sore. And so, the introductions were made. John Cooper. I am I, Cordelaria, Amara's father. Pleased to finally meet my daughter's boyfriend. Pleased to meet you too, sir. And thank you for the hospitality. Of course. And allow me to introduce you to our second daughter. Fie Teleria. Pleased to meet you, Fie. I'm John. M.M. Nice to meet you. The young teen nodded and shook my outstretched hand. I saw the crest she bore and knew that she would become a knight, but had yet to awaken. She was 14, so she would only have to wait another two years. 
Fia looked at me with a courteous smile, a mature gesture betraying little of her true emotions, truly fit for a noble daughter of a duke. She didn't seem to have any real desire to interact with me, but I would hopefully eventually have a chance to win her over. After getting her ankle healed, Amara walked back over, nudging me with her shoulder. We should get you settled in your room. The butlers have already arranged his room. The duchess chimed in behind us. John, everyone here resides on the third floor, as you will. For now, we should talk about our schedule for the next few days. Come sit. She waved everyone over to the nearby couches where we got comfortable. Icor pulled out a sheet of paper, a comprehensive to-do list already prepared for us. Today, we are to attend to our personal affairs. I have a meeting with the Marshal of the Third Knights Division. Talexia, you have those plans with Raven. That's right. Omara, your friend Mina is holding her 22nd birthday celebration today. You're due in three hours at Perincia to attend that with John. Oh, crap. I forgot about that. Omara's eyes widened, making me wonder who this friend was. As for Fia, your own friends are holding an early Christmas celebration. You'll be staying overnight, so prepare for that and be ready to return tomorrow morning. M.M. Then let's prepare. Amara, take John on a tour around the estate until you need to leave. I'll be heading out soon, as will your mother. Okay. Everyone stood with those plans made. After that, the rest of the family dispersed to go take care of everything. Amara linked arms with me and took me around the first level of the house, pointing out anything I needed to know. The first floor is where most of the household activities are taken care of. Cooking, dining, attending to guests, training, education, and whatever else goes on. The second floor is for work. We have two offices, two studies connected to the library, and a small atrium containing the household pool along with some rooms that act as the family storage and vaults. Damn, I muttered as we walked around. The first floor was rather threadbare other than the subdued decor but the second floor was full of cool stuff, especially the library and atrium. The library wrapped around the atrium, extending all the way into the heights of the third floor. The bookshelves were practically the walls themselves, crammed full of a veritable fortune in paper, only the occasional window providing some natural light while floating lights illuminated the rest, drifting through the air on multiple levels. As for the atrium, it was indeed a huge pool, but it was also surrounded by a garden. And this wasn't a generic countryside family garden, but one filled with exotic plants I had never seen before. Inside the pool itself there were some water lilies, but unlike normal water lilies, these ones actively moved around, spinning and drifting amongst several others, almost like they were all performing a dance. And outside the pool were some plants a little too active for my liking. There were vines with feelers poking out, roses with large bulbs within their petals that glowed like a lamp, coral-type plants that shot beams of light out of their hollow bodies like flashlights, and some short trees that sprouted oddly shaped leaves which occasionally dripped a mysterious liquid into the pool below it. There were even some floating plants that drifted in the occasional breeze from one part of the room to the other. It was rather magical, but I still found some of it a bit creepy. Still, I looked forward to actually experiencing it. The atrium was connected to a few other rooms too. Two of them were hot baths while another was a large hall intended for parties, such as the one coming up in a couple days. The whole area around the atrium was intended to be a place of socialization, so I would get my chance to take a dip in the pool soon, maybe use the hot baths which were basically giant hot tubs. And then, there was the third floor. This was where the family resided. All their bedrooms and those for special guests were here, including my own. There were also much larger dedicated bathrooms with a variety of features such as a pseudo-shower function, blanketing the entire room in a mist of water. This was just the main hall and its offshoots. The two secondary buildings, although large in their own right, were more than a little boring. One of the side buildings was called the Ancestral Hall. It was a proper place to honor the ancestors of the Teleria family. It held all of their familial records as well as a few dozen heirlooms. As for the second building, it was a residency for most of the butlers and housekeepers. Beyond that, there was the backyard, which was a massive tree-filled garden bordering the definition of a forest. And this backyard led out into the vast field behind the estate that extended all the way to the walls, which I could see in the distance over a mile away. Turns out, most of the neighboring houses and estates were taken by members of the Teleria family. It was common for that back field to act as a place for children to meet and play, while the adults had easy access to the homes of other family members. And all of them would be coming to the mansion for Christmas. Apparently there were a lot of them. Lots of cousins, aunts and uncles, and distant relatives who still carried the family name Teleria. 
With that, my tour was basically complete. Amara showed me everything she thought was interesting, including her own room where we got a bit frisky before continuing. By the time we finished, both parents were long gone while the sister was getting ready to leave. But we also had to prepare, so I found my room and separated from my girlfriend to change. It was a birthday party and the birthday girl was one of Amara's good childhood friends. While there, attendees would consist of about a dozen of our peers. The adults would have a slim presence. There would also be activities before the birthday celebration. What they were, I didn't know, but I still went prepared. It was apparently rude to outshine the host, so Amara had both of us dressed down a bit, a balance between formal and casual. After we were ready, we boarded one of the many carriages owned by the family, a small one that took us to the city's teleporter nexus. Would you look at that? The room that contained the teleporter was massive, and the entire place was enchanted, brick by brick. The teleporter itself was over 80 feet tall and 200 feet long, constructed with eight large elliptic rings stacked on top of each other 10 feet apart. Each ring hosted staggeringly complex runic formations that warped and twisted into and under each other, leaving even my enhanced mind tired as I tried to trace. The power source, a massive Authority 11 crystal, sent out waves of incredible magic power, the veins of the rings pulsing in accordance. I could sense the overwhelming power within. Even the air was distorted by the pressure. Lady Amara, the teleporter is prepared. Please step forward. Understood. She nodded and pulled me along onto the platform where we stood along its edge. Some operators to the side fiddled with some sliders and pressed a button on a control panel. The rings flashed as I felt a compressing force envelop my body, my mind feeling like it was being pulled in two opposite directions, everything in my sight blurring and shifting. The disorientation filled my senses for but a mere second before I suddenly realized that I was on solid ground again in another place. I stood rooted for a few seconds before zoning in and looking around, my head slightly dizzy, but nothing my strong mind couldn't work past. Amara seemed used to it as well, at least more than me, so we promptly walked off the platform and left the teleporter nexus. We arrived at Perincia, a city on the other side of the entire kingdom. Upon walking out, there was a carriage already waiting for us, sent by Amara's friend. We boarded and were taken to her residence. Amara gave me some details as we rode. Mina Haliv is a year and a half older than I am, but since our families are close, we've been friends ever since we were children. She's an Authority 7 warlock who inherited some of her parents' talent. Who are her parents? Her father is Grand Duke Charles Hawk, one of the Authority 12 warlocks of the kingdom, and her mother is Grand Duchess Milia Hawk, his wife, and an Authority 11 warlock. Oh. Shit. My eyes widened, not realizing Amara had a friend who may as well be a princess holding the fourth highest status in the world, just below an actual princess, her parents themselves, and the king. Amara smiled. Don't be so intimidated. I'm not. Just surprised. Our mothers are good friends seeing as they're similar in power and position, and Duke Hawk is also my mother's superior in the military. He also oversees a massive farming territory responsible for over half of the kingdom's food production. Along with a few mines, he's an incredibly rich man within an impossibly rich family. Their family line traces back to the founding of the kingdom and is even tied to one of the past kings. Well, so the guy was a massive deal, a true elite in this world. He was effectively royalty, his family potentially holding more influence than the king himself. That was something else I thought about. How powerful was the king, exactly? Was he the highest power in the kingdom? Or was he just a puppet that managed the general affairs of the kingdom while the grand dukes ruled from the sidelines with their iron fists? I was curious. But such things were well above me, so I didn't think about it much. Amara Hunt. Yeah, he almost married my mother, in fact. But despite being one of his suitors, she chose my father instead, allowing Milia to marry him without competition. And she's still friends with your mother? Of course. My mother simply doesn't care about the plans or thoughts of others. Milia realized that, and it's not like my mother had much of a choice in regard to being Charles's suitor, so she didn't resent her. So when my mother found my father and simply dropped from the list, nobody was able to do much and everything was settled. Now, Milia respects the kind of person my mother is and the two became friends. H.M., I understand that, but I'm not sure about your mother not caring about the plans or thoughts of others. Seems false considering how she treats us. She does that because she has to. It's part of the responsibility of being the head of the Teleria family, as well as being pressured by all the other families who have a vested interest in my marriage. 
It was easy for her since she was already in line for succession, but I'm not in the same position, and you're also not from a noble family like my father was. It was easy for her to ignore other people. We don't have the power nor influence to do the same. That's true. I nodded as if I hadn't already guessed that. Once again, it was reiterated that all the cards were stacked against us. There was no use comparing, and I still had to be thankful to the Duchess for even allowing this to happen. After conversing more about Mina and Amara's history with her, we arrived at the Hawk Estate. At first glance, although it wasn't much bigger than the Teleria Estate, it was definitely richer. The two massive statues flanking the main gate, showing the weathering of time, yet still giving off a feeling of vast authority, painted a clear picture of the generations of prosperity, wealth, and unquestionable power needed to construct such an estate. Kings came and went. Hundreds of diplomats shifted the political landscape every year. Entire armies of soldiers and generals cycled through, falling to the scourge for time. But this family remained standing, through all trials and tribulations, affirming its unshakable foundation with every new generation. Not even President Carrion could compare to the depth and majesty of those within this family. And so we pulled up to the front steps of the mansion. I was curious to see what Amara's friend had in store for us. Chapter 84 Free I put out my hand, Amara placing hers within as she gracefully stepped down from the carriage. We linked arms, the two of us walked up the steps and through the front doors to a butler. Greetings, Lady Teleria, Sir Cooper. Please, follow me to the guest hall. The lady awaits your presence. Amara thanked the man and let him lead, bringing us to a large set of doors. A room with tall walls of glass and a pleasant humidity greeted us as we stepped through the doors, a sparse garden surrounding a tiled rotunda. At the center of this small greenhouse was a large round table with several guests already chatting. I scanned through all thirteen of them, recognizing only one of them. Pontek Goliard, the current rank one elite. He really didn't like me much, his face darkening significantly after catching sight of my face. Thankfully, it wasn't hatred, merely irritation but some people didn't need to hate someone to actively plot their downfall. Everyone else displayed some degree of curiosity, entirely unaware of who I was. First impressions would be important here. Amara. A voice rang out, a girl in a dress standing and gracefully running over with a bright smile. Amara returned the smile and put her arms out, hugging her friend. Happy birthday, Mina. Thanks. I'm glad you could come. And you must be John. Pleasure to finally meet you. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks for having us. Of course. Come sit. Everyone is here. We're about to get started. I smiled at her as she walked us over to the round table. She presented a generally cheery disposition at first glance, but Amara had told me some details. Having graduated from the Magisterium, Mina was a soldier. Due to her status, she wasn't required to stay at the front lines all the time, so she was transferred to Duchess Teleria's Warlock Corps. The relationship between the two families was a foregone conclusion. But unless she was some intelligence officer doing paperwork behind a desk, she would have seen quite a bit of action already. She graduated two years ago, an extra two years to experience the horrors of war, plenty enough to become more than a bit jaded. The scourge, while in theory easy to fight, offered plenty of trauma in return. I could even see a scar on her collar, as well as a small one on her arm. It looked like even the rich and talented were forced to fight for their lives occasionally. After being ushered over, Amara and I sat down. Then, Mina clapped her hands. All right, I've got an exciting event planned, and it was last minute so I couldn't be sure, but nothing has changed so we're moving forward. Last night, a flicker herd was making its way through one of our nearby fields. Oh, you don't mean. That's right. She clapped excitedly, everyone's eyes brightening except for mine as I glanced around confusedly. We're going flicker hunting. I've also got enough bikes for everyone to use, so we're heading to the site ourselves. When? Now. Come on. Mina waved, and everyone jumped out of their seats to follow with bright smiles. I stuck with Amara, heading in a line out to the backyard of the estate. There, right in front of the open back gate, were 15 motorcycles. I was stunned for a second while walking over, reaching out toward my own and feeling the sleek metal body. It was equipped with segmented metallic wheels, making me concerned as to how they expected metal wheels to grip any kind of surface. The wheels were also a bit wide, probably for ease of control. Thinner wheels tended to be more difficult to work with, sacrificing traction while turning. Other than that, it was a basic bike geared more toward the streets than any serious outdoor sporting. And, like all vehicles in this world, it was driven by magic instead of motor. I wouldn't get to hear it purr. 
so I hoped it would at least be fast. The suspension also seemed pretty solid after I checked it. Spring manufacturing seemed good enough in this world. After checking it out, I looked over and pat Amara. Hey, what's flicker hunting? You'll find out soon. More importantly, can you ride one of these things? If you can't, you can come with me. Heh, it would sooner be the other way around. I've ridden bikes like this before, slightly different construction, but I'm sure I can handle it. All right, just don't get hurt. We aren't like the knights who don't have to worry about crashing. True. I nodded while throwing my leg over the bike, slotting in a small keycard sitting on the seat and turning. The bike glowed as it powered on, and I proceeded to tamper with some of the buttons and levers. This bike wasn't a twist handle, but a push lever. Not only that, but when Amara pointed out some of the other controls, I found out that these things had something similar to gears. There were speed levels, basically gears, that allowed the driver to fine-tune his control over the acceleration. The bikes were powerful enough to throw you off with a slight press of the thumb, so the lower levels dampened the power throughput while the higher levels unlocked it. There were only three levels, adjusted with a switch. I tampered with it a few times before nodding. All right, I'm good. Let's get this on for good measure. I took off my suit coat, throwing on my protective coat. I even had my hood necklace on just in case. In a sudden burst of inspiration, I went sifting through my dimension. I hadn't found much in the way of weapons, but that was because they were deeper and more powerful, thus more elusive. But there were some things somewhat unrelated to combat that I had found. Even in my earlier dimensions I had found things like mild protective gear that was pretty useless for me. However, there was one nice accessory that I had found that would come in handy right about now. After smiling, I felt an object appear in my hands, lifting them up to eye level. Aviator goggles. With fur lining and a leather body. Groovy. Amara glanced over when John mumbled, seeing him pulling something over his head. Those goggles he spoke of were placed over his eyes, the straps wrapping around his head to hold then securely in place, frayed while poking out where they met his face. But she couldn't help the gawk as she ceased her tampering with the bike. Oh my lord. What are those? They're protective goggles. To keep the wind out of my eyes. Ho hoo. She sputtered with a smile. In the corner of her eye, she could see everyone else looking over with judging expressions. And yet John stood there with a goofy grin on his face, looking oh so confident. Amara laughed, unable to see anyone else but her boyfriend. She cared so little that, despite seeing them, they didn't enter her mind. Haha, they're ugly. Here, I have some you can use. Nonsense. These goggles are meant to be functional, not stylish. And they represent far more than mere eye coverings. The people who wore these were daredevils, and I don't plan to shun their legacies with some basic glasses. Oh, well excuse my insolence then. I just thought that enchanted glasses might work a bit better. Neen. All you need to worry about is keeping up. He sat down on his bike while smirking. She giggled while settling into her own. Inwardly though, she was eager. She couldn't be more familiar with these bikes. Mina had been a fan of them and was rich enough to buy and play with them all the time. As her friend, Amara had been a part of that. Even as kids they were pretty good at using them, let alone when they grew up. Most of the kids of high nobility, like those here, had learned to ride these at some point in their life. She was more than confident in her own skills. How could she ever fall behind? It was a funny joke, and she couldn't wait to drive circles around John. She would show him what she could do. At that moment, though, she saw John's bike spin. With some odd maneuver, his back wheel spun around while his front wheel was rooted in place. Like that, he turned until his back was facing her. Then, he pressed the accelerator and caused the wheel to spin on top of the dirt pathway. It wasn't a lot, but it kicked up some dust straight into her face, making her cough while waving it away. Asshole, what are you doing? Oh, don't mind me, darling. I'm just figuring things out. Yeah, right. Get back here. Haha. <laughs> she pressed down and rolled forward, slowly chasing him around the group in an attempt to get close and grab him. But he just evaded her with some well-timed burst of speed. Right as they started to enter their own little world, though, Mina shouted, All right, time to head out. Oh, right? Amara stopped and ducked a bit, her face reddening as Mina laughed. After that, everyone rolled out of the gates, John in their midst. The Hawk estate was located within a city, but in the direction they were going, there was a massive open gate just calling their name. They drove to that gate and were automatically let through. Beyond that, there was nothing but fields of green and farmland as far as the eye could see. All right. Everyone follow me. It shouldn't take more than 20 minutes to get there. Keep an eye on each other, and let's try not to have any crashes. With those words, Mina drove off ahead of everyone, accelerating onto an untrodden path. 
All the bikes fell in behind her, gradually accelerating before hitting a comfortable but fast speed. There were four couples who had decided to pair together on their bikes, so there were 11 bikes instead of 15. Amara, who brought up the rear, glanced at all of them before searching for John, and she found him as he slammed down the accelerator, flying past everyone. Her eyes widened as he leaned back and yanked, bringing the front wheel of the bike up in the air. Ha uh ha, -huh. I still got it. Everyone watched with incredulous faces as he held a back wheelie for several seconds. He then struggled to hold it for longer on the uneven terrain. He laughed like a mad and while doing so, the enchantments across the wheels glowing as he sped up and down, drifting around the group, pulling ahead of Mina before falling back behind toward Amara. She watched as he completed a round, pulling up to her side and throwing up a sign with his hand. He called it the Shaka, something he did almost like a greeting, and she threw it right back at him with a bright smile, thinking about what it meant. John had a lot of odd mannerisms, sayings, metaphors, and more. She had started to mimic and play along with most of it since it was fun stuff like this. It made her feel closer to him. He was from an entirely different culture where things seemed to be a lot more relaxed yet was founded upon fundamental respect. It was so different from what she knew, but she had come to like it a lot. He saw everyone as his equal, nobody above or below him, unless they tried to kill him. This much was clear by how he treated both nobles and commoners alike. He didn't hesitate to hold verbal battles with some of the highest nobles in the kingdom while giving other commoners his professional courtesy. It all depended on how they treated him. He could be totally casual with those he was familiar with, no matter their status, while not giving off the image of a hoodlum. And when he cleaned up, dressing nice, he looked no less noble than actual nobles. If anything, he acted more noble than those who were supposed to be. It was why she liked him so much. In a world where everyone calculated every word they spoke to her, where those beneath her tried to kiss her feet, those equal to her tried to use her for their gain, and those above her treated her like she didn't deserve their time or attention. He was a breath of fresh air who she could be herself with. A person with principles and no rules. They could throw dirt into each other's faces, play tricks, tease until red-faced, and at the end of the day they would throw each other onto the bed and make out like there was nobody else in the world. It was so natural, so fun, and felt so right that she couldn't imagine it being any other way. They were just two people, a boy and girl fighting to make it in a difficult world, fighting their own battles to carve out a place for themselves. What was a boyfriend and girlfriend, a lover, a spouse, if not someone to support you and someone to love? If it was any other way, then it simply wasn't correct. When she was going through the magisterium, keeping her head low simply to bide her time and get past all of the suitors who pursued her, she felt that. Despite not liking what was happening, she was the one in the wrong. Political marriages were normal. Pursuing someone based on their status and wealth was normal. Sure, there were stories of the noble finding forbidden love with a commoner, but those were either in books or ended with the commoner becoming nothing more than a concubine, leading a harsh life. Omar's parents loved each other, but she considered them lucky. Two nobles who fit each other well happened to love each other. She still didn't believe it was a guarantee to find love in your spouse. So she, like countless others before her, had gradually started to resign herself to what was meant to be. She would be able to pick out a better one with the open-mindedness of her mother, but it would be all the same. She had seen it before, heard about it before. She would get married, continue to cultivate her power, and then have kids in order to continue the family line. It was cyclical, as was everything else related to nobles. But then, she found something else. Something, someone, different. She found excitement, felt constant embarrassment, and reddened in shame since all of it gave her butterflies. She found real love in a man who didn't even know about her status and didn't care even when he found out. A man who held himself to high standards, someone who was grounded, generally humble despite small bouts of narcissism, and someone who didn't try to tiptoe around her thoughts or feelings. It was all a matter of respect, and yet he was still able to have all the fun he wanted, second-hand embarrassment be damned. Compared to everything she had done with him in the past few months, compared to him as a person, everyone else seemed so dull, so lifeless. Nobles living for nothing other than their business or wealth. Everything they did merely being a means to an end. Even now, as Amara watched John speed across the grass fields, circling around the group, wearing those ugly goggles and cackling while doing tricks on his bike, she could sense nothing but fun and excitement. He was here at the birthday party of someone he didn't know, in front of total strangers, and didn't give a single damn about the weird looks they gave him or the silent judgments inside their mind. He looked like a kid, and she was one of the few who knew that just a couple days ago, 
he had been saving adults and children alike from living terrifying lives of slavery. Yet he only regretted that he couldn't do more, guilty of the decisions that he had to make. And very few would ever know who truly did it, who it was that stood behind the American legend. Even less would see him and know the prestige his name carried. So she just sneered at the faces those nobles made. What did they know? They were just as ignorant as the peasants they abhorred. She couldn't even take them seriously anymore, let alone fathom loving one as much as she did John. And she was realizing more and more just how free it made her. Almost as free as John looked sailing through the air without his bike. Wait. John. Chapter 85. Flicker. My spark spun to life as the bike suddenly found itself riding over nothing, dropping down about a foot and catapulting me forward. Despite my increased mental capabilities, instinct took over and I tucked my head in and somersaulted, bracing myself for the subsequent landing. Moments before my body hit the ground though, a gentle cushion of air curled around my body, lowering me to the floor. Screams rang out shortly after. Shit. Watch out. Crash. The crevice harvested more victims, most of those in front unable to register my unscheduled short-range flight. I had to hurl myself aside to avoid a tumbling bike and its rider, a death grip on one handle and a look of blank shock on his face. Thankfully, most crashers were knights hardy enough to take a hit and warlocks with spells to save themselves, so nobody was particularly hurt. Well, I was glad I wasn't the only one. Just then, Amara slowly rolled to a halt beside me, crossing the crevice at a much lower speed and infinitely more grace. Are you okay? Yeah, thanks to you. I took her hand, pulling myself up before glancing at the others. Sure enough, all of them were perfectly fine, at most a little dirt marring pristine white clothes. The bike seemed fine too, their sturdy construction and greatly reduced number of moving parts resulting in increased durability. My own bike was still active at first glance, so I slung myself on and tested the throttle. It jerked, the back wheel worked perfectly fine, but the front wheel snapped off from the pressure and went rolling off into the distance. I jumped off just as it fell over. Oops, is everyone all right? Mina jogged over. She had been thrown off as well, but there wasn't a speck of dust on her dress. After everyone nodded in confirmation, she sighed. All right, we should continue. Don't worry about anything that's broken. Just find a partner to take you. Everything else can be left behind. She spoke while lifting her bike, checking and finding that it was okay. Hearing her, I shrugged and walked over to Amara. Looks like I'm with you. M.M., you want to drive? No, I've had enough fun. I'd rather just cruise with you. I spoke while taking a seat behind her, putting my hands on her waist before pushing them around her belly, wrapping her in a hug from behind. She looked away, her ears burning as she tapped the gear switch. Hey, all right. Let's go then. Let's. I smiled as she rolled forward, all the others getting themselves situated and following behind Mina. For bikes were left behind, but it didn't seem like Mina cared at all. With so much money, what was a few broken toys? We continued on our way our target thankfully not far. Within five minutes, we crested a hill to meet an untouched field filled with vibrant blue grasses. I looked out, wondering where these flickers were. I had no idea what they even were, so I was curious, especially since hunting them was supposed to be so much fun. After a few seconds, I noticed some shifting in the field. The blue grass was close to three feet tall and hid quite a bit from view. Still, I was able to pick out something splitting the grass as it moved, slithering like a snake. It wasn't all that fast, until I suddenly saw a small gleam of light in two places. There were several other entities that moved at that moment. There were around five at first glance. My brows raised. I saw Mina pull forward on her bike, her scarlet red hair shifting in the breeze as she peered out toward the field. Whoever catches one gets to keep it. Really? Out of my way. With her word, everyone suddenly rushed down the hill and stormed into the field, moving as fast as they could. Omara was right with them forcing me to clench her torso as she sped off. Find the main body, and don't let it trick you. Okay. I answered back confusedly, not sure what she meant. Still, I looked out and felt an aura nearby. It gave off no indication of danger whatsoever, so these flickers were either non-hostile or weren't dangerous. That made them much harder to find, though. Still, blots of aura sped their way through the grass, matching the rustling paths the grass made for them. There. Amara pressed the accelerator as she spotted the closest one speeding after it. The bike finally flexed its speed, shooting off like a rocket with incredible acceleration. Amara was forced to make some sharp turns, but with the magic of the bike, so long as we didn't hit a crevice and could hang on, it wouldn't lose traction. 
I pressed against her body, shifting my weight with hers as we turned with the flicker. We managed to draw closer, pulling up nearly directly behind it while splitting off from the others. That's when I finally saw what it was. It was a wolf, but also not a wolf. The body carried a certain loop and grace, but that's where the similarities ended. A pair of wings, translucent blue, sprouted from between its shoulder blades. Six legs gave it an unfamiliar gait, and reversed horns similar to that of a goat sprouted before its ears. Light blue fur, much closer to white than blue, gave off an impression of coldness. It glanced back at us with predatory eyes, and I caught a glimpse of its azure crystal irises. Despite its strange chimera look, it still radiated an aura of beauty. I also felt an amazing power coming from its aura. As we finally closed in and Amara prepared to cast a spell, its aura surged with a blinding light. By the time my aura recovered from the extrasensory equivalent of a flash bang, a myriad of other creatures had emerged from the main body, which itself was hidden among a few clones. The creatures began running toward the bike, but I still couldn't feel hostile intent in their auras. They collided with me, offering no physical impact, but multiple flashbangs went off in my head again. It was disorienting, but thankfully I had the foresight to fortify against another flash. However, it did accomplish its intended effect, distraction. With my senses temporarily washed out, I couldn't feel past a certain proximity. After a short while, I had gotten used to the feeling. It had happened more than a few dozen times by now, but more importantly, felt like a very familiar attack of a different level altogether. The Flicker's confusion tactics felt very much like a less hostile version of Apocryon's aura. His was so vast that even with all my power I had only scratched it. He had taught me a lot from a single exchange. The man was a genius. But this creature, this Flicker, wasn't on that level. I pulled out my 1911 and fired. The bullet tore through one of the incoming animals, a shower of illusory shards instead of blood and gore bursting forth. Illusions vanished in rapid succession as I emptied the rest of my magazine into the oncoming horde, a reload sufficient to clear out the rest. Amazing. Amara brightened up, driving faster without having to worry about the disorienting powers of the illusions. She turned, following one of the clones of the original creature. The other bodies can't go far from its main one. Attack the body and check. If it dies easily, then it's a fake. Just make sure to keep your attacks light. We can't hurt it if it's actually the main body. All right. I nodded before sending away the pistol, taking out a trench gun. Without even thinking, I swiveled myself and the shotgun toward the body we were following and pulled the trigger as we came within 30 meters. Boom. Splat. The pellets turned the creature into a bloody mess, its body instantly collapsing. The shots hadn't even been empowered. That's not it. Damn. Next then. Amara turned to find the next one. I turned my head to watch the body, the crumpled mess dissolving into blue and white sparkles. These things were tricky, weren't they? That still didn't explain the enthusiasm everyone had for hunting them. Sure, they were difficult prey and harmless, making for a skillful yet safe activity, but there was something else to this game. I had a feeling they were valuable, the power of their aura was nothing to scoff at. Amara did tell me to keep my attacks light, we shouldn't injure it. I pondered as she found the second body. This time, I didn't hesitate to simply pump off some mundane buckshot. Its body was immediately riddled with wounds, prompting Amara to turn yet again to find the next body. However, after glancing between the three remaining clones, I patted her shoulder and pointed. Go after that one. All right. She didn't hesitate to follow my direction. It didn't matter either way, but she knew my aura was sharp. I was just trusting my senses. As we pulled up on the one I pointed out, I stuffed a few shells back into the tube and point shot the creature. Boom. Pellets went flying, and, this time, the body didn't show the slightest sign of blood. Amara's back stiffened in excitement. That's it. Suppress it. We need to capture it. I'll try. I mumbled back. I wasn't exactly suited for not killing things. However, Apocryon had given me an ace for this situation. Nobody else may have noticed back then, but when I shot at him, the bullet didn't actually land. If all of those spikes were nothing more than illusory and tricks within my mind, my bullet would have landed since it was real. So either the things created by his aura hadn't been an illusion and his he could warp reality with but a thought, or I didn't actually fire a physical bullet. My conclusion was the latter. I had in fact fired a bullet, but in that elusive world, neither the gun nor the bullet fired manifested in reality. What I brought out was the spirit of the gun, and what I fired was the spirit of the bullet. I had attacked his aura with my own using summons as a channel for my power. Apocryon, as a warlock, 
used odd spells to create those black spikes that attacked me. They were illusions founded on aura, but still mixed with magic. I simply did the same thing, except with my summons since I didn't have magic. The result? I could attack with my aura using my summoner powers as the medium. It wasn't even a fraction of Apocryon's skill, but I had opened that door. So now, against this aura creature, I decided to do the same thing. Boom. I fired my shotgun. A blue light flashed as an illusory shield belatedly manifested around it, the flicker staggering under the impact. Its aura fluctuated. I could sense its surprise and panic. It probably wasn't expecting to encounter someone who could directly affect it. Another set of clones appeared from its body. Two of them ran off in opposite directions while the third snarled, ready to fight. With a quick thought, I pointed to the right. That one. Okay. Amara jerked the bike, causing it to drift and turn toward the running creature. At the same time, I pointed my trench gun at the clone that turned to fight, firing and scattering the illusion. After that, the clone that ran to the left also dissipated, leaving only the one that I had pointed toward. Amara caught back up to it with ease. Her skill on a bike impressed me. Then again, she had done this before, probably several times throughout her life. The creature continued to run, even flapping its wings to change directions with incredible agility. Amara almost skid out a few times, barely able to keep up. But it couldn't escape us, especially with suppressive fire. Firing bullets even elusively still utilized as much energy as firing normal shots. I still had to empower it with my Psyche and Conjure Spirits from my dimension. It was combat as I had always known it, except every shell I fired let out illusions that only I and the target could see and hear. Well, Amara could also see it since she was within proximity, but all the others running around chasing their own targets couldn't. The flicker was just fighting a losing fight at this point. Our bike speed wasn't tied to our mentality like the flicker's evasive maneuvers were. Sure enough, after I let off enough shells, the beast slowed to a halt, unable to continue. Its aura flickered out of control, barely able to maintain itself as its six legs buckled. We slowed down not far from it. I jumped off then with my gun raised, Amara staying on the bike just in case it wanted to run off again. So what do we do with this thing? Is there a way to capture it? Mina has the collar, but I can bind it. She took out her staff, a large complex spell winding its way through the air. The wind was kicked up a bit, the blue grass around us swaying with her magic until the streams of air compressed and wrapped around the creature. I could see her magic coalesce around its body, binding and holding its figure in place. It could no longer flicker and release clones, even when it tried. Although Amara wasn't launching aura attacks like I was, mana could still affect it. It was still a physical being. She walked up to me, the spell continuing to operate after having been cast. She had a huge smile, barely containing her excitement as her focus started to ease. We did it. You made the battle far easier. I can see why they would be difficult to hunt. I attacked its aura, so someone who doesn't know how to do that would have to expend a lot more energy to whittle it down. Of course. I mean, look at those guys. She pointed, causing me to turn to all the other bikes flying through the blue field. The others were rapidly throwing spells at sprinting animals or using their insane reflexes to try and slice at it with swords and spears. None of them were having an easy time, some were outright failing since they couldn't track the main body as well as I could. The key to this game was aura. Without that, you couldn't win without overwhelming power. These flickers didn't seem amazingly powerful beyond their aura. This one didn't fight back with magic or its body. After I disrupted its aura, it was too weakened to do anything. After chuckling at the hilarious figures of everyone fighting to capture those flickers, I turned back to my own prey and walked over to it. I didn't feel any danger from it, only warning. Fear was predominant in its posture, but an alien intelligence was easily visible behind those crystal blue eyes. It observed me as I squatted down in front of it. Amara also silently strengthened her magic, worried that it might try to hurt me. I reached out with my hand, slowly and without malicious intent. If it was a creature of aura, it could no doubt feel my intentions, especially when I made them obvious. I was still surprised when it didn't try to stop me, only apprehensive as I touched its shoulder. Its fur was incredibly soft, but the body underneath was rigid. It was definitely as strong as a knight of its level. From its shoulder I moved my hand to the base of its wings. It twitched, wanting to start but heavily restricted by Amara's strengthened air currents, so I ignored the attempt. Despite seeming more like shards of crystal than anything else, the wings still had a corporeal presence, tensioned like metal threads and unyielding to my poking and prodding. After the wings I felt the horns. They weren't metallic, but they may as well have been. 
I couldn't really test it, but I felt they would be incredibly hard to damage. They were also pitch black, contrasting against its snowy blue fur. I stood with a sigh, admiring it like a piece of art. What an amazing creature. Are they all like this? Every flicker is unique. They're all hybrids of various animals. Snakes with feathered wings, turtles with the head of an eagle, lions with the tails of a scorpion. No two are the same, however. These also aren't normal animals. They're spirits. Spirits? Like summon spirits? I believe that's the consensus, yes. Amara nodded, walking closer to the creature. From the legends, flickers start out as little wisps, aimless spirits that spawn from other dimensions. And once they come to our world, they see all the creatures within it and create their body in their own image. This is why all flickers are unique. They aren't born from parents, at least not that we know of, so each one is its own entity and chooses its own form. The body of a flicker is its personality. Hmm. I tilted my head, scanning the creature before me. I guess this one likes strength. It's also agile. Yeah, it's slippery. The only reason we had a chance at capturing this thing was because you took it down. Speaking of, how'd you do that? Just used my aura. I'll tell you about it later. Such a thing would be better explained during a discussion. So I brushed off the topic and continued looking at the creature. Suddenly, though, I frowned with a thought. Do these things ever take on the form of a human? Actually, no. I'm not sure why they don't, but I've never heard of a humanoid flicker. Some people say that they're not intelligent enough to mimic us. Others say that there's another power that stops them. Perhaps there's something special about the human form. Regardless, everyone seems to agree that there's no such thing as a flicker taking on human characteristics. Curious. I rubbed my chin and thought. From my perspective, there wasn't any reason why they shouldn't be able to take on human form. Beyond some intelligence and whatnot, humans were animals too. We had organic bodies just like every other creature on the planet. Or, at least from the perspective of Earth. I wasn't so sure that was the case here. Regardless, the form shouldn't matter. Humans walked on two legs and used two arms to carry out tasks. And if they could mimic the organ design of animals, they could do it for humans. Was there something else there? Maybe there was something special about the human form, just not in the way people thought. Instead of flickers being unable to mimic humans, perhaps the smart ones did it and something special happened to them. Maybe the reason nobody thought that flickers mimicked humans was simply because they were never able to detect one that did. It was an interesting hypothesis that couldn't be answered anytime soon. Nonetheless, the very existence of a creature like this was fascinating. Chapter 86 Slice of Payback the flicker was a strange sort of spirit, seemingly incorporeal, but very much physical. I still didn't know what made them so valuable, so I asked Amara, Hey, what's this thing used for? Do you hunt them for a crystal or something? Oh, heavens no. Quite the opposite. Flickers are almost always turned into a companion spirit. Because they're similar to summoner spirits, they can be bonded to a human, turning them into a lifelong companion. The only thing that makes something like that difficult is the age of the flicker. Younger is better because the bond has longer to mature and you don't need to overcome as many existing connections. At the very least, there's no difference in talent among flickers, so age is the only thing to pay attention to. How can you tell its age? They have crests that grow. The larger, the older. But you need a special magic to display it. Mina should have a device to reveal it. We'll wait for her. M.M. I bobbed my head, staring at the creature for a bit longer before looking back out. All the others were still trying to capture their flickers, but some groups had already given up or failed entirely. I could only see four bikes in the distance. At some point, Amara tapped her aerial and sent a message. After that we waited, and eventually Mina came driving over. Hey, you got it. Yeah. Amara smiled as Mina came to a halt beside us, taking large strides and observing every inch of the six-legged wolf. It looks cool. Oh, let's see how old it is. With a wave of the hand, she brought out a device. It was a large collar, which she placed around its neck and activated. The collar flashed before some magic projected an image into the air before it. It was the crest. This creature had a crest composed of a bunch of star formations overlapped on top of each other. In the middle of all these layers was a single circle, and the layers, despite being erratic, had clear levels to them. And after the device did its work, we saw a number pop up below the crest. 1,553. I tilted my head, unsure of what that meant. Surely this thing wasn't over a thousand years old, right? I heard Mina gasp a bit beside us, muttering in surprise. Under 2,000 days old. Amazing. 
You got a young one, Amara. Not even five years old. This would go for a lot of money. Amara mumbled, kneeling down and dispersing her spell that bound the creature. It seemed the collar acted as a restraint since it still couldn't escape. Like that, Amara looked into its eyes for a bit before standing back up. Are you sure it's okay for me to have this, Mina? It's your birthday, after all. Oh, don't be silly. I couldn't choose my own companion even if I captured it myself. If my family finds one that fits me, then I'll get it. Otherwise, it isn't happening. Even if this one might fit you? Trust me, it's not worth the trouble. Just take it. Even if you don't want to use it, you can just sell it. Young ones go for sky-high prices these days. You could buy yourself something nice with that. Hmm, all right. Thanks, Mina. Hey, you caught it on your own. That alone means you earned it. I only did the easy part. Amara turned and looked back at me, smiling before reaching out and intertwining her fingers with mine. I had some great help. Is that right? Heh, you two are chummy everyone you go, huh? I heard you guys were close, but you can't keep your hands off each other. Hmm. Amara hummed and reddened a bit, trying and failing to keep her embarrassment hidden. Mina laughed. Hiki, you've always been cute like that. I know there's some bad words going around, but I wish you two happiness. John, be sure you treat my friend well. She deserves nothing but the best. I hope you can give that to her. If I can, I'll do so for the rest of her life. Oh ho. Mina sported a funny grin as I leaned down toward an increasingly red Amara, giving her a kiss on the head and letting her sink into my chest. We both chuckled. All right. So long as she's happy, I don't wish for anything more. Hopefully these people will be wrapping up soon so we can go back. Until then I'll go watch them, but you two can head back ahead of us. The head butler back home will be able to help you with the flicker. To get it there, just use this cage. She waved, a large sled appearing on the floor before us. On top of the sled was a large cage more than big enough for the flicker. Using magic, Amara was able to guide it in before shutting it and hooking the cage up to our bike. With that, we started making our way back to the estate, flicker in tow. Amara and I were alone within the Hawk estate for over an hour. It was only then that Mina finally returned with the rest of her guests. Apparently, they managed to capture two more flickers, though it took collective effort and large dedication. At least it paid off. Not that we minded alone time, but sitting around awkwardly in an unfamiliar estate wasn't exactly fun. In that time, though, we were able to have the head butler send the flicker we caught to the Teleria estate. Amara also sent a message to her mother notifying her about it. After that, we held a little discussion about what to do with it. Amara liked the flicker, that much I was aware of. And they were rare enough that not even nobility could hold stockpiles of them. While they could be found and hunted with relative certainty so long as a noble wanted it, the problem of age and type was a major factor in why they were still incredibly rare to acquire. Flickers could live longer than humans, and they only gained more power the longer they lived. And they couldn't be held in confinement otherwise they would die. There were only two places they could properly thrive. The mind of a human and the wild. How they worked, what they were, and almost everything else about their existence was a mystery. But that was all overshadowed by the fact that they could be made into companion spirits. These were creatures that could fight and assist in battle, and one notable trait they all shared was their hatred for the Scourge. Flickers were actually known to be found on battlefields. You could find groups of them out in the wild hunting Scourge beasts. There were even historical records of entire armies of Flickers appearing during some of the biggest Scourge tides in military history. They were thought to be the antithesis to the Scourge, and because of that, where the Scourge was known as evil, flickers were regarded as sacred, though not officially. Some people called them fairies. To even see one was a legendary encounter for the ordinary. It was also said that flickers were common in the Outlands. The only reason they were rare around the kingdom was because they were hunted so often. Our recent hunt proved that fact. However, there was one place within humanity's territory that they appeared often. The church. Apparently, flickers could be found in abundance within the church. It was said that to attain a companion spirit was normal for the Templars, the church's soldiers. I decided to ask Vetsmon about that sometime. Still, I couldn't help but think that the church had a lot of things going for them. This was yet another thing on that list. All of this painted a clear image that flickers were incredibly valuable. While all flickers had the same talent, their environment dictated how much they could grow. The flickers that hunted the scourge regularly were said to be incredibly powerful, while ones residing within the peaceful borders of the kingdom were weaker. However, this was only a matter of training. And if a flicker became the companion spirit of someone who fought the scourge, 
that Flicker would grow alongside its partner. If I or Amara bonded with our captured Flicker, then its future power would be directly dictated by our own. So while it was useless in the hands of the average or ordinary, it was disgustingly powerful in the hands of the strong. It effectively doubled your combat power, depending on how you used it. When thought of like that, it was almost like their very existence on this world was for the express purpose of either fighting the Scourge or helping humans fight the Scourge. So a young flicker that could be easily bonded to a human was incredibly valuable. Even someone like Mina said they could go for sky-high prices, which meant that a single flicker could move a mountain of gold. No wonder everyone was so excited to go flicker hunting. Though, I couldn't help but feel like these nobles really did live in an entirely different world from everyone else. Hunting extremely valuable creatures was simply seen as an exciting activity, not the chance of a lifetime that it was. And that was only to the children who didn't have a flicker. Otherwise, it wasn't even that. I could barely wrap my head around that level of living. Either way, I understood how valuable the flicker was. In fact, if I were able to make it my companion, then I would have a creature with the strength of a knight to protect me. For my fragile self, it could be another critical layer of protection. But it was the same thing for Amara. Having a creature to occupy targets so she could release spells without contention would do wonders for her combat prowess. Despite that, when we talked about it, she actually brought up the notion of giving it to me. When she said that, I just stared at her for a bit before putting a pin in that conversation. I wasn't exactly in the mood to fight that battle yet, especially since by that time, everyone else had come back. So from there, the two of us shifted back into birthday part mode. Mina only had a large feast planned, during which many more people showed up. Not everyone was invited for the hunt, only her closer friends. During that feast, we simply engorged ourselves with foods and exotic treats. There was also Mina's favorite band that came and gave us music. However, unlike the last noble gathering I went to, I wasn't really allowed to stay out of the way. That was because of Amara. Since she was Mina's close friend, we were seated at the main table of the dining hall where many of the other guests came and went. It was the center of the function, and I was right there in the middle of it. Despite the rumors, or perhaps because of them, Amara was talked to a lot. And since it was rude to eat while entertaining someone, I wasn't allowed to do so since I was her partner, and it wasn't like I was completely detached. I was introduced to a bunch of people whose names I forgot 10 seconds after they gave it to me, and then I had to go along with their small talk, which was painfully boring. They seemed to have that down to a science. A conversation could be dragged on for hours if you let them bounce between dozens of light topics with no substance to speak of, and it seemed to accomplish nothing but prevent other people from coming over. It was nothing but trying to maintain attention, as if sitting before Amara for longer somehow gave them more brownie points. I was sick and tired of it ten minutes into our conversation with the first pair of individuals who sought our time, and there were at least a dozen afterward. And yet, Amara went with it all without ever showing discontent. She smiled the entire time, showing utmost courtesy and friendliness to everyone that came over. Every conversation she held looked as genuine as they could be, as if she truly cared about every detail of these people's lives. I was amazed. Despite my commitment to laying low for our sake, I was almost tempted to shatter the veil of fake pleasantries and chase everyone away. That was especially so when men started coming over and introducing themselves to her as if I didn't exist. I wasn't jealous or threatened in any way. It was just annoying to be so blatantly undermined like that and be held back by social etiquette. But I wasn't interested in making a scene. They weren't outright attacking me, just playing a bunch of irritating social games so I endured through all the snide remarks and provoking smiles. Even without my aura, the contempt was palpable. It was like they did it all for no other reason than to piss me off. Anything that would make me slip, cause a scene, and degrade our reputations further. Yet I simply rolled with it, responding politely where necessary and taking small victories when I could. The little things, like refusing to shake someone's outstretched hand, was where I got my small slice of payback. Everything else was handled by Amara. She was the star of our show anyway. I was just the dunce who followed her. And she knew just what I liked to hear. Unlike me, she could navigate the social bullshit gracefully. The wording, the delivery, the intent, and implications. She wielded it all like a damn sword and struck at every opportune moment like a snake. She wasn't one to be pushed around, and insulting me was an insult to her. So I let her do the work for both of us. And it was like that until the feast finally ended. It went without direct confrontation, yet I found myself more drained than if it actually had. Once we boarded our carriage to head to the city teleporter, I let out a long sigh, 
loosening the collar of my shirt before taking out my cigar case. I lit one and took a few puffs before handing it to Amara so she could do the same. After a few seconds both of us felt its rejuvenating effects, sitting in silence while the carriage rolled. Chapter 87 Bond With the morning sun at her back, Duchess Teleria strode into the dining hall, a cup of tea with a ludicrous amount of sugar already waiting for her. The butler stepped back from the table, giving her a moment to take a sip before delivering his report. The flicker that Lady Amara captured has been processed. Here is a report on its attributes. The tamer also wants you to know that the bonding ritual can start at any time. Thank you. The duchess took the sheet of paper from her butler, glancing through it. On it was an image of the six-legged winged wolf. She wasn't particularly impressed by its stature or look. Although exotic, she had seen many that were far stranger. What she was interested about was the age and the fact it was a knight. This flicker would grow to be a flighty physical combatant, complementing excellently with the explosively powerful but fragile Amara. It was very possible that Amara would be able to use it as a mount in the future. At the very least, it would be capable of escaping with her, providing another lifeline. However, there was another attribute that actually surprised her. Right below its type, sensitive aura was written. How rare. She mumbled. A sensitive aura meant that it was incredibly attuned to danger and had fantastic instincts. That would make it an entire level more capable than a mere knight. However, that also raised a question. How the hell did she manage to capture it? The Duchess knew her daughter well, both her strengths and limits. After all, she had once been in the same shoes. She couldn't have done it alone, even considering the Flicker's inexperience of youth. But Amara also hadn't talked about what happened on the hunt yet, so she had no idea what had happened. After glancing through the rest of the report, she decided that this was a worthy flicker. Where's Amara? The lady is in the atrium with Sir Cooper. Shall I summon her? No. I'll go see her. The Duchess strode out of the dining hall, approaching the doorway to the atrium only to find her husband crouched at the door crack, eavesdropping. What are you, Dash? Shoo. Come listen. She gave Icor a weird look before walking over silently. However, she still casts some magic hiding their presence while amplifying the sound coming from the atrium. Flicker looked like a knight type. You're a warlock, so it'll be a good partner for you. Especially if it can use those wings. And if it grows more, you could ride that thing and cast spells from the sky. That's true. Some sounds of disturbed water reached her ears. One or both of them were inside the pool, but she could sense some hesitation from her daughter. And what she said next had her stumped, despite the hesitation it came with. Hey, you should bond with the Flicker. What? It's a knight, so it would be very valuable protection for you. You wouldn't have to worry about Vetsmon or Fiden keeping an eye on you. It could distract enemies while you shoot them. Amara, I'm not taking your flicker. Who said it was mine? You're the one who brought it down. I just drove the bike. It was a gift to you from Mina. Besides, it's your parents who are going to be paying for the process of bonding. I can't have them pay for me, and I doubt I would have the money for something like that. And if I told you not to worry about that? I think you know that answer. The two went silent for a bit, leaving both of the eavesdropping parents alone with their own thoughts. The Duchess hadn't quite believed her daughter earlier when she said that John was so adamant about not letting her pay for things. After all, he still caved. What if it was just an act? But hearing him now, she was having second thoughts. It was clear that he had drawn some lines. Anybody else in that situation would be begging for the chance to bond with a flicker, let alone have someone else pay for it who in their right mind would actually reject it when it was being handed to them. Suddenly, after a few moments of silence, John laughed. Ha ha, don't look so concerned. Look, if your mother approves of the flicker, then just go bond with it. But you should have it. It would do more for you than me. Not happening, Dot. Why not? Why do you always reject my help? This isn't even that much of a money issue. I could have someone just find me another flicker. You know the kind of power my family wields. So why? because I already have everything I need from you. There was some movement through the water in the midst of their silence. Then, John spoke in a hushed tone. You already know I'm not a big fan of all the charity I get. I don't even care about the fact that some people expect something out of me later on. I've gotten a lot of help, and I'm trying to get into the position of helping people instead. But beyond that, I don't need your help because you're the only thing I really need. All I want from you is to be by my side and to keep getting stronger. So all you want is for me to protect you? No. I want you to get stronger for your own sake. So that I won't ever have to worry about my girlfriend being in danger. 
and I would be very happy if you bonded with that flicker because it would give me more peace of mind. That's more valuable to me than another weapon. But you captured it. Then consider it my first Christmas gift to you. Ugh. You know, sometimes you piss me off. You and that damn pride of yours. Why can't you just take my help when I give it? Duchess Teleria heard her daughter flail around, water getting kicked and splashed, John recoiling from the waves. Aha. Uh -huh. You trying to get wet? Just watch the hair, huh? Splash. There was a squeal before both of them went underwater. John definitely didn't watch the hair. After that they both came back up, taking a few large breaths before laughing and play fighting a bit more. At some point though, they went quiet. There was no talking, and little to no movement, but from the tidbit she picked up, the Duchess quickly realized what they were doing. Pfft. Icor barely stifled his laughter, causing his wife to roll her eyes. All right, that's enough. Amara, she announced, dissipating the spells and walking through the door. After walking around some flora that blocked her view, she saw Amara and John in the water, no longer pressed together. She looked at her daughter's sopping wet hair and modest swimsuit before turning toward John and his shirtless body. Yet another thing she didn't believe her daughter about but seemed to be true. Despite not being a knight, he was still sturdily built, barely hidden well-toned muscles painting quite the comely picture. She couldn't help but glance at the abs once or twice, thinking that this definitely wasn't anything like the expected physique of a summoner. She let off a small hum before looking back toward Amara, whose cheeks were a little rosy. The flicker has been processed. If you wish to and if you're able, you can bond with it. It's available at any time, so make your decision and let me know. She was silent, pondering for a few seconds before looking back at John. His brows raised. Don't look at me. Do you want it? Actually, I already know you do. Go get it. Asshole. Oof. He clenched his abs as she threw a punch into his gut, making him chuckle a bit as she walked out of the pool. I straightened my back after Amara threw her punch, looking at her back and activating my telepathy. I love you. I love you too, stupid. She responded without a trace of hesitation. I clicked my tongue, smiling while watching her figure. Her swimsuit was a single piece that hugged her body, with a small frilly skirt going from her waist down to her high thighs. There were no bikinis in this world, go figure, and it didn't reveal much skin aside from her arms and legs. But damn did she look good, especially when she combed her wet hair back, exposing her delicate pale nape. I sat a bit longer in the water before getting out. After cleaning up and heading down, everyone gathered for breakfast. Amara and I arrived after the food had been plated and laid out, the two of us sitting opposite her sister. I gave a nod to her. She returned a hesitant glance. And after everyone had eaten the bulk of their meal, Ikor suddenly spoke. We have plans for today with the Raven family. We're due at the races in two hours before transferring to a theater for a show and a party later in the day at their household. In our absence, the housekeepers will prepare for our extended family's arrival. They're coming tomorrow for the Christmas Eve celebration. Amara stiffened. Oh, crap. I need to go shopping. You can buy gifts tomorrow. For now, we need to finish eating and then perform the bonding ritual. Right now? Yes. The sooner the better. We can't keep this flicker in captivity for long. Or are you not sure about it? And no, I am. Then prepare yourself. I'll bring you to the holding area outside once you're ready. I've already called the tamer who will initiate the ritual, so when he gets here, we'll begin. All right. She nodded, letting out a small breath as I smiled. After a short while to polish off the last bits of breakfast, Everyone filed out into the backyard to a side building where the flicker was being held. The building was used as storage, but now, the gardening tools once prominent were dominated by the massive cage in the center. Inside that cage, the flicker was shuddering in a corner, movement still severely restricted by the collar as it attempted to raise its head to track our small group. The tamer, who had just arrived, issued instructions. Lady Amara, please step into the cage. The formation has already been drawn. M.M. She nodded and stepped through the door, entering the cage with the flicker. After that, a large formation on the floor of the cage glowed. The flicker must choose you. It has already been weakened from its captivity, so you may either subdue it or beckon it to accept you. Because this flicker is sensitive to aura, you should engage your own in order to open a certain level of emotional communication with it. Amara didn't respond, simply opening her aura and reaching out toward the flicker with it. Then, the collar on the flicker opened and fell to the ground, releasing the creature. Its figure flickered several times, as if stretching its body, but the cage around it prevented it from going anywhere or doing anything like teleporting. 
Its body also tried to split and release clones, but that seemed to be suppressed as well. It had no choice but to face Amara, who stood before it with regal bearing. Forming a bond with a human is built into a flicker's very instincts. This formation will bring out its desire. So whichever path you choose, it will either submit or accept. I don't want to have to force you. Amara spoke, her aura flaring. Ever since we practiced telepathy, her own aura had gotten much sharper, only slightly behind my own. She knew it could understand her, whether it be through her words or emotions. Aura was an amazing communication tool, bound by concepts rather than languages. Come to me. She called, and the flicker lifted its head toward her. Then, it suddenly snapped to me. My eyebrows raised. Everyone could tell that its focus was on me. It had picked me out specifically. Amara picked up on it too, and she quickly spoke. Go to one of us. It doesn't have to be me. Amara. I called out, shooting her a look. But she didn't bother reacting. She just let it happen. Sure enough, the flicker came walking toward me, its head bowed and eyes looking up, as if for approval. Neither of the parents spoke, nor the tamer. I wasn't even within the cage, not within the formation that was supposed to be pushing the flicker toward Amara. It wanted to disregard all of that and come to me instead. I looked down at it with a frown. I could feel its aura drift toward me. It wanted to make contact. It wanted to bond. It seemed that function was built into its very soul. However, when I sent my own aura back at it, I merely made contact with its mind. I'm not going to accept you. I spoke those words, causing its faint excitement to dwindle significantly. I continued. I'm not the one you should choose. If you're worried about strength, then go to her. She is guaranteed talent. She will rise to the top of this world. It looked back at Amara with a glint in its eye. If a flicker's strength really was tied to its owner, then Amara's talent was its own talent. If she were already guaranteed to rise to the top, then so would it. But when it looked back at me, it didn't look completely convinced, as if doubting whether her talent was greater than my own. After all, I was the one who subdued it. I just scoffed. Don't give me that look. She's the best you could ever hope to get. You should be so lucky that I subdued you and not some other creature. And if you're so intent on doing what I want, then walk your ass over to her. From now on, you will be her protection. You will be her strength. Your life will be tied to hers as she fights the scourge. Our future battles will be difficult. So that's what I want. And that means I won't bond with you. So go. If you're not ready to protect her, then I question whether or not you're even fit to be a companion at all. The flicker looked up at me, slowly raising its body as I finished. It stood tall, no longer so submissive as it had first been when it walked over to me. I smiled as it shot me a sharp look. I had questioned it, doubted it. I heard its pride. It realized what I wanted from it. I smirked. That's right. We don't need a cute dog to roll over for us. We need a fucking wolf that will rip the scourge to shreds. So how about you show me whether or not you're even worthy? Pup. The wolf bared its teeth, letting out a low growl as spikes of hostility finally came from its aura. I laughed as it turned and marched toward Amara, as if out of spite. After approaching her, it pressed its head forward. Amara looked at me for a second before reaching out her hand. After she placed her palm on its head, there was a flash of light. The bond was made. The flicker disappeared after that, causing Amara to close her eyes. It was a few seconds later that she opened them again, smiling. I did it. The ritual is done. The tamer spoke, the formation of the cage fading to darkness. From now on, you have a companion spirit. The bond it has with you is deeper than any other. It will follow your direction, but it is not your slave. How you control it is up to you, because now, you understand it best. Yes, I can feel it. Amara nodded, and then, the flicker reappeared, materializing from her side. It seemed rejuvenated, even a size bigger. And it immediately looked toward me, almost smirking. I gave it a smile back. What's up, pup? Wanna fight? It bared its teeth again as Amara walked out of the cage. I walked over as well, facing the wolf head on, bending down, getting close as if I didn't care whether it lunged at me or not. Watch yourself, pup. I'll put you down just like I did last time. Except if I have to do it again, there will be a lot more blood. HRMM. The wolf let out a sound and backed off a bit, making me smile. I reached out and ruffled its head a bit. It felt taken aback, but soon leaned into the motion. Heh, good pup. I stood and looked at Amara, who gave me a placid look. I waved to the wolf. Well, there you go. That wasn't so hard. Now you have a lifelong companion. Are you sure it isn't yours? You have the bond. You tell me. TSK. You should have just taken it. At least you know I mean the things I say. Ahem. 
The Duchess interrupted, stepping between us and looking at her daughter. I know this was fast, but congratulations. You'll be much safer now with that by your side. Spend some time and think of a name for it. Becoming close with your companion is important. Do you have a companion, Mrs. Duchess? I suddenly asked, causing the Duchess to turn to me and stare for a few seconds. She nodded. I do. We've been companions for 22 years. I only received her after I entered the military. Oh well. You got her when I was born. TSK. You're making me feel old. The Duchess clicked her tongue with a smile and walked out of the storage building, making me chuckle. After that, we all prepared for our date with the Raven family. The bonding ritual didn't take long, so we took our time before boarding a carriage. Like last time, we used the city's teleporter in order to travel. Apparently, the Raven family had very close ties with the Teleria family. They were both dukedoms and had been allied for a very long time. Though the Teleria dukedom had publicly risen above the Ravens over time through their acquisition of the city of Joffrin, they owed their initial rise to the Ravens. The Ravens had an even longer history, famous as neutral parties, yet always consistent with their knightly talent. The Teleria family was a warlock family. Icor being married into it was actually one of the few times they ever hosted a knight. But the Raven family was, through and through, a knight family. They even had their own styles of martial arts. In fact, they had created one for every major weapon, like the sword, spear, axe, bow, and even knives. They also had techniques for movement and a variety of other useful skills. It was more appropriate to call them a martial sect. And in fact, they had a famous school of martial arts. It wasn't as famous as the Magisterium, but that was only because they strictly accepted knights. Their achievements and renown were the highest in their field, despite only being a dukedom. Yet one question marred all their accomplishments. If they were so great, why hadn't they produced an authority twelfth? That might make it seem like I was expecting too much, but as far as I knew, Grand Dukedoms raised not just consistent, but powerful talent. It might seem absurd for authority twelves to be produced consistently, but that's how humanity managed to survive the scourge. Or so I was led to believe. Either way, I had expected an authority twelve at some point considering their peak at martial history. Apparently that wasn't the case. Not that I would ask about it. To say something like that to them would be incredibly insulting to their entire family line. Just a cursory thought of mine. Besides, I was more curious about these races. Would it be like horse or greyhound racing? I couldn't wait to find out. Chapter 88 Pride The Telerias and I stepped out from the spinning rings of the teleporter, entering the city proper. The wedded city was the home of the Raven family. They had been on the land for so long it was basically an ancestral home and they owned nearly everything within its jurisdiction. The Raven family wasn't just a martial powerhouse, with nothing else. Their earliest attempts at establishing a separate martial school would have been run rushed over by the Magisterium and Jealous Nobles. Their economy was practically entirely self-sufficient. Rich mines supplied rare minerals and metals to feed their rapidly expanding smithies. Surrounding fertile lands meant various outrunning villages could supply the urban center with food and geographical isolation meant any competition would be a hefty and unsound investment. All this led to an incredible independence from the kingdom, with nobody capable of stunting the Raven family's growth economically, socially, or otherwise, the wedded city would make a perfect isolated bastion, and all that wasn't even mentioning the support the Teleria family gave them as allies. It really seemed like the Raven family and its city was the perfect place to live. Contrary to stereotype, the city wasn't all brutalist and practical. We stepped out of the teleporter nexus to a marble pagoda dozens of stories tall, gilded trims adding just a touch of brilliant gold. Massive sculptures perched on ledges drew my eye to the murals. Each level had stories etched across its surface. Depictions of sweeping battlefields, furious tangles with ferocious beasts, and portraits of great men and women of the past sprawled across pure white marble. Each piece was inlaid and accented like the trims were and I couldn't help but compare it to Roman architecture despite the distinctly Asian pagoda resemblance. From the nexus we walked into the strangely empty central plaza before the palace, the center of the entire city where only a few dozen people hurried about. Some were simply passing through while others were admiring or paying respects to the five titanic statues in the center. They all stood a little over 100 meters tall, one prominent from the rest. A plaque at its foundation bore the erratic crest of the Raven family's founding ancestor. That ancestor was dressed in primal gear, hoisting a spear up in victory while gazing menacingly off into the horizon. 
as if warning anybody who might show his family hostility that his deceased spirit might just come back once again to destroy them if they dared to attack. It was clear that, back then, he had fought long and hard to carve out a place in the world for him and his descendants. To his side was his wife who held a bow, almost the perfect picture of Artemis. She stood slightly behind him, one hand on the bow and another cradling her husband's arm. Surprisingly, the next statue wasn't anyone in the Raven family but, as I learned from the plaque underneath, was actually the founding ancestor of the Teleria family. She cradled a wooden staff, metal entwined around a massive chunk of roughly hewn crystal shaped like a beast heart. Despite the rather stern aura the staff put out, her face was gentle, eyes closed and undisturbed under thick obscuring robes. The final two, who stood behind the two women, were both men and prior chiefs of the family who preserved the family and city through catastrophic battles. One drove back the scourge, the other, rebellious families seeking the easy disposal of a rival. Those two chiefs, or generals, flanked the two women and faced the east and west, two guardians against all that might threaten the Raven family, a symbol of their perseverance. It was a majestic display that inspired pride in the hearts of all who looked upon it. It seemed these people were artists as well, because I'd never seen more masterfully carved sculptures in my life. Even I found myself feeling a wave of valor rising up into my chest as I stared at those five statues. And all around us, children and their parents would bow their heads in reverence, a silent collective pride rising from around us. Are you all right? I felt Amara tug my arm from the side, causing me to tear my gaze away and look down at her. Yeah, I'm fine. Come on then. Right. She pulled me along the rest of the family already walking off. From the plaza we got a carriage which brought us to another area of the city, and it was during the drive that I couldn't help but sigh. Amara nudged me, making me glance at her, her face filling with concern. I glanced at the others inside the carriage before suddenly asking Amara a question, breaking the silence. What did you think of those statues? Me? Well, I've seen them several times before. This isn't my first visit. I mean, conceptually. What do you think when you see something like that? Hmm. She paused for a second, forced to consider her response for a little longer by the expectant gazes of her family, apparently interested despite the spontaneity of the question. I suppose I think about how amazing the artists were to create such a thing. Same with the palace. It's no wonder that the Raven family is famous for their artistic skill as well. Why? What do you think? Amara masterfully deflected the bulk of attention back to me, raising the question as to why I had asked in the first place. I gazed out the window avoiding eye contact as I also formulated my words. Well, I think about the Raven family itself. When I hear about their sheer dominance, their hold over precious minds, their skill in art and weapons production, their mastery in martiality, and then the legends surrounding all of their historical figures, I can't help but feel that it must be an incredible privilege to be a part of that family. Elaborate. Amara probed further, not completely understanding. I rubbed my chin. It's a matter of prestige and pride. Could you tell me that, after gazing upon those statues, you don't feel any sense of glory? You can practically see the aura of valor radiating from the stone. It's a symbol of conquest, of triumph against all odds and a sign that everything those ancestors fought for bore fruit. I mean, just look at them now. Look around and tell me that all this isn't exalted by their children, their subjects? And if you were a part of that family, how could you not feel endless pride in it? Just think about how good it would feel to have that kind of pride in something, anything. A strange silence settled over the cabin as I finished, minds racing to process my statement. The Duchess responded, I do hope you're not trying to imply that the Teleria family doesn't carry the same pride. Our founding ancestor holds a similar position of prestige with them, and yet you don't have the same statue in your own city. She went silent for a second, perhaps a bit caught off guard by my blunt rebuttal. I continued before she could take offense to it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not questioning your pride or your respect for your ancestors. I'm just saying that there's a clear difference in how the two families carry themselves. As soon as we stepped out of that teleporter, I could clearly feel that everything around me fell under the jurisdiction and influence of the Raven family. As far as I'm concerned, this place is its own society independent from the kingdom itself. They don't have statues of the king. They have statues of their famous warriors, generals, and chiefs. When you're here, it feels like this family would go to war against anyone who dared to threaten them, even if it was the kingdom. No other city has made me feel that way. That's true. The Duchess nodded slowly, mulling over my words a bit longer. What the Raven family had done by putting up all of the statues, monuments, and art was distinguish itself from everyone else. 
So unlike them, every other noble family were mere leaders of a city beneath them. They weren't a part of the city itself. If the Delaria family were to suddenly be kicked out of the city of Joffrin and get replaced by another noble family, close to nothing would change. Perhaps some economic policies might shift, but otherwise, everything would proceed as normal. But removing the Raven family from the wedded city was impossible unless you raised it to the ground, completely erasing every fragment of influence they had. Such a thing would be necessary because their image was quite literally plastered everywhere through their art and culture. The difference was striking. In this light, who really owned their city? Duchess Teleria was the city lord of Joffrin. But did her city reflect that? Did her city tell its inhabitants that her family was the one who had developed it from the ground up? Did her city know of her family's sacrifices and battles that had led them to attain the power they held today? No. All they had was a little ancestral hall behind their estate, removed from the people. And who cared about that? Who would really care if they were replaced one day? Other than their own family, who truly cared about the Teleria name. I was almost certain that everybody we passed by on the carriage had at least one or two stories about the Raven family legends. I knew the Duchess understood all of this as she frowned while pondering. Then, it was Duke Icor who spoke. I suppose then, the only question a family such as ours would need to ask would be whether we feel it's necessary to do something like the Ravens. That's true. Maybe you don't. I had just been thinking about it because seeing those statues was rather inspiring. It's amazing what art like that can do for a city or nation's pride. And it's amazing what that kind of pride can do for its people. M.M., indeed. I'd actually never thought of such things before, at least like that. You're quite the thinker. Eh? Then again, you are a summoner. I'm not sure you can help it. I just hummed in response, the conversation fading as we arrived at our destination, replaced by ever more enthusiastic cheering. The stadium before us was as grand as all the other monuments in this city, called the Golden Bowl. It looked like it was built from the shattered chunks of marble boulders and then fused together into a single construction by pouring liquid gold between the gaps. However it was made, it looked as rich as it was creatively envisioned. Primarily used as an arena for battles and tournaments, the Golden Bowl was in close proximity to and owned by the Martial League, the Raven family's famous martial arts college. Only now, because the school was on break, it had been repurposed as a racetrack. I walked beside Amara as we entered the bowl, a butler under the Raven chief meeting us at the entrance. He was sharp, looking more like a guardian than a butler, and carried a huge battle axe on his back. He greeted us, forming a perfect right angle at his waist. A pleasure to have you with us, Duchess Teleria. The chief awaits you in the host's suite. Allow me to guide you all. Thank you. She nodded, the butler snapping to attention and leading us in. We were met with the roars of thousands of people as we rose beyond the confines of the structure's halls, emerging onto a large set of stairs providing access to the stands. At the topmost tier was the suite, which we headed straight into to meet with the Raven family chief. I felt a surge of expectations from within. Based on everything I'd seen, my standards for the leader of this city were sky high. My aura responded to my curiosity and anticipation, probing outward, opening itself, trying to pick up any shred of the powerful presence that should reside within the suite. And it found the anomaly when we entered. Ah, Telexia, Icor. It's good to see you again. Likewise, Ironheart. The Duchess smiled as she went to shake the chief's hand. At his side were two individuals, a woman and a man. The woman was a head shorter than the others. She carried a prickly presence, as sharp as her blade, and she didn't do much to conceal it. It was like she could cut me with her gaze. An atrocious strength abounded within the man. It was like his muscles exerted power upon gravity itself. He seemed heavy, like a hummer compressed into a man. As for the chief himself, I felt nothing. He was a black hole, exerting no force upon his surroundings or making me feel any particular way. He seemed powerless, completely ordinary but it was precisely because my aura could pick up nothing that I felt a significant level of apprehension. I almost hesitated to approach, my mind instinctively going into overdrive in an attempt to either get a read on the slightest bit of his power or figure out a way to flee, which I knew was impossible. I froze behind the group, Amara turning toward me in concern. I felt her aura reach out toward mine, opening up the connection for my telepathy, letting my mind into hers. What's wrong? Can't you feel it? The chief's aura. No, I can't feel anything. Exactly. I struggled for a few seconds, scratching my head as if to stimulate my fading senses. It felt like I was getting sucked into his aura, like I didn't want to look away. I knew that feeling was unnatural somehow. Amara looked back at the chief, 
but feeling my stress, she looked back and took my hand in comfort. I muttered inwardly as I finally turned my gaze. What a fucking monster. He might be worse than Apocryon. Who's Apocryon? The most dangerous individual I've ever encountered. He has the most powerful aura I know of, yet this man feels to be at least on his level, if not higher. I guess the differences would only be in how they wielded it, not necessarily their power. I at least don't feel like I'm going to die in front of this guy. I took some subtle deep breaths. It felt like my ears were ringing, and even though my vision was fine, I had a hard time focusing on anything. That aura seemed to scramble the senses, an incredibly advantageous tool for any knight to have, yet I was sure that was nowhere near the extent of its abilities. He's coming. Hmm. I almost panicked, raising my head in alarm at her words, yet I couldn't actually seem to see him coming. Until his hand touched my shoulder, all my senses returning to me in full clarity. Sorry about that. Are you okay now? The man smiled in front of me. He was only a bit taller than me, but his build was much stockier. He wore a nice set of casual clothing, his vest seeming to bind him in and his medium-length gray hair flowing freely around his shoulders. Amara had told me that the Raven family, contrary to their namesake, had predominantly white and gray hair. There were several people within the suite who had the same hair as him, obviously from the family. It was almost like their indicator of royal blood. I quickly composed myself, realizing that several people were staring. I must have been acting strangely. I could barely remember anything from when my senses were scattered. Yes. Sorry. Heh, there's no reason to apologize for having such a keen aura. I normally don't have to rein it in because those who can sense it in the first place are also at such a high level that their senses can withstand it. So I suppose you're the outlier here. I guess. I gave him a grim smile as he chuckled, returning to his seat. At the front of the suite behind the glass window, there were several rows of seats that people used to view the field down below. His seat was in the middle of those rows, a smooth path carved out before him for his exclusive viewing pleasure. I'll be sure to control myself. You have my apologies. Please, come relax. The races are just getting started. He motioned to the whole family, Talexia and Ikor taking up a seat beside him while Amara, myself, and her sister sat beside them. We had our own row to ourselves. From there, I was able to calm myself and look out the window, finally seeing what these races were all about. On the ground at the starting line was a row of slim winged creatures. Their hardened leather almost looked like a carapace at first glance, giving me the impression that it was some insectoid creature. But they were definitely regular animals, only their body structures were incredibly streamlined for quick flight. Their riders looked like a bunch of knights, and their gear was designed to sit flush with the creatures they rode like a professional sports bike racer. They practically lay across the backs of their gliders, as Amara eventually informed me. Their heads were positioned directly behind the glider's own, and their legs fell just on top of the base of their long tail. Curiously, their tails had an interesting flap on them, almost like a sharp rudder. Their pointed snouts were also rather ferocious. Riders, to your marks. An official stepped atop a stand, raising a small staff into the air. All the riders moved their gliders just before the starting line. There were only five lanes on this track, and each lane had a staggered line. Once staged, the official staff glowed. Get set. The gliders stilled as their riders lowered, their wings unfurling, tensing with explosive strength. The arena filled with a nervous silence, the cheers of the audience reducing to a low rumble. For a few seconds, the hum pervaded, then the official brought his staff down. With a sharp explosion, all the gliders shot forward with shocking speed, the wind being kicked up all around them, leaving behind a plume of dust. I watched as their bodies shot down the 200-yard long straightaway. Slight gaps began to appear between each one. Then they hit the curve, and the difference in speed became apparent. Their bodies tilted, their heads only a foot or two above the ground, and yet they didn't touch it with their taloned feet. The tips of their talons only came down between each stroke of their wings, stabilizing them before they shot off with another burst of speed. Each did their best to retain their momentum, but at least along the curve, it took far more agility in order to turn while maintaining such a high speed. Wings flapped as they made their sharp turn before landing on the next straightaway. The first one to hit the straightaway was able to put an even larger gap between them and the others. It was clear that clearing the turns the fastest was the key to victory. First place gradually widened the gap until they completed the lap, shooting across the finish line, the rider rising from the glider with a cheer. Winner. Number 49, Gay Ball. The stadium roared with the excitement, joy, and groans of tens of thousands, 
their infectious energy bringing a smile to my face. It was bigger than a football stadium, and, with magical engineering, it was as tall as the professional stadiums on Earth. It could easily hold just as many, perhaps even pushing a hundred thousand. Every city needed a great source of entertainment, and it seemed rather clear that this place, despite being owned and utilized by the Marshall League, was the venue of choice for the city's citizens. Whether it was races like these or battles in the arena put on by the Knights during tournaments, the stadium turned activities into foci of entertainment. I settled into my chair, my smile widening as the next race went off. Chapter 89. Mischievous. The more I watched the Gilder races, the more I found myself thinking about my days playing football. The nostalgia was almost painful. I leaned over to Amara. I used to do something similar to this. HM? You mean glider racing? Well, not really. I used to play a sport called football. Each team had 11 players and our goal was to get a ball from one end of the field to another. The opposing team had to stop us before getting their own turn and forcing us to stop them. I see. But wouldn't the team with the highest authority player win by default? Well, that was the thing. Everyone who played was completely ordinary, so it all came down to skill, team coordination, and the strength of each person's body. I smiled, thinking back to those times when I would get laid out by someone 60 pounds heavier than me. The people who played were all a bunch of genetic freaks with strength I could never imagine having. I had to fight tooth and nail to be on the team, but after my first year I had enough strength and speed to keep my place. Then we won two national championships. National championships? MM. Over 100 teams across the nation fighting for a single champion title. My team won that twice while I played. Those victories were hard fought. And our audiences looked just like this. Tens of thousands of people. Support split between two teams, all wondering which team would come out on top. Every play, every run, every throw, and they would go crazy, like their lives hinged on their team winning. And you were one of the players. You must have been amazing. Well, not that amazing. There was still a whole other level above me that I couldn't hope to reach. I was nothing like those guys, just a bit more athletic than the average Joe and willing to work hard enough to get me where I needed to go. I slumped back into my seat. There was a time when I had hopes of making it to the National Football League, despite the internal recognition that my body probably wasn't up to the task. But I didn't even get to find out. I was taken away right after my last year at college ended. That fateful day, when school was finally over. I had my degree, and I was ready to move on to bigger and better things. I managed to get a tryout on one of those national teams, having made enough of a name for myself to get the chance. It was the opportunity of a lifetime. But, on my way there, I was killed instead and sent to this world. I couldn't help but feel like I was a bit robbed. That was the past, though. It was quite the disconnect comparing my past world with this current one where I had to struggle just to survive each day in an unfamiliar hostile environment. It hadn't even been a year since my transfer and fighting had thoroughly dominated my life. My mind was strong enough to vividly remember my past memories, but it felt like I was looking into the mind of another person. My time here had changed me so much I could hardly imagine going back to or being the person I once was. Amara's hand slipped into mine as I ran through my thoughts, her fingers subtly intertwining between my own. Don't go putting yourself down. I can't imagine that anything you fought that hard for was a minor accomplishment. Tell me, how did it feel being on that field and fighting for that championship? Honestly, it was the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life. I didn't think it was actually possible and yet my team and I were able to push that far. It almost felt like it shouldn't have happened, but we did it anyway. My spark not only helped me better remember the actual happenings of my memories but the associated feelings as well. However, I had an instinctual feeling that the chill running through my body would have been just as vivid even as a mundane person. I wasn't exaggerating when I said it was the most stressful thing I've ever experienced. My participation was the culmination of years of work and dedication. Every play felt like a battle to the death by itself, and there was only a minuscule margin of error. The stakes had never been higher, and there was actually a chance that we could take the title. And I was proud to say, we not just accepted, but seized, that chance, and it paid off. Nothing, not even the things I'd done here in this new world, had yet come close to matching that level of stress. Not even actual battles for my life. Maybe it was because I was fighting for others, not just myself. Or maybe it was my own biased perception. Even Amara seemed surprised. After all, we recently had that battle against the Cyclops Scout. We were running for our lives, how could a mere game be more stressful than that? But even if she didn't understand, she accepted. 
It was obvious that, back then, those games had held incredible importance to me. That was all that mattered to her. She squeezed my hand a bit. You took the victory against all odds. Among all the ordinary people, you were definitely near the top. Well, looking at the entire populace of hundreds of millions, I would indeed be above almost everyone. Those above me at that time might only be in the thousands. Yes, so stop insulting my boyfriend. I won't stand for anyone degrading his abilities or accomplishments, not even himself. H.M. Well, your boyfriend thanks you. I turned as she leaned against me a bit, planting a kiss on the side of her head. We turned our attention back to the races, placing an order for some drinks with a pair of butlers. It wasn't even noon and people were already drinking. I decided I wouldn't be left out. Because of my lighter breakfast, it didn't take long for me to feel the alcohol in my head. Here comes the happy juice. I smiled while grabbing my next drink off the butler's tray, my words causing Amara to break out in a chuckle as she did the same. I took a sip of some kind of margarita. It tasted great, making it quite the dangerous drink. Then, to my side, Amara lifted her arm and exposed her aerial, reading a new message. Her aura then reached out to mine as she smiled. I completed the telepathic link and let her speak. My sister wants me to explore the bowl with her. Do you mind if I leave? Come on, you don't have to ask me. Go have fun. I'll probably explore some too in a bit. All right. Keep the link active though. Just in case I want to hear your voice. She stood with those words, squeezing my hand one more time before strolling over to Fie. She stood happily, the two sisters walking out of the suite and into the stadium. I waited a bit, continuing to watch as I finished the rest of my drink. Once empty, the butler came back and retrieved the empty glass. I lingered for a bit more before preparing to leave, but then, someone came and sat down next to me. I looked over curiously, seeing a girl around my age looking at me with quite a bit of interest. She was only a couple inches shorter than I was, and yet being a knight, she was infinitely stronger. I saw a pair of blades on her back and snow-white hair, indicative of her status as a child of the Raven family. I tilted my head. Hello. Hi. You were able to sense the chief's aura. I suppose. Who are you? I'm his granddaughter. Shadowbane. Pleasure to meet you. I felt a bit odd as she stretched out her hand, but I just rolled with it. It wasn't just her sudden approach. The Raven family also had some rather odd naming conventions. John Cooper. Likewise. How old are you, John? 22, almost 23. Oh, amazing. For you to have such a keen aura means you're incredibly talented. Are you a warlock? Summoner. Oh. She practically cringed in surprise, her blue eyes widening. I didn't expect that. Disappointing. I grinned a bit knowingly. Summoners were weak, especially for knights. Considering how highly she thought of my aura and the fact that I was with the Teleria family, she no doubt had much higher expectations. But surprisingly, she shook her head. Not disappointed. Accomplishments with aura are irrelevant to the type of Magus. Still, it's rare to see summoners in this city at all, let alone with a noble guest. I do feel a bit of pity, though. With your talent, you could have gone much farther as a knight or warlock. Maybe. Maybe not. I quite like the cards I've been dealt. My lethality is rather high. Really? Are your summons special? I would say so, although it may just be my own narcissism. Can I see? I guess. I shrugged. This girl was really curious. With a wave, I summoned my pistol, showing it off in my hands. It's called a gun, and it shoots projectiles like a bow. Except far, far faster than mere arrows. How much faster is far faster? Well, I suppose that depends on the bow as well as the weapon I choose. But on average, I would say around 10 times faster. That's very fast. That's just based on the bows I know, though. I don't have precise numbers, less to say of Magus enhanced weaponry, so I can't say for sure. But I have no doubt that any one of my guns could fire a projectile faster than any bow. I see. Her eyes flashed as she rubbed her chin. If that's the case, then I have a favor to ask of you. What's that? When we all go back to the estate later today after the theater, I would like to have a small spar with you. You see, I'm a knight specializing in speed. I've been training my reactions gradually and can dodge most arrows. I'd like to test it against your weapons. HM, maybe. What's your authority? In my 24 years of life, I've achieved authority 7. Oh, sure then. I easily agreed with that knowledge. I wasn't even sure a fully empowered shot could pierce her muscles, let alone an unempowered one. I had nothing to worry about. She smiled. Thanks. Also, I'd like to pick your mind about Aura, the original reason I came here. I mean, I don't mind, 
but stuff about aura is hard to teach. The best I could give you is a vague idea of what I've found. I'll take it. Anyone who can sense the chief's aura at such a young age has valuable experience. And I'll be sure to prepare a reward, regardless of the depth of knowledge you decide to impart. You don't have to worry about that. I don't mind helping. Let's do it during our spar. Just come find me when you're ready. I will. Thank you. No problem. I smiled as she stood, the two of us shaking hands again before she walked off. Not long after, I decided to get up myself to go explore the stadium. I was getting more than a little cooped up with the luxury of the executive suite and wanted to see every inch I could. This was basically the closest I would get to seeing something like the Roman Colosseum in its prime. Not to mention the fact that I was moving into my happy phase of drinking. I wanted to find some like-minded individuals and perhaps make these races a bit more fun. In fact, there was one person who would have exactly the information I was looking for. It was all about knowing who to ask. So I stepped up to the bar before leaving, smiling at the bartender. What can I get you, sir? Some information on where I can make a bit of coin. Oh. He looked up at me, not completely surprised. After all, there were undoubtedly plenty of nobles and noble children who liked the thrill of gambling. What better place to do it than at these races? He smiled. Go find the bar to the west of the finish line, Mark Tankard too. Ask for a race tab. You'll be able to place your bets with it. Thank you for the information. I flicked a coin at him, which he caught with a bow. After that I left the suite, making my way down the stadium stairs and into its internal hallways. The ceilings were high and the walls were decorated with more art, including some famous warriors and glider champions of years past. This was definitely a popular sport. There were dozens of food stands as well, filling the halls with mouth-watering aromas. I wandered for a while in the general direction of the bar, taking out a cigar and taking a puff. These cigars helped my body process the alcohol, so not only would it keep me from getting a hangover, but it would keep me from getting drunk and allow me to drink more. If I balanced it right, I could ride a buzz for a long time. I finally found Tankard 2 after inquiring from some stall owners. It was a half-enclosed area that resembled a restaurant. In front, there was a large screen above the bar itself showing the races in full detail, as well as some nearby windows that looked out to the ground of the track. I walked up to one of the small two-person tables, seating myself on a tall stool and waiting while watching the screen. Not long after, a waitress came over with a menu. Will it be for drinks, sir? Eh, get me a margarita mix for now. Also, I'd like a race tab. Of course, sir. For warning, our entry-level bets are working at 5% commission today. No problem. Then I'll be right back. I gave her a smile as she turned. I wasn't planning on spending much at all, so I really didn't care. Don't bet what you can't lose. I was really only doing this to get away from all the bigwigs and find a little excitement. Better than sitting around for hours letting my buzz go to waste. Soon enough, the lady came back with a drink and a card. On the card was a list of races, competitors, and their bet ratios. I could easily pay for my bets with my own bank card, making it really easy to spend money without a thought. Ah, damn it. What an idiot. Several people around me yelled in anger as the next race finished. I chuckled and looked through some of the lists. I didn't know about any of these people, only their numbers and the ratios. So I placed a few bits amounting to no more than a few thousand coin. After that I simply sat back and watched the show, occasionally munching on a piece of bread the lady had brought for snacking. Even better, since I was betting, they gave me my drinks for free. It was a common tactic to keep people happy and spending money, not that it would stop me from indulging. Like that, an hour flew by as my buzz grew making me laugh as more people gathered for the betting and yelled at their losses. At some point, though, I heard a voice in my head. Where are you? Hmm. I jolted a bit, forgetting that I was maintaining telepathy with Amara. I responded after composing myself. I'm at Tankard 2, one of the public bars west of the finish line. Oh. Well, I'm coming over there with Fie. Stay there. I'm not going anywhere. I let out another chuckle and waited. Soon, Amara entered with her sister the two of them taking up spots around my small table. Hey. Hi. Was it too boring in the suite? MHM. Instead, I find company in a rambunctious bar, and bread. The bread is actually really good. Try it. MMPH. I lifted a large slice of bread and pushed it into her mouth, making her open and eat the entire thing. After many seconds of chewing, she snatched my drink, washed it down, and shook her head with squinted eyes. Bleg. You've moved onto the heavy stuff. Hee <laughs> hee. I forgot you don't like this drink. Let me take a puff. She grabbed the cigar out of my mouth next, taking a long breath with her eyes closed. 
I saw her sister look at her strangely, as if questioning whether she was still her sister. I smiled at the face she made, Omara shoving the cigar back into my mouth when she was done. Thanks. All right. I need to go see a friend. Fie, how about you stay with John? Huh? Huh? We both looked at Amara in surprise before looking back toward each other. Well, this was awkward. Even Amara could sense that. But she doubled down while disregarding her slight embarrassment. Come on, you two can hang out for a bit. Neither of you would have fun in the suite anyway, so get along for a bit. I'll be back in an hour or so when the races start finishing up. Uh, all right. Good. Just listen to John, Fie. At least don't go wandering on your own. Have him escort you around if you want. M.M. Fie just nodded, Amara walking off with a wave. After that, Fie took a seat beside me at the table. Well, it was a good thing I was already right in the middle of my happy face. Since I was sitting my head wasn't spinning, but I could still feel the corners of my mouth lift almost uncontrollably. I stared at Fie for a bit as she just stared down at the table in silence. Pfft. I barely held back some laughter sticking out my hand and clearing my throat while trying to look as professional as possible. Ahem. I don't believe we've personally met. John Cooper. Nice to meet you. Fie Talaria. She shook my hand with an odd look. Fie was just a 14-year-old girl, so she had yet to go to the Magisterium or experience any of the battles she would face as a future knight. She carried the same look as Amara and her mother. Ashy gray hair, generally pale features, and a sharp look. It seemed the Talaria genes were dominant. I suppose the only difference might show itself in her disposition. If she inherited her father's talent, maybe she also took after his personality. Or maybe she would just be the night version of her mother. Well, I'd have to break her out of her shell first. Unfortunately, alcohol wasn't allowed to be my hammer. So I'd have to do this the old-fashioned way and actually appeal to her as a fun person. At least, I could still rely on ethanol to get me there. After shaking her hand, I suddenly leaned over to her and pointed up at the screen, showing the racers for an upcoming event. Hey, which one do you think will win? The people in the back? Yeah, pick the one you have the best feeling about. I brought out the tab as she tilted her head and pondered. Maybe. Number 24? 24, 24, huh? Pick a number between 1 and 10. 7, 7. I mumbled while tapping the card, slotting in a 700 coin bet for racer 24. She watched as I barely placed the bet before it closed. The race starting. All right, young Padawan. The ratio is 1 to 3. So we're either going to lose 700 coin, or you're going to win a bit over 2,000. W8, you're betting on this? Hell yeah. This one is all on you. What? Oh, here they go. We both watched as racer 24 stepped up to the line with four others, preparing for a two-lap race. Fiji's face tensed with anxiety as she stared intently at the screen. Bang. The sound rang, all the racers shooting off the line. They quickly reached and soared around the first turn, our racer keeping pace as they drifted into the next straightaway. Some seconds later they hit the next turn, itching the line and finishing the first lap. But then, as they sped down the straight, our racer started falling behind. Come on! I cheered as they reached the turn, watching as the gap was widened a bit further. But then, on the last straight, his second wind kicked in, and he sped right back up to the front. He's doing it. I started punching the air in excitement, tensely watching as they hit the final turn. It was close. Our rider kept right in front, the pointed noses of all the gliders mere inches apart as they sailed in perfect formation just a foot above the ground. And then, against all odds, our rider kept his wind and pulled ahead just a foot. But it was enough. He flew across the finish line, the audience in the stands cheering as I jumped. He did it. Ha ha. You won. I shook Phoebe's shoulder out of excitement seeing her staring dazedly at the screen. And then her face glowed in victory, her fist clenching as she turned to me. There was a glint in her eye when she shot me a toothy grin. I picked the right one. That's right. Now do it again. Okay. She nodded as we threw our seats together, going through the other list of racers and picking a few out. She even started debating about what numbers would be lucky or not, most of her arguments coming from personal experiences and biases. I didn't care either way. All I did was hedge some bets on racers besides hers, seeing which of us was luckier than the other. Even if neither of ours finished first, one still had to beat the other. We treated it like a competition. And so the races continued, the two of us wholly invested like everyone around us. I cackled as Fie started to cheer and curse the racers. She didn't win any more after the first one, but we bounced back and forth between winning and losing against each other. 
It was hilarious every time she got bent out of shape. It was also pretty easy to mess with and tease her like Amara, though instead of only getting embarrassed, she liked to fight back. Not only that, but as we both got more comfortable with each other, she started to get bold. As we watched another race, my aura suddenly felt something mischievous brewing. I leaned back, expanding my peripheral vision and seeing Fie shooting looks over at me. And then, just as the race was about to finish, she lunged. My mind was a bit clouded so my reactions weren't great. I couldn't stop her as she grabbed my glass of alcohol. Huh? Hey. Mine. You little punk. I hastily climbed out of my seat when she jumped out of hers, stepping off to the side and downing the entire glass. Cough. Ack. It actually tastes good, but my stomach. Fucking hell. I watched her incredulously for a few seconds. That was a half-full glass of liquor. The high proof made it tasty but deadly. Shaking my head a bit, I snatched my glass back before reaching out. My knuckle went straight for her head, digging and twisting it into her hair, ruffling it up a bit. Ah, uh, what a brat. Do you drink like this with your friends or something? What's got you so bold? I just wanted to try. My friends have tried it, but I haven't. Bunch of delinquents. All right, sit down and start chowing. Hmm, eat the bread. I pushed her back onto her chair and shoved a slice of bread into her face. That drink is gonna have your head spinning in a bit, but bread can make sure it won't hit you like a truck. Eat a few slices, quick. I pushed the tray of bread in front of her before suddenly taking out my aerial, tapping it a few times and catching her attention. She lowered her head in worry. What are you doing? I'm getting my camera ready. This is gonna be hilarious in about 10 minutes. Because if your sister is any indicator, not to mention your age, you'll be drooling like a drunkard. No way I'm missing that. I laughed evilly as she sulked and turned back to watch the races. After that, I just watched and waited neither of us making any more bets. And soon enough, she started leaning. Oh, here it comes. Shut up. I cackled as she tried to straighten herself out on the seat, only to stumble a bit and lose balance. And after the 10-minute mark hit, she was bobbing her head around, probably feeling like her brain was swimming. I couldn't stop laughing, and she didn't even have the mind to care. That girl ascended to an entire other plane of existence and I got it all on camera. Even the drool. That shit had me rolling around in my seat. But as hard as it came on, it faded just as fast. After about 15 minutes of drifting through the astral realm, she finally came back down to what seemed like a functional bus. John, place another bet. I think I've figured out who's gonna win. Oh God. Hey, come back to me. Drink some water. I tapped her cheeks a few times before pushing a drink of water into her hands. She drank it deftly enough, at least until she started laughing her ass off. I kept trying to grab her attention but it was all for naught. It took a few more minutes for her to finally collect herself enough to care about anything. Just as she had finally started to calm herself down a little, I suddenly felt a gaze land on me. It felt familiar. I looked over and saw Amara walking toward us in the distance. Chapter 90 Don't Tell Mom I'll see you at the estate later today. We can continue this conversation then. Of course. Also, bring your boyfriend. I'll need to see him. I will. Amara smiled sheepishly as she said her goodbyes to her friend. The Raven family was unique in that they were more meritocracy than strict hierarchy. Status could be earned through martial prowess and talented students were afforded their due respect. The superiors of the family demanded as such. It was different from the magisterium. There, even someone talented might not be given an ounce of respect if they weren't a noble. Amara had seen that clearly with John. Despite having the potential to be top ranked by the end of the year, all while entire authorities beneath his competition, his popularity was merely infamy. Granted, their relationship didn't help that. Still, Amara knew very few people who actually respected John. One of those few was amazingly the puppet master himself, not to mention the head of the Tavera Mafia. He seemed to draw more attention from the adults. Perhaps that was because, compared to all the students at the Magisterium, he acted like one. All the other noble children may as well be just that. Children. That made the Raven family special. Here, noble titles meant much less. Martial skill was everything. So if a noble child couldn't rise to the standards or challenges, they would be reduced to a mere commoner in status. Nobody would care about them, especially if they acted out of line. Amara had several friends here due to that. The best of her friends, the girl she just met with, was one she had learned from over the years. During her early years at the Magisterium, in an attempt to teach her daughter about the intricacies of combat, the Duchess would send her over to the wedded city to spar and fight against the knights. And so she met Shadowbane, 
Their personalities were similar enough, and they found themselves getting along so well when they first met that they immediately became friends. After that, they continued to battle each other despite the age gap. Amara took it as a challenge, and Shadowbane would create challenges for herself in order to get stronger. It was unfortunate that Shadowbane stayed within the Martial League instead of going to the Magisterium. She hoped to one day get into the position to work together again, perhaps in the military, but that was still a ways off. After leaving the suite, another one reserved for other ravens and knights their age, Amara headed back down to the halls in search of her boyfriend and sister. She didn't get any messages, so she hoped they were able to get along. She was close with her sister, so she wanted to make sure they had a good relationship as well. Besides, Amara didn't see any reason why Faye shouldn't be able to have fun with John. He was a good person and definitely knew how to have fun. He wasn't stuck up and rigid like many noble men. It was one of the many things she loved about him. But she knew that things took time to develop. She at least hoped they were able to have a good talk. So when she finally turned a corner and found the bar, she peered in curiously as she walked over. Only to see John laughing his ass off and her sister pulling on him with a loopy expression. The hell? She tilted her head, and sure enough, John quickly noticed her. His expression made him look like a criminal getting caught in the act. And as soon as he spoke something to her sister, she jumped as well, looking over at her with a red face. And then, out of the blue, they started running. Go. Go. Shit. Hey. Watch your mouth, you delinquent. He reprimanded her even as they ran away, pushing through the crowds of people. Amara stood there completely baffled. She couldn't possibly imagine why they were acting like this. Unless they did something bad. She had a faint suspicion, but she needed to actually talk to them first. So she gave chase. Ah. She's coming. Get on my back. Hurry. Okay. Okay. John suddenly kneeled, letting Faye jump on his back. That allowed Amara to catch up quite a bit. But then, John took off in a sprint. Amara's eyes widened. She didn't know if he had ever taken off so fast, not even during battles. He usually wasn't in the position to run so she didn't see his speed very often. So she was shocked when she actually had to run as fast as she possibly could just to keep them in her sight. Damn it, John. Get back here. Don't stop. Go, my glider. I'm going. Ha ha. Fee laughed as John got a second wind, leaving Amara in the dust. And since he still had his cigar in his mouth, steam puffed over his head with every rapid breath he took. Feeling her eye twitch, Amara suddenly took a deep breath the air element swirling around her body with a gust of wind. The atmosphere bent with her command, and with a step, she soared several yards. John couldn't run forever, and she had magic to carry her forward. Who said she had to break a sweat to catch them? Sure enough, it didn't even take a minute for John to start petering out. Amara had to use magic to even keep up with him during that minute, but after he started slowing down, she caught up. Faye squirmed around on his back. Keep going. She's coming. Ugh. If I take another step, I'm gonna barf. What are you two doing? Amara caught up as John heaved for breath. He didn't look incredibly tired, but since he had been drinking, his stomach caught up to him before his stamina did. Without acknowledging her, he took a seat on a nearby staircase. Faye stayed on his back, simply sitting behind him and using him to prop herself up. Well, at least they seemed to be getting along. Amara smiled a bit before John gathered himself and spoke. I have no idea what you're talking about. Why did you run like that? Why is she all red? No reason. He turned his head away. He was still clearly a bit drunk, and Fia E seemed woozy. She narrowed her eyes, walking over to her sister and putting her face really close. Fia e twisted away, but the rank cloud from her mouth made it plenty obvious. You let her drink? She took mine when I was distracted. Fia e, I didn't mean to. Yeah, right. You listen here. Amara scolded her sister telling her all about how she shouldn't be drinking at her age and how much trouble she would be in if their parents found out. At some point though as Fia started getting down, John stood and waved. All right, all right. She gets it. Don't make a big deal out of it. But it is a big deal. No, it's not. Your sister is responsible enough to know what she should and shouldn't do. No need to badger her for being a little cheeky. So long as she doesn't do it again, right? He tilted his head back at Fia, getting a hasty nod from her. He then smiled and ruffled her hair, messing it up and earning a few swipes. See? Just let it be, and don't tell mom. We can head back after sobering her up a bit more. Ugh, fine. Amara, exasperated, relented with a long breath. Afterward, the three decided to buy some candy and head back up to the stands, taking a random open spot among the crowds of people. There, 
They watched the rest of the races. As the last few races came about, though, Fee suddenly asked, Hey, John, can we play some bets? You let her gamble, too? Ah, uh, that was gonna be a secret. I am sorry. He fumbled around as Amara pounced on him, Fee apologetically panicking to the side. After the last race, Amara, her sister, and I went back to the suite. Fee was quick to sober up, so she drew no suspicions. The only tell was her otherwise unexplained closeness with me. The three of us kept recent events a secret between us. Like that, we grouped back up with the parents and moved to our next destination. It was a theater not far from the stadium. There, we were led into an elevated suite with the Raven Chief. Down below us was a huge stage, meant for musical and theatrical performances. I sighed a bit. I wasn't particularly interested in their theater. On Earth we had movies that could depict battles between stars and demigods. Here, they had jesters and actors with painted stage props. It wasn't that I couldn't respect the art of the play, just that I didn't find it very entertaining. But who knew? Maybe they would surprise me. It was just unfortunate that my standards were so inflated. And unlike at the stadium, there wasn't anywhere else to go. So I was stuck sitting in a chair for the couple hours we would be here. Soon enough, the play started. It turned out to be something close to a musical, with musical pieces being mixed into the play. The tale was a classic hero story, but there was still value in cliches. It told the tale of a man fighting battles against beasts, acquiring allies as he grew strong, and all of them conquering the desolate lands of their enemy before beheading the beastly king. Contrary to my expectations, the props used by the actors were incredibly realistic, backed by enough magic to make the stage look like a door to another world. However, it was the musical pieces that caught my eye. Specifically, one of the ending pieces carried out by three of the heroes as they were approaching the final legs of their journey. During a scene around a campfire, they pulled out instruments and played some songs from their hometowns, a way to bridge the gap in their relationships and grow closer. But I didn't care about any of that. What I cared about was the instrument one of them used. A guitar. Well, it was similar enough. Six strings of varying thickness and a wide wooden body with a sound hole in the middle. It sounded similar too. It wouldn't take more than a tune-up, and I could have it sounding like an acoustic guitar. I got excited, patting Amara. What? What is it? That instrument. The one the second man is holding. A lute. Yes. I need one of those. Why? Do you know how to play one? I do, in fact. I smiled at her, earning a bit of surprise. Well, can you sing? I don't know about that. But I can at least play well. Well, maybe we can get you one. Is there a shop? I don't know about here, but there's definitely one at Joffrin. I'll ask my mother on the way back. Groovy. I responded with a wide grin, making Amara chuckle. Welcome to our humble abode. Humble my ass. I mumbled from behind the group as we walked the path to the Raven Estate. It was a castle. Not a mansion, but a castle. And unlike many of the other constructions through the city made of white marble, this castle was constructed of black crystal bricks. It looked like liquid gold was used as the mortar between each brick as well. Regardless of the materials used, it had to be worth an astronomical amount of coin. As impregnable as a fortress and as lavish as the royal palace, this castle covered such a large plot of land that there was actually a field within it. I ended up comparing it to the golden bowl in size. I let out a long plume of smoke from my mouth as we entered. Outside the castle were several carriages carrying students of the Martial League as well as noble friends of the Ravens. We were just one of many attending this party. Well, I at least wouldn't have to worry about dealing with conventional nobles. I had a good impression of the ravens and knew they wouldn't stoop to making things difficult for me. John Cooper, son of a bitch. I muttered while turning, my placid gaze falling on a young man who entered the gathering hall. Everyone's attention was caught by his sudden hostility. And sure enough, I felt Amara's apologetic feelings through our telepathic connection. I am sorry. Another suitor. It's fine. I sighed inwardly. I couldn't blame her for being pretty. Tinderai, what are you doing? I hope you don't intend to disgrace our allies. The chief stepped forward, snuffing out the young man's fiery confrontation. He assumed a rigid posture, lowering his head a bit. I apologize, chief. I wish to challenge John Cooper to a duel. Why would you want to do that? The chief asked with incredulity, as if he truly couldn't fathom why the young man would want to fight. The young man, Tinderai, was a bit baffled that the chief wouldn't know. Thankfully for him, the chief's wife pulled her husband's arm and whispered into his ear. His eyes widened in understanding. I see. I understand why you want a duel, but they are guests here for our Christmas celebration. 
Mr. Cooper, a duel holds traditional value for those here at the wedded city. I'll give you the option to accept, but do not feel obligated. The chief turned to me, everyone's curious gaze waiting for my answer. I felt my face drop. Man, I'm already halfway to the moon. You're really gonna kill my buzz, huh? I fight for Lady Omara's hand. Do you dare do the same? Omara palmed her face beside me, grabbing my arm. John, you can let me take care of it. No, no. I can't let Lady Omara fight my battles. I am a man, and I fight for my woman. Please stop. She covered her face blooming with heat, pushing me to the verge of laughing my ass off. If I was gonna do this, then you bet your ass I was gonna embarrass her while doing so. I took out my golden cigar case earning a few looks of shock before snuffing my stogie and stowing it away. All right, I accept the duel. Chief, what are the rules regarding inflicting injuries? They're expected. No knight who shuns injury can truly call themselves a knight. How convenient. I smiled a bit, causing Amara to pull my sleeve. Please don't kill someone. What's his authority? Five. Oh, cutting it close. I clicked my tongue as the chief spoke. Very well. Seems like we have some more entertainment. To the arena. The duel between John Cooper and Tinderai will start in 15 minutes. Who? Several people broke out in cheering, bloodthirsty for a new fight. This family definitely had a warrior culture. Why else would duels be a tradition? Everyone streamed to the arena, scrambling to get better seats. As for me, I popped the cork on another bottle of alcohol, making my own preparations. Chapter 91. Kill him. Amara sat nervously on the stands around the arena. Her parents and sister were to her side, as well as the chief and several other high-level spectators. Hundreds had already gathered from out of nowhere. Most of them were students of the Martial League. Tinder I was once a student. She wasn't worried about the amount of attention directed at John. The magisterium and his anomalous performance had already run through the gauntlet. She was worried more about whether John could avoid killing Tinder I. She knew how his weapons worked better than anyone. It was incredibly difficult to rein in their power. All that was setting aside the fact he was drunk. She watched as he took another swig from a bottle of alcohol. She wasn't sure where he got it from. Maybe he pulled it out of his ass. A drunken man with those weapons was a recipe for disaster. She hoped Tinder I was stronger than he looked for his own sake. It would be problematic if he killed someone of the Raven family. After all, allow me to establish the stakes of this duel. Tinder I's voice echoed through the stance. If you lose, you will stop pursuing Lady Omara. Huh? Guy, I really hope you don't actually want to make those mistakes. Why? Are you afraid of your own weakness? A summoner isn't worthy of her hand, so you should face that reality now. Son, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm saying, if you make those mistakes, I'm going to have to kill you. So don't, for your own sake. Shotgun in hand, John racked the slide and flung a shell skyward, nabbing it out of the air and turning it over a few times. This is a slug, right? Hey, do you have armor on? I do not. Tinder I responded, unsure of what to make of John's antics. John looked between him and the shell a few times, making Amara's anxiety spike. She shouted, no slugs. Fine. He shrugged and tossed the shell, littering the rest over the arena floor before slotting in buckshot. She sighed in relief, sitting back and earning her mother's curiosity. What are slugs? It's a type of projectile as gun shoots. They're meant for punching through tough armor, so if he uses them while Tinderite doesn't have armor, he'll kill him. He was serious about that? Looks of surprise spread on the faces of those nearby who overheard. Amara massaged her temples. Please stop underestimating him. His summons are wholly devoted to killing, and he regularly fights above his authority. Now he's been challenged to a duel by Night while half drunk. If Tinderite really threatens his life, then John will kill him. Hmm. Well, at least you know he'll kill for you. How romantic. Fee nudged Amara with a teasing face, causing her to blush a bit while pushing back. Amara. A voice interrupted their play fight. Amara turned and found Shadowbane walking over. She waved. Hi, Shadow. So someone is trying to unseat your man, HM? What happens if he loses? He won't. If he does, it would be on purpose. That seems like a convenient excuse. It's a good thing I trust you. Shadowbane sat down in front of Amara, resting her back on Amara's legs. Let's just watch. I'll step in if you want me to. Thank you. Amara smiled at her friend's courtesy. By now, John and Tinderai finished their preparations. Almost 300 people had gathered in the stands, and more were still streaming in. Amara looked around and suddenly understood why this was getting so popular. It wasn't every day that a summoner appeared in their city, let alone one that could fight. They were all curious. Not only that, but Tinderai was somewhat famous himself. There were rankings for each of the years at the Martial League, much like in the Magisterium elites, and Tinderai was regularly on top. He was also a direct descendant of the chief, giving him the same familial status as Shadowbane. He had both a name and the power to back it up. It was the reason he was one of Amara's suitors. If he married her, it would strengthen the alliance between the families. And Amara wasn't particularly opposed to his character by principle. It was precisely because of the alliance between their families that he actually treated her very well. While he may be a bit impassioned as evidenced by his eagerness to duel John, he was still a good person. It was just unfortunate for him that the two never saw much of each other given their geographical separation. Regardless, there were several good reasons to watch this fight, and people didn't want to miss it. Amara watched as John pulled out a pistol, holding the trench gun in his spare hand. All right, I'm ready. As am I. The two finished their preparations, and the chief raised his arm. Fighters ready. Fight. John had taken a rather strange stance just before the match started. He wielded a pair of rather strange rods, one short, one long, that looked much like batons. Tinder I was sure this would be a rather easy victory, despite all the grandstanding John had done before. His stance was so utterly unconventional it couldn't even be called amateurish in the realm of baton fighting. One small thing worried him though. John looked a lot more resolute and self-assured in a strange stance than a rank amateur would. However, he cast those worries aside, focusing on the upcoming fight and preparing to end it in a single slash. But he was very soon dissuaded from the idea this would be a quick and easy battle. A loud noise rang out the moment the chief dropped his arm, startling both the audience and Tinder I. He didn't allow himself to be distracted by such a trick, however, and remained observant of John's approach until a burning heat crawled up his gut. Tinder I glanced down. His shirt was speckled with blood, a hole about the size of his finger staring back at him. Back. That hurt. He grunted right as the shock dissipated, pink shooting across his tough skin. He lifted his shirt, seeing as John only fired once. And he saw a huge welt on his abs, more specks of blood coming out as the flattened bullet fell off. It was not more than a flesh wound, but it took nearly an instant. Not only that, the weapon it came from was much smaller than the other one in John's hand. Come on, bub. Let's see how far you can get. Tinder I leapt out of the way just as he heard the voice, throwing off the first of John's loud bangs. Two more landed before he had a chance to shift his momentum, but once he did, it threw off a few of the following shots. A momentary pause rang out and Tinder I thought John had run out of charges for whatever it was, but another bullet planted itself solidly in his gut again. The bullets had been filled with just a little psychic. Tinder I could feel remnants where the projectiles had hit him. He could, similarly, feel they weren't imbued with the most they could take. 
John was testing him. While he was processing this and preparing for a counterattack, a silence reigned across the arena. The audience was completely stupefied. The contrast between Tinderized battered body and John's confident stance contrary to all expectations. John looked at his pistol for a second before tossing it aside, letting it vanish and raising his shotgun. And then, to the shock of all the spectators, he walked toward the knight, longer two pointed straight at the smoldering Tinderai. Gritting his teeth, Tinderai considered his options. John was not only testing him, but so utterly confident in his abilities that he, a frail summoner, would approach someone perfectly capable of ending his miserable existence in a second. He lunged. Ack. Bang. An even louder explosion rang out. Tinderai staggered, nearly blown backward, even with all his compressed momentum flinging him forward. Everyone watched with morbid shock as blood poured from the right side of his chest, shirt torn to tatters, holes dotting his skin. There wasn't much penetration, but it carried shocking pain. And John didn't stop. More explosions, accompanied by piercing pain, littered Tinderai's body. By the time the resounding noise subsided, his limbs and chest were covered in blood. But a knight was nothing if not resilient. Realizing that John's attacks were no more than superficial, he gnashed his teeth and charged through it. John had made one critical mistake. He let himself into a knight's range. With a burst in strength, Tinderai bound across the gap separating them, emerging from the grayish haze with sword in hand. John snapped to attention, his woozy demeanor gone. As soon as Tinderai landed, John let off his last shell, aiming right for his leg. Ah. Tinderai let out a scream, his shin blooming with blood and bits of flesh. He bubbled for a moment but swiftly caught himself, using his other leg as a springboard to finish his attack. The last uncontrolled lunge from Tinderai sealed his fate. Too late to change direction midair, he flew past John's dodge to the side. A thinner tube replaced the one in John's hand, a finger-sized hole blossoming through Tinderai's arm. Once he finished his roll and popped back up to his feet, John chambered another round and shot again, putting a hole in Tinderai's thigh. Ah! Tinderai yelled in indignation, continuing to try and charge John. He was faster, stronger, and more durable. But John was able to consistently put distance between them, finally taking advantage of his superior range, shooting while dodging and running. Tinderai couldn't get close without a new hole appearing on his body. And once he ran out of ammo for his Springfield, he switched to the pistol and loaded a fresh magazine, the fresh mag dump of empowered rounds more accurate and effective than his first probing attack. Tinderai felt his consciousness fade. Who? He let out a long breath when Tinderai finally collapsed, heaving for breath while blood drenched his clothes and pooled on the floor underneath him. His eyes were sharp. Amara knew he had flipped the switch as soon as Tinderai had actually challenged him. Despite Tinderai being on the floor though, John brought out the shotgun again and loaded it with shells, keeping a close eye on him. Stay down. I wouldn't want to blow off your leg. His voice was quite clear, no doubt aura enhanced, piercing through the low murmur from the stance. Amara, biting her thumb, suddenly heard her mother from the side. Well, I guess it makes sense. HM, what does? Well, he has more experience fighting people than scourge beasts. It's no wonder he handled that fight so well. I suppose. But all the knights here regularly fight each other too. That's true. It's also more than possible that nobody has any idea how to fight him. If you keep your distance, he'll shoot you. If you get close, he'll shoot you with another weapon. The only way to win is to catch him by surprise or survive long enough to kill him up close. Tinderai was incapable of either. Telexia had gotten a relatively good grasp on how John's fighting style worked. That's when Shadowbane stood and stepped down the stands, confusing Amara. All right, fight's over. John's the winner. She announced that she jumped and landed in the arena, walking over to John. However, when her voice reverberated in the ears of the fallen, it caused bubbling rage. Let alone when he heard all the murmurs of surprise from the stands. A knight losing to a summoner? It was incomprehensible. What knight could be so weak as to fall before the most useless magus in the world? The pain he felt told him that his loss wasn't unjustified. He couldn't so much as flex his thigh, let alone walk properly. The bits of metal still sitting inside his flesh reminded him, with a constant searing pain, that his life was no longer in his hands. But Tinderai's indignation wouldn't allow him to stop. He raised his head, eyes full of spirit, and reached out with his hand. How could a summoner resist his grasp? He would fall with a mere flex of the fingers. His hand brushed by John's leg, intending to grab it, though hardly having the time to. Complex purple lines on John's coat flared to life, his aura surging out with panic and unbridled killing intent. His head and shotgun snapped downward in unison, finger on the trigger and already squeezing. He was going to end Tinderai's life. He was practically screaming it to the world. Don't do it. The chief yelled, realizing what was happening, his body flickering faster than anyone could follow. Shadowbane was only slightly slower, her body flying so fast across the ground that dust kicked up in a thin line behind her. Boom. Everything happened all at once, everyone holding their breaths as the shot was fired directly at Tinderai's face. But luckily for him, John's body was ordinary. Even with the powers of his coat and mind, his body couldn't completely keep up with his thoughts, much less the chief's invigorated body. The chief's hand rested in front of Tinderai's face, buckshot pellets flattened across his palm, and Shadowbane's sword was skewered through Tinderai's wrist, pushing it away from John's leg. The four were interlocked for a moment before John caught himself, muttering with a scoff. Fuck. Way to kill my bus. Sorry for making you move, chief. No need to apologize. One of our students didn't know when he was in over his head. I don't blame you for reacting the way you did. Even half drunk, you've got better instincts than most. Thank you, chief. His face was filled with a goofy grin, conveniently explained away by the remnants of alcohol in his bloodstream. However, Amara sensed there was something more behind it than just an inebriation. Shadowbane turned to address John. My turn now. Let's do it later, though. I'm down. Just let me know when. Mm. She nodded, pulling her sword out of Tinderai's arm and causing him to yelp. After that, some healers came and took him away. The chief looked around as chatter rose in the stands again. I announced the result of this duel as John Cooper's complete victory. A talented cold summoner has appeared within the magisterium. May his future be prosperous, and may the scourge quake at the sound of his weapon. Invictus! Invictus! Everyone cheered with the chief, John looking around in confusion. After that, everyone cleared the arena, retreating to the dining hall for the initial celebration. After the fight, Amara took away my bottle of alcohol and stuffed a cigar in my mouth. I was being forced to sober up. Thankfully, there was nobody else who wanted to duel me. If anything, I became a bit respected. There were many students from the Martial League who came to converse with me, wondering how a cold summoner, the weakest type of Magus, was able to defeat a knight like Tinderai. With some explanations about my weapons, they were able to understand a bit more. Besides, they had all seen it in action. Some had even retrieved some of the pellets and bullets as souvenirs, passing them around. However, shock was further amplified when they learned I was still in authority for an entire level below Tinderai. Most weren't sure what to say, while many doubted my words. I didn't bother trying to convince them, though. I could only shrug and let them believe whatever they wanted to. After an hour or so, the time for conversation passed, and I was allowed some reprieve. A big feast was also prepared during that time, so everyone took their place at a grand table seating over 100. That wasn't to mention the side tables holding everyone else surrounding it. Just the waiters numbered five dozen, all of them rushing around to cater to their guests. Platters of meat slabs were constantly replaced as they were devoured. Wine flowed like a river, the volume consumed placing everyone solidly into alcoholic territory. I didn't partake, but it was still fun to watch. A large chunk of the night was spent eating and drinking. It was toward the end when the chief suddenly spoke up with a small announcement. Duchess and Duke Teleria, I have some gifts I'd like you to accept. But first, I can't help but mention something I overheard. Mr. Cooper, I heard that you wanted a loot. Hmm. I looked up, caught off guard by the mention of my name. Looking around, I just nodded, making the chief smile. The six-string loot you had been eyeing during the theater performance was a bassin, and while we
It was very similar to a guitar, with six strings in a body that could be comfortably held within one's arms. So while the shape wasn't the same, a bit slimmer than a normal acoustic, it still looked to have the same function with the sound hole and frets. However, it was incredibly nice. The wood was an odd deep blue bordering on black, and the strings were made of slightly golden metal. There were also some enchantments across its back. The craftsmanship was extraordinary. I couldn't help but reach out, too excited to use it. I grabbed it out of the hellcase, taking it in my arms and plucking a few strings, letting their somewhat unfamiliar notes play across my ears. Thrum. After a bit of tuning, I ran my thumb across all six, hearing the familiar blissful sound, smiling contentedly. It's amazing. Thank you, Chief. I'm glad it meets your standard. Now, allow me to present the Talaria family with their gifts. With his word, more butlers appeared with items in hand. I looked up, interested to see what they would get. Chapter 92, Revelation. The first to receive a gift was Amara. A butler came up and presented a small box, a ring sitting inside. It was a plain silver band with a stripe of white crystal going around its center. That ring stores charges of the blink spell, capable of instantly transporting you 20 feet in any direction at will. There are three charges and one charge is naturally accumulated every 12 hours. Use it wisely and it'll save your life in disadvantageous situations. Thank you very much, Chief. I will use it so. She smiled and slipped the ring on, prompting the next gift. This time, one long box was presented to Faye. She opened it with barely restrained excitement and found a sword inside. A long sword crafted by our family's best whitesmith with a concealed 49 crystal in the base of the blade. Your father wanted us to make you a sword that would last you through your years as a knight. For potentially the rest of your life, this may be your personal weapon. As you grow, it will as well. It stows into a ring. Use it well. Ooh. Faye's eyes sparkled as she stroked the longsword. It was a mastercraft with a long silver blade and a black and gold hilt. The several enchantment rooms along the flat of the blade were the only implication of the embedded white crystal. This was a massive gift for a future knight like Faye. She was so enamored with it, running her hands repeatedly along the flat and hilt of the blade, that Duchess Telexia had to remind her to give thanks. Thank you, Chief. Haha, of course. Now, I open the floor to all those who wish to make their exchanges. Please, take the rest of this evening to enjoy yourselves and your gifts. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Everyone cheered before moving to socialize. Hundreds of gifts were exchanged between friends and family all around us. Amara. At that time, Amara and I turned to find Shadowbane approaching us. In her hands was a medium length wooden box. Here, she held it out, letting Amara take it and open the lid. Sitting on the fine felt was a subtle dagger, its surface covered in so many rooms, very little of the original sheen remained. An undeniably deadly weapon. You'll be facing some dangerous enemies through the rest of your year, and especially when you enter the military. I won't be able to see you, so I want you to have this now. It was just recently finished. Oh my, thank you. Amara held up the dagger, the intricately crafted hilt and dangerously sharp blade catching flashes of light. It's not meant to be used for anything except for a last resort defensive measure. It's a bonding weapon, and it has various magical functions capable of killing up to an 49 beast, but only once. If its power is used, it needs to be replenished by someone like your mother. Its crystal can only sustain the more basic functions, not the high end killing power. So like the ring, use it wisely. Well, my eyes widened along with Mars. Being able to kill an 49 beast was no small matter. For someone like us, that was some serious firepower to be wielding, even if only once. Not to mention how the killing charge could be replenished. That alone made it several times more valuable than if it were only consumable. Amara looked up at her friend with a gentle smile. Thank you again, Shadowbane. Unfortunately, my gift to you is still being made. I'll be able to deliver it to you not long after Christmas. Sorry, don't worry about it. You know, I don't expect gifts from you. Sometimes I'm not sure if you're complimenting me or insulting me. Amara muttered, thinking, you can learn how to reward things, no? With a smirk, Shadowbane turned to me and nodded. Shall we go? Oh, right, sure. Wait, what's going on? Amara asked, confused as to how we were talking as if we already knew each other. I shrugged. Shadowbane wants me to spar with her. I told her I'd help her out. Oh, can I watch? Fine with me. Sure. Both of us nodded, prompting Amara to follow as we left the dining room. From there we entered the empty arena, disregarding the blood splattered across the floor. You saw my duel with Tinderai, so you should have an idea as to how fast my bullets are. Those projectiles? Yes, I do. Though they weren't as fast as I expected. I've seen bows that can shoot arrows not much slower. Well, I've never seen a bow like that. It's no matter. It's still faster than anything I've ever gone up against. This will be a valuable experience. She walked until she stood 20 yards away, swearing off with me. I let out a breath of smoke, adjusting the cigar in my mouth before pulling out a loaded Springfield. I casually pointed my barrel at her, throwing out some preemptive advice. These things only shoot straight. No twists or turns. So try to predict the path of the shot based on my aim. All right. She nodded and drew her sword. It was slightly curved, a bit over two feet long, and probably meant to complement her high-speed fighting style. She took her stance, her eyes sharpening. It wasn't like I was trying to hurt her, so I steadied my gun and aimed at her leg, firing only after I knew she understood where I was shooting. I saw the bullet kick up a plume of dust behind her. It had sailed right past her thigh, attesting to her incredible agility. Her movement, despite having anticipated the shot, was still unbelievably fast. It was uncanny seeing a human moving with such speed. She kicked off, approaching me from an oblique angle. I shifted my aim to compensate, adjusting for a few seconds so my bullet would hit her abdomen and pulled the trigger. This time, she was unable to dodge, the bullet hitting just off center. She was barely able to move in time, let alone dodge it completely. She clicked her tongue, pulling the flattened bullet off her steel abs. Since it wasn't empowered, it didn't deal any damage to her. TSK. That's difficult. Fast and small. I can barely catch a glimpse with my eye. The fact that even at this range says enough about your speed. It's insane. There's something I want you to keep in mind though. Just on the off chance you have to dodge something as fast or even faster than these bullets. I explained while stowing the Springfield, bringing out two 1911s. Don't react to the sound. Sound travels at a certain speed. That speed is surpassed by my bullets. That means the bullets will hit you before you even hear the sound. Is that so? Yes. Keep that in mind for the future. Also, you have to take into account your own body and how fast it processes things like your sight and hearing. You're talking about reaction speed? Something like that. When sound hits your ear, your ear sends the sound to the brain, and your brain has to make sense of the sound. That all takes time. It's only mere fractions of a second, but with speeds like this, that amount of time is crucial. This bullet will hit you not only before the sound reaches you, but before your brain could even process the sound itself once it hits your ears. You're saying that senses can be a weakness, and the best way to surpass that weakness would be to use something like Aura, which has none of those weaknesses. She looked at me with a glint in her eye, making me smile a bit. You catch on quick. Yes, Aura will tell you far more about the world around you, about the people around you, and at far faster speeds than your body. It's an amazing thing every time I think about it. It's also the only reason I'm alive today. It was able to give me life-saving information when I needed it most. I can sense most threats before I see them, and react to attacks before they're even let off. I've gotten a glimpse of such things as well. But the complexities of Aura continue to confound me. It doesn't make sense when all the instructors and the Marshall League explain it to me. All the techniques they teach to wield Aura feel worthless. Well, it's a good thing I don't have any techniques to teach you. All I have are my most important impressions about what Aura is. Take Amara, for example. Hmm. Amara perked up when I pointed at her. Her magic. She can cast spells in the air. How is that made possible? Her aura. She casts spells with her aura instead of her body. Exactly. Now knights. They can launch attacks with vigor beyond their body. That takes aura as well. They are basically doing the same thing
You can use that magic beyond yourself. Shadowbane shivered in revelation, suddenly looking to her side and swinging her sword with all her might. Light bloomed across the entire length of the blade, a massive razor of light erupting along its path. It tore a trench into the ground before impacting the wall of the arena, shattering the surface, leaving cracks and one huge slash mark about 12 feet long. Haha. Uh -huh. Amazing. She looked down at her blade, laughing in disbelief. It's so simple that I don't know how I was ever so stupid to not realize it. It's not about coating my blade with it. It's not even about those stupid techniques. Why don't they teach this? Why don't they tell us something so basic? Hell if I know. This is just what I've learned on my own. I've never actually been taught anything. That only makes you greater. Your talent is unlike anything I've ever seen. And although you've already done so much for me, I still have a question. Go for it. I tapped my cigar before putting it back in my mouth. You sense the chief's aura. How did you do that? Well, it's no different from how you launched that blade just now. Just instead of using your vigor, use your mind. It's easy to use my aura as an extension of my mind since I'm a summoner. But you should be able to do it all the same. Think of aura how you your eyes or ears. Open its senses to the aura of others and take what you find into your mind. Others who don't actively control their aura will emanate their thoughts and feelings, or perhaps the power of their own aura if they have developed it. I see. Her eyes sparkled as she focused. I could feel her aura bloom, all that focused on me. And it felt similar to what Amara would do when she reached out to me desiring a telepathic connection. I could sense her, her curiosity and excitement. I didn't reach out to her. I simply let her feel around. It would take more time for her to tune into her surroundings and the psyche of others like I had, but now she had at least opened the door. However, I did provide some stimulation. I suddenly raised my gun and fired straight at her chest. And without so much as a thought, her body twisted, the bullet soaring past fractions of an inch away from skin. Well, even she was shocked by her maneuver. Her head snapped back toward me, a smile plastered across her face. I could sense it. I knew exactly when you were going to shoot. Bring your aura to a high enough level and it'll feel like precognition. I can predict the movements of knights and read their intentions to some extent. It helps a lot when fighting them. Not only that, but I can sense danger before it even comes. I don't have to see or hear an enemy. I can just use my aura. I can see that. It's a whole other world. I was blind compared to back then. You've opened up my eyes. Well, I'm glad I was able to help. Shadowbane stared at me intently for a short while before turning to Amara. Amara tilted her head at her friend. What? You lucked out with this one, sister. W, what do you mean? Amara turned flustered as I laughed. Uh huh. Yes, she did. Come here, darling. I ran over, bounding to her side and scooping her up before planting a juicy kiss on her mouth. She was too shocked to resist. After a moment of surprise, Shadowbane shook her head to the side. I didn't need to see that. Anyway, I'd like to prepare a gift for you, John. As thanks for helping me so much. I appreciate it, but I don't need a gift. I'm just glad I could help. You can't possibly not understand how valuable what you've done for me is. I have a feeling you do this often. He does. Amara shouted in agreement. He's got too much pride and can't accept help or generosity unless it's shoved down his throat. I had to force him to accept the guitar from the chief. You were going to reject that? He was. See, John, you're the stubborn punk here. Omar stabbed my chest with her finger in accusation, causing me to shoot her a look with a raised brow. Keep talking like that, and I'll shove my tongue down your throat. Why, why, you bad guy? Shadow, help me. Do not bring me into this. Shadow Bane dodged Amara's beat red, pleading face, quickly making her way out. And I gave chase just as the silly girl tried to fly away, barely managing to snatch her and pull her in for a loving embrace. Chapter 93, New Year. Graceful strums of acoustic strings came together in a nostalgic memory, John humming an accompanying tune. Omar sat beside him on a love seat, leaning against him with her head on his shoulder, eyes closed as she let herself drift with the music. But she wasn't the only audience member. Beside the doorway, the Duchess stood silently, unknown to the two occupants. One was too focused on playing while the other was too enraptured by the music to pull herself out of her own little world. The Duchess couldn't blame her. At first, she had intended to enter and disturb them with some small business, but after hearing a few notes, she stood by and took in the music. It was calming, slightly somber, and well crafted. Either John was a talented musician or he knew some songs and how to play them perfectly. She was inclined to believe the latter. It didn't detract an ounce from his talent. Not everyone could play an instrument at all, let alone that well. If you got the chance at all. Instruments were expensive, to say nothing of custom or high quality ones. The one John received was especially so. The wedded city was known for both its martial arts as well as the creative arts, be they music, painting, sculpting, smithing, or theater. There was no better place to acquire an instrument, and that dark blue loot was from the Raven family stash. The number of instruments on that level could be counted on two hands. It was assuredly very expensive. It had been given away since John had bested Tinder Eye in a fair duel, while half drunk. That was the official reason, anyway. Far more likely were the prohibitively exorbitant maintenance costs burning the guitar sized hole in the treasury. Since the chief was going to give gifts to the Delaria daughters, why not also give one to John to both reward him for the duel and apologize for the disturbance? Well, that and the golden cigar case. The Duchess had seen it before and back then it had given her a shock, as it had the chief. Every noble worth their salt knew about those things, and they weren't given to just anyone. The chief was probably trying to make an impression on John since he was also Amara's boyfriend. Regardless, he killed several birds with one stone, getting rid of an expensive paperweight in the process. And now, John had a loot. The Duchess was already enjoying his music, so she didn't feel like it was a bad gift. I was wondering where that sound was coming from. Ikor appeared in the hallway, walking over curiously. The music continued as he peeked in, seeing John and his daughter together as he played. The Duchess had already cast a mute spell, so the clicking of his tongue couldn't be heard by anyone but them. Tisk, look at those two. Our little girl is growing up. Eh? You seem to approve of him. And you don't? Look beyond the status and tell me exactly what's wrong with him. Well, she peeked through the cracked door, seeing him playing like there was nothing else in the world except for him and his girlfriend. Her eyes narrowed a bit. There isn't much, he's almost perfect. But like you had been concerned about before, I find his exceedingly high kill count concerning. And back then you had been the one to tell me that it wasn't anything to worry about. That it was all self-defense. Yes, but that doesn't mean such a thing is normal. You don't kill so many people and come out of it so innocent. Maybe I'm wrong, but I can't deny the possibility that he may have some psychopathic tendencies. So what would that mean for their relationship? Ikor asked, his curiosity peaked. The Duchess only shrugged. I'm not sure. I'm at least not worried about him. I'm worried about Amara. Yet another reason I wanted her to stay away from his business. She's barely been exposed to the harsh realities of war against the Scourge. She's only seen a few people die to those monsters, a far easier reality to bear than seeing one man die at the hands of another. Or a hundred men dying at the hands of one. And then knowing that one is supposed to be your boyfriend. Yes. The kingdom has been without internal conflict for centuries. Most people believe that humans can only die at the hands of the Scourge because they are a sole visible enemy. Only within the dark sectors of the kingdom can one find the unseen realities. And John is deep within the darkness. The only question is, how difficult would it be to pull him out? That depends on him. For now he has the magisterium to distract him. And he seems to be intent on joining the military. Where he goes from there, well, it's difficult to say. For now, we should focus on making sure nothing irreversible happens. The Duchess glanced back at John, staring at him for a few seconds before a pair of eyes suddenly flicked up the gaze into her own. He gave her a quick smile before going back to playing, causing her to sigh. Well, at least he's not untalented. How unfortunate that he couldn't simply be a noble, or even a knight. Such amazing potential squandered on a common summoner. You say that, and yet he's proven that he's above average even among warlocks and knights. Summoners have a limit below warlocks and knights.
Their power was the only reason she had a list of suitors at all, and was the only reason her marriage was concerned. Someone like Shadowbane had none of those issues despite being in an almost identical situation. The Raven family had enough independence to completely disregard the opinions of all the other nobles, even the Grand Duchies. The Talarias were more independent than most, but not to nearly the same degree. Ikor hated that, and he knew his wife did too, but they couldn't do anything about it. Not yet, anyway. Rash decisions couldn't be made right now, and certainly not for the uncertain variable named John. But the glimpse of freedom it gave them was one of the reasons he was taking a liking to John. Disregarding everything else about him, it was the slap in the face his mere presence gave the other nobles that he adored. At the very least, he didn't feel so bad about prolonging the time he was able to do so. Especially if it made his daughter happy. All right, let's let them have their time. I feel weird watching when he already knows we're here. Amara needs to prepare for the party tonight. She can do that later. In fact, you should be following her example and giving your big hubby some love. I'm feeling a bit romantic. Ikor moved in and wrapped his arm around his wife's waist, giving her tempting looks like an alcoholic and a bottle of fine wine. Talexia glanced at her husband with a concealed grin, moving her mouth and whispering softly into his ear. Then, you should confide me in an hour. Once I'm done arranging the servants, I'll have a little time. But only if you're done with correspondence. Ho ho ho. You drive a hard bargain, my dear. But I'm nothing if not generous. Consider it a deal. He gave her a wide grin before planting a hand on her, but with a loud smack. The corner of her lips lifted a bit as they parted. It was Christmas Eve, and the entire Talaria family arrived in the main estate for a grand celebration. On Earth, I had thought my family was pretty large. Several aunts and uncles, many more cousins, and some grand relatives. A few dozen was a good estimate. At the very least, houses were packed for holidays. But not like this. I looked around, seeing dozens walking every direction around the mansion and hearing even more entering through the front doors. It was already hectic, and the first guest had only arrived around an hour ago. Amara wasn't even with me. She was taking care of some last minute shopping, and it wasn't like I had nothing to do, being an outsider. I could only grab a drink and observe from the side, trying my best to blend in with the sparse walls. I was adorned in my second best suit, themed red for the Christmas occasion. This was actually something I had also convinced Amara to do. They didn't have the classic Christmas colors like on Earth, so I decided to bring them here and have her join me. Wherever she was, she'd also be in red. Everyone else was wearing normal suits. The Delaria family was composed of several branch families tied to the main one. This included the Duchess' two sisters and brother, along with their families, and some other detached cousins descended from previous family heads and their siblings. Regardless, there were a lot of people. Not too many children were around, mostly adults, including some young adults around my age, roamed the entrance hall. Because the family head, aka the Duchess, had inherited the great power of her parents, her siblings weren't as talented and thus didn't have as hard of a time having more children. But that didn't mean they were having five or six. It simply meant they were more successful earlier, not many would be Amara's age, having breached 25 or even 30 years. This also meant the main line almost always aged slower, subsequent generations appearing at far greater intervals than their cousins. It was also why there were rules imposed upon the branches to effectively disown the ones that were too detached from the main line. Otherwise, there would be hundreds of branches by the time only a few heads had cycled through. That was another thing I noticed. There were two old people I sensed with some extreme power. They were subtle about their entrance, but I could guess who they were. Prior heads of the family. The ancestors. The position of family head wasn't passed down by generation. Those who reached that level of power were able to live for significantly longer and didn't need to be replaced so often. That wasn't to mention how it wasn't always guaranteed to find a suitable heir each generation. Quite often, a few generations passed before someone inherited the title. This also meant Amara wouldn't be the next head unless she showed power and talent just as great as her mother, and was yet another reason why her marriage was a big deal. She was quite literally the perfect candidate as the daughter of the current head. Her fate had basically been sealed the moment Alexia rose to her position. Or, would have been, if not for me. Which was why other nobles were so pissed. I was screwing them out of far more benefits than I realized. Ah. Little poor me. I let out a hefty sigh, prying myself off the wall I was leaning against and heading upstairs. After a doorway or two, I found myself on a balcony overlooking the city. Christmas Eve was the most festive time of the year and every hour. People were counting down to midnight when the new year would start. It was already dark out, so I could see all the bright lights illuminating the streets between the city's buildings. The central palace in the city center was a mile or so away from the Teleria mansion, but because one of the central streets led from the front of the mansion directly to the palace, I could see the entirety of it with an unobstructed view. There were so many decorations hung over the street that it was a bit blinding. It certainly painted a spectacular picture, showing off the city's prosperity and joyous atmosphere. For a moment though, I suddenly thought of the Tavares and how they must be doing. They had gone to war as soon as that auction was over, and I had no doubt that it continued on even into Christmas. It would only end when Patriarch Tavera completed a crown with the authority of Heart. Whoever used it would receive a massive boost in power and cement their position for decades, if not a century, to come. Back then, I had the fleeting thought that perhaps the patriarch wasn't only a 49 as his bounty had claimed. After all, you couldn't use a crown that was too potent for you. If you were merely a 49 and tried to use a crown made from that authority 11 heart, you might explode. So either he was far stronger than the public knew, or there was someone within the mafia who the patriarch was placing his hopes in. The patriarch was getting old, so he wouldn't necessarily be the one to use the crown. Someone who would live for far longer would be the most optimal choice. Despite being relatively close to the man, I still knew next to nothing about their internal operations. They kept their cards close, so I'm sure I was in for a surprise when all of this concluded. As I thought of those things while gazing off into the distance, I suddenly sensed Amara walking back into the mansion. We immediately found each other's gazes, even through the walls, our telepathic connection never having been disrupted even while she shot and smiled. Our new range record had hit a mile. Amara had been shopping by the palace, about a mile away, and while the connection got a little foggy, we never experienced any disconnections. I imagined that a mile and a half was our furthest possible range. Quite useful in a world where radio didn't exist. Maybe I tried to explain that to Son and see if he could replicate the tech. She waved before disappearing into the house, so I turned around and started making my way over to her. When I found her, she was greeting all of the family that she knew. I let her be and watched from the side, catching the occasional thought from within her mind. It was pretty clear which of the family she liked and didn't like. It was mostly cordial, with few being close to her and others not so much. I only made note of the adults she liked. Because none of the family needed to do things together like preparing the food. Everyone was free to do whatever they wanted until the dinner or until some activities were started. Christmas in this world involved a few traditions, one of them being gift exchanges. I thought it was a bit unfortunate though. For me on earth, making dinner was one of the fun parts of Christmas. A dozen people crammed into a small kitchen, all scrambling to finish cooking in time or to keep something from lighting itself on fire, had a certain charm to it. Perhaps an argument here or there about whether it'd be better to add more milk or butter to some mashed potatoes, or how much seasoning should go on the beef. That wasn't even to mention the simultaneous management of rambunctious children, yelling at them to take their activities outside and preventing them from climbing up on the roof in the process. Here, there were neither of those things. There were few children at all, and those who were there were properly behaved under parental pressure to look better in front of the Duchess. It was boring. Perhaps it was a bit friendlier since everyone was family, maybe a bit more comfortable, but it still felt like any other noble party. Amara slipped by my side. So, what do you think? Eh, it's quite tame. Well, obviously, it's not Batsy Scala. I'm not comparing it to that. You know, I never thought I could miss screaming children and the smell of burning food. Burning food? The occasional mishap when cooking Christmas dinner. One time, my family cooked a huge
but it's those kinds of memories that stick with you. Not how perfectly everyone is conducting themselves during what's supposed to be a fun holiday. I glanced around with those words, Amara following my gaze to look with me. Bright smiles, professional handshakes, the occasional chuckle and a bunch of business talk. The adults were networking, while the young adults were hiding in corners with the few friends they had made while they were younger. As for the five or so children I had spotted, they were following their parents, neutral expressions on their faces. I'm sure this was normal for all of them, but it had yet to feel like a holiday for me. I couldn't help but feel disappointed when comparing this with my memories from Earth. Or maybe I was feeling homesick. My family back on Earth should be celebrating Christmas right now too. This was the first time I had ever missed it. It sucked. My mood rapidly fell, even though I had been telling myself to stay positive for Christmas. I guess Amara sensed it too, because she was quick to come in close, looking up at me while taking my hand. What's wrong? Nothing. Just remembering. Yeah. I'm sorry you can't be with your family. If I could give you anything, it would be that. Thanks. But hey, it could be worse. At least I got a pretty girl to keep me company. Hmm. Well, you're not so bad yourself. Omar smiled and leaned in coquettishly, wrapping an arm around my neck. Right when we were about to kiss, though, we heard a deep voice. John. Eve. Omar jumped when she recognized her father, quickly backing away from my face in embarrassment. Ikor looked at us with a neutral expression for a bit before turning to me. If you two wish, the young ones are gathering in the atrium to swim. I opened it for them since it's better than walking around bored with their parents. Otherwise, the mansion is open to you. Please enjoy yourself. Understood. Thank you, sir. Midnight will be the final countdown. Everyone will be gathering on the balcony for that. He walked off with those words, leaving us to our devices. I smiled, thinking that maybe I was on Ikor's good side. He seemed to be more lenient with us than the mother, which was the opposite of what I was used to. I could sense his goodwill when he told me to enjoy myself. And, perhaps a slight bit of pity, I turned to Amara and motioned with my head. To the pool? I suppose that would be more enjoyable. I haven't had a night swim in a while. Hand in hand, the two of us headed to our rooms to change before going to the atrium. We arrived to a slightly livelier recreation of the entrance hall. Most of the young adults and children had gathered here, split into various small groups depending on how well they knew each other. It was, however, much friendlier than the scene we just left, familiarity and youthful energy combining to break down more than a few social conduct rules. That, where the parents just ditched them here, getting their alone time with each other without having to occupy the little ones. Amara and I didn't catch too much attention when we entered. I took a seat with my guitar case while some cousins walked up to her to talk. I was naturally introduced in the process. I stood and shook some hands, meeting some guys and girls around our age. Two of them were even magisterium students, and both knew me by name from the elite leaderboard. It was hard to tell what they thought of me. Here and now, they didn't express any animosity, but it was hard to tell what they really thought behind closed doors. They seemed neutral, however, probably because of the irrelevance of Amara's marriage to them and their distance from the elites. After some cursory greetings, we went to the side of the pool. She dipped a towing. Oh, it's cold. Good. What are? Ah. She squeaked when I wrapped her in a bear hug, every gaze instantly snapping to us. Don't you to dash? Haha. Uh -huh. I let out a playful laugh as I sent both our bodies into the water, a wave surging from the point of impact. After a few seconds underneath, we both rose back up with deep gasps, brushing hair out of our faces. She splashed some water at me. That's the second time. Hey now, your hair looks just as good. Not the point. I like to acclimate to cold water. Where's the heat anyway? The butler just turned it on. Faye suddenly appeared in the water beside us, startling Amara a bit. I told them to. Oh, thank you. Hi Faye. Hi John. Faye and I smiled and waved at each other. That's when I had a spontaneous thought, grabbing Faye's arm and pulling her over to a side of the pool. Hey, you want to do something cool? Sure. All right. I'm going to sink under the water, and you're going to get behind me and put your feet on my shoulders. And then when I jump back up, you're going to jump off. Comprendo? Okay. Okay. I smiled as she went behind me, holding both her wrists as Amara watched inquisitively. Ready? Mm. All right. Taking a deep breath, I sunk down under the water, waiting there as Faye's feet found my shoulders, getting comfortable. Then, I bobbed up and down a couple times before launching her up with all my strength. She soared over the water, letting out a scream. Ah. Uh, I laughed as she went under, taking a few seconds to come back up with a bright face. She brushed her ashy gray hair back with a smile. That was cool. Well, some of the other kids nearby were mesmerized, like they had never seen anything like this before. I motioned toward one, who looked to be an eight-year-old boy. Do you want to try? Come on. Okay. He was a bit hesitant, but there was an underlying excitement as he swam over. I went under and let him get a foothold before launching him through the air. Hooya! He resurfaced, clumsily smearing a side with hair coating his face. That was far. I want to try. A few more kids came over, encouraged by the bravery of one of their friends. I smiled and threw them forward, one by one. It wasn't particularly tiring, and there weren't too many, so I spent the next few minutes letting the kids take turns getting thrown across the pool. It was only when I got tired of doing the same thing over and over again that I finally stopped, taking a rest. I swam over to the side of the pool where Amara was lounging and watching, pulling up in front of her. I only rose to her chest when I stood. After sweeping my hair back, I reached my arm around her and felt up her spine, making her smile as she spread her legs a bit, allowing me to get in closer. She softly greeted me. Hey, hey, you know, we haven't kissed today. I know. I've been busy. You have. But that actually works out, because I have an idea. Tell me, what do all the adults do at the end of the New Year's countdown? I'm not sure what you mean. There's nothing particularly special that happens, other than fireworks. Then let me tell you about one of the traditions we have where I come from. My hand moved a bit lower. There was nobody behind her to see it, so I decided it couldn't hurt to get a bit bolder. At the end of the New Year countdown, everyone who's in a relationship is supposed to kiss. One kiss, right at the start of the New Year. It's a sign of good luck. Or to some, it's a kind of promise that they make to the one they want to spend the year with. I see. Everyone does this. All the couples. Yes. Millions of people across the nation. All kissing at once right when midnight comes. Apparently nobody does it here, but I wouldn't mind taking part in this tradition with you, if you'd like. Oh, of course. Hmm. That's good. Then, we'll need to make sure we don't kiss before then. I smiled before moving in and planting a kiss on her collar. I could feel the wave of chill she got on her arms. Why you just said no kissing? Not technically a kiss. I need your lips for that. Well, stop anyway. Teeter's kids here. She whispered harshly, embarrassed by the gazes on us. I didn't even have to turn to know how many were looking, but it was fun teasing her, so I just laughed. Thankfully for her, it wasn't bright in the atrium. Only the moon, the stars, and the creepy floating plant things that cast light across the water, hiding her blush well. After that, I jumped out of the water, grabbing my lute and gliding my fingers across the strings. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Is everyone here? The Duchess asked softly while looking around. Small groups had gathered around chairs and couches set outside by the butlers, families, and close relatives grouping together to celebrate the new year together. The atmosphere was quite joyous as midnight came. The children were excited to be up so late while the parents had loosened up with alcohol. And off in one corner was their own music, played by none other than John. He sat on one of the couches, painting quite the humorous picture. Faye was in his lap. The Duchess couldn't imagine how the two had gotten so close so fast. But neither she nor the four other girls squeezed onto the same couch as John posed any obstacle to his playing. They all carried looks of contentment on their faces, gazing at the moon or relaxing with closed eyes as they let the music fill their ears. And Amara, the one person she expected to be in his embrace, was in a chair to the side. It was like he had ditched her for these other girls. It was quite perplexing to Alexia, but she couldn't possibly think of anything to do about it. John's
There was a shout, and everyone looked out toward the city. In the sky appeared a huge timer cast by a magic projection. It ticked down second by second, a dull roar from the city growing louder with it. Adults filled their drinks for the final toast of the year, while kids crowded to the front of the balcony to get a better view of the city beyond. John rose from his seat, placing aside his loot as everyone moved to the edge of the balcony for a closer look. Omar glanced over from behind everyone, seeing John arrive at her side. She muttered while learning against his chest. A new year. I can't imagine what it has in store. Neither can I. The last several months have felt like a decade to me, and a lot more is about to happen. Well, what better way to face it than together? How corny. I was trying to be romantic. She blushed a bit before glancing back at the timer. Everyone shouted as the final seconds ticked down. The entire city was chanting in unison. Amara glanced up, seeing John staring out with a neutral face, unable to guess what he could possibly be thinking about. I love you. She mumbled, causing him to look down with a small smile. I love you too. Three, two, one. Happy New Year. Fireworks were launched into the sky, filling it with color as the entire city roared at the top of its lungs. Off in a corner of the balcony, Amara lifted her head and grabbed Jin's suit, pulling him down, receiving a long, deep kiss. Her mind was filled with happiness. Her first kiss of the year with the one she wanted to spend the rest of the year. No, the rest of her life with. To her, it felt like this moment was the start of a new beginning. Up until she met John, her life had been normal. And then he came along and completely upended the place, citrine and rearranging until it was unrecognizable. It felt like she was a part of something bigger now. Her future now felt entirely uncertain, but she didn't give a damn so long as she was with him. If they had to take on the world, then so be it. No matter what, as soon as they went back to the capital, things would be different. She already felt like an entirely new person. This was just an expression of her change. And she had no regrets. She couldn't possibly imagine life anymore without him. In fact, she was almost scared of even thinking about what it would be like if he were to disappear. Just the thought made her emotional, her eyes tearing up a bit until they finally separated. They looked into each other's eyes, their ears filled with nothing but the explosions in the sky, their faces reflecting the colorful displays. John let out a long breath. How did I ever find someone as perfect as you? Amara froze speechlessly, a tear falling out of the sheer intensity of emotions filling her mind. It was such a genuine question that its corniness couldn't even register. John's head tilted a bit, likely confused as to why she was crying. But there were so many love chemicals filling her brain that she wasn't able to speak, simply pressing her forehead against his chest and hugging him. He returned it while looking up, watching the fireworks and thinking of the future. Chapter 94 Facade Christmas passed merrily. The day was spent in the company of Amara's immediate family, as tradition dictated. It was a time of ease, comfort, and appreciation, so all families throughout the city spent their time together. There was nowhere to go, no parties to put on or attend, and only a few gifts to exchange. Since I got along with the family, I didn't feel out of place and contentedly enjoyed hanging out with them. I was enjoying myself when, in the evening, I received a succinct message from the puppet master that slightly dampened my mood. The magisterium, specifically the president, has decided what to do regarding your kill. As for your request regarding the corpse, such matters are best spoken about in person. Come see me when you return. Until then, enjoy your Christmas. That was it, and the message left me with a small feeling of unease. I wasn't particularly concerned with what they did to my record or placement, but anything regarding President Carrion didn't sit well with me. Still, I had messaged the puppet master earlier when I had my thoughts about using the Cyclops as the ingredient for a crown. I didn't tell him the specifics, but let him know that I might have some business with it and asked him to hold it for me until I could grab it. This was the first message I received since then. If anything went sideways, it probably wouldn't have been his fault. I trusted him. I simply did as he said and enjoyed Christmas Day, the first day of the new year. It was the day after that I was set to return. Business didn't stop with the new year, and both the Duchess and Duke had matters to attend to. Amara was to stay behind and handle whatever her parents needed her to do. It was probably in the realm of organizing received gifts and bonding more with her flicker. There was just under a week left before the Magisterium's second semester would start. The elites were slotted to head back out to the front lines nearly immediately afterward. And so the day came for me to return. You promise you're going to visit? Faye, her voice tinged with hopefulness, asked. I smiled and gave her a hug. Of course. You just keep yourself out of trouble. Or just make sure you don't get caught. Ahem. The Duchess cleared her throat in warning, causing me to snicker. I winked at Faye and ruffled her hair, making her laugh. All right. I need to get going. Mr. and Mrs. Delaria, thank you for your hospitality. I quite enjoyed myself. Of course. Be safe on your way back. I will. I shook their hands before heading to the carriage, Amara following to bid each other a quiet goodbye. Once she closed the door, I was off to the rail terminal where I was sent back to the capital. Amara turned after shutting the door and watching the carriage roll off. She saw her parents staring at her, making her tilt her head. It felt like she was being put on the spot. What is it? You're quite the grown up now, aren't you? I'm not sure what you mean. Amara was confused by her mother's scrutinizing comment, prompting her father to translate. Ahem, your mother, and I happened to overhear yours and John's proclamations of love to each other on New Year's night. Eh? It was quite the surprise. We didn't want to say anything until he left, but we had never known you to be so bold. I court chuckled a bit as Amara's face turned beet red, but instead of showing her embarrassment, she huffed and turned away. Humph, I'm not ashamed of anything. It's the truth, and nobody can say otherwise. We're not questioning that, dear. We just didn't think that you two had gotten so far. It's only been how many months? Almost four. And you two already look like you want to marry each other. The Duchess commented with sharp eyes, making Amara go silent, neither denying nor confirming. She sighed at that. Daughter, don't make this difficult for me. Not any more than it already is. It never had to be difficult in the first place. You think Shadowbane would have to deal with any of this? Whoosh. A small gust kicked up right as Amara said that, making her heart pound erratically for a moment as a thick sound barrier was created, blocking out all sight and sound beyond their group. Not even Faye was able to see or hear what the Duchess said next. Believe me, Amara. I'm trying. I know we aren't the Raven family, and I'm sorry any of this was ever a problem, but it is because we can't control our own interests and power without the approval of the rest of the nobles that this is an issue, and we cannot extricate ourselves from their influence anytime soon. So unless you need to do the entire Teleria line right now, just because you don't want to keep your pants tied, I suggest you work with me until we can find a way that works for everyone. Amara was silent, her head dropping with indignation. She wasn't mad at her mother. It was her hatred for the noble class that was only increasing. Telexia could only sigh. I feel like if I don't continue to expose you to the harsh realities, you'll run off and do something that will make all of our conflicts explode. I know you can't see a way out, and I can't give one to you right now, but you need to trust that I'll find one eventually. I just hate feeling like I'm just a tool. Frustrated tears rolled down Amara's cheeks. She felt like she was going to explode, yet was constantly being crushed and confined with no way to fight back. Alexia walked forward and hugged her, stroking her hair. I know. Again. I'm sorry. I wish I could have spared you from that. I thought that I could do so by finding you someone suitable, a good man to marry since you would have to anyway. But I didn't expect for you to find yourself one, and for him to be so outstanding that he would piss off the entirety of high noble society and risk his life for his girl. Sometimes I think that you're the lucky one, not him. Hmm. Amara smiled just a bit, the two separating and looking into each other's eyes. Regardless of all that, plans change, and we adapt. What I need from you is to play the game with me and bide your time. If you really want this, then you'll do that. I have a feeling John understands that as well. He's rash, blunt, and frighteningly casual with people he shouldn't be, but he's also smart. That's probably the only reason he's still alive. So for his sake and ours, can you restrain yourself and play along? Yes. Good. Thank you. Telexia nod
So long as that worked, she wouldn't step outside the lines. It eased her greatly to know she wouldn't be going against the Duchess. The most pertinent issue now was the Teleria family's over-reliance on noble society. It wouldn't be a problem had they just been another good little noble family, sequestered in their own fiefdom far from the capital. As they currently were, that was almost exactly where they stood, but Amara's current predicament certainly increased tensions. And if Amara read into her mother's words correctly, there was soon to be a lot more conflict in their attempt to extricate themselves from noble society. Their bid for freedom would not pass without some extreme consequences, and that made Amara wonder what her mother could possibly have in store. She would need some extreme measures to compensate for this extreme circumstance. Whatever it was, she didn't know even half of it. Fear now joined caution in keeping her in line. If she weren't careful, she would be the spark that ignited a firestorm larger than even her family could handle. My first stop after arriving in the capital a day later was the hotel. There, I unpacked and situated myself before sending a few messages and leaving to take care of my most important order of business. I soon arrived at the Polaris headquarters, finding my way to Maxwell's study. He greeted me with an even gaze. Yes, good day to you too. I have questions. I may have answers. He looked down at his desk, papers covered in scribbles before him. I took a seat and asked, I don't know if you've heard, but I recently killed a Cyclops scout. Yes, I have been notified that you did something rather impressive. What of it? I was wondering about its viability as a crown. Would I be able to use it? And would it be beneficial for me? Hmm. He looked up at me and backed down in surprisingly deep thought. Considering the nature of your weapons and their reliance on your sight, it wouldn't be a bad decision. A scout has an advancement path almost entirely dedicated to observation. A 47 is when they finally attain some form of offensive capability, but even that only stems from an extreme level of observational ability that far surpasses even those well above its authority. It's one of the most extreme examples of a specialized scourge beast. So yes, if you wanted to, you could use its corpse to create a crown for yourself. You wouldn't attain the same observational abilities, but it would still increase your own several fold. Really? If you truly think it's a good pick, then I'll go through with it. I already want to. Each body has a limit as to the amount of crowns it can hold, and this crown would fill a slot well. It's quite a suitable pick considering your style. It would magnify a strength of yours. His evaluation was straightforward, and he didn't even know the future of what my summons held. Sight being a significant factor was an understatement. It was the foundation of ranged combat, if nothing else, not to mention all the other benefits that greater observational abilities provided. I was fully prepared to move forward with this if he signed off. And since he did, there was nothing more to say. All right then, I suppose I just need to retrieve the corpse. Yes, bring it here, let me inspect it, and then we can find an alchemist to discuss the process of turning it into a crown. It wasn't dismantled, correct? No, it wasn't, not even for its crystal. I gave it to the puppet master for safekeeping. Very well, go get it from him. Perhaps we can have the crown ready before you go back out for your next trip. Sweet. I got excited, standing and making my way out. I'll go talk to him. MM. He just nodded as I strode out of the study. From there, I made my way straight to the magisterium. I had already messaged the puppet master, and he was just waiting there. So with a quick ride, I made it to the gates where I sought him out. I found him in the training grounds, specifically that little shed he was always in. He was waiting outside. You're here. Yes. Where's the corpse? Come inside first. We need to talk. He waved me in with a less than jovial mood, amplifying the ominous feeling I had felt back when he initially messaged me. We entered the shed where he took a seat, inviting me to do the same. Once seated, he sighed and sat straight. First, let me tell you about the decision made by the president regarding your record. Okay, it will be recognized. You are now the first authority for it to ever kill an authority seven in magisterium history. This record will stand for centuries to come, enshrined in the Hall of Fame. Even if there are those younger than you who eventually do the same, your record as the first will forever stand. It's an honor granted to extremely few. I see. My eyes widened a bit. I didn't really think much of it, but this was still a big deal. My name would forever sit on display within the magisterium. Future generations would know that it was I who set that record, something never done before in recorded history. I felt some pride in it, but refocused as he continued. However, there will not be a ceremony, as there were for other records. The record will be quietly enshrined inside the hall, not to be celebrated or congratulated. Hmm. Well, I don't care about that much. I expected something petty like that. That's good, but. He went quiet, giving me a sinking feeling. What is it? Forgive me, John. I didn't realize until you sent me that message. By then, it was already too late. It seems that they ripped the opportunity away before we even realized it was there. That's the difficulty of having smart enemies. Puppet master, where's the corpse? I asked directly. It was almost obvious why I had asked about it in my message to him. I wanted to make a crown out of it. But if he could see that, why couldn't they? I just didn't think they would stoop to that level. It hadn't crossed my mind. My kill should be mine to do with as I pleased, especially one of such a magnitude. But more than that, I had entrusted it to the puppet master. If I had at least kept the head with me, even just as a trophy, I would have been able to do whatever I wanted regardless of what they said. But I didn't. The puppet master stared at my shoes, unable to quite meet my eyes. A look of almost defeat crossed his eyes for a split second before he continued. Currently, it is in the possession of the president. Where it could be precisely is a mystery. Regardless, it is set to be enshrined inside a case within the hall later in the week. The corpse will be there alongside your record as evidence and a trophy. I want it back. Carrion gave me a message to deliver, in case you said that. An excerpt from Magisterium Regulatory Policy. The puppet master handed me a folded sheet of paper, which I took and read. Article 3, Section 1. Hunted beasts and their corpses become property according to kingdom law. The property rights belong to the hunter by default, unless otherwise dictated by any employing entity the hunter may be affiliated with. Section 2. As the employing entity, the Magisterium reserves all rights to beast or animal corpses hunted by any and all students and staff under its name and purview. This includes all pieces and parts of the corpse such as the black crystal, and all monetary gains from selling the corpse, processed or otherwise, are, by rights, considered Magisterium revenue. Article 2, Section 1 of the Ignoble Hunter Rights Bill. Only beasts or animals at or above authority 9 are allowed to be claimed by non-noble persons regardless of any affiliations and or contracts which may dictate otherwise. This includes all parts of the beast or animal, such as the black crystal. Section 2. If the property has been processed or dismantled before the ignoble hunter has claimed it, and the ignoble hunter and the employing or contracting entity cannot come to an agreement on distribution of property parts and pieces, the property must be sold and the employing or contracting entity is allowed to withhold coin equal to the processing costs, with a limit of 70% to selling price. I sat there in silence. For some time, I wasn't sure what to think. According to law, I had no rights to the course. The only way I would ever have the rights was if it were an authority 9 at minimum. However, there was some fine text hidden within these laws. The ignoble hunter rights bill. Keywords. Ignoble hunter. Would a noble child have to give up their kill to the magisterium? No, they wouldn't. The bill was only for the ignobles, the commoners, the peasants. I could practically taste the mockery in the name of the bill. In fact, the very paper I held was contempt. The president, having studied my weapons, or at least having read the reports about them, knew that my sight was an important factor in their use. And it wasn't far-fetched to think that I may want the corpse for a crown. It was well suited for me, after all, regardless of my plans for it, he seized it. And his only explanation were some snippets of law. He was prepared for this. He knew I would come for the corpse. Even if I didn't, either he wasted a small bit of time printing this message, or he would taste the satisfaction of withholding an important opportunity for my growth. And he did. This could have been an incredible boost in my auxiliary power. The advantages in battle I would have gained from this crown would no doubt be a potentially critical factor in preserving my life and the lives of my team. And now, with a single piece of paper, all hope of that was lost. There
A towering window silhouetted him against the magic tower in the distance, his outline practically glowing in what seemed a cruel mockery of my suppressed anger. I walked up casually enough, unknown strength keeping me from just leaping at him, and stood squarely before his desk with a placid face. I want the corpse of the Cyclops god I killed. Given your mood, you visited the puppet master first, who should have given you my response. I don't believe there's much more to say, oh dash. Fuck the loss. I curse plainly, without a single change in attitude. You don't care about them. You're prideful as thinks you're some kind of king. Skip the bullshit. One of your students wants the trophy of his kill. You think a reward is an order for the first record of its kind. I thought we were skipping the bullshit. Carrion shot back, rising from his seat and meeting me at eye level. His aura fanned out as he did, a sense of dread permeating my pores. But I felt so detached from my own self that I didn't even react to it. My emotions didn't feel like mine anymore. You're right. I don't give a damn about the loss. Except when they give me every right to tell you to fuck off. You're not getting that course. And you're not getting a crown out of it. He smiled and eyed me, a certain facet of his genial facade revealing a much darker interior. I'm going to lock the corpse away, crystal and all, right inside the Hall of Fame. I'm going to pin it up nice and pretty behind a single pane of unbreakable glass. Everyone will be able to see it and know you were the one who killed it. They'll sing your praises for the next few months. You'll become an idol for the younger generations. And yet, you'll always know that the corpse behind that glass could have bestowed you greater power. It will forever be a reminder of what could have been. So please, indulge in your hatred and rage. I want to see your frustration and indignation. It's the least you can do for attempting to undermine me in my own mansion. Even though something like this is a small matter I shouldn't mind, even though you're a bug not worth paying attention to, I've decided to do so as I was bored. What better way to entertain myself than to see a worm like you squirm around when he was denied the little scraps of food he caught? A harsh laugh came from his throat as he walked an arc in front of me. My vision turned spotty. My mind went white. I couldn't comprehend the sheer intensity of my emotions. This kind of depraved malice. I didn't understand it. My rationality screamed at me exactly what I needed to know, but even with the power of Psyche, it didn't get through. I didn't know how to react to it. Even my orb boiled over, slashing against Carrion's with wanton rage and attempting to get a foothold. But against the Authority 11, any cracks were as ephemeral as the light. I was powerless. That's just how it was in this world. I couldn't do a damn thing about it. Having had his fill of fun, Carrion sat back down behind his desk again, a frown filling his face. All right, now get out of my sight, you insect. Bam. He flicked his hand, a wave of vigor throwing my body across the office. I rolled limply when I hit the floor, only stopping when I crashed into the door. It felt like my entire body had been battered by a sledgehammer, blood leaking from my nose and mouth. With nothing more than a thought, I suffered debilitating injuries. That was the physical manifestation of such a difference in power. I pulled myself off the floor with any scraps of energy left in my body, too exhausted to even offer one last sign of defiance by slamming the door. I needed to retreat and regroup. Sticking it out here would achieve nothing. Once I had stumbled my way out, I caught sight of the puppet master just outside the building, my head pounding from my thoroughly battered aura, my body throbbing from new injuries. It was a good thing he was there too. I didn't have the strength to walk myself back to the dorms. I crumpled into a heap on the pavement, a few quivers of pain racking through my body. The last thing I saw before darkness took my vision was the puppet master looming over me, mouth open with unheard words. Chapter 95, Hunt. When I woke from my slumber, I was met with the cold white ceiling of a hospital room. After my vision cleared up a bit more, I sat up slowly and scanned the room, recognizing the magisterium's own medical ward. It took another minute for the throbbing in my head to settle down enough for me to process everything. The memories came racing back. My psyche overwhelmed just trying to categorize everything. Dreams served me well in formation advancement. They served better in helping me understand my memories. By the time I had made sense of everything, the situation had been laid out and analyzed in a far more objective manner than previously. I had gotten too caught up in the extreme circumstance and lost myself back then. Now I could look back at what happened with a clear head, and I didn't like it one bit. I had been denied a vital boost in power. I was to be mocked with my own trophy. Carrion shed his mask and toyed with me as a cat might a mouse. We were now assuredly mortal enemies. It was almost odd how that worked. I didn't think I could ever have a mortal enemy like that. But by now I was pretty sure both of us wanted each other dead. The only thing stopping either of us were our statuses and Carrion's own biases. I wasn't worth the trouble to kill. Not yet anyway. If nothing else, he made the fact clear. I suppose it was actually a good gauge. I at least knew that there wouldn't be any serious attempts on my life yet. My powerful detractors still thought I was just an annoying bug. And so I was denied my crown, but that meant nothing changed. I could keep moving forward as I'd been. I tapped my aerial and made a call. Yes. Maxwell's enthusiastic voice sounded in my mind. Yeah. Hi. So funny story. I gave him a quick rundown of what happened, causing him to go silent for a few moments. Unfortunately, I can't do anything about this. I'm not what I once was. If anything, you got off lucky. The only thing holding Carrion back was fear for his reputation and complete arrogance. The situation could have gone much worse. You should be glad Carrion thought so little of you. I hunted a succinct appraisal, so now it's just a costly lesson, and a mistake you won't make again in the future. You've lost another layer of insurance, but at least you weren't making any significant bets on it. In the end, this changes nothing. I know. Back to training it is then. Indeed, there will be opportunities again in the future. And at least now you know the things nobles will do, even if only to be petty. You lost an opportunity for growth. He merely said a few words to those under him. The power nobles wield is far greater than your own, so for your own sake, stop provoking them. I'll do my best. Pray that it's enough. He hung up with that response, making me click my tongue as I put my wrist down. I immediately lifted it back up and noticed the time. Well into the next day. A few notifications from Amara popped up, all during my vacation from consciousness. My rampant aura back then really took its toll. My emotions had reached such an extreme that I almost completely detached from them, as odd as that sounded. And as a result, my aura had sharpened significantly. Perhaps in an attempt to express my rage, my aura had clawed against Carrion's. But it was completely stifled in its attempts. Carrion was simply too powerful. The best metaphor would be a scalpel trying to cut through a foot of solid steel armor. There simply wasn't anything I could do, no matter how much experience sharpened my blade. This was maybe also a good thing. Our fight, if you could even call it one, was one of aura. No physical traces other than my blood were left behind. Should Carrion claim I tried assaulting him, he would have to fabricate evidence in his support, and would still be laughed out of court at the mere idea of a student seven authorities below him coming even close to hurting him. It had also served as a sort of tempering. That was the first time my aura had been so unrestrained and yet utterly confined. It was a valuable experience, using my ability in such an extreme way. At least I hadn't come out with nothing. I sighed while dialing Amara. Hey John. Hello, my sweet. How are you doing? I asked with a bright smile. It felt good to hear her voice. She sighed. It's fine. Boring. Maybe a bit irritating, but fine. How about you? I tried to call you yesterday. Are you alright? Of course. I was just occupied for a while. Good. How about matters with the corpse? Is the crown viable? She asked expectantly. I had naturally told her about my plans when I thought of them. I just never expected things to go this way, but I didn't want her to worry. She was dealing with things on her end, so I wouldn't burden her with yet another issue until she was free. I'm not sure yet. The stuff regarding crowns is pretty complicated, and I'm still waiting to get news on what the Magisterium is doing. I'll know later when people start coming back from vacation. All right, I'll try and finish things over here. I want to be back sometime within the next few days. That way we can have some quiet time to ourselves before things pick back up. Sounds lovely. I offered a pleasant agreement. We went on to talk for a while. There were no doctors to disturb
Patriarch Devera was well prepared, and that a mortal heart was the trigger for all of this. These plans were no doubt months in the making, if not years. The Devera family would either rise to heights never before seen, or be eradicated from the face of the market entirely. In such a war, there was little I could do myself. How long do you think this war will last? That depends on the Devera family and how fast they can concoct the crown out of the heart. It could be anywhere from a month to half a year. They at least have the power to repel their enemies, but not forever. Right. Well, I'll be gone for most of it. Maybe when I come back from my next trip, it'll all be over. There's a chance. But this is also a time of opportunity for someone like you. If you would like to take a look, I was silent as the key master slid a small stack of papers over to me, a solemn look crossing my face in the process. He noticed, a placating smile supporting his next words. Don't worry. This is merely one of the bounties on the repository. I felt it would be a fine chance for you to make some extra money while ridding the market of yet another parasite. It'll be far easier than your last kill, because this person is a summoner, like you. HM, that's rare. I took a breath while grabbing the paper, reading some details about a woman. She was the head of some company that specialized in smuggling operations. They moved not just people but hard drugs. Her company alone was responsible for nearly 30% of the entire market's drug throughput. The key master spoke as I read. Killing this woman won't stop the smuggling. It'll just stifle it for a short period of time. But what this will do is create a power vacuum that many unsavory individuals will be fighting to fill. The war with the Tavera family is already kicking up a storm. This will make it worse, and in the process, take a small amount of pressure off of them. That's not the reason I'm offering this to you, of course. But it is a natural consequence. Chaos will put a halt to any operation. It'll destabilize everything and present more opportunities to continue dismantling the structure. Exactly. But being a woman as rich as she is, she naturally has a significant amount of protection. She's been able to use her summoner smarts to avoid any and all calamities that would have befallen her. So it's obvious to say that she's cautious, perhaps paranoid. But I'm willing to bet nothing can prepare her for you. And given her completely ordinary body, I don't have to worry about sheer power. Any of my attacks can kill her. But she no doubt has protection against that, like armor or some magical stuff. I muttered, seeing the few pictures of her with various pieces of gear on. She really did look paranoid. She probably didn't do anything beyond the walls of her own home if she didn't have to. And when she did, she only went out with the best magical protective measures. How was I supposed to pierce that? It was safe to say that nothing I had could pierce defenses bought with money like hers. And the key master confirmed my guess. Indeed, she has a long list of protective items from the clothes she wears to some amulets. However, one thing has to be noted about the amulets. They are magical defensive systems that react to anything it can detect. But even the best of those aren't invulnerable. Do they react specifically to magic? Any magic that comes within a certain proximity of her is automatically defended against. And anything that would physically harm her is likewise defended against with a shield. But nothing is instantaneous. A projectile fast enough might be able to pierce the veil. I perked up an understanding, causing the key master to give me a small grin. Are you willing to take that bet? You must know the consequences of failure. You already have a rather massive target on your back. Exactly. The target is already there. They're gonna hate me anyway. May as well make them bleed for it. Besides, I recently got a whiff of a new toy to play with. I took the papers and started walking out of the hotel. Any details about her that I needed to know were on it. The key master waved. Enjoy your hunt, John. Always, key master. I didn't immediately go try and find my new target. I needed to study the information I was given and also take care of one piece of business. I hadn't been idle in my training while on vacation. I still cultivated my authority every night and scouted my dimension for interesting things. Most of the time, it felt like I was sending a drone out into an empty void. But recently, I had picked up on a new lead. There were two guides that I used for searching the dimension. The first was my psyche that I could use for brute forcing wide area searches using pulses of power. The second was a more recently discovered method, and that was using my aura to feel around for spirits. It was with my aura that I was able to point myself in the direction of a new spirit. It didn't feel like anything significantly more powerful. It carried a signature similar to the Springfield, but it felt different, which meant it was modified. I decided to check it out before moving forward. I had a feeling it would be useful, so I lounged in my hotel room for a while, sending out my psychic drone over to find a new gun. It took a while, but after going deeper into the endless darkness, I was able to find it. It was definitely a Springfield, but two new attachments were immediately familiar. First was the scope. Second was the barrel extension, one I recognized rather quickly. I didn't hesitate to go up to it and commune with it, and the first thing I received was an influx of memories. Major, what's this thingy? It's something made by Maxim, or whatever the company name is. It's called a silencer. Don't take it off or fuck with it. There's only 20 of these here, and I barely got the letter allowing me to access them. What does it do? I asked while lifting the rifle, examining the smooth barrel and strange cylinder on its tip. There were some ridges along the center portion of its body, but otherwise it merely looked like a long, skinny canister. It didn't look particularly special, but I had never seen anything like it. At the very least, the rifle already had a telescopic sight. They were definitely more useful than ladder sights for targets at a distance, at least in my own experience. The major issued a few more out to my buddies before addressing us. It's a silencer, so it silences the gun. Reports show that it reduces sound at the muzzle by a third. It does nothing to prevent the crackdown range, but it almost entirely eliminates muzzle flash, so I'm fitting you guys with them. We'll be doing plenty of night operations soon, and these will hopefully be of great help. Where does the bayonet go? Nowhere. These can't fit them with the silencer there. But we won't be fixing bayonets anytime soon, so get used to it. After passing out all 20 rifles fitted with scopes and silencers, the major ordered us off. That night, we were back out in the field, flanking hostile operations establishing new trench lines under the cover of night. In the darkness, a muzzle flash easily exposed your position. Combined with the sound, it was almost impossible to keep your position hidden. But with these, it almost became easy. A bullet sang through the night, planting itself solidly into the forehead of a man barely visible in the dust and dying light. A few moments of silence reigned, then the camp burst into life. Alarms well for alerted ears and lanterns flashed to life in the darkness. Some of those lanterns were put out almost as quickly as they turned on. But one wasn't, and it revealed a few men inside a small pit a bit farther away. I shifted my sights onto a highlighted silhouette, the light a consequence of negligence or a futile attempt at gathering more information. The supersonic whiplash of the bullet sounded right after I fired, right as the man's figure crumpled out of sight. I had yet to be accurately located, but suppressive fire started plinking my way. I was still green. They hadn't a damn clue where I was. Besides, I wasn't the only one. Another shot rang out from my left, and the gunner slumped back before his loader even had another belt of ammo in his hands. A third shot left the MG nest filled with not but bodies. My partner next to me snickered. Come on, keep going. Can't let them beat you. Keep your trap shut and find me a target. One o'clock. There's a runner. I fired again, cutting him off mid-stride. I let out a low whistle after that shot, impressed that I even hit a moving target that distance. The spotlight suddenly flared, briefly washing out my vision and turning night into day. I remained perfectly still, letting what may well be a beam of light with deathly powers itself illuminate my motionless body, not even twitching as a bug meandered across my arm. It swept past us and back. The thumping in my chest grew louder. The beam slowed down near me, almost touching my leg, when a report rang out again in the night. The almost musical sound of shattering glass reached my ears, and, more importantly, the light at my feet vanished. Another shot, another kill. Bullets continued to rain down on the outpost as enemies scrambled to find their killers. But they couldn't. There was no muzzle flash, only the cracking sounds of each bullet as it took another life. There were too many soldiers to possibly kill even a majority of them with our small fire team. The enemy had also started sending squads up the hill we were on to hunt us down. While we could sometimes cut them down, and distance was defin
Knowing that, I disregarded everything else and took a deep breath. I could only see and feel. Everything else felt dull to the point of non-existence. My entire world was the cold steel of the trigger on my finger, the wood on my cheek, and the rapidly changing figure of the general. The flag nearby had already been marked by my spotter as being just under 500 yards away. It was a long shot, and the car was moving, but I had hit longer. The car came to a momentary stop, and I found my opportunity. I had concerns about the driver blocking my shot as they turned at such an angle, but I didn't have time to worry about that. I took my shot right as I felt sure. Then I watched intently for a second until the bullet landed, tearing through the head of the driver and piercing through the general's neck just beyond it. One shot, two kills. Holy shit. Major ain't gonna believe that shit. The engine of the car revved, the Reaper taking control for a moment as it swerved to the side. My spotter laughed in disbelief before jumping up. Let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. I tore my eye away from the scope, running uphill and away from the chaotic enemy camp. Well damn. My eyes opened, Springfield in hand before I realized it. I looked down and examined the new rifle. Optic mounted on top and the Maxim silencer on the end of the barrel. Not only had I attained this modified rifle, but now I had memories of someone taking an accurate shot at around 500 yards. The longest shot I had taken so far wasn't much farther than 300 yards. Any farther was luck's territory, but that shot wasn't luck. That was cold, hard skill demonstrated by a sharpshooter. And now, I had those memories and experiences. I smiled and thought of the possibilities while rising from my bed. I had my target, and night was falling. It was time to hunt. Chapter 96, Complacent. I perched atop a roof, the fifth story blending in well with similarly tall buildings nearby, and giving me clear lines of sight to a large plaza filled with a red haze. Target, Sarah Trot, 47 years old. Summoner, Authority 8. She only made herself visible in two areas, the red light district in the Founders Market, and another city outside the capital. The war had brought her back in town, the chaos providing enough opportunity to warrant her personal attention over the last few days. According to some eyewitness reports, probably the ones that confirmed her location to begin with, years of living as a higher authority and under defensive measures made her a bit more complacent than during her initial rise to power. She was no longer as paranoid. Assassins and bounty hunters looking for her had either met grisly fates at the hands of her bodyguards or couldn't even scratch her countless layers of defense she always wore. All that concerned me was her recent resurgence in regular, predictable activity. Now would be as good a time as any to make a move. The plaza itself was around 300 yards away. It was nearly impossible to miss. A rather demonic red glow spilled through the surrounding streets and into the air, almost like a literal pit of fire and brimstone. That plaza was where Sarah had appeared six times in the past week. She always worked in the dark, so I just needed to stop the place at night. However, picking her out among the crowds would be a difficult task. If I had the crown from the Cyclops Scout, identification would probably be pitifully easy. I let out a sigh. Remembering such an emotionally charged and unstable moment wouldn't help me with waiting. I adjusted a few crates in front of me and set my rifle upon them. The new scope was a welcome addition. I could now see a bunch of bare tits and ribbon clarity even from so far away. But I didn't stare. I had a job to do and a girlfriend with even better tits. I could stare all I wanted when I finished, but the only thing I would be staring at now was heads. And so I sat there for three hours. It was incredibly boring. The only movement I made was switching eyes on occasion to reduce fatigue and pulling back a little to get a better view of things. That's when I spotted something, or someone, interesting. Rayla was strolling down one of the streets, occasionally throwing a glance to a particularly dark alleyway or suspicious building. I got curious and followed her with my reticle, watching as she entered one of the red buildings. She came out not long later, walking just as casually as she had been before. Probably a delivery. Those were fun. I smirked and reminisced. Before getting sent to the trenches, I had the pleasure of making some deliveries to the brothels. Out of the dozen or so deliveries I ever had to those establishments, seven resulted in the owner offering some services in exchange for payment. I never accepted, of course. Coin was more important for me at the moment. Even so, I wasn't about to risk getting some kind of magical disease from a whore. Did magical diseases exist? I would assume they'd be on a whole other level from regular diseases. Maybe they only infected people with magic. Still, I had never heard of them before. Or maybe they were just classified as poisons or parasites instead. I returned to my reticle and followed Rayla as she walked off, sliding gracefully out of the few drunks attempts to hit on her. I sighed when she disappeared from my line of sight, going back to watching. My spark was probably the most useful to me right now. With it, I could focus on the task at hand while also having my own thoughts. I could simply assign it to track and match faces to the picture of Sarah I had in my mind. The rest of my mind was generally free to wander, so I was able to keep myself occupied with some daydreaming. It was only unfortunate that I didn't have music. Playing music with my guitar right now would be stupid, and even if I had a way to play back the music of this world, it wasn't particularly to my taste. I had the faint hope that I would get some kind of device in one of my future authorities. At this point, I would welcome a gramophone, if only for the novelty. It wasn't only weapons that I found in key dimensions, after all, but there wasn't much in the way of radios in WW1, so my options were limited. And even then, my kind of music wasn't relevant then. I'd have to wait, as I needed it for countless other things. Another side escaped as I moved my reticle to check a doorway. There were a few doorways that Sarah came out of the few times she emerged. The one I focused on was one of them. It creaked open. Cautious eyes scanned the alleyway before the burly body it belonged to slid out, scouting the area and motioning behind him. My eyes narrowed as a woman creeped out, escorted by another four men. Bingo. I centered my reticle on her, calming myself and bringing my full mental capabilities to bear. Although she was dressed in a large coat that protected all her vitals and a hat that could no doubt take a punch, parts of her neck were still exposed. I could easily make out her face and identify her. Swords were easy to react to. Magic was similar in that regard. Her defensive amulets could detect all forms of energetic attacks and react to block them, even if she couldn't. And if she was able to sense it, then no matter what it was, it was useless. She would just activate her defenses personally, surrounding herself with an impenetrable bubble. My reticle rested on her neck as she moved, my coat subconsciously activating and dilating my perception of time. My spark fed information to me, ingrained human heuristic processes boosted with psyche and fed with information from my aura giving me incredibly accurate calculations for my shot. Everything was accounted for. My zero point, distance, wind speed, humidity, even margins of error. Not a single variable my aura could detect was left unaccounted for. I tracked her movement, concentrating intently, anticipating her direction, and even the sway of her body. I was so focused, in fact, that I almost felt like I could feel her intentions, even at such a distance. It was like reading another's aura, but at a distance far greater than I had ever done before. She confusedly jerked her head around, eyes starting around, unknowing as to the exact nature of the brief contact our aura's made. And she found me, her eyes locking right as I pulled the trigger. It sailed through the air, a supersonic shockwave following behind until it was replaced with thin wisps of blood. A gout of brilliant red erupted from her neck, almost obscuring the clean separation between her spine and head as she tumbled forward like a puppet with cut strings. I took a deep breath, calming my nerves as time rushed back to normal speed, a strain making itself known in my table from my brief but extensive expenditure of psyche. One shot, one kill. It was so simple it almost felt like cheating. The bullet hadn't even been enhanced with psyche. A regular bullet from a regular gun on my end, and a dead crime boss on the other. She was as ordinary as I was and literally didn't warrant more than that. In this world full of superhuman freaks, it really was hard to be a summoner. Warlocks could create impenetrable bubbles, and knights, by default, were built like literal tanks, not to mention the effects of vigor extension. Summoners were but fleshy punching bags before them. That was why I didn't feel like I was cheating. In exchange for this awesome power, I was horribly vulnerable. It wasn't long ago that I had been smacked across
There was nobody else who could mimic what I did. It was a signature at this point. As I climbed off the building, I could see people murmuring and looking around, looking for me in curiosity. One or two even seemed to recognize me. Their gazes on my body were rather intense, though not hostile. Thankfully, I was far enough from my target not to be found. Now I just needed to hide away for a while and let the chaos fester. In a day or two, nobody associated with Sarah Trot would give two hoots about taking revenge on me. They would be too busy scrabbling for the power she wielded. That alone would ensure my safety, at least in the short term. In the long term, the target on my back only got a little bigger, but I didn't care much. I would be leaving again soon for another school field trip. And even if I were here, so long as I was in the magisterium or the hotel, I was safe. A bigger concern was the war going on with the Tavera family at the center. The patriarch was basically one of my patrons. I wished I could do more to help him, but the war was out of my league. Anybody I could reasonably kill would have a negligible impact on the outcome, and I would be putting my life in grave danger for trivial gains. It wasn't worth it, especially not to me. I was indebted to a lot of people and wanted to help, but I wouldn't go and kill myself like that. Couldn't pay anybody back if I was dead. My life wasn't even worth enough to compensate for my debts, so I could only sit on the sidelines and watch. I scurried away with those thoughts, retreating to the hotel where I found the keymaster. I walked in with a smile. Hello, keymaster. How's the night treating you? Ah, John. Long time no see. The night is well, and its darkness is rid of one more slippery rat. Damn. It's like you were there with me. Hmm. He smirked ever so slightly, giving me a weird feeling. It's impressive how efficient you are with such matters, John. I was just listening for that familiar sound. Every time it rings, I can almost feel the gratitude of the entire market. Yet it is accompanied by the frightened and enraged screams of the damned. Your name is carried as far as your bullet sore, but fame and infamy walk hand in hand. Sometimes I worry for your life. Ah, uh, you worry about me? I appreciate the concern, my man. I do. I stuck out my fist for a bump. Yet my man didn't know what it meant, so he lifted his half clenched fist with a confused tilt of the head. I smiled and bumped his knuckles before leaning on the desk. If I ever need a safe harbor, I'll just come running over here. I have a feeling nobody would dare trespass on grounds such as these. Nobody but the Almighty. Then I have nothing to worry about. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to a point where I won't need it. But until then, I can only thank you for your hospitality. Of course, John. But don't think you don't deserve at least some of the things you receive. Not even I can know how many lives you've saved by killing the person you just did. Just by removing evil, you allow good to flourish. It's dirty work sometimes, but what you're doing makes you deserving of some good yourself. He let out a small laugh. I still remember what you said not long after we first met. You called yourself a leech back then. Do you still feel like one? Yes, I do. HM, you certainly have a lot of pride. I would say it's a bad thing, but that drive to help people is saving a lot of lives. I've been told that before. My girlfriend seems to think the same thing. Perhaps it's a pattern worth recognizing. If I agree with the foundation of the accusation, I would agree. Haha, uh -huh. how stubborn. I do enjoy these talks, John. As do I. I smiled as he stuck out his hand, shaking it. I can tell you're tired. To be sure to rest well, may we talk again soon. I will. Have a good night, Keymaster. Always. With that goodbye, I retreated to my room for the night. It wasn't long until sunrise, but since I was still in vacation mode, I decided I could sleep in as much as I wanted. Chapter 97, Cosmic Scale. A few days passed, but the turbulence in the market only grew by the hour. My name was making ripples in the market and Lividus even sent me a message that all my co-workers had been talking about it. My bounty even rose to 170,000 coin, a numerical reflection of my infamy. Thankfully, everyone in the market was distracted. With me hiding out in my room all the time, they didn't have the time or patience to try and kill me. That wasn't even accounting for the proven difficulty of taking my head. It was January and vacation ended on the 20th. Amara was doing her best but wouldn't be back for a while, so I had nothing to do and a lot of time to do it. My primary focus was training. Over the course of a week, I devoted close to 30 hours to tracing paths through my ever-developing advancement formation. My motivation couldn't be higher, but Psycho was only half the equation now. Aura was now one of my most important tools, only below summoning, the base of it all. After my little spat with President Carrion, one of the pieces of information my spark had processed was the incredible compression my aura was under. It had tried to uncontrollably rampage with all its power back then, expending a massive amount of my energy in a very short period of time. I had basically been unconsciously trying to kill Carrion with it, but it had been confined to just beyond my body, despite the level of power exerted. Carrion's aura had been so incredibly dense owing to his authority that mine, relatively powerful, had been thoroughly suppressed. While it seemed wholly negative at first, I had actually come away with a few positive takeaways. The result was the experience itself. With just a bit of analysis, I could mimic that feeling and confine my aura to my body instead of letting it diffuse freely. It was quite uncomfortable at first, as it had been when Carrion did it. Back then, I felt like I'd been blind. Perhaps my spotty vision and blank had been, in part, caused by the suppression rather than my rampant emotions. And that blindness was crucial to concealing my aura. Contrary to the physical eye, blindness and my mystical eye meant invisibility to the aura of others as well. Of course, that was a rather oversimplified way of putting it. Plex was testament to just how much more was beyond me, but, without a doubt, this new ability of mine was invaluable. The only other benefit that could come close in value was how refined my aura became, specifically in its form. Another aspect of my aura that had changed was its weight. Having been squeezed into a little box, it now spread significantly less even when I wasn't actively trying to hide it. It was sharper, more consolidated, denser. By default, it still took the form of a cloud or mist, but with a noticeable increase in power. I didn't know exactly how much. It had doubled at least, perhaps even more. Aura was less quantifiable than even Psyche, already incredibly vague on exact quantities. I didn't even know it could be made more powerful this way. Any power differentials I had experience with, I simply chopped up to the gap in authorities. I had only been honing my technique over what I had. It was like trying to increase a factory's productivity without even realizing entire portions of the production process could be cut out. Apocryon showed me what it meant to have control over Aura. Carrion showed me what it meant to have a powerful Aura. They were two sides of the same coin, and both were benefiting me greatly. In fact, this increased power of mine was the main reason why I could train for much longer. Aura was almost like the energy of my consciousness, but with a denser power, I was not only able to go for longer, but I was also able to exercise much finer control of my Psyche. Psyche was about complexity, vigor about intensity, and man about feeling. Those were vague descriptions, but there was no doubt that advancing oneself as a summoner required them to make massive jumps in the complexity of their power. And to make complex things, one needed precise control. Perhaps this was the main barrier to summoners that blocked many from advancing their power. At some point, the advancement formations would become so complex that their ability to control Psyche simply couldn't keep up. Practice could help, but Aura was definitely the leading factor in one's ability to get better. I was sure it was like that for knights and warlocks too. Perhaps to them, it was obvious. But summoners didn't have an obvious way to integrate their aura in Psyche. It didn't help that they were considered useless. It was like a knight trying to get stronger without knowing that he could project vigor with a swipe of the finger. Summoners were still blindly searching through darkness for the right path. What cruel irony to see the smartest ones fumbling about to find their way. Well, at least Maxwell and I were doing things differently now. After Amara returned, we had around two weeks together with no interruptions or work. The first night when she came back was quite passionate. We hadn't been apart for so long since we started dating. We both had distractions and work, so it wasn't all that bad. But when we finally reunited, we indulged in each other to more than make up for lost time. From then on, productivity naturally decreased. We still trained every day, as was standard routine. But generally, we spent our time either in each other's company at the hotel or going on dates to f
It was difficult for her to detach such an intrinsic part of her life from her understanding, and that was only to grasp some basic scientific concepts. I couldn't even fathom having to explain something like electrical engineering to her. Not that it made it unfun. She genuinely had endless curiosity, and I was eager to tell her everything I knew. It made our discussions interesting, and it was especially exciting for both of us when certain things clicked for her. Amara was definitely smart, and I was glad that she was able to adapt her mindset enough to soak the knowledge up. Those two things would no doubt aid her in the future as she realized her talent. Our two weeks together were spent like that. Nothing but fun dates, romance, and intellectual discussions. And so the last day of our vacation arrived. You say the air around us can become liquid? Yes. The atmosphere around us is composed of a bunch of different elements. And there are how many states of matter? Four. Solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Right. And most elements can go between all those states, even if it's difficult to make them. With extreme temperatures, like extreme cold, you can even make air into a liquid. Why does a gas become a liquid? Because the energy of the atoms is reduced enough for it to condensate. Cool it below its melting point, and it will become a solid. Yes, that's all you need to really know. But there are some special cases. The melting and boiling points for elements are obviously different. It's why the air is naturally air while water is naturally water. The planet rests at a constant range of temperatures. If the whole world became significantly hotter, water would evaporate and most life would die. Similarly, if temperatures drop significantly, water would freeze and throw us into an ice age. But because air remains a gas at this temperature, we're allowed to exist. However, there are a few elements that are nearly impossible to turn into solids. What gases are those? Helium for one. Hydrogen too. Not sure about nitrogen, but oxygen can technically become a solid. Hmm. Amara looked down, reading through the periodic table of elements I had drawn out for her. That high school studying was starting to pay off. That paper was only one of many pages that I had left doodles on. I mainly drew things out for her so she could visualize what I was talking about. It was how many people learned, because sometimes worded descriptions weren't enough. She had a whole booklet of these pages by now. That was because, as it turns out, not only did Psyche and Aura make you smarter, but it also made you something of an artist. The ability to draw the images in one's head didn't come easily to most, certainly not me. I was no artist, that's for sure. But after trying my hand at it, I found that I was far better than I had been previously. That was the main reason she had so many pages. I got excited and doodled every chance I could to exercise my new artistic skill. The only thing that reduced my image quality was control over my own hand. But with practice and enough time, that would be rectified. Amara sighed, leaning back and processing the knowledge I gave her. You're really turning my worldview upside down. Well, I suppose I understand that. Everything I'm telling you is normal for me. It's no different from how you see magic. You simply understand it without thinking. That's what science is for me, right? You didn't have magic where you were from. No, I didn't. So when I encountered magic, my worldview was flipped, just like yours is now. Even then, what I'm teaching you is only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more out there. I get chills just thinking about it. But you won't understand any of it unless I lay the groundwork for you. Like what? Give me a hint. Well, all right. Let's see. I compiled my thoughts before speaking. The sun in the sky. Yeah? You told me it's a big ball of fire really far away. It is. But that fire isn't actually fire. You see, when atoms get crushed together hard enough, they fuse into one being. That fusion releases a ton of energy, and you know how many atoms are in a small space. That many atoms all fusing together constantly in such a small space would release a huge amount of energy. Yeah, it would. All right. Well, imagine an entire world, like the one we're on. And imagine if it were all made up of atoms that were all fusing together constantly. It would be a ball of fire that releases an ungodly amount of energy. Yeah. And now, imagine a million worlds worth of atoms, all fusing together and releasing energy. Amara went silent, attempting to comprehend what I was telling her. Once she nodded slightly, I continued. That's the sun that you see in the sky. A massive ball capable of containing a million worlds, and one that does nothing but explode and release light and heat. That heat is what warms this world. It's the sole reason we exist. That's what a star is. And that's just one. Come here. I suddenly grabbed Amara's hand, pulling her to the huge wall of glass that gave us a beautiful view of the city. But I didn't care about the city. I pointed up at the sky. With no light pollution, one could see the stars in the night sky, so bright and clear. You see all those little dots of light? Those are stars and galaxies. And what we see is only a fraction of what exists. Imagine every inch of darkness in that sky containing billions, no, trillions of stars. Many of them are far more massive than the sun we see, thousands if not millions of times bigger. There are literally countless stars. And there are countless worlds, countless moons around those worlds just like our own. All of them are so far away that even given millions of years of flight, we could never reach it. The closest star is no less than trillions of miles away. It's a scale that humans literally cannot comprehend. I let out a breath, staring up at the sky, almost entirely forgetting about Amara and my small moment of existential enamor. But I have thought about these things no small amount of times before, so I was able to pull myself away and look down at my girlfriend. She was still staring, silently grasping the enormity of the universe. Even in numbers, it was difficult to comprehend the cosmic perspective. But after two weeks of scientific discussion, she was beginning to understand, just enough to abstractly realize its scale. She was like that for almost a minute before she looked down, spaced out. It's difficult to understand. You kind of lost me with the big numbers, but I feel like I get just how enormous stars are. Hey, yeah, that's good enough. With more time, you'll start to understand more. I have a question though. How did you, or your people, figure this stuff out? Like the stuff that happens inside of a star to produce the light? It's so far away, and nobody could ever step foot on it. How did they figure it out? She asked curiously, finally zoning in and looking at me. I rubbed my chin with a smile. Well, you see, it was one of the greatest minds to ever live who paved the way for truly understanding how a star works. Many people tried to propose different theories on how it worked. Some thought it was a massive ball of liquid like lava that was just slowly releasing heat. But one man, named Albert Einstein, came out with perhaps the most important, or at least the most iconic, mathematical model to exist in science. I grabbed a sheet of paper and wrote out the mass energy equivalence. E equals mc squared. Short and simple, but those five characters were monumental in the history of science. Energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. This laid the groundwork for understanding that the sun has so much material that its own gravity crushes the atoms and its core to the point of fusion. The very same force that pulls us to the ground when we jump also causes the sun's core to explode with my limitless power. This forms a cycle known as the proton proton chain, also called the PP chain. Hey, PP chain. She chuckled a bit, as did I after having intentionally dropped that pond. I'm glad that you're as mature as I am. Anyway, you don't have to see something personally in order to find out how it works. It took a long time, but we advanced science so much that we could explain things that we couldn't even see. And we verify its truth with math, which is basically a language in and of itself. I see. She went silent again, taking a few seconds before muttering. I guess I really am the lucky one. I have you give me knowledge that nobody else in the kingdom knows. Well, it helps you, so I'll continue to give you knowledge so long as you want it. I want nothing more than for you to grow your own strength. Since my knowledge does that, then I won't spare the effort to teach you. Thank you, John. Her response was more heartfelt than I expected, surprising me a little. Seriously, not even my mother can understand the things you're doing for me. I don't know if you can either. What you're giving me is priceless. And I know you're not even doing it because of our relationship. Is that right? Well, you enlightened Shadow Bane to Aura despite having come in contact with her for all of two hours. You do it because you're a good person, better than anyone else I know. So my thanks comes to you not as your girlfriend, but simply as Amara. I want you to know that my appreciation for you and what you're doing for me is completely unfiltered. Oh. I looked at her, taking a mental step back and reevaluating her. Not as my girlfriend, but simply as a person, as Amara Te
Okay. And then, then your body. Hmm. I'm not sure if I should be excited or nervous. Anything else? And then, your life. I spoke while leaning down and kissing her neck. I'll need help raising the kids, after all. HH, how many? I don't know. Stronger authorities make it more difficult. So I think we'll just have to keep going and going and going until one of us gives first. I smiled while kissing her neck repeatedly, causing her to shiver. Hearing my last words, her deep red face tried its best to give me a confident smirk. I think I'll win that. Oh, hey, honey, please. I laughed a bit, giving her cheek a quick squeeze before we dove into another hug. Chapter 98, Warmth. You've seen the new rankings? Go to the Hall of Fame, new display. Authority 7 Cyclops. Cooper. A common. I think he heard us. Place straight into fourth year. Freaking cold summoner. Got suspended, the president. With the hilarious. A bounty. Shit. They're everywhere. I instantly snapped him when he walked out into the hallway, a hushed whisper permeating through the crowd. The Magisterium campus had come back to life after winter break. Students bundled in thick clothes clustering in groups across the open campus. But only one thing seemed to be on their minds. John. He clicked his tongue and went on his way, arriving at a doorway where Amara was waiting. The two linked up, glancing around them. You sure are popular now. I know. If I kissed you now, it would really catch some attention. Now let's control ourselves, please. Her face flushed scarlet, not all from the cold, as she took his arm. It was a bit embarrassing to walk around with so many eyes on them. They were basically broadcasting their relationship. She normally didn't mind the attention on John much. No matter what she did, he would somehow attract more. She just preferred subtlety, especially right now. They were having enough issues as it was, and this definitely wouldn't help. Not that they could do much about it other than hide away in their rooms. But necessity called, and they needed to go to plenty of places. The first being the ranking steal. They made their way to the leaderboard, having yet to confirm John's new ranking. Killing an authority seven had been achieved before, but it had been so long ago nobody knew how many points it would bestow. The last time he checked his rank, he had been rank eleven with around five hundred points to his name. That had increased with each trip, rising into the thousands. Now, he looked up near the top. Rank one, Pontac Goliard, three thousand and sixty points. Rank two, Fight and Desmus, two thousand eight hundred points. Rank three, John Cooper, two thousand seven hundred eighty points. Rank four, Vetsmon Verga, two thousand five hundred fifty points. Rank six, Amar Teleria, two thousand four hundred twenty points. Rank twelve, Tana Charon, sixteen sixty points. The couple saw their new ranks and smiled. You've officially surpassed me. It was a special circumstance. It means little. John had a small smile, but when Amara saw it, she didn't sense any amount of happiness. That's when she suddenly remembered something, though it made her confused. By the way, about that crown you were going to make with the corpse. Did you decide against it? No, not really. Having the scout's observation would be a huge indirect buff. What's a buff? A benefit. Anyways, you know how important sight is for acquiring targets at a range. Yes, I do. So why are they saying the corpse is in the Hall of Fame? Well, let's go see it first. John mumbled with a low voice, Amara walking with him to the hall. It was a grand building spanning the entire west side of the Magisterium. It was quite literally a hall, walkable from end to end. The eternally preserved spoils of war from the Magisterium's founding to current day sprawled across its length. On the side of the hall most relevant to recent events, an entire building's worth of space was occupied by a large crystal prism. John. There was a shout as they walked near. John and Amara saw the rest of their squad, Vetsmon, Fiden, and Tana. They smiled and approached, giving greetings. It's good to see you guys. Have a good vacation? Of course. Did you? I enjoyed myself. We both did. I wrapped my arm around Amara's shoulder, squeezing her as she play fought back. All right, all right. Let me see this case. She moved away, everyone's eyes drawn to the glass case. A polished bronze plaque made itself known. John's name was pressed in bold black lettering on top with smaller letters detailing exactly what was done and when. Inside the case was a series of stands and wires that pieced together the mangled corpse of the Cyclops Scout. While much had been mulched by John's anger-fueled trench gun, enough of the body remained intact to make it seem whole. It was still as tall and lanky as when it was alive. As a rather bitter capstone, the intact head with its huge single leg glared at all passersby. That's my side. I still can't believe you actually killed that thing. It gives me the creeps, even in how it looks now. Like I said to Amara, it was a unique circumstance. An authority seven is an authority seven. You saw how many it killed, and it may have killed us too if not for you. John half heartedly agreed in response, staring at the corpse with an intensely neutral face. Amara leaned over and tapped him softly. So, what about the crown? Well, the material for it is right there. He waved to the glass case, causing her to look at it again. The corpse, in its entirety, was locked in the glass case. Even the black crystal, which Amara could faintly sense, was solidly encased in the flesh of its head, untouched since initial mulching and transportation. The others had been listening and picked up what they were talking about, coming to a unanimous agreement that the scout crown would be incredibly useful. But one problem remained. John was on one side, the eye on another, and a wall of crystal between the two. Amara felt her heart sinking. Are you going to retrieve the corpse? I was. But Carrion told me, according to Magisterium and Kingdom Law, I had no rights to the corpse, so I will not be retrieving it. Fuck the loss. The curse practically leapt from her lips, an ineffectual expression of rage against rancid inequality. Are they seriously going to take this away from you? They would stoop that low. According to Carrion, it's a great way for him to get back at me for what happened at his mansion. No, that's not right. You made the kill, so you should have the right to do whatever you want with it. Not according to the loss. Carrion has every right to do what he did and pin the corpse up in here. Dink. John raised his knuckle and tapped the glass. Hmm. Seems strong. Whoosh. Some wind was kicked up right as he said that. He looked at Amara. She had rage painted all over her face. Even the man around her couldn't help but react to her emotions. But she didn't explode. Not yet. She just looked at John, almost like he was the one she was mad at. When did you talk to Carrion? The day I got back. You didn't tell me for three weeks? You had your own business to deal with. And after that? I wanted us to enjoy our time. I had long accepted this by then. I didn't need to make you this mad during that time. Fuck. She stopped, a pressure wave exploding from her foot and kicking up the air in the surroundings. All eyes fell on them, silence raining through the hall. But Amara didn't care. All she did was turn back to the case. Then, a large spell appeared before her, when gathering before forming a long, dangerously sharp blade. The air was tangible as it was compressed, almost enough to condense it into a liquid. And then, it was launched forth. SCRE. A slicing screen was let out as the air blade and the glass collided. But even after that, there was only the slightest scuff mark left behind. John scoffed. He really pulled out all the stops. It can't even be stolen. That glass is probably worth more than the corpse inside it. He's mocking you. Yes, he is. John confirmed Amara's statement with a simple nod. He's mocking me with my own achievement. He knows how valuable it would be to me, and so he hangs it over my head. And there's nothing anyone can do to change this. Yes, there is. I can do something. But you're not going to. He looked down at Amara, his expression neutral. But she could feel how dead serious he was. Just leave it, Amara. It's nothing more than a missed opportunity. There will be plenty more in the future, and now I've learned my lesson, so this won't happen again. We both know that's not the point. Yes, we do. But there's nothing I can do about it that won't just make things worse. So I'm going to swallow my pride and let him have this win. Can you do that with me, please? Amara was silent, the rage filling her mind, yet held back by the rationale in John's request. She wanted to be unreasonable and try to exercise her authority to fight against this. But disregarding how ineffective that would be, doing as John was doing was the smart choice, and she knew it. Her fist trembled as she held herself back, her voice trembling in response. Fine. Thank you, my love. He hugged her to his chest, looking
The others followed behind him, while Minnie watched from the sides. They needed to be at training soon anyway. After walking for a while, we arrived at the training grounds where we found all the other elites in the Puppet Master. I made eye contact with him, the two of us nodding to each other before we got started. Today's scenario is a collective one. You all will be responsible for defending a small base. The wave of beasts will be constant and will last for two hours. In order to successfully defend yourselves, you will need to give everything you've got and work together. This means knights will need to form defensive lines and warlocks will need to coordinate spells. I will not tell you how to do any of that, so good luck figuring it out yourselves. He waved with that last word, teleportation magic enveloping us before sending us to the center of a military base. There were almost 40 elites now, and all of us arrived in a massive group. Once we hit solid ground, there was a shout. All warlocks, get out the walls. Knights, follow me. It was Pontac Oliard, and he immediately took charge. Nobody could argue with him, not to mention how stupid doing so would be when time was of the essence. Monsters were already besieging the walls. I rushed up the stairs with the warlocks. This would be a good chance for Amara and I to let off some steam. The knights below us formed a defensive line in front of the gates. They knew their own rotations best, and we could hear their shouts as they organized themselves into groups. The warlocks were similar, dividing themselves into sections along the wall where they took turns firing off spells. Normally, this would all be good for a war of attrition. Many hours of defense required not just constant killing, but also enough rest. But it was clear that we wouldn't be getting much rest. The monsters we saw were big and plentiful. It would take everything we had in order to defend for two hours. That much was certain. Taking out a chair, I equipped my new modified rifle and started shooting. I knew my own pace, so I ignored everything else and simply did what I was good at. Time skip magic. All right, good job. You're done for the day. In two days, we leave for the blooded hold, so finish your preparations and recover. Dismissed. The puppet master waved us all off, though half the elites were sprawled on the floor in exhaustion. Even I was taking a knee, my breathing heavy and my head splitting with an ache. My eyes were focused downward on the snow beneath my feet, each one of my breaths letting out a long fog from the cold. It was only several minutes later when everyone started to rise and disperse. Betsman grumbled, several minor injuries across his body, his armor radiating some steam from the heat of his skin. That guy is trying to kill us. We're getting better, though. Fine mumbled after him, causing me to nod in agreement. It was hard work, but every time I drained my psyche and stressed myself, I would have long dreams that assisted in my cultivation. Over a month had passed, putting us at the end of February. Tomorrow was the first day of March, and we would be leaving for the blooded hole the next day. For around 40 days, the puppet master pushed all the elites to our limits. That was especially so for our group, who we seemed to have high expectations for. Tana couldn't even walk since she was so tired, having bounded around the battlefield for three hours without rest. Amara was sprawled on the floor too, her mind in another universe after having her manage rain so thoroughly. I was hardly better than them, but that was because I was improving just as fast, if not faster than them. Over 40 days, I had made strides in my progress. The original estimate for completion of my Authority 5 formation was seven months, of which two had already passed, but I was starting to think that I was a bit ahead of schedule. I was now done with my first layer of the three-layer formation. It happened so fast that I was starting to think dreaming was too strong of an ability. Then again, the others were improving at record speeds as well. Fighting was even faster than before, Vetsmon was around 20% stronger, and Tana had much more stamina. As for Amara, she had the greatest progress. I was helping her study science every night, and she was coming to a deep understanding of it all. She could already use some rudimentary fire magic despite not even properly creating whatever course she needed to gain her affinity. She understood it far better than I did, and all I knew was that my teaching was bringing her forward significantly. She was already in Authority 5, so she was on her way to becoming an Authority 6. Once she did that, she would gain a perfect affinity for that level and start using proper fire magic. The others were Authority 5 as well, making their way to Authority 6. I was pretty sure that Fiden was the furthest along, being close to the cusp. I was the only one still stuck at Authority 4, so I needed to catch up, which I seemed to be on my way to doing. After finally getting up, I bid goodbye to my squad, Amara and I walking off together. We were all tired, and tomorrow we were planning to have a dinner together, plus Fiden's girlfriend. Since that was the case, we decided to just retire right after training. Amara and I didn't stay at the Magisterium much anymore. The hotel was far nicer, so we always ended up staying there. After taking a carriage and greeting the key master at the desk, we took the elevator to my room. There, I entered my room and stripped my clothes. Amara was letting me have the shower first since I sweat from all the running. She could use magic, so her physical exertion was a level lower than mine. Once my sweating garments came off, I opened the walk-in closet and took a look. A quarter of the closet was filled with my few sets of clothing, while the rest had gradually been taken by Amara. Dresses, stacks of casual wear, plus all her delicates organized neatly in a drawer. I smirked a bit. We were living together. I didn't have any problem with it. Amara's family had a property within the capital, but since she had the dorm, she was never expected to use that place. And now that I was here and we liked the hotel room a lot more, she phased herself in. We hadn't talked about it properly, but there really wasn't a need to. It happened naturally, and we were okay with it. There was nothing more to say about the matter. I washed myself up before letting her have the bath. She enjoyed doing it in a hot tub while I liked succinct and generally cool or cold showers. Plus, sitting in a hot bath was basically just marinating in your own filth. I didn't get it, but she liked it and came out smelling nice, so I didn't care much other than when I occasionally poked fun at her. I took my place on the couch, laying there before passing out for a bit, as I usually did. Unlike vigor or mana, draining psychic directly made one tired. I could barely even think straight after such a strenuous day, so I at least needed a nap if I wanted to be functional for the rest of the evening. It was an hour later when I woke up, the alarm of my aerial spurring my consciousness, and the scent of some cooking ingredients tickling my nose. I sighed and got up, walking over to the kitchen where Amara was chopping some ingredients. I'm just getting it prepared. That's fine. I smiled and wrapped her in a hug from behind, watching her cut. Having been raised as the daughter of a duchess, touching any kitchen where other than gold-plated dining utensils was out of the question. Ordinary society here was like olden society back on earth. Women were taught how to cook. Such a thing was normal for most of the population, nobles being the exception. Amara had never learned an ounce of cooking, while I had learned enough to cook some tasty meals back on earth. After some observation, she asked to learn some from me, and after a day or so of teaching her, we established some ground rules. The main one was that, until she at least learned how to use a knife properly, she didn't get to cook at all. I had to teach her how to prepare ingredients, so any time we cooked, that was what she usually did, and she was a fast learner. Before long, she was able to do most of the work while I needed to do the more important parts that required some experience, like the actual cooking part. She tended to overcook out of fear that something would still be raw, and for the sake of time and ingredients, she just let me take over that part, especially when we were tired. I watched her knife work, dicing what was basically blue garlic. Some vegetables were far different in this world, and garlic was apparently one of those. It still took the form of clothes, but it was blue instead of white, making me apprehensive at first about using it. Once she was done dicing that, she moved on to slicing some chicken before preparing some spices, doing anything within arm's reach so as to not interrupt our hog. But once she was finished with everything, she set her knife down and relaxed back into my embrace. The two of us silently stood there, tired and aching, finding some comfort and ease in the warmth of our bodies. The night was cold, sprinkles of snow falling outside the window, cooling the room. I'm tired, Amara mumbled. I could tell she just wanted to go to sleep, but we needed our fuel to recover. That was one thing I learned from sports. You can't skip the refueling process, even if it was a chore. I pat her waist. I know. Go wait at the table. I'll finish up. Thank you. She let out a breath as I gave her a quick kiss. Once she separated, I grabbed the ing
I was far bolder than typical. One of the reasons Amara was always so embarrassed. As for Vetsmon and Tana. Well, they hadn't gotten far, but progress there was definitely progress. I can only applaud Vetsmon for his efforts. He and Tana were a lot more chummy, definitely much closer than they've been a month or so ago. But Tana was still oblivious. I was worried about Vetsmon getting too deep in the friend zone, but there was only so much I could do to interfere, making him panic, and then Russia could ruin everything before it even started. I didn't want either of us to overthink, so I left the guy to work his magic. He was at least trying, which meant, sooner or later, the make or break moment would arrive. I just had to sit back and wait and offer what little help I could. The Magisterium's fourth year class was set to leave for their next expedition. There was no grand departure ceremony this time. The underclassmen who idolized the elites and the students' families came to the platform for a final send off, but the platform felt more like a typical train departure. As we boarded the rail with our luggage, I suddenly thought of something while looking out to the families. The puppet master had said that none of his elites had ever died under his care. That was an amazing track record to have. His training obviously worked well, but that didn't apply to those in the fourth year who weren't elites. There had been a few deaths in the normal student body. Still, it wasn't impossible. Murphy's law would screw over anyone not up to standards and ensure those who did would meet something beyond. It must be scary for all these parents to send their children to the front lines. They weren't even soldiers yet, and they were already risking their lives. That was the unfortunate reality of this world. War on Earth seemed a lot better in comparison to this. Modern battles had a lot less collateral damage, casualties in general were heavily reduced, and the fighting was dictated by the people at the top. Parents could direct their rage at actual people in charge and had a chance to at least revolt and try to affect some change. But in this world, the scourge was an existential threat. The common people who fed the war machine couldn't even revolt. The very people who fought off the strongest of the scourge were also the ones who ruled with an iron fist. The ordinary man could only swallow their discontent. Only by the grace of those at the top who still held a sense of justice were the ordinary able to live relatively good lives. It was just another difference between this world and the one I called home. I turned and boarded the rail when Amara tugged my sleeve. It was a three-day trip to the base. We would be making a stop midway as well in a city. It was one of the name I actually recognized. We're here. All students, gather. An instructor called us onto the platform. This is the city of Halesburg. You all have three hours to wander and do as you wish before we continue our journey. Don't cause trouble and don't be late to return. This rail works on the military schedule and it won't wait for a stray student aboard. Unless you want to be stranded here, keep an eye on the clock. That's all. Dismissed. With that, the students dispersed through the terminal to enter the city proper. My squad and I followed, laying eyes on the modest city. There were a lot of farms around here, so this place acted as a transportation hub. This terminal was especially important for transporting food to other cities like the capital. What should we do? Betsmon asked while looking around. The city was smaller and not as rich, so options were limited. There really wasn't much around. I looked around and nodded my head toward a main road. Let's wander. If we see something we like, then we'll go from there. All right. The rest of my squad nodded, all of us taking a walk. It was good to loosen up the muscles anyway. Fiden's girlfriend joined us along the way, so the six of us went around the small city and took in some of the sights. We stuck out like a sore thumb. Gazes fell on us and flicked away just as quickly. Our rich kid from the city looked painfully obvious to the small-time merchants and farmers out in the streets. Anybody we came across was quick to get out of our way. I felt like I was being treated like a mob boss. There were a few shops that caught our eye, so we just went where we felt like and bought some things: some jewelry stores, clothing shops, armories, smithies, tea shops, the works. We checked out anything interesting. Nothing really caught my eye, but my main focus was elsewhere. We wandered through the quiet market for another two hours, and just as my hope started to wane, we came across a small side plaza. Vendors neatly lined up against the squat mud brick buildings, and there, standing behind a counter talking to another man, was my old friend. My eyes brightened. Chief. Hmm. The old guy turned around, his eyes widening in panic as his gaze fell on my coat, but immediately narrowing when he saw my face. John. Yeah, it's been a while. I'd has. I didn't expect to see you here. He seemed a bit baffled as I went up and shook his hand, patting his shoulder with a broad smile. I happened to be passing by. How are you? How's the village? We're doing just fine, as always. What about you? Things seem to be going well in the capital. Well, I got into the magisterium, and it's been tough, but I'd say things are working out quite well. I'm an authority for now. Oh my. Congratulations, John. I'm very glad you were able to make your way. He looked shocked at my news, his eyes bulging a bit as he forced out a smile. I could see him glancing at my squad behind me. They were rather confused, and the chief was quite overwhelmed, so I decided it was right time to make introductions. Chief, these are my friends from the magisterium. We're in a squad together. Guys, this is the chief from Humor Village. He helped me get to the capital when I was stranded and had absolutely nothing to my name. I owe quite a lot to him. Th there's no need to exaggerate so much. It's a, a pleasure to meet you all. The chief stammered out a greeting, shakily bowing before exchanging handshakes with everyone in turn. He seemed a bit more comfortable after that, almost as if he had confirmed that the squad and I were real. John, you said this is your squad? Are you all going to the front lines? Yes, we are. I was placed in the fourth year, and I managed to get into the elites after that. The elites? You all. He looked around at everyone with quite the reaction. I wasn't sure if he was just surprised or scared. That's when Amara spoke with a small smile. John here managed to fight his way up to elite rank three. He's the best summoner to ever walk through the magisterium. Summoner. He also managed to kill an authority seven scourge beast. He's in the hall of fame now. S7. With every sentence spoken, the chief's terrified surprise became more evident. I elbowed Amara who seemed to enjoy exasperating the problem. All right, no need to butter me up so much. Hoo hoo. All right. Still, I'd like to make a proper introduction. Hello again, chief. Amara smiled and curtsied toward the chief. My name is Amara Teleria, daughter of Duchess Teleria, rank six of the elites, and John's girlfriend. Pleasure to meet one of my boyfriend's patrons. Why yes. The chief wasn't sure how to react to all that sudden information, bowing a bit with a blanket panicking expression. I clicked my tongue at Amara's antics. But then, I saw Vetsmon step up with a goofy grin. I'll also introduce myself again. I'm Vetsmon Verga, son of Ignatius Verga, the family head of the fourth paladin peerage of the church. Also the rank for elite. I'm Fighting Desmus, son of Marquis Adrian Desmus, rank 2 elite. I'm Tana Choron, daughter of Count Phelan Choron, rank 12 elite. I'm not actually a part of their squad, but I'm Mira, daughter of Marquis Revenon, rank 11 elite. The chief and I were silent as everyone introduced themselves. The little plaza had gone silent. I felt dozens of stares on me and my friends, a scattered mix of fear and awe. The sons and daughters of some very powerful people were here. I suppose the chief hadn't expected such an intense greeting, because he was now completely flabbergasted. If not for him trying to show these noble children a respectful smile, he'd probably look horrified. Why yes. It's a pleasure to meet you all. He forced the words out, his face almost red with strain. I clicked my tongue, shooting the others a look before patting his shoulder. Don't worry about these posers, chief. Come on, let's go get a drink. Who's a poser? I want a drink too. Me too. Don't let Tana have a drink. Everyone quit as they followed the chief and I, heading to a bar where we ordered some alcohol. I sat on the edge of the table with the chief, a bit of separation between us and the others. Once he got some breathing room, he patted down his sweat with a long breath. Goodness, John, you've made some powerful friends. It hasn't even been a year. A lot has happened. Nonsense. You're dating the daughter of a duchess. Are you secretly a noble? I'm not. I chuckled and took a sip, the chief stealing glances. I found the difference between an ordinary village chief and us magi rather
I want you to take this as my thanks for your help back then. A proper thanks too. Not the measly thousand coin I'd given to you. Amara. I turned, catching my girlfriend's attention and tapping into my telepathic connection with her. We had made it a habit to simply keep it active. Can you create a barrier around the two of us? If you can block sight and sound, that would be nice. All right. I'm just going to give him some money. It's for his safety, just in case. Oh, sure. She nodded and cast some magic, covering me and the chief in a dome of condensed vapor. Nobody could see or hear anything from without, so I took out the item I had prepared in case I was actually able to find him. Here, chief, this is a spatial sack. It can hold about a chest worth of items. I made sure it was subtle and could be used by ordinary people. W what? His eyes bulged when he saw the band I placed on the table in front of him. It was a Polaris brand spatial sack card from a special kind of wood, powered by an embedded white crystal. There was no indication of any magic though. It looked like a completely ordinary wooden band, like something an ordinary carpenter would carve for fun. Because the chief was completely ordinary, utilizing its storage features was the limit of what he could do. He didn't have a crest that it could bind to, so it would be up to him to keep it safe. So long as he did so, it would remain a very valuable item. But that wasn't even the good part. Inside the band is 80,000 coin. Alongside what the band itself cost, it's a bit over a tenth of my savings. I felt that was a good amount to give you. 80 what? I am sorry, John. I couldn't possibly take so much money from you. Chief, you went out of your way to help me when I had nothing. I don't care that you only spent a few coin to get me into the capital. You were the one who brought me there and opened the door to all the other opportunities one got. You secured my future. Without you, things would look quite bleak for me. Now, I want to secure your future. I grabbed his hand, slipping the band over it and onto his forearm. It shrunk to his size before activating. His eyes went blank for a second, likely seeing everything inside. He couldn't stop the magic even if he wanted to. He was soon aware that there was in fact 80,000 coin inside, broken up primarily into silver denominations. It wasn't like I could give him 80 gold bullion and expect him to actually use that. That meant the band was loaded with a pile of silver coin. Only 10 of those coins were gold bullion. After seeing more money than his entire village made in years, he tried to take the band off. John, I can't dash. All right, stop. I think I said this last time, but I'm not taking no for an answer. It's about time I paid you back, so take the band and use it wisely. It should be enough for you to live comfortably, or to get yourself to that point. Besides, I'm going to be making more money as I increase my power. Don't stress yourself out and accept this. He went silent as I stared him down, seriousness in my eyes. It was almost like I was threatening him to accept it, but this was what he deserved. I didn't believe in simply paying back what I owed. I believed in paying back that debt proportionally. What he had given me back then wasn't even something that could be repaid in money, but it would have to do for now. I lifted my aerial, seeing the time and realizing we had to leave soon. I stood. All right, our rail leave shortly. That money and band is yours to do with however you wish. The only thing I can ask is that you're smart with its use. This dome around us is meant to prevent anyone from knowing you have this kind of money. But once you step out of here, it'll be up to you to keep it safe and hidden. I don't know when I'll be able to see you again. So until then, I wish you and your village good health. Right as I said that, the dome dispersed. I stepped out of my seat, joining the others donning coats and bags. The chief stopped me right as I was about to leave. John, hmm, may the Lord bless you. I know you're fighting the scourge. Please, keep yourself safe. The world is a better place with a good man like you in it. I wish upon you happiness wherever you go. Thank you, chief. I went and shook the man's hand one last time before leaving with my squad. As we walked back to the rail, that's my elbowed me. Did you give him a fortune or something? No. It was just a gift for his help. Knowing you, it was probably a hundred thousand coin. I also saw the spatial sack. Amar chimed in, shooting me a glare. You can give away all the money you like yet can't accept something like a stupid loot without being forced to. I'm indebted to him, not the Raven family chief. That's besides the point, and you know it. I can't believe that I actually wish for you to be more selfish sometimes. Why should I be selfish? For your own sake, stupid. Act. I jumped a bit as she kicked my leg, a small smile on my face. The others made similar comments as we walked back to the terminal. The platform bustled with activity, students about everywhere in final preparation for our resumed journey to the front lines. I sighed, rather content after handing off my gift. It was the first time I was able to properly pay back a debt. Chapter 100, Royal. Even from a distance underground, we could hear the sounds of battle. Our supervisor, a lieutenant, called out and shook us from our stupor. We braked hard into the station, the terminal already filled with wounded for loading. Disembark and move to munitions. They'll have instructions for you there. Hurry up. We've got casualties that need loading. Flashes of red and white briefly silhouetted defenders scrambling atop tall stone walls. Explosions rang free from all sides, and occasional scourge beasts being flung high into the sky. The blooded hole was far larger than any base we'd ever been to before. I couldn't even make out distinct people on the other wall. It was just a mass of colored uniforms launching fireballs and arrows. I already had my coat on, so I slipped my gloves over my hands after picking up a prepared pack from supply with the others. Protocol was pretty standard. The warlocks were to go up the walls with ranged knights while the remainder were to meet up in the courtyard to coordinate a counter assault. As per usual, summoners were left to do whatever. When we exited the terminal, I was able to pick up several powerful ores within the base. One of them matched President Carrion and Authority 11. There were a few Authority 10s below him and many more Authority 9s. As for the Authority 8s and 7s, they were everywhere. There were as many as there were 10s in the hold. Those at our level still outnumbered the others by far. There were thousands upon thousands of soldiers here. The base itself covered dozens of acres, and it was the main wall in front that held the beast back. The terminal was in the middle of the base not far from headquarters. However, the sheer size of the base made the distance rather great. That's why several trucks were waiting. All those from the Magisterium, board the trucks, and we'll take you to the wall. Hurry up. We were waved on, my squad sticking together as we piled into one of the transport trucks. It wasn't long before we were dumped out to fight. I went up the wall with Amara, running down its length until we found some room in one of the sections. We didn't ask questions. We just set up and fell into the cadence of the commanding officer nearby. Fire. A hundred mages launched their spells, the darkness flaring with fire, plumes of steam briefly flashing into existence before wind cut them apart, scourge beasts falling to pieces or vaporizing under the devastating assault. The tide briefly opened, the ground visible for moments between the collapsed bodies of scourge beasts, before being swallowed up again by another fresh wave of hostiles. Any warlock at the level to fight here had more than one affinity. There was no earth magic being used since the knights were forming offensive lines to meet the scourge at their best. Any agitation with the ground, while effective at disrupting scourge lines, would prove equally effective at tripping up the advancing knights. My gun, for once, barely stuck out with the sheer amount of screaming beasts and fiery explosions. That I was using my suppressed Springfield definitely helped in that regard. The moon was bright enough to see a decent distance by, so I stuck to picking off larger targets, whittling down HVTs while the warlocks cleared out riffraff with area of effect spells. I tapped into my telepathic connection with Amara for a sudden question. Hey, it takes a warlock three advancements to develop a perfect affinity. Can they develop two different affinities back to back? Or do they need to completely advance their affinity before moving on to another? Give me a moment. A gust of wind, uniquely tinted with Amara's aura, sliced through a group of advancing beasts. Okay, they can technically take whatever path they want. They can advance their water affinity twice before suddenly switching to fire for a couple of advancements. But no matter what, after an advancement, a decision is made that dictates the purpose of the next level. I see. I nodded while firing another shot. It seemed warlocks didn't need to focus entirely on one affinity at a time. But then that inspired another question. Why is it normal to focus on one at a time? Because then there's more time for an enlightenment. Not only that,
The only downside was that you wouldn't have the spell versatility the other affinities gave you for periods of time. Even that wasn't really a negative. The strength of perfected affinity gave you far outstripped the versatility of more. Quality over quantity, as some would say. I mulled over these thoughts as I chambered another round, a four-legged beast crumpling off in the distance. I was perched on a chair, as was Amara. She learned her lesson and brought one too, so we could preserve our stamina during long battles like this one. After some time, though, I felt something poking at me from beyond the darkness of the battlefield. I dragged my reticle across the back of the horde, but even the moon didn't provide enough light for me to see that far away. I didn't feel anything concrete even after reaching out further with my aura, but I knew for a fact there was something, someone, out there. We're being watched. What? By who? Amara lifted her head. I could tell that she was concerned about the people around us, thinking that some nobles were trying to cause trouble. I shook my head. Nobody on the wall. Something is out there beyond the battlefield. I can't see them, but there are definitely a pair of eyes on us. That doesn't sound good. Another scout? It doesn't feel like one. It's not hostile, just curious. I don't know why one would be so close either. I brought the scope back up, looking around to see if I could make anything out in the distance. But it was futile. The feeling was too faint and visibility too low. However, at some point, the feeling rapidly grew. No, it was getting closer. My eyes widened. We were a half day too early. It seems they made a stop. A humanoid spoke from atop a hill, another one already there turning to face it. The two of them could see the waves of monsters besieging the wall, watching indifferently as the humans fought them off. The other humanoid waved. It doesn't matter. There's plenty of fodder left, and they're here now. Who was it that you said to keep an eye on? A few, but two in particular. The former approached the latter, a crystal orb filled with mist condensing into two profiles. One was labeled Pontec Goliard, the strongest elite of the Magisterium. There were some descriptors labeling his outstanding achievements and abilities, as well as his noble title. But there was another one beside it. John. The son of Goliard is powerful, but not beyond expectations considering his noble lineage. The great outlier in recent times is this John Cooper. So far, we collected little to no information on him. No noble title, no family, no background. The only achievement he holds is being the rank 3 elite, and that wouldn't be anything of note if not for the fact that he's a cold summoner. Hmm. The second figure took a look at the information below John's portrait. His keen aura and abnormally powerful weapons were of particular interest, but no additional details could be provided, not even on their functionality. Nonetheless, he was an outlier, one that it took interest in. Where is this John now? He's on the wall. It seems his summons are ranged weapons. We're collecting information on him as we speak, but the conclusion right now is that he's someone to keep an eye on. He's said to have a keen aura. We can sell this now. A bow flashed into existence in the figure's hands, a hefty arrow being knocked as he scanned the walls. At some point, he recognized an oddity. A man sitting behind the wall, wielding a weapon that occasionally let out explosions. They weren't of any sort he'd ever seen before. Through the distance and ambient noise, it couldn't be heard well. But it was noticeable enough. He smiled. Found him. He raised the bow, pulling the string back before locking in place, a momentary tableau of brutal grace. A slight twitch was all it took to perfect his aim. He watched as John stopped firing, eyes tracking each suspicious movement of his head. There was a lull in John's movement. Fingers twitched. The arrow flew true. His eyes followed. John's eyes widened. How interesting. He smiled. A blur of gunmetal gray flew past my head, a gust of wind brushing past moments later. My eyes followed a second later, fast, but not fast enough. It had implanted itself solidly in the wall behind me, the arrowhead's only proof being a cross-shaped hole surrounding a metal shaft. To travel such a distance and still impart enough force to burrow itself into a reinforced wall required an incredibly powerful night behind it. Amara also froze, staring at the arrow with cold sweat forming on her forehead. T that's this portion of the wall had fallen silent, surrounding soldiers sensing the wisps of leftover vigor flowing from the point of impact. The commanding officer realized the section had stopped firing and turned to chastise them when he too noticed the rod impaled in the wall. What is that? An arrow. Something out there fired it. I mumbled in response as he walked over and yanked it out, a shower of debris accompanying it. Amara spat out her words. That's a royal. Why the fuck did a royal try to kill you? I don't think he was trying to kill me. I responded to her telepathically. There was no hostility. Merely observation. Until I sensed the arrow. It feels more like a test than an assassination attempt. That's even worse. Let's get off the wall. She stood and stowed her items, grabbing my hand and leading me down the wall. We need to find the puppet master and tell him about this. Does this mean something? You do know what royals are, right? Amara asked as we searched around, causing me to nod. Yes. They're intelligent humanoids unlike the rest of the scourge. Then it should be obvious that catching the interest of a royal is really bad news. I don't think you know this part, but the intelligent part of the scourge doesn't just sit back and throw fodder at us all the time. They use the scouts to collect information, then take out targets with potential. There's been many reports of student deaths from royals, so they want to kill me before I can get stronger. Well, they certainly know about your strength now. It's safe to say that everything you do beyond the walls of this space from now on is going to be extremely dangerous. A strong scout is the least of our worries. I could feel Amara's solemnity through our connection. It seemed that the scourge had its own special task force in charge of espionage and sabotage. This was a side of them that the public didn't know about or conveniently chose to ignore. If I was now on a list, I had to be extra careful. If they really wanted to kill me, then there wasn't much I could do to protect myself. After a bit more thought, I stopped Amara from walking before taking out my aerial, dialing the puppet master. Yes, John. I have some bad news. I told him about what happened, causing him to go silent for a moment. I swear, you can't go a day without pissing someone off. I didn't realize I needed to tiptoe around the scourge's feelings. I'm talking about me. Here I am trying to keep you alive while you continue to attract the worst possible enemies to have. Now I need to second guess every little mission I send you unless everyone gets killed just because you were with them. You know, I'm starting to think I should just kick you off the elites so that you don't get put on every damn hit list known to mankind. My face went blank as the puppet master ran it through the aerial as if it were my fault. Well, I couldn't completely blame him. I let him get everything off his chest, a process that took a whopping 15 minutes. He was usually succinct, but apparently today he decided to take exception to my plights and talk my ear off. It was quite impressive, really. Once he was finally done, he took a few deep breaths before giving me some clear instructions. Just sit your ass down on the sidelines while I figure this out. And don't go blabbing about this either if you want to keep your life. Yes, sir, puppet master, sir. Don't patronize me. He grumbled and hung up, causing me to chuckle. So, Omar asked, earning a shrug. The puppet master just rewarded us with unpaid vacation. We get to do whatever the hell we want until he finds a suitable mission for us. Which may take a while. So he's keeping you away from danger. Good. How strong are the royals anyway? I haven't a clue how strong they were besides judging bounties and looking at information available on the Black Spider repository. Anything on there would be worth killing, and thus higher authority, but I didn't have exact numbers. Bounties were so high on royals both because of the lack of information about them and their high kill counts. What I did know was that they were humanoid scourge entities with intelligence on par with humans. That made them especially dangerous, because they could plan ahead just as well as humans could and, more importantly, control the masses of beasts below them. There weren't as many of them as there were humans, so humanity still stayed ahead. But on the battlefield, numbers meant less, so their lethality was amplified. Even more worrying was their odd powers. While some were generally in line with the three Magi classification, others diverged and were more like scourge beasts. I wouldn't know what to expect when facing one until they attacked. Amar shrugged. They still go by the same authority system as us. They can be of any level, but chances are, the one that tried to shoot you wasn't absurdly high level since you're not dead. Still, they're not things you want to mess with. I get that. Let's just relax. Lord kn
The three-layer advancement formation was difficult to even start. Like any puzzle, I had to look for patterns, accumulate information, before realizing how things fit together. But once I finished preparations, it was just a matter of time before the first layer was completed. The second layer essentially restarted the process with a whole new set of patterns and the added difficulty of needing to couple and anchor the formation to the first layer. It would be more difficult, but the experience gained from constructing the first layer made me pretty good at recognizing patterns. I was pretty confident in the speed of my progress. After analyzing over the break, I was making good progress with the second layer. Some pieces I had connected and laid aside, others I had attached to the first layer as foundations. In the process, I realized I could still utilize the first part of the advancement formation to help me with cultivation. The advancement to the fifth authority was all about preparing my mind to accept the second spark. I needed to make my mind stronger and faster to properly fit the second spark. It was like upgrading a computer. My hardware had to get better to accommodate another component. Advancement formations were sets of instructions for how to move magical energies. Some steps were obscured until the entire formation was complete, but they still existed. Most couldn't take them early. They were obscured, after all. But since I was a damn genius, I was able to make them out and take some of the steps early. This acted as a sort of positive feedback loop. My initial efforts kickstarted the ocean of stars in my mind. They now moved along a current that, despite being slow, was significantly beneficial. And each speed up in my thought process from that moving current meant I could comprehend the next steps faster, which would thereby result in even faster thinking. After rinsing and repeating that cycle a few times, my progress exponentially accelerated. So I utilized my newfound free time, courtesy of the puppet master, to buckle down and train. The siege petered out by the next day, and the puppet master hadn't yet received missions to send my squad out on yet. We were all just stuck indoors while everyone else got sent out. I used that time to train almost relentlessly. Or, in all honesty, it was more like studying than anything. You know, you're pretty relaxed about all of this. Amara sidled up to me on my buck. Getting targeted by royals was no different from being targeted by the entire scourge. It wasn't something to take lightly, as the puppet master's rant had made quite clear. It's because I've got to focus on my advancement. But I'm well aware of just how large the target on my back is getting. In fact, it's getting quite suffocating. There are enemies I need to face that are at a level I can't handle, and my ability to hide is rapidly decreasing. I needed time to grow, and there were just so many things that cut into that time. The balancing act was delicate. I couldn't seem to do anything that wouldn't end with a blade in my face. I could only redouble my efforts in the time I had. My aura was sensitive to danger, but it also reinforced my own sense of urgency. Every gaze that landed on me, every hostile thought, every threat, was yet another level of stress that stuck with me throughout the entire day. My aura reminded me relentlessly that I needed to get better. It amplified my subconscious worries and incessantly reminded me of my inadequacies. Refusing to train was nearly impossible now. My subconscious screamed at me. My mind wouldn't let me. Reality dictated against my wishes. My only source of comfort in these trials was Amara, and even then I couldn't tell her everything. Her normalcy was my rock. After that day, the puppet master didn't send us on any missions. We sat within the base and trained for two entire weeks. After a while, I felt like he was being paranoid with how safe he was trying to keep us. But at some point, he finally came to us with a mission. We were called to the briefing room and arrived early, eager to see what he had in store for us. You're here. Good. Are you sharp? The puppet master asked me as I took a seat at a table with my squad. Yeah, it's been nothing but training these last two weeks. At least you're not lazy. I guess that's the only reason you're not dead. Anyway, I've got a special task for you and your squad. He lifted his hand and papped the board he was standing beside. On it was a map, as well as a few images of some scouts. From some patrols and scouting operations, we've received reports on scout activity along this ridge. I have a feeling it has to do with you and the interest the royals have taken. They've been trying to find both you and Pontek, but it doesn't seem like they're planning anything big. They aren't willing to invest too much to kill you yet. Headquarters wants to use your specialty to run a counter operation against them. You're good at killing scouts, and that's what you're going to do. You'll be working with a squad of soldiers. There are three of them, and they're going to take you out there and bring you back. One of them is an authority eight knight, so you'll be protected if anything goes sideways. The other two are warlocks, authority SIXS, there to provide some extra firepower if you need it. Still, if all goes as planned, you'll be the only one killing anything. Are there any royals over there? Plus, these scouts are quite literally designed to pick things out. How am I supposed to kill them without fighting everything nearby? We haven't seen the royals recently, though it isn't guaranteed that they will be absent, so that's why you have the authority eight. As for how you go about keeping yourself hidden, that's entirely up to you. Killing even just one scout is still considered a mission success, so do what you need to do to stay alive. You'll get more of these missions depending on how well you perform, so do as much as you can, but don't be foolhardy. You'll get plenty of other chances, so just do what you're good at, and make this worth it. Hmm, all right. I nodded at him. He was giving me autonomy, which spoke to how much he trusted my abilities. Well, it seemed I had earned that trust among several people. I seemed to be getting sent on these kinds of missions more and more. First to Vera, then the key master, now the puppet master, and the military. Well, I couldn't be surprised. I happened to be pretty good at what I did. You leave in an hour from the western gate. The target location isn't very far away. Backup will be on standby. Any questions? It was a pretty straightforward mission, but I still had one concern. The soldiers. Will they defer to my decisions? Yes. But they're ranked higher, so don't expect them to bend over backwards. I've already discussed all of this with them, and the commander agreed to trust me and let you be the centerpiece of this operation. If it fails, don't expect to get called up for it again. It won't. So long as the situation is reasonable, I'll trust you'll make it so. I've heard what you've done over in the markets. You seem to have a knack for this. Anything else? Head shook around the room. Good. Go forth and prove me right. With my concern rectified, the briefing ended, and we were dismissed to prepare for the mission. I wasn't surprised the puppet master had heard of my exploits in the market. It meant that my name was getting out there, or at least my infamy. Big names, like my targets, going down the way they did, would no doubt cause a ruckus. I didn't feel much pride in the task itself considering it was almost too easy for me, but that didn't mean others could see that. I made a note to myself to prepare for more of these missions in the future. The others were just there for support, but we all still had to prepare for a worst case scenario. To do anything less would be stupid. We trickled our way to the western gate over the next hour, each of us grabbing whatever specialty specific gear we needed from acquisitions. I was the first to arrive, needing nothing other than my summons and some rations. Waiting for me was a group of three soldiers and two trucks. The authority eight approached me. I'm Chief Commander Carlson. Just call me Chief Carlson. You're John. I am. I look forward to working with you guys. Likewise, we shook hands, my impression of this man rapidly growing positive. He was an officer, but wasn't immediately an asshole, even to a cadet. From my experience in this world, people tended that way when facing anyone of lesser stature. We'll be in charge of transportation and protection. We've been ordered to leave any offensive combat to you. A simple in and out is what they said. If all goes well, it'll be just that. They might not even know we were ever there. Well, that makes me curious. Let's go. You all will be with me. The warlocks will take the back of Hummer. With his word, we boarded the Hummers. We were gone within minutes. By now, evening was arriving. The sun would set not long from now. Dust would give me enough light to see by, but also some darkness for concealment. From the western gate, we rolled across the relatively flat terrain around the base. The dead scourge that once covered the immediate area had been vaporized, buried, or removed by the numerous garrison warlocks. A few hills here and there were the only other outstanding features. There weren't even forests. After about half an hour, trees started encroaching on clear landscapes. We eventually entered a forested ridge, forced to slow down to better navigate. Thankfully, we didn't have to go in deep. Just ten minutes of driving through the ridge was enough to put us
and around the scouts were some escorts, at least 40 of them. This shouldn't be too bad. There are six of them. Best case scenario, I kill between three and five from the shadows before bailing. Worst case, I kill one or two before bailing. You can guarantee at least one kill? Certainly. That's the easy part. The challenge will be killing more before exposing my position. Hmm. That's the least of our worries. There are scourge beasts not far from here. The issue with launching these attacks is the possibility of getting surrounded before withdrawing. At that point, I myself might even be overwhelmed, to say nothing of your squad. But we were told that you can kill them from a distance. I can, but not this far. Let's see. I lifted my head, scanning the surrounding area before pointing at a closer cliff. Bring me there. Very well. I'll separate us into two groups. The others will hang by the other hummer, and I will accompany you to the outcrop. I was told you have a partner. Yes. Amara will join us. The rest of you, mind waiting for us? No problem. That's my answer from the side. Chief Carlson nodded. Then let's move out. No reason for us to be still out past Chow. With those words, we all jumped on the hummers. Amara and I joined the chief in his, while everyone else was in the other. When we drove, they hung back a couple hundred meters from the outcropping, while we pulled up right behind it. That was another benefit of these magic vehicles. They were completely silent aside from the tires rolling on the dirt. That made these stealth missions a lot easier. We jumped out and approached the outcropping. I lay down and crawled toward the edge of the rocky ledge. Springfield in hand, I scoped in. I reckon they were about 350 meters from our position. The scouts were gathered in a group, chewing on the carcasses of some wildlife. I smiled. Most of them were stationary. That made this a lot easier. In a low tone, serious face on, I motioned to Carlson and explained the plan. The most I can kill in sequence is five, and that's if all my shots are perfect. I'm not betting on more than three realistically. After the first shot, they'll be alerted, so however many I get in five shots is probably going to be my limit. Understood. If they find us though, we need to pull out quickly. They'll give chase as soon as they spot us and after that, we'll have all the scourge beasts within five miles homing in our location. I'll be prepared to bail. Just let me get off my five shots. Sure. He nodded, and with that, I nudged Amara who lay right beside me. Ready? All I need is silence. Of course. Keep in mind though, my bullets will still make sound when they reach the scouts. All this barrier is doing is keeping them from listening for our direction, to some extent. Remind me to ask you about how that works again later. Sure. Amara's sound barrier materialized around us. I felt like I'd gone deaf. Every sound from outside was completely gone. I couldn't even hear my own breathing. I took some deep breaths, steadying my aim as I found my first victim. There were six, and in my head I planned my sequence of attack. Target priority in mind. I twitched my reticle onto the first head. I could only feel the trigger click, the recoil hitting only moments after, the suppressor and Amara's air working in tandem to completely nullify any report. Downrange, one scout dropped dead, its head sporting a brand new hole. The others were still reacting as I found the next target looking curiously at the corpse of its buddy. Although still careful, I took less time to squeeze off the next round, hitting center mass and dropping it to the ground. A quick look told me the scout was heavily wounded, not dead, but would soon be. A silent scream tore through the air, the other scouts finally getting past the shock to move. I ignored it, taking aim at the slowest just as it started moving. The beasts all around started scrambling moments later. Point thirty dash zero six bullets were supersonic and thus broke the sound barrier, creating a shockwave that exploded in the ears of anything it passed. They had to pass the creature first before the shockwave was felt, but nonetheless, all of them were seeing their buddies drop to the floor before hearing an explosion. It was obvious that they were under attack, but they didn't know where the attacks were coming from. Some of them were already looking our way, probably inferring the direction from the way their buddies had fallen. It was impressively sharp for what was bound to be an instinctual reaction, but they still weren't sure where exactly they were being shot from. They couldn't see anything, for one, and vision was what scouts relied on. They could gather all the information they wanted, but their eyes took precedence above all, and thus far they could find nothing. That uncertainty was exactly what I needed. Having started striding off in multiple directions, the scouts made themselves too difficult to assuredly hit, so I held off for a little while. However, they couldn't keep running, and one stopped and turned to communicate. I fired at it, my body having steadied completely, my reticle resting right on top of its neck. I watched as the bullet tore through its chest like the last. All the beasts around it turned, watching in morbid astonishment as its body crumpled in on itself. Three bullets, two more to go. The other three scouts were now looking in our direction, doing everything they could to find us. I could sense their gazes through my aura. They weren't locked onto us yet, but even the slightest movements would give our position away. I ignored it and found another still scout, firing. Shit. I cursed in my mind as the bullet landed off center. Instead of shooting through its chest, I tore off its arm at the shoulder instead. That scout fell to the floor, and its erratic movements made it too difficult to shoot accurately. So I instantly racked the bolt before settling in for my last shot. That missed shot caused me to panic a bit, so I got a nice spike of adrenaline that helped me hyperfixate on my next target. One of the two remaining scouts looked back at their screaming friend. The other one, however, was looking at me. I could feel its gaze. That shot had given me away, but that was alright. It was focused on me, our aura's meeting. It was enraged and was already sending beasts to me. Several of the escort beasts started running in our direction, but its focus was its downfall. I could almost feel our eyes meet through my scope in an eerie sort of connection. That's when I realized that my intent could be easily read. It was also when I figured out how to utilize the aura technique I had theorized about. Instead of making myself invisible, I could just create the illusion of me being invisible. That also applied to my intent. If I focused on nothing but killing the scout, it would realize that and try to evade. It would be able to sense what I wanted to do. It was almost like mind reading. But if I masked the intent coming from my mind, then it wouldn't be able to read anything. And that's exactly what I did. I created a veil around my mind, dividing it from the rest of my aura that the scout could see. It was as simple as making a barrier of power. I could practically see the confusion on the scout's face as it seemed to lose me. A final trigger pull was muffled in the bubble. The scout's head fell as my bullet severed its neck. That was four kills and one casualty. I spoke to Amara through my telepathy. That's it. Release the barrier. Got it. She responded. Sounds of the world returning to my ears. I spoke. That's all. Let's get out of here. Ha, huh, with pleasure. The chief commander seemed oddly happy as we backed out and boarded the Hummer. Like that, we drove away, the rest of our squad falling in as we went. Before long, we had left the ridge and no scourge beasts were in sight. In and out, not undetected, but without contest. The commander laughed. You know, I've never seen anything quite like that before. No wonder you wanted you to do this mission. That was damn near the easiest mission I've ever done. Just like that, for scouts are dead, and not a single man was killed in the process. Nothing more than a bit of magic power for vehicles and your energy was spent. Well, it certainly went well. I missed one, but they just kept standing still. They were almost asking to be shot. How you did that from so far away is beyond me. Only the best archers I know of can pull off stunts like that. Which means that you, John, have earned yourself some more missions. Hooray for me. I gave a sarcastic cheer, making him chuckle. Don't be so down. These are the best ones to have. They're fun, relatively safe, and don't come very often. It may be another week before you get called again. So until then, you're living the life. That's true. Not only that, but your name is going to get passed around. Some might say otherwise, but I'm a firm believer in recognition being a most valuable resource. You're still in the magisterium, but if you want a good post once you enter the military, then you'll need to have some connections. Make yourself desirable and you'll get desirable positions. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Of course, you're quite amazing, and not just for a summoner. Would hate for that talent to go to waste. I smiled. It seemed my initial assessment was right. After that, I lounged back with Amara as we drove back to base. He was right. This was rather fun. 